Fog surrounds two twin cliffs making it impossible to see the ground below. A man with long hair stands on top of a 10,000 miles cliff, reminiscing about the old times, especially the day he dreamed about becoming the god of martial arts. One he could not easily fulfill, but still wanted to achieve. The man tells that he was treated like a madman whenever he told someone about his aspirations, but he trained his martial arts day and night to achieve his dream like a crazy man. While he wasn't able to become the god of martial arts, he thought his training was sufficient, but it wasn't. Another man in a dark navy robe, with an army behind his back, interrupts the crazy demons reminiscing. A member of the demon cult, the left hand of illuminating light, tells him to stop wasting time and return the heavenly pearl he stole from the cult. The crazy demon turns, upset that someone interrupted him when he was talking. The left hand of illuminating light asks what the crazy demon will gain from telling useless stories when his end is already set. He has run till now, but he won't be able to get any further. The crazy demon takes out a small red bead from himself, the heavenly pearl. He threatens to drop the bead down the cliff. The demon cult man immediately apologizes and tells him to please continue with the story. The crazy demon goes on telling how he is adept in mind games, trickery, baiting and lies, and he is unable to fall into honey traps. He is also an insanely good drinker and extremely good at light body technique. The left hand of the demon cult interrupts again. He tells that it's just what the crazy demon thinks. The actual reason he never falls for honey traps is that beautiful women are unable to force themselves to even pretend that they like him. So they had to bait him with a more normal looking woman they managed to find. The entire world is aware of this fact. Their eyes meet and crazy demon again threatens to throw the heavenly pearl. The other man tells him to continue again. To become the god of martial arts, the crazy demon become the crazy jack of all trades, that is who he is, the crazy demon. The illuminating light cult and its left hand are unaffected. The crazy demon is not done yet. After enduring everything, the times he spent journeying to bring justice to the world, all feel meaningless. The other man speaks up again. The crazy demon is on the list of the most wanted men list of the Murim Union as a public enemy, and he is even higher than any of the cult members. It was the orthodox sect that named the crazy demon in the first place. The crazy demon signals again if he should throw the heavenly pearl. The other man clenches his jaw and apologizes for angering him. The crazy demon concludes out loud that the item must be really important, seeing that the other man, the left hand of the illuminating light, is controlling his temper. The crazy demon also killed hundreds of the cult's members during the chase, yet the other man is still keeping his temper in check. The left hand of illuminating light is furious. Just because the crazy demon has a mouth doesn't mean he can use it however he wants. A wave of bloodlust suddenly permeates the air. The cult does want to kill the crazy demon, so he is going to respect their final choice and end it with a fight. Before that, the crazy demon wonders if he should throw the heavenly pearl since it's going to be troublesome to fight while holding it. The other man apologizes again for showing his emotional side and pleads to talk the matter out. Suddenly, the crazy demon erupts. He is being chased for days with a heaven's net without any rest. Because of them he couldn't even sleep nor eat, let alone take a dump, it was utterly depressing. That was why the demon cult used heaven's net to begin with. The crazy demon clenches his fist around the heavenly pearl. The other man asks him what he is trying to do. The crazy demon is about to give the guy a big shit of his own, and he swallows the pearl. Suddenly, silence ensues. The other man starts sweating profusely while the crazy demon wonders about the unexpected taste of the pearl which tastes like peaches. The left hand of the illuminating light is furious and calls the crazy demon a bitch for actually eating the pearl. Seeing their reaction, the crazy demon grins, it was the right choice. A nerve pops out in the other man's face and orders his men to attack. He tells them to leave his life intact and that he will grind him alive and present him to the cult leader. The men charge at the crazy demon. The crazy demon takes his stance. He ducks when the first man attacks and punches him in the gut. The first man goes flying and the second man swings his sword. Crazy demon elbows him in the back. More men come at him, and the crazy demon pulls in his hand and pushes out with a palm strike. His palm strikes the abdomens of the men one by one, and they all thump to the ground. The crazy demon dares the left hand of the illuminating light to come to fight him himself. He's been letting his underlings die for him endlessly. He has also sent days of goons after the crazy demon to drain his strength. He should step up now. The left-hand man is infuriated and grits his teeth, 
stepping forward to fight the crazy demon himself. He orders his men to stand back, awfully full of himself for someone who didn't even show himself when the crazy demon was at full strength. A blue ball of energy appears in the left-hand man's hands, and he charges at full speed. The crazy demon also takes his position. He locks his knees, and auras of orange energy appear in both his hands, he dares the other man to do whatever he can. The crazy demon is hurt from all the fights before and gathering energy tore his internal energies. But he is determined to take this left-hand bastard with him. He uses his attack of the journey through Steel Lance. Both men clash in an explosion of energy and blasts everyone away. The crazy demon goes falls over the cliff, spurting blood from his mouth. He was too weak in the current state of his body. On the cliff, the left-hand man kneels, defeated, because the crazy demon was so strong even injured, stronger than what was known of him. He sits there with a crushed and purple hand, screaming at the top of his lungs when he sees the crazy demon fall to his death because he had swallowed the pearl. Dying isn't so bad either. While falling, the crazy demon curses them all to a sad demise at the hands of their leader with a final fuck you. The left-hand man orders his goons to go down the cliff, they need to at least find his body. On the other hand, Darkness greets the crazy demon, at least he was able to fight before dying. He killed many elite demon cults in this time, and he stole and ate the sacred item of a demon cult, so his life was pretty exciting. He wonders if the Mirum Union would give him the best martial artist of the year award if they hear of all this. But it doesn't matter at the moment, more than everything, why wasn't he able to date a hot girl? The crazy demon wakes up to find himself standing in a white realm, wondering where he is. A tan man with a huge beard greets him. The crazy demon must be out of his mind if he ate something that contained a soul without any hesitation. The crazy demon turns and freezes. This new old man is extremely strong. The white-robed man tells him that is not important right now, and that the heavenly pear he just ate contained the soul of many important martial artists. Now that crazy demon has eaten it, the souls that were unable to ascend will stick to his own. If he sleeps the souls will wake him up and if he eats the souls will share the essence of the food, and they will cling to whomever he touches. His chi will also go berserk in an uncontrollable state. The crazy demon likes the last part, because that means he will become stronger. While the bearded old man is thinking if the guy is slow because who thinks a state of chi overload is a good thing? He asks the crazy demon out loud why he swallowed the heavenly pearl. The crazy demon shivers and freezes, he feels how the other man can kill him with just his gaze and that he is powerful beyond comprehension. If he doesn't answer his question, he will die on the spot. The other man demands an answer without any lies or trickery. The crazy demon answers honestly. He didn't eat it because he wanted to, but to make sure that the demon cult leader wouldn't be able to eat it. He hates the demon cult leader because he doesn't see other people as equivalent humans. If someone like him were to become stronger, the outcome is unthinkable. The older man is silent for a while and contemplates his answer. He realizes that this was the crazy demon's way of doing well, which is a good enough reason. The crazy demon's shoulder slumps and he finally relaxes. The older man extends him a last lifeline, and he won't be able to help further since he will be receiving his punishment. The crazy demon is confused, but this is the best choice the older man can give him, and the best present the crazy demon will receive. The older man joins the tips of his fingers and a tiny ball of energy appears in the space between, emanating light and power, and it bursts. Light engulfs the crazy demon. Izaha wakes up jerkily in his bed, back in the inn he used to live in as a child. Sunlight sneaks in from a gap in the window. Izaha slowly looks around him. It is his room and doesn't feel like a dream either. He wonders what happened, he was around twenty when he lived in the inn. A realization suddenly hits Izaha, and he freezes. He can start training his martial arts several years earlier than before. Since he has done it before, he can get stronger way faster than the last time. He clenches his fist and grins. He can become way stronger than that time. He suddenly feels a slight pain on his lip. There's a cut there. He tries to think if he got beat up and when. He walks out of his bedroom and sees that the main room of the inn is in shambles, tables turned and dishes broken. A realization hits Izaha, and he remembers which time he is in. He loses himself in the memory that Izaha was serving two men at a table. They had heard that Izaha was eager to save money, so they asked him what he was saving up for. He couldn't respond that he was desperate because his parents were dead. He fumbled around for an answer. 
It was a passing comment so he tried to respond with a joke as well. He told them that he dreams to listen to a song by Che Hyang at the Plum Blossom Brothel, a humble dream of an errand boy. A rumor spread that the errand boy of the Zaha and wants to sleep with Che Hyang so he's desperately saving money. Whispers started, everyone drawing up the same conclusion to his reason for earning money, calling him a loser and whatnot. E Zaha snaps back from the unpleasant memory. He made a joke about Che Hyang who was getting popular in Iliang Prefecture and a twisted rumor spread. Looking at the state of the inn, he has come back to that time, everything has been smashed. Thinking about it makes Izaha mad again, they beat him up and ruin the inn because of a rumor. He decides to inspect the state of his body and then pick what he is going to do. He sits on the floor of his bedroom, deep in concentration. He starts with relearning the, the art of journey through the steel lands he used in his time as the crazy demon. He closes his eyes, and immediately chi flows into his palms. He is confused about why there is chi in his body, as he didn't have any at this time in the past. And there is a lot of it too. He doesn't know the reason for it but this is a fortunate event. He goes ahead and progresses with the art of the journey through the steel lands. He takes a deep inhale and starts. The sun goes down, and the day gives way to night. Izaha finally opens his eyes. He can't believe his eyes. Even if he was familiar with it, he reached the first stage of the journey through the steel lands very fast. He suddenly remembers the white-robed older man's words. This is the best choice I can give you and the best present you will receive. Izaha wonders if this is what that old man meant. The energy in his body might have something to do with the heavenly pearl he swallowed. But more than half of the energy inside of him isn't budging, which is a shame. Izaha smirks, there is no need to worry, and he still has a significant amount of time. He can get stronger much faster than he expected. His stomach grumbles loudly, it must have been a long time since he used the heart technique. He strolls outside to take a look at the Iliang prefecture. There are people out and about in the streets, and the night stalls. Izaha's memory is slowly refreshing itself. A man picking his teeth notices Izaha, the errand boy of the Zaha Inn, walking around and alerts his fellow man. They are surprised he is still alive. People start talking. They heard that he got beat up a few days ago, but that he must be strong enough now to walk around. Someone calls him a loser. That was what Izaha was like before. Everyone mistreated him because he was an errand boy at an inn. Izaha swears in his mind, it makes him angrier the longer he thinks about it. He steps on the cobblestone, and suddenly notices that he is now in front of the Plum Blossom brothel. He has another flashback of the guards of the brothel beating him up. They accused him of being crazy and trying to sleep with the best girl in their brothel, Che Hyang. They rained down kicks and punches at him, all the while he lay curled up on the pavement, protecting his head from fatal blows. They were blinded by their rage at an errand boy's audacity to go for Che Hyang, wanting to make sure he never said such a thing again. Izaha cowered on the ground, he had never said that. He opened his eyes to see Che Hyang witnessing this from afar. He cried, wondering why she was looking at him like that when he had said no such thing. He stumbled back to the inn, limping. People whispered and asked each other if they saw Izaha get beaten to a pulp. He broke down again, wondering what he did wrong. The flashback fades and a vein pops into Izaha's forehead. Even the crazy demon had times like these. He has now returned to the perfect time. He decides to clear up the confusion. A man approaches him suddenly, asking Izaha what he is glaring at. The man calls him a loser and asks him if he is going to set the brothel on fire now or something. The man accuses Izaha of being scared and that he probably can't even light a fire. He saw Izaha get beaten up a few days ago, he might be fine now, but it is a surprise he didn't die. The man tells him to stop roaming the streets, and stay at the inn if he got beaten up. When Izaha continues ignoring the man, the man gets annoyed wondering if he went deaf because of being beaten too badly. Izaha asks the man his name. The man is shocked and infuriated. He pulls his fist back to punch Izaha. Izaha darts to the side to dodge the punch and strikes the man on the chin with the inside of his wrist. The man falls from the force of a single attack. Izaha now wonders why the man was mad when he only inquired about his name and tries to recall the man's name again. Izaha walks to the entrance of the Plum Blossom brothel. The first guard tells him to go away and get lost. Izaha reprimands him, that is no way to talk to a customer. The guard is enraged and lunges at Izaha. Izaha ducks down to dodge, 
and his palm shoots out from below and grabs the guard's face. He pushes his hands backwards and slams the guard to the ground. The guard is knocked out and drool escapes his mouth. Izaha removes invisible dust from his old robe and continues walking further. The guest service is a mess. He can't find a trace of the service mindset. Izaha pushes aside the curtain and enters the brothel, where people are chattering merrily, completely unaware of Izaha's presence. He smirks and yells, scolding the staff and telling them to receive their customer. Everyone is taken aback and they turn to face him. Whispers break out in the brothel from Izaha's sudden outburst. Everyone starts wondering if he has gone mad, showing up here after getting beaten up just a few days ago. Two guards approach Izaha. One of them clenches his fist asking Izaha if he knows where he is. Izaha smirks, it is a place where people can drink, and he came here knowing that. A vein pops in the guard's face, and he raises his hand to hit Izaha, but a voice halts him in his shoes, telling them to allow Izaha in. Izaha remembers this new guy, Cha Sante, manager of the Plum Blossom Brothel. Cha Sante announces that they cannot throw out a customer who came here to drink. A customer is a customer. Izaha just stares, and the manager commands the guards to find their customer a nice table of drinks. He wouldn't get another chance to come to a place like this, so they should treat him well. The guards take Izaha upstairs to serve him at a table. They guide him to a room, and a male server asks Izaha about the kind of drinks he wants. Izaha hasn't been to places like this before, so he tells them to serve him whatever's expensive. The server is angry at the way he is being talked to so he tells Izaha to watch how he's talking with him. Izaha arrogantly looks down at the server and apologizes by calling him a son of a bitch. He orders the server to bring him some alcohol. The server is infuriated and veins twitch on his face. He wonders if Izaha is crazy and only restrains himself because of the manager, Sungti's, orders. The server tells Izaha to hold up and goes to fetch him a drink. Izaha smiles confidently and relaxes in his seat. Hot food and top quality liquor is served to him. A woman arrives to serve him. Izaha asks the female server if Chehyang is available at the time. The woman politely tells him that the owner will be mad if he meets with Chehyang. He got beaten up a few days ago for a similar matter as well. Everyone in Iliang knows he got beaten up, and he tells the woman to not worry about a thing and just bring Chehyang to him. The woman sighs and tells him that she will send word. Alone in the room, Izaha picks up and smells the liquor. It seems like they are messing with the errand boy. Judging by the smell and color, it isn't even third-rate liquor. The owners are such scammers. Suddenly, the door slams open and a guard enters the room. He swears at Izaha profusely and asks him who he think is his and if he is crazy. Izaha lazily raises his gaze and calmly asks if it is wrong for a mere errand boy to come to drink at a brothel. And why does everyone keep calling him a son of a bitch? Izaha remembers the guard by the name of Dongwak, so he asks Dongwak to come sit with him, and he will pour him a drink. Dongwak is taken aback and wonders if Izaha ate something wrong today, but he walks forward and seats himself at the table. He asks Izaha if they hit his head too hard last time. Izaha grins and silently pours and hands Dongwak a drink. Dongwak tells Izaha to get lost after drinking before things get troublesome and not cause a scene. Izaha once again calls out Dongwak, which infuriates him and he slams his cup on the table. He raises his hand to attack Izaha. Before the attack can reach him, Izaha picks up a chopstick and stabs Dongwak's palm straight through and smirks. Dongwak bows down in pain. Why did Dongwak have to be like this? Izaha was planning to drink quietly and see Chehyang before he leaves but everyone keeps on barking like a horny dog. Just then, Che Hyang enters the room. She is upset when she notices brother Dongwak injured, so she tells him to stay outside. Dongwak immediately leaves the room, and Che Hyang seats herself at the table, opposite Izaha. Izaha smiles, and Che Hyang asks him why he is smiling. There is no particular reason though, an errand boy does not need to control his emotions in a place like this too. Che Hyang solemnly asks if Izaha finds this situation funny, and that her brother, manager Sante, and the owner will not stay put. Plus more money is on his tab because Che Hyang came in, the Duquan liquor is also expensive, and the medical bills for hurting Dongwak are included. She tells Izaha for his own sake to just pay up and leave before he gets into more trouble. This is the first time Izaha is seeing Che Hyang up close. She also makes it clear that even if Izaha brings a whole sack of gold and silver, she will not sleep with him. 
Just because she is working at a brothel doesn't mean she sleeps with everybody. She is not a whore. Izaha puts his glass back on the table and starts clarifying. He tells her that he never said any such thing as he is saving up so he can sleep with her. He just wanted to hear one song from her. As Chaehyang said, she sells her art instead of her body. And Izaha respects that. Chaehyang is surprised. What she heard was completely different. And Izaha tells what he did was intended as a joke in the inn. He didn't want to do that and didn't have the money either. This was the reason he was looking for Chaehyang. So he can clear the air. He orders Chaehyang to get out of the room now. She is speechless and shivers. Three more guards burst. Thank you, Rennie Reeson, for purchasing our YouTube membership. You are the first person to do so, and we appreciate it greatly. Your support means a lot to us. We are in need of more people to help us raise funds for our original manga. Thank you. Love you guys. Just at the door. They believe that Izaha came here to fulfill a death wish, so they should take it outside. It'll be a pain in the ass to clean blood inside. Izaha asks for time to finish one more cup of liquor before heading out. They are confident that they can kill an errand boy like him easily, so this shouldn't be a hindrance. The men burst out laughing and send Chaehyang outside, while they settle down with Izaha while he finishes his last glass. The men declare that Izaha here is a real man. He came to the brothel proudly and even called for Chaehyang. If they had known that he was a real man before, they'd have beaten him up harder, and they regret it. But now that they are aware, they will give him a proper beating this time. The men try asking Izaha for affirmation, but he just asks them if they want a drink. The men decline his offer and command him to come outside already. Zaha ignores them and pours another drink for himself. He is disappointed that they sell something this week as top quality liquor. The men tense, wondering why Izaha is so relaxed, maybe he went insane from the beating a few days ago. The liquor is all gone now. Izaha steeples his hands and calmly asks his old friends if they think he is that big of a joke, they agree. The men call him a dumbass, he could have ended it with a beating a few days ago, but he escalated things to this extent. A laugh escapes Izaha, and he starts chuckling loudly. The men call him a fucker, he is laughing. Izaha's laughter shows no sign of stopping and two men lunge at him at once, swords out. Izaha stands up abruptly and violently throws the table. The food rains down at them while he kicks the table towards them and slams it to the ground, with the two men underneath. Spiral cracks appear in the table. Izaha stands with one foot on the table, repeating himself coldly. Do they still think he is a joke? The woman from earlier stands in the doorway to the room, and she is shocked to see Izaha beating up the guards. Izaha suddenly stops and asks the old hag, the woman's server, to bring him more of that shitty third-rate Duquan liquor. The woman is offended but doesn't show it, and tells him that the liquor is a high-class Duquan liquor, and not third-rate. Izaha glares. Who does she think she is fooling? He doesn't hit women who don't know martial arts, but she should think before she speaks. The woman scoffs but turns around to go fetch more liquor. Izaha faces back at the injured guards on the floor. Those fuckers should laugh more if they thought he was a joke. They aren't laughing in front of the funny guy anymore. Dozens of red-robed guards enter the room again with the manager of the Plum Blossom Brothel, Sungte in the lead. Izaha greets him. Sungte checks the state of the room. Broken dishes and furniture are everywhere, and asks Izaha if he is crazy. A vein pops in his cheek while he glares. Izaha is going to die at this rate. Izaha stands from his crouch on the floor and laughs. Sungte is enraged and lunges at Izaha, shooting out with his palm. Izaha darts sideways, picks up the empty liquor container from the floor and smashes it on Sungte's head. Sungti's right eye starts bleeding and the guards gather around him. Izaha dares anyone else to come to fight him. They grit their teeth in anger but no one comes forward. Blood splatters from Sungti's head to the ground. It seems that Izaha has a death wish, and Sungti starts pulling out his sword from the scabbard. Before he can completely unsheathe the sword, Izaha warns him to think before he acts. Because if he finishes drawing out that sword, he will die. Sungti shivers in fear and freezes. He gets the feeling that Izaha is not lying and that something drastic must have happened in a span of a few days. The most socially adept person in the Iliang prefecture, Cha Sungte, is perfectly aware of the situation. The guards on the ground aren't lying defeated because they were unlucky or something, and Izaha wasn't able to injure Sungte's eye just because he was lucky. If he doesn't want to die, Sungte should think before he acts, otherwise he can pull out his sword and die. It is not an empty threat, 
Semte couldn't even see Izaha's movements. Semte stares and then orders his men to retreat downstairs and wait. He sheathes his sword and asks Izaha about his plans, as it doesn't seem he will leave after a drink. Maybe he is trying to get an apology from the owner for what happened a few days ago. The idea sounds appealing to Izaha. If he wants an apology, then the owner, Joga, should come to him. Sante agrees to call the owner. Izaha asks if Sante's eye lost its sight. Izaha didn't lose an eye when he was beaten up a few days ago, but he did feel like he was going to die. Sante turns to a server in the hallway and tells her to set up a table in the next room. Sante asks Izaha's permission to heal the injured guards if he's not going to kill them. Townspeople killing each other is a bit uncomfortable. Izaha's expression stays aloof all the while, and Sante is taken aback. The injured guards are taken to a healer, and Izaha is shifted to another room where he dines with Sante. Sante can't make sense of the mess. Everything happened out of nowhere. He asks Izaha if he got lucky somewhere or with something. Izaha remains silent and stares at the different bottles of liquor than before on the table. Sante pours Izaha a glass of the top quality Duquan liquor. Izaha calls Sante out, stating that this liquor is different from the Duquan liquor he was given earlier. Earlier they brought him something shitty and claimed it was Duquan liquor. Sante is shocked he noticed that and pacifies the situation by telling him that they must have brought it out by mistake and they need to profit from the business somehow. Izaha commands Sante to quit talking and drinks first to check for poison. Sante drinks first and Izaha follows. Sante asks if Izaha has always been this good at fighting as he has never heard of his skills before. Izaha tells him that he just held himself back because his father told him not to fight. Sante calls bullshit. Sante apologizes for earlier as he understands Izaha wanted to retaliate as his underlings humiliated him. Izaha slams his cup back on the table and thanks Sante the son of a bitch, for understanding. Izaha is starting to get annoyed, the way Sante apologized irritates him. Izaha's hand shoots out ready to break a few bones to change that attitude. Suddenly, a chair screeches back and Sante prostrates on the ground, apologizing profusely. Sante is kneeling for the first time in his lifetime, he is sorry. Che Hyang enters the room at that exact time and she is shocked to see her scary brother Sante prostrating before an errand boy and with a wound on his face. Sunday scolds Che Hyang and tells her to get a grip. She takes the liquor bottle to Izaha to serve him as if it wasn't for Sunday. Che Hyang pours Izaha a drink with trembling hands. Izaha tells her that an errand boy has pure love, but that love was never directed towards her. He orders her to leave the room, she is ruining the mood. Che Hyang stills, but Sunday tells her to hurry and get out. Che Hyang stands up on shaking legs and leaves, she is crying just from hearing that. Izaha calls out to Cha Sante and commands him to stop talking so impolitely, especially because his eye slit is making Zaha more uncomfortable. Sunday understands and shuts up. Both men engage in a staring battle. Sunday bows in gratitude. He is very good at being polite. Liquor swishes in the cup while Izaha awaits the owner's presence. If the owner is in the middle of serving the experts from the Black Cat Union in the Pear Blossom Brothel, it will be difficult for the owner to come right away. The Black Cat Union are unjust guys, but a union will be established in the Iliang Prefecture with their approval. That is why the owner is trying to get on their good side. With what happened today, even if Izaha subdues the owner, the Black Cat Union will step into the matter themselves. Izaha slams his cup on the table. Having a drink and a nice chat with the owner will not solve every problem. Sante asks Izaha about what he wants to do. Izaha says that the owner and his brothers can just work as his underlings. That way the Black Cat Union won't step into this. But Sante doesn't think the owners will be willing to do that. Speaking of this, maybe Izaha can create a sect in the Iliang Prefecture himself. The brothel people can join as his subordinates. Sante is taken by surprise. Izaha will give them a choice so they should make a decision wisely. If they think that the Black Cat Union will win, they can fight alongside the Union. But if they don't think so, then they should join Izaha. Sante wonders just what changed Izaha so much. No errand boy speaks of creating a sect so casually. Izaha slams his liquor back on the table and stands up. Sante thinks he is heading out, so he tells him to stay a little longer. Izaha is not running away though. Sante is asking for a beating just drawing that conclusion. They have another stare down, and then Sante bows his head, wishing Izaha a safe trip back. He will let Izaha run a tab for his drink today. When Izaha exits the room, 
Dozens of guards are just standing outside. He smirks and tells those lowlifes to make way for him. Just as Izaha descends the stairs, he finds the doorkeeper of the brothel creating a ruckus and looking for Izaha. As soon as he catches sight of Izaha, he pulls his fist back for a punch. Before the fist can even reach him, Izaha swings out his hand and jabs the doorkeeper hard on his cheek. The guard loses a few teeth and goes flying to the far wall. Silence ensues in the main room. The other guards should have explained the situation to the doorkeeper already. He had to get beaten up once again. Not like he expected any better from such inconsiderate bastards. Izaha calmly makes his way to the front door and takes his leave with a final wave. The errand boy had fun at the brothel today. All the men are infuriated but none of them move to stop him. While walking back to the inn, Izaha stops at a swordsmith's shop, Dragonhead Smithy. He will need a weapon if he wants to fight against the Black Cat Union. He makes his way inside the shop where men are hard at work, hammering and cooling weapons. The vice master of the shop, Gwak Yange, greets the errand boy from the Zaha Inn and inquires if he is here for credit repayment. Izaha wants to buy some items, and not a sickle or a kitchen knife either. He tells the vice master about his plans to fight against the Cho family, and that he is looking for a couple of weapons. Gwak Yange tells Izaha to cool down and not let the beating he got a few days ago get to his head. He shouldn't risk his life. Izaha orders him to shut up and brings him the weapons. Any light sword, whip or decently sharp dagger would work. Gwak is confused about his choice of weapons, but they're Izaha's preference so they should be respected. The vice master orders his men to bring out the black dragon sword, the white dragon whip and the cloud dragon dagger. While they wait for the weapons to arrive Gwak tells Izaha that he used to like Zaha's grandparents' noodle soup, but Izaha's soup tastes terrible. Izaha ignores this statement and tries to change the subject. But one cannot just talk about the unification of the Murim word with an errand boy. Both men glare at each other. The other men finally arrive with the weapons. Izaha buys them all because he is in a hurry. The vice master demands 90 niangs for all three weapons, which is a discounted price because he is from this town. Izaha negotiates. He will pay 50 niangs to borrow the weapons, and he will return them when he is finished with them. Gwak the vice master is annoyed, borrowing them is the same as daylight robbery. Just then, another set of footsteps reaches them, and a voice booms. The master of the shop, Kum Chuliang, approaches the group and everyone except Izaha bows to him. Gwak tells master Kum that Izaha is planning to have a war with the three brothers of the Cho family, and he wants to borrow the weapons for 50 niangs. The master asks Izaha if he is the grandson of the Zaha and it had been a while since they saw each other. The master tells the same thing as Gwak to Izaha, he liked the chicken noodle soup his parents cooked but his tastes terrible. Kum Chuliang tells Izaha that he will stop the Cho brothers from bothering him if that is why he is going to war with them. And if they refuse to listen, the master will protect Izaha, he had ties with Zaha's grandparents after all. There is no reason to make a bigger deal of anything than it is. Izaha wonders if the master was always like this, he doesn't remember the smith master saying these things in the past. Maybe the future changed because he changed. Izaha appreciates the consideration but he wants to handle the situation himself. The smith master, Kum Chuliang, asks Izaha about what he is planning to do. Izaha tells him that they should gather the forces from all blacksmiths from this area and establish a steel dragon sect. The master is surprised. If the Cho brothers establish a union in this prefecture, they will rip more money off of everyone. That is why Izaha is planning to establish a federation of sects in the Iliang prefecture and make sure that the Black Cat Union cannot do any such thing. In the federation of sects, brothels will belong to the rebirth sect, smithies will belong to the steel dragon sect, and the architects will belong in the chuck sect. Izaha will rally the rest of the jobs himself to create more sects accordingly. No one will be required to pay any dues and no one sect would be above another. Their purpose is to make sure that their hard-earned money doesn't get stolen. The plan sounds sloppy but it is pretty well thought out. The smith master inquires about the federation's name. It is a place for lowlifes, a dirty end, and by combining these two the name will be HAO sect. The smith master is pleasantly speechless. It is interesting to see a mere errand boy trying to start a sect. He must be confident that he can hold his own against the Cho brothers. The smith master orders Gwak, the vice master, to give Izaha the weapons for free. They will continue this conversation if Izaha survives. Back in his bedroom at the inn, 
Izaha meditates, deep in concentration. He finds men digging a hole behind the inn. The second brother of the Cho brothers, Cho Igel, greets Izaha. He was going to call Zaha out after they were finished digging the hole. Cho Igel slams his dagger on the table and commands the errand boy to come and sit with him. Izaha glares apathetically and silence reigns. Izaha and Cho Igel talk while the goons dig a hole in the background. Today was a good day for the Cho brothers. They were able to get the Black Cat Union's approval to build an official union in the Iliang prefecture. And yet, a scumbag of an errand boy, who can't even make a noodle soup properly, caused a scene in their brothel. What is Cho Igel supposed to do now? He asks Izaha to state three reasons he should stay alive. Izaha laughs instead of crying which infuriates the other man, so he swings his hand to attack the errand boy. Before the attack can reach him, Izaha pulls out his dagger and stabs that hand into the table. This time Izaha asks Cho Igel for one reason he should stay alive. Cho Igel now sees for himself what everyone meant when they said an errand boy caused trouble at the brothel. The goons are done digging the grave, they are ordered to dig a little deeper. Cho Igel believes Izaha must have gone through some enlightenment and congratulates him, before swinging his other hand to attack. Izaha cuts the man in diagonals and grabs that hand and stabs it too. Blood splashes everywhere, and Cho Igel screams in pain. The hole was just to threaten Izaha, which is bullshit. Izaha waits to hear just one reason why the other man should be kept alive. However, there is no reason someone like Cho Igel should be allowed to live. Not only did he take part in human trafficking but he also mercilessly killed people when things didn't go his way. Izaha's acquaintances were among the people he killed. Cho Igel shouts if he dies his brothers and the Black Cat Union won't forgive Izaha. Cho Igel shivers and gulps, he looks down to see the dagger protruding from his heart. Izaha had asked for a reason to stay alive not a threat. Cho Igel takes his last breath and slumps on the table. Waizaha turns to see the goons still digging and commands them to stop. The men turn to see their boss dead. They should not be surprised, he was messing around with a knife and died off by himself for no reason. The men cower in their place, not recognizing Izaha, who is just an errand boy of the Zaha Inn. The men don't think so. Izaha asks those men to take off their masks, to see if he recognizes anyone, but he hasn't seen any of them in the Iliang prefecture before. They are not from the Black Cat Union either, they just recently came here and have been working in the Pear Blossom brothel since. Izaha gives them two choices, either stay and die or bury the dead person and return to their hometowns. Two of the men go for the second option, they won't appear near the brothel again either. They are told to scram. The third man asks if Izaha needs any workers in the kitchen, he has no way of earning money if he isn't working in the Pear Blossom brothel. The third man is a good cook and is capable of making a decent chicken noodle soup so Izaha spares him. Izaha goes back inside the inn where he finds Sunke standing. Cha Sunke smirks, he can't believe the errand boy defeated Cho Igel. But there was no way Izaha would have lost to someone like him. Sunke eye is now fine as well. It was just a part of a conspiracy. Sunke reported his eye as injured and observed the situation after running away to where the doctors are. Had he not done so, he would have also been digging a hole here, and he is indeed very useful and quick-witted. Sunke is grateful to Izaha, he had no choice but to stay alive, and he wonders what Izaha is planning to do with the other two Cho brothers. Izaha is going to kill them, if he lets them be, the Iliang prefecture will suffer even more. Sunke warns Izaha to be extra cautious when killing Cho Ilsum, who is the worst villain in their prefecture. Izaha suddenly calls out to Sunte and orders him to buy them some snacks to go with the liquor already at the inn. Sunte balks, there are no snacks at the inn. Izaha does not have any money either so Sunte will have to buy them with his own money. Zaha Inn used to be a place with delicious chicken noodle soup, it has fallen to a great extent. Sunte can even buy some snacks that he likes, if they have any leftovers from tonight then they can eat them tomorrow. Sunte goes to leave. Izaha calls him out again. He is not going on a stroll so he should not walk with such leisure. Sunte is pissed, to think he'd be running errands for an errand boy. He runs. Izaha and Sunte eat together in silence. Izaha tells Sunte to eat a lot as he bought it with his own precious money. Sunte is enjoying the meal as much as he can, which is nice since he earned it by exploiting young women and scamming people by selling cheap Duquang liquor as if it's top grade Duquang liquor, he should enjoy all of it. Sunte's hand trembles from this assault of words, 
and the food does not taste that good to the plum blossom manager anymore. Sungtae slams his chopstick on the table and gulps down the liquor. Sungtae is indeed angry. It angers him that the food he bought tastes awful. He tells Izaha he is worried about how the Black Cat Union will react if Cho Igil dies and Cho Ilsum follows suit. If Sungtae is that worried then he should train himself to be stronger. He always says he is worried without actually doing anything. Things like he is worried or concerned and what they can do. He needs to stop spouting these kinds of bullshit. Sungtae is pissed off and he stands up, slamming both hands on the table. There is no way the guy in front of him Izaha must be someone else disguised as the errand boy. A nerve pops in Izaha's cheek. Sungtae must want to die, and maybe all of his questions will be answered if he dies. Sungtae immediately backtracks. They will both go ahead and kill all the people in the Black Cat Union. Izaha finishes his drink before going to get rid of the eldest Cho brother, Cho Ilsum. Since he has no clue where the youngest brother is, he will take care of the eldest one first. Sungtae is surprised by Zaha's tone. He is talking as if he is just going for a bathroom break. But if he is going to kill that brother, he might as well do it soon. The bigger problem is Cho Sampion, the youngest Cho brother since they don't know his whereabouts. Sungtae is confident that he can kill someone like Cho Sampyeong if he returns home, but he hurt his eye so it might be a little difficult for him. Izaha tells him to make up his mind. Sungtae can bide his time and use his stealth to his advantage. He is renowned as the man of stealth. Cha Sungtae is perfectly capable of taking over all three brothels if they kill all three brothers. Since many people are living in brothels, it won't be possible to get rid of them completely. They should make sure everyone can get their money's worth and ensure that people don't sell cheap liquor at high prices. They will take care of the ill when they need help, and if anyone wishes to go back to their hometown, they will let them. It might be a bit difficult but they are going to do it anyway because it's better than dear Cha Sungtae dying in Izaha's hands. If Izaha leaves things to Sungtae and it all goes to hell, he will make sure Sungtae personally greets the Cho brothers. Sungtae is frustrated. He does one thing and Izaha threatens to kill him. Maybe he'll just retire and retreat to the mountains. If they succeed, he can run three brothels. But since he doesn't want to, Izaha can find someone else for the job. Izaha finishes his drink and gets out of his clothes so he can change into Sungtae's. Sungtae is flustered. Izaha tells him to get out of his clothes so they can exchange. Sungtae swears at Izaha and then at the Cho brothers. Turns out Izaha is smarter than expected. If he had gone to the Pear Blossom brothel in his old robes, he'd have drawn too much attention to himself, and he might even be stopped at the entrance that Izaha gathers his hair in a ponytail and turns. He looks like an errand boy but not. He is better looking than it seems. Since he always wore beggar clothes, he looked homeless. If Sungtae was Izaha, he'd have taken better care of his appearance. Izaha slaps Sungtae on his theatrics. Seems like his old habits are coming out since he is being friendly to Sungtae. Izaha leaves the inn, with a final warning to take care of his clothes and good luck from Sante. With his hands behind his back, Izaha reaches the Pear Blossom brothel. The doorman bow to him respectfully, and he asks after the owner, Cho Ilsum. Izaha tells the doorman he is from the Black Cat Union, and to take him to Cho Ilsum. He arrogantly slaps the doorman when he asks his name, and the doorman guide him inside the brothel. Cho Ilsum could not believe his brother died at the hands of a mere errand boy. The second brother had visited Izaha and was ordering people to dig a grave when Zaha killed him. Cho Ilsum moves and lunges at Izaha, energy gathered in his palm. Izaha counters with an attack of his own. Their energies collide, and Cho Ilsum goes flying to the ground. Cho Ilsum stands on his feet, shocked that he lost in terms of internal energy. Considering how well known the eldest Cho brother is, he is weaker than Izaha thought. Cho Ilsum grits his teeth, shocked. Zaha was just a mere errand boy a few days ago. Izaha takes advantage of the other man's hesitation and attacks first. Cho Ilsum pushes both hands out to defend himself, while a burst of energy escapes from Zaha's palm and slams him to the far wall. The wall cracks and blood spurts from Cho Ilsum's mouth. The eldest Cho brother vomits blood, shocked that Izaha can use such advanced techniques. Izaha's hand shoots out and he picks Cho Ilsum up by the neck. An errand boy is allowed to use the same techniques as other people too. Zaha strangles Cho Ilsum. Despite the years of rule within the village, he used other people's livelihoods for his gain. He is sloppy. Izaha slams him to the ground. Hard. 
All the guards gather around their lord when they hear the ruckus, who is now dead. They cannot do anything now that their lord is dead. Izaha announces that the Black Cat Union leader has changed his mind and has decided to delay the creation of a sect within the Iliang prefecture. Since Izaha used Cho Ilsum as an example, if anyone decides to question the decision made about creating a sect, they should know that they will meet the same end. The men part in the middle to make way for Izaha, eager to live. A whisper breaks out among the men, that he is the errant boy of Zaha and, and no Black Cat member, although his clothes have changed. Izaha turns and reveals that he is indeed the errand boy of the Zaha and the men should not be angry now that they know he is an errand boy. Still, no one dares to retaliate and attack him. Izaha killed Cho Ilsum because he killed people around the prefecture without a reason. Izaha returns to his inn, where Cha Sungte greets him. Sungte is surprised he is back so early. Izaha tells him of Cho Ilsum's passing, guess one can pass on even if he has committed crimes. Sungte thinks Izaha is lying, but he is free to check for himself. It has only been moments since Izaha left the inn, and he looks like he is in perfect shape even after killing Cho Ilsum. Sungte wonders how Izaha got so strong in such a short amount of time. Izaha retreats to his bedroom, ordering Sungte to clean up the inn. Cha Sungte is irritated that he's being ordered around to clean up, and picks up the broom. Since Izaha has taken care of urgent matters, he will be able to train while he relaxes. He is getting stronger much faster than he thought, he cannot let this chance slip by. He takes a deep breath and a ball of energy appears between his hands. Evening turns into night, which gives way to morning. Rumors start on the streets about Cho Ilsum's death and the errand boy of Zaha In's involvement. Some people can't believe it while some think he is dead as well, all the while Cha Sungbei smilingly walks among them. Back in his bedroom, Izaha has finally conquered the land of the wood and is now approaching the land of darkness. Even if he had already achieved this in his past life, the speed and depth of his understanding were too fast and shallow. He is certain that he can get stronger than in his past life. He suddenly realizes that his room is a mess. There are soot and explosion marks everywhere. It must be because of all the impurities that flowed out of his body while he was moving from the land of wood to the land of darkness. The smell is awful too. But even the awful stench is a sign of his accomplishment. This just means that his body is much purer than before. Cha Sunde exclaims in disgust at the putrid smell. It smells like rot. Izaha exits his room and Cha Sungte's first conclusion is that Saha shit himself. Izaha is pissed. Sungte runs outside the inn to escape the smell, still mumbling about how Zaha should have relieved himself outside of his room and whatnot. Sungte crouches in disgust while nerves pop in Izaha's jaw. Izaha takes a bath in a room at the Plum Blossom Brothel, feeling relieved. He remembers Sungte wielding a dagger at him and telling him to go take a bath first and foremost. The door of the restroom slides open and Chehyang enters with towels. She is here to help Izaha with his bath, as Sungte ordered her to. If Izaha doesn't want her to do anything, she will at least wipe him dry after he is done. Izaha tells her there is no need for her to come anymore. He will tell Cha Sungte about this too. He has already told Shehyang that she's not a prostitute that sells her body, but a host that greets guests, so he expects her to act like a host. Shehyang is turned speechless. The bastard Cha Sungke keeps telling her to do stuff that he never even asked for. Shehyang bows to him in gratitude and apologizes about what happened before, but it is all in the past for Izaha so there is no need. Shehyang asks him why he took the beating in the past and if he is capable of fighting back. Izaha tells her that he needed to be beaten to have a reason to seek revenge. When it comes to a gentleman's revenge, ten years isn't too late. But when it comes to an errand boy's revenge, the timer starts the moment they get beat. He just made this up on the spot. With that, Che Hyang leaves him for his bath. Izaha ponders about women's nerve to use their beauty. Things like a woman's beauty don't work against him anyway. He suddenly remembers the left hand of illuminating light's words how he didn't prefer normal women which most would consider beautiful. That's why they had to use other people and failed. This was a well-known fact. He snaps back from the memory when Sungte bursts the doors open. There has been a fire, and not a tiny one, but a fire that started from Izaha's quarters. Izaha immediately straightens. The inn is engulfed in flames, shining like a beacon in the dark. The last Cho brother addresses the crowd. From now on he will personally kill whoever helps or hides the Zaha errand boy. 
Cho Sampian's brother's grave is behind the inn. Maybe he should retrieve the body first before starting the fire. Cho Sampian turns to face Izahao, walking from the crowd. The last Cho brother dared to set fire to Izaha's quarters without knowing who he is, something must be wrong with him. Cho Sampyung is surprised to discover Izaha in his new appearance. He cannot believe his eyes. Another man with a top hat, Sunbei, asks if this is the guy. Sunbei is offended that Sampyung brought him here to kill a mere errand boy. Sampyung's brothers were going to set up a sect within the Iliang prefecture, however, they've been struggling because of a single errand boy. If someone as experienced as Sunbei raises a sword to an errand boy, the whole of Nurim would laugh at him. Sampyung should kill him by himself. If his skills are that awful and he can't take care of a single errand boy then joining his brothers is going to be his best option. Sunbei is right, Cho Sampyung should have some common sense. He should stop making others do his work and fight Izaha himself. They will make sure that the loser dies in the fire. Sunbei concludes that the errand boy has a large ego and he, Nung Jiziek of the Dark Hurricane Castle, will be the witness of this battle to the death. Cho and Izaha take their stance. Cho Sampion gulps, and realizes that his brother's lost to this errand boy. All the while Izaha observes Nung Jiziek. The new man is smart, and although it seems like he's giving Cho Sampion a chance to fight, he is trying to gauge Izaha's skill. Izaha glares and Sampion jumps in fright. Izaha doesn't need to wield a sword to deal with people like Cho. Offended, Cho Sampiang lunges and swings his sword. Izaha darts back to dodge and brings his fist up. He punches Sampiang in the abdomen and he falls to the ground. Izaha didn't even use his full strength and Cho is already cowering. Cho Sampiang clenches his teeth and swings again. It doesn't even scratch Saha. Cho Sampiang is sloppy. Izaha pushes out and grabs Cho's sword hand and squeezes. His brothers that went ahead were sloppy too. It is best if none of the brothers come back to the village. Izaha snatches Cho's sword and slashes him in two swipes. Cho Sampian crouches and falls to the ground, now dead. Whispers start again. Izaha took care of Sampian that easily and they can't believe this is the errand boy of Zaha Inn. Izaha is annoyed. The Inn didn't do anything wrong to be burnt down. Nung Jizya commends Izaha on his skills. They will see each other again if something happens. Izaha calls out and stops Nung in his path, he doesn't care who he is. Izaha knew and saw who tried to kill him and burn down the inn, he would not be nice and just let him pass. The man runs but Izaha jumps and chases him. Nung Jiziak throws a ball of energy at Izaha, but his eye glints and he counters with a sword attack. The slash splits the man's face in half and he drops dead. Izaha stands victorious. The remaining pieces of the inn eventually crumble while the crowd anxiously observes Izaha. Cha Sungte stands among the crowd, surprised that Izaha got rid of both the last Cho brother and the other Jiziak man, who they do not know. Izaha asks the Cho underlings about who told them to burn someone else's home. Maybe they want to burn him too. The men cower in fear and apologize, begging for their life. Izaha asks them again about the reason for burning someone else's home. Sungte comes out of the crowd and contributes that perhaps they burn it because it smelt like shit. When he smelt it his first thought was also to burn it down. The crowd starts whispering hearing this, wondering why it smelt like shit, and that someone might have taken a shit inside or something. Izaha is pissed and veins pop in his face. He cannot decide if he should just kill Cha Sungte. Izaha orders Sungte to take all the men here and rebuild the inn. Sungte is getting certain that he wouldn't harm him just because Izaha has been too nice to him for a few days. Cha Sungti's eyes twinkle and he decides to make it better than before if they are rebuilding it. Since they have enough space, they will make it an impressive two-story building. Izaha explains that they will build a wall around the outskirts so that there is enough space, build a gymnasium and include some space for training. Sungte is confused so Izaha orders him in clear words to make an inn that is also a martial arts training space. Sungte will keep that in mind and will be sure to name it the Zaha Training Inn. Izaha tells Sungtae to keep an eye out for anyone with talent while working on the construction, for starting that organization they were talking about. If the Black Cat Union interferes and does not stay still, Izaha will take care of them himself. They are just called an organization, and as usual, they are going to continue to do their work. Izaha's organization is going to be called Haomun. It was the first organization Zaha started in his past life, and it gets created here. 
Sumtae wonders if he should call Izaha the Mun owner now. Sumtae asks why now that Izaha is a different person, he lets Sumtae live. Izaha tells him he lets Sumtae live so that he can mess with him. Sumtae guesses that is better than dying. Back in his room in the Plum Blossom brothel, Izaha trains. He needs to build up his inner body techniques. He knows how important it is to build them up to save others since he experienced it in his past life. All the while Sumtae pours over scrolls and handles construction. Come morning, two men arrive at the Plum Blossom brothel from the Black Cat Union. The Cho brothers used to treat them well. Since they have always treated those men well, Sante wonders how they should deal with them now. Izaha jumps from his bed to go greet the Union men. They will most likely turn a blind eye to Zaha killing the Cho brothers and tell him to pay them their dues. They will also suggest that Zaha join the Black Cats and introduce himself. Sante runs after Zaha pondering what Zaha would do. It'll be difficult for Izaha to deal with the Black Cat Union if he tries to do anything now. The Black Cat's men will try to kill Zaha first before they do anything to everyone else, but he will not die. Izaha arrives in a guest room and settles himself down to greet the Union men. The first man is a Black Cat Union Peak Office affiliate, Jianpeng. The second man is Han Go Wook from the Golden Peak Office. Izaha doesn't grace them with a response, and the men get agitated. Jianpeng slams his fist on the table and confirms that Zaha was the one who killed the Cho brothers. It is the truth, though Izaha wonders if they are asking this because they might be related to the Cho brothers. But they have different surnames so that can't be true. Both men glance at each other and think about why Izaha is being so cocky. He must think he can beat anyone because he took care of the Cho brothers, otherwise, he must be very confident in his skills. Zaha asks the men why they are being so quiet. Izaha is impressed that the men are so calm, maybe it is because they are here to collect funds. Jianpeng starts talking. Cho permitted them to create a sect within this prefecture but Zaha killed him. If they report this back to the Black Cat Union, things will become difficult for him since he has disrupted the work of the Black Cat Union. Izaha laughs. He understands what the men mean, they want Zaha to continue to pay them with bribes like Cho had done before. The men smile and agree, and Izaha tells them that they should have a drink first. He calls Ms. Sun, the purple-robed lady, to get them some of that shitty Duquan liquor and bring whatever snacks they have. Ms. Sun obliges. Liquor is one thing, but Han Go Wook hopes that they can all clearly agree on the terms before they leave. Izaha smirks and tells him condescendingly to just focus on the drinks. Han Go Wook is infuriated and slams his fist on the table. They have had enough of this, and Zaha will not get away with everything. Izaha glares, perhaps the men want to try their hand at fighting him. Both men shiver in their places wondering why Zaha is so confident, and that he must have something in mind. Izaha relaxes back in his seat. The Black Cat Union cannot come to the brothel and save both men without anything happening. If Izaha was scared of the Black Cat Union, he would not have taken care of the Cho brothers. The men shake. Although Izaha would assume that Jianpeng and Han Go Wook's skills are better than those of the three Cho brothers since they were sloppy. If the men don't decide before Ms. Sun comes back with alcohol, Zaha will fight the two men to death. He has already made up his mind, so they should think carefully. Ms. Sun arrives with alcohol. The men tremble in their shoes at Zaha's cold stare and settle themselves down. Their tone changes immediately. Ms. Sun is shocked. The men will be sure to put in a good word with the Black Cat Union so there is no need to worry about it. Izaha will believe them. While they're at it, the men tell that it's great Saha killed the Cho brothers. They couldn't stand those brothers at all. Izaha laughs and agrees. The Union men leave the brothel running. If Izaha kills the two of them, the Black Cat Union might use it as a pretext to come after Zaha. To the Union, it doesn't matter who's running the Iliang prefecture, they just need someone who obeys them. In this vicinity, the only person that Izaha needs to be careful of is the Twelve Heavenly Palms Master, the Slaughterer, and there is no need to draw his attention to them yet. Izaha will be in training for a while, so he commands Sungtae to confiscate each of the brothel owner's assets and manage them. Sungtae will also be acting as the administrator of the Hal clan for the time being. He will be removed from the position if he tries to misappropriate the funds, and death will await him if he is removed, it is up to Zaha as he is the clan master. Izaho congratulates Sungtae on becoming the administrator who has now succeeded in life. Sungtae swears it is extremely hard to make a living in Jianghu. Izaha meets with the smith master at the noodle shop and orders himself a bowl of noodles. 
The Smith master expresses his shock that Izaha took care of the Cho brothers so easily. The Black Keg Union might come after him, and if that happens a lot of young ones in Iliang would be killed. Izaha thinks back to his past life. The Smith master was very against paying protection fees to the Cho brothers back then as well. Izaha tells that the Black Cat Union won't come after him yet, and even if they do end up in a confrontation, the rest of the people would be fine since he was the one who killed the Cho brothers. Izaha intends to take on the Black Cat Union by himself which is unbelievable, but no one expected the errand boy of Zaha in to defeat the Cho brothers either. The Smith Master tells Izaha to pick up the tab for the noodles for both of them, as he is the clan leader of the Hao clan. The shopkeeper asks about what the Hao clan is, and if Zaha build it. Izaha tells the shopkeeper, Duxu, that he is a part of the Hao clan too because all who Izaha knows personally are automatically a part of the clan. So Duxu is to provide his noodles to his sect leader for free from now on. Duxu glares, no customer is allowed act like this. Just then a voice calls out to Izaha from outside. Both the smith master and Duxu usher Izaha out and tell him to be careful. They only call him clan leader when there is trouble. The rain is falling heavily outside and Izaha comes out to meet the man who called for him. The new man has his face and head covered and confirms that Izaha was the one who killed Nung Jiziak. Nung Jiziak is the man Izaha killed after he dealt with Cho Sampion. The new man reveals himself, he is Y Sienwa from the Black Reconnaissance. Izaha recognizes him as the sword demon twin, Y Sienwa. He was someone that came after him and died at Zaha's hands in his previous life. Sienwa is younger now but it's the sword demon twin. Izaha tells Sienwa that he killed Nung Jiziak because he burned down Zaha's house. Thanks to that Sienwa will be killing Izaha here too. Izaha wonders if things will go the way Sienwa wants them to. Zaha is sure nothing will go Sienwa's way, just like he went bald. Why Sienwa is outraged and declares that he will start by ripping apart Zaha's bloody mouth. Lightning flashes and the men clash. Sienwa slashes with his sword, and Zaha drags his feet and jumps back, splashing mud everywhere. Izaha already knows that sword demon twins refer to two people. He is sure that the other twin, Guyangsu, is here somewhere. Baldi attacks again and Zaha blocks the swipe with his sheath sword. Sienwa swings again and Zaha jumps back, twisting with a series of complicated steps. Zaha concludes that Sienwa will give Zaha a chance to counter his moves and the hidden Gu Yangsu will probably target him then. Just then Cha Sungtae comes running to help. Izaha tells Sungtae to stand back and that their opponent is a martial master. Sungtae swears at the rain and throws away his eye patch. Sienwa takes a swipe at Izaha again and he darts back to dodge. Zaha tells Sungtae to be careful as one more man is hiding in the vicinity. Surprised, Sungtae looks around but doesn't spot anyone. Suddenly, a man with a blue headband jumps from a roof, twisting and landing on his feet, and joins Sienwa on the ground. The other twin has finally appeared, and Sienwa is shocked that Izaha already knew that there were two of them from the start. Sienwa warns his junior brother to be cautious because Zaha is a martial master who is hiding his strength. Both sword twin men lunge for Zaha at the same time. Suddenly, Sungti's voice calls out distracting them, and he announces that he will be joining the fight as well and that they are going to find out just who Sungtae is. The other three men still. Sungtae provokes Sienwa by calling him a bald bastard and that he is going to break that bald head first. Enraged, Sienwa charges at Sungtae, swinging that sword. Sungtae blocks and end up flying towards the ground, completely still and knocked out. Surprised, Izaha glances at Sungtae and tells him to get up. He is not buying Sungtae's act. Cha Sungtae sits up, perfectly fine. Cha Sungtae got mud all over his clothes when he pretended to be dead. He tells Sungtae that if it wasn't raining the sword twins would have fallen for it perfectly. Sungtae would have been able to cut their heads off cleanly the instant they let their guards down. The sword demon twins shake in outrage because Izaha and Sungtae are fooling around in front of them. Sungtae observes that the bald bastard is shivering, since he doesn't have any hair it looks like the rain is dancing on his bald head. Enraged, Sienwa charges at Sungtae cursing him to die, but Izaha blocks his attack and their swords clang. Sienwa swings again and Zaha parries and dodges. Thinking back, it is Zaha's first time feeling something like this after he has returned from the past. Zaha smiles, fighting is so exhilarating. The junior brother, Jie Youngsu, freezes when he sees Zaha smiling. Izaha finally unsheaths his sword, and a red aura emanates from him. 
a layer of crimson energy covers the sword. Everyone including the smith master and the shopkeeper, who are watching the fight unfold from inside the sword demon twins and Sunte are shocked. Izaha is using sword key. The sword twin demons glance at each other once more and start circling Izaha in an attempt to kill him. Izaha's eyes glint and he swings. Check! Blood splatters and rains on Izaha, the sword demon twin now dead. Everyone is shaken. Rain pours down heavily and Sunte bows to Izaha in gratitude. Zaha tells Sunte to look up and behave like he normally does. There were the men from Black Reconnaissance who is above the Black Cat Union. This thing is getting huge. Izaha walks away, heading to the brothel to take a shower while Sunte stays back to clean up the place. The smith master finally realizes that it was indeed Izaha who killed the Cho brothers. Izaha is in a bathtub, soaking himself in peace. He is getting stronger and faster. It bothers Zaha that the people who are supposed to die by his hands at a much later time have died now. Adding to the list of groups that Zaha has to take care of, he has Black Cat Union and Black Reconnaissance as well compared to the past. Izaha closes his eyes and notices that the sounds from outside his bath have suddenly quietened down. Suddenly, two men with swords in their hands burst open the door and enter the shower room. They are the Lee brothel owner, Song Wujiam, and the Shir brothel owner, Yun Jungu. Izaha asks them if Cha Sungai put them up to this. They don't answer in charge at Zaha. Abruptly, the bathtub shatters and Zaha jumps at the men. His hands shoot out, each palm twisting the gut of each man, and he blasts them back. Song Wujiam and Yun Jungu probably attacked knowing that Zaha wouldn't have any weapons since he was bathing. He wonders if Cha Sungte told them. Now dressed, Izaha walks out and searches for Cha Sungte. None of the guards at the brothel know where Sunte is. They haven't seen him since he left a while back. Izaha turns and walks out into the streets, the rain still falling hard. Izaha does not know if Cha Sunte is involved in the attack, but anyone who bears their fangs at Zaha will die. Just then, Izaha hears Sunte's voice, daring some bastards to come at him. Turning around, Zaha runs towards the voice, following a trail of dead bodies. He turns a corner and spots a group of men surrounding Sunte whose back is against the wall. The men are shouting about how Sunte is already tired and that they should attack him together. Cha Sunte is still fighting, face bloodied and sword out. Izaha is so surprised he calls out Sunte's name, and the men turn their attention towards Zaha. Izaha smiles, teasing Sunte that he is still alive. Sunte pleads with Zaha to save him and swears profusely at the group of men. Sunte shouts at Izaha to quit standing still and save him already. As the person being saved, Sunte has no shame. The men turn their weapons at Zaha, and he dares them to come at him already. The men believe that they have no reason to fear Izaha, an errand boy, and attack him together. Izaha shoots out his palm and strikes all the men in the same go, and they go flying to the ground, bloody and beaten. Sunte curses the men, they dare stab Cha Sunte in the back. Sunte tears up at the thought of Izaha coming all this way to save him. Izaha corrects him. He was looking for Sunte so he can kill him. Izaha thought that Sunte was somehow a part of this. Cha Sunte is surprised and asks Zaha if they attacked him as well. Izaha reveals to Sunte that he was taking a very nice bath. But then two brothel owners came at him. Sunte swears it seems like some people still don't understand. Even though martial masters stronger than the Cho brothers were killed after looking down on Zaha. Perhaps Zaha's misunderstanding was resolved after seeing Sunte in this state. He is not friends with those bastards. Sunte is annoyed, and Izaha is being inconsiderate after coming to kill him. Izaha asks Sunte how many more people Zaha has to kill from Iliang Prefecture. These guys aren't even from the Black Cat Union. Guess they are looking down at him because he is an errand boy of the Zaha Inn. Zaha wonders how many more men from Iliang Prefecture must he kill for useless shit like this not to happen again. Sunte will take certain measures so that none of them would dare to look down on the clan leader, and he will do it right. Dang. Izaha just took a bath, and now he is dirty again. The sun shines daily and the construction of the new and progresses slowly, all the while Izaha trains diligently in his room at the brothel. Just like that, a month passes. Izaha visits the site to assess the inn's construction. He is disappointed that Sunday has managed so little even after a month. The construction scale grew larger, so it'll take at least a year. A year is too long, and Izaha wants the inn to be done sooner. Sunte wants to speed up the process as well but it can't be done, 
things won't get any faster if they throw in a bunch of random people. However, Sempe has recently found a decent individual so construction's gotten somewhat faster. Sempe calls this individual to them who is the head of the construction team, Yun Jia Sung. Yi Zaha recognizes Yun Jia Sung, he was a master artisan back when Zaha was acting as the Hao clan's leader. Sempe introduces Zaha and Jia Sung to each other. Yun Jia Sung has been introduced to this job by recommendation from the smith master, GM Chil Yong. If Jia Sung performs well during this job, He'd be handed the position of the head of the architecture clan, and he wouldn't have to pay any taxes either. Hearing the confirmation from Zaha, Jasung promises to make the Zaha and into something marvelous. Before that, Jasung asks a favor from Zaha. They are thinking of building barracks beside the inn to use as lodgings and for meals, and he would greatly appreciate it if Zaha occasionally provided them with some food at his expense. Yi Zaha chuckles and orders Sungte to send people from the Mei. Li and Shir brothels to the inn every morning and have them feed the working people here some good meals. Zaha tells Jia Sung that if he is satisfied with Jia Sung's work, he will become the head of the architecture clan. Yi Zaha makes his way back to the Plum Blossom brothel. On his way, he runs into the smith master, GM Chul Yong. The smith master asks Zaha if he met Jia Sung, and tells him that Jia Sung is a very talented lad, and he is diligent enough to go around alone looking for jobs day and night. Yi Zaha cannot believe that Jia Sung had a connection with Master GM. It is indeed very beneficial for Jia Sung to be a part of the Hao clan. Master Smith, GM, would like to give Yi Zaha a gift as a commemoration, and he asks Zaha about the kind of weapon he wants. Master Gum has not made anything that can be considered a renowned blade or a treasured sword because you can't sell that kind of weapon and if word gets out one will be lucky if he's not killed after it gets stolen. Even if one gets lucky and sell it at the right price, others will threaten to make something similar. Izaha thinks in silent contemplation and then tells GM that he wants a weapon that is completely dull regardless of its weight, and it never breaks, gets bent, and can never be outclassed by any other weapon. If its sturdiness is the only thing that Izaha wants, then whether it be a staff, stick or spear, its form does not matter. GM will keep that in mind and will present Zaha a present one day. Izaha walks away, on his way to the brothel. Down the street, two men in black robes and black headbands block his path. They confirm that Izaha is indeed the owner of the brothel. Izaha turns and walks away from them. The men stop him. They are messengers from the Black Cat Union and have come to deliver a message from their superiors. They tell Zaha that the Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master would like to meet him. Since messengers were sent instead of executioners, it would be in Zaha's best interest not to refuse. If the men return empty-handed, without the brothel owner Izaha, then the executioners will come. If that Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master person calls Zaha, he doesn't necessarily have to comply. If Izaha does not comply, he can just run away and if he does that he will live and no innocent lives will be lost. If Izaha wants to keep being the boss of the Iliang Prefecture, he has to bow down to the Black Cat Union. And if he doesn't, he has to leave the Iliang Prefecture. But if Izaha does that then he won't be called a man. So, Zaha decides to meet the Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master. He won't head out now with the two Black Cat's men but in the evening. He cannot go meet an influential figure of the Black Cat Union empty-handed, and he also can't go in his casual wear. Izaha asks for the address, and he will arrive there himself in the evening. The Pavilion Master will be waiting for him in a cabin on the hunting grounds of Dinghu Mountain, which is pretty close to the prefecture. The man warns Izaha one last time that if he decides to run, then he should run away as fast as possible. But Zaha is not going to run. Back in the brothel, Izaha finishes changing while Sungte panics beside him. The Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master is a money-crazed murderer, and he dared to call for Izaha, the Hao clan leader. Izaha tells Sungte that he wasn't called, he is the one going, and Sungte sweats. Sungte announces that he will gather everyone, they should go to war. Izaha is fine on his own, they do not want to kill all of the youths of Iliang Prefecture. Sunte erupts in a panic once again, crying about how Izaha will die and that the pavilion master will destroy him since Zaha is an errand boy who angered him. Cha Sunte declares that he will accompany Izaha, but he is not serious. Zaha swears he will be back in a while, and he tells Sunte to just focus on recovery. Before Izaha can depart for Mountain Dinghu, Sunte gives Zaha his treasured red robe. It might get torn as Zaha is not going there to play around, but Sunte tells Zaha that he can make a rag out of it. Izaha chuckles and dons the robe and leaves for the cabin. 
At the cabin in the hunting grounds of Mountain Dinghu, the same men from earlier today wait for Izaha. They believe that the errand boy must have run already. But from a path in the forest, Izaha comes walking and the men are shocked. Zaha didn't run away and decided to bow down and enter the Black Cat Union, a mere errand boy of an inn who is quite greedy. Izaha reaches the door and announces himself. The guards pissed off that a mere errand boy is getting overconfident because he killed the Cho brothers. They will see how long his confidence lasts. The guard opens the door and welcomes Izaha inside. Inside the cabin, a big man sits in the middle of the yard in front of a fire, and the chair opposite him sits empty. The fire crackles and Izaha stares ahead. The big man is the Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master, Ban Sa Wung. The guard tells Pavilion Master that he has brought him the brothel owner, Izaha, and Sa Wong swears and looks at Zaha. Ban Sa Wung wanted to see the looks of the bastard that took over the three brothels, but Zaha looks younger and more arrogant than he expected. If he came to Sa Wung without running, then Zaha is probably going to say that he is going to manage all three brothels so he wants Sa Wung to treat him well. Zaha does not know his place and his greed is through the roof. Izaha just stares ahead and then plops himself down on the chair on the other side of the fire. Sa Wung is pissed, no one said that Zaha could sit. But Izaha does not need anyone's permission to sit down. The man from earlier is observing all this and thinks that Izaha is insane, it wouldn't be enough even if he crawled while bowing his head to the pavilion master. Sa Wung calls Izaha crazy and begins laughing out loud. With a smile, Sa Wung asks Izaha his age. Izaha ignores that question, the pavilion master didn't just call him here to ask his age. All hints of laughter disappear from Sa Wung's face. If that is all Sa Wung had to say, then it's Zaha's turn now. Izaha gives Sa Wung a choice to die alone, or lead his underlings to their deaths as well. Sa Wung is enraged, an errand boy dared to threaten him, it'll be difficult to spare Zaha now, and he pulls out his sword. Izaha's eyes glint, and he jumps up and kicks out. Sa Wung blocks the kick with his sword, but he still goes flying to the ground from the force of the kick, mouth bloody. Izaha has Sa Wung cornered now to the edge, and they face off while all the goons watch with shocked faces. Sa Wung, spare Izaha? That's a joke. Zaha is not someone who needs his mercy. Sa Wung grits his teeth in shock and his hand that is holding the sword shakes. He was blabbering like he was going to kill Zaha, but now he's just standing there. Sa Wung is outraged and lunges at Izaha, swinging his sword in an arc Zaha turns and dodges. Sa Wung's sword shoots out, jabbing back and forth. Izaha twists back and darts. He guesses that even a pavilion master of the Black Cat Union is just third-rate trash. Izaha twists forward, hand pushed back and then it shoots out and strikes Sa Wung in the gut. Zaha jumps and swings his sword using the sword key technique and slices Sa Wung's neck. Blood rains and Sao Wung's last expression is that of fear, and he falls. Chills erupt in the air and all the Black Cat Union underlings shiver in fear. Izaha turns to them, this is what happens when someone messes with the errand boy of Iliang Prefecture. The brown-haired ponytail man the one who relayed the message to Zaha, and has been observing things since is shocked that Izaha defeated the pavilion master so easily. Izaha glares and dares the men to fight him and follow Ban So Wung to their deaths. The men cower from fear and none of them move an inch. A man steps forward from the underlings to converse with Izaha. The man tells Zaha that he just attacked the Black Cat Union, and how is he going to handle the consequences? That shouldn't bother anyone, they are all about to die here. The men tremble and Izaha commands them all to kneel before he counts to three, and he will send whoever has straight knees to ban Sawung. On the count of three, all men are down on their knees before Zaha. Izaha recalls his training. The reason why he endured physical pain during internal energy cultivation, trained in martial arts and meditated while fasting, and held in his shit, all that suffering was for moments like this. The man who came forward to negotiate asked Zaha if he is going to spare them now as he said he would do if they kneel. However, Izaha only said that he will send them to the pavilion master if they don't kneel, he never said he will spare them. The negotiator man begs to spare all of their lives. If Zaha is going to kill them all then they have no choice but to fight back until they die. Izaha asks the man if he is a negotiator, and to propose after he identifies himself. The man introduces himself as the secret inspector, Sima Bai. Izaha does not recognize Sima Bai who perhaps died alongside Ban Sawung when he was killed by the Black Cat Union for corruption. 
Seema Bai tells Izaha that if they knew Zaha was similar in skill to the pavilion master, they would have joined him to defeat Sawum. But since he didn't reveal his strength, Seema restrained some of the people ready to jump in. Izaha smiles. Seema is not half bad. He found out Zaha's technique, that an errand boy hides martial arts. Izaha chuckles and tells Seema he passes, as it is the law of nature for those that are quick-witted to survive. Seema Bai raises his fist in celebration, but then realizes Zaha hasn't told the fate of the other men besides him. Izaha tells him that the other men have to die, and they might inform the Black Cat Union. If Zaha goes into an all-out war with the Black Cat Union right now, it'll get tiring. Zaha orders the rest of the men to come at him together. The men start to pull out their swords with shaking hands, but Seema stops them. He tries to negotiate with Zaha, it should be fine if they swear not to inform the Black Cat Union about this matter. Zaha cannot believe this because he does not trust Seema Bai. No matter how Zaha looks at him, Seema seems to be the next in charge after the Pavilion Master, which is correct. Izaha killed the Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master, Seema's superior, and he won't be left alive if he reports this to the higher-ups without a scratch on his body. It's the same for the rest of the underlings. They just watched from the sidelines as Zaha killed the Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master. Even if they manage to stay alive, their reputations as traitors will never disappear. It is obvious how the Black Cat Union will treat them after that. The men are speechless and Sima's shoulders slump. Zaha orders them to begin but Sima interrupts again by announcing that he has come up with a solution. Sima pleads with Zaha to make his decision after hearing the suggestion. Izaha is impressed and smiles. Sima must be a reincarnation of Zhuge Lian, Chinese military strategist, or Sima Yi, Chinese military general, to come up with a solution so quickly. Sima smiles brightly and contributes that they just need to embezzle the money in this cabin. They will openly commit a crime. There is a large amount of money that the pavilion master embezzled in the cabin. If the higher-ups hear a word of this, then the entirety of the Golden Phoenix Pavilion must die since they kept their mouths shut and helped him do it. Then they will take that money to the Iliang Prefecture and will become accomplices to the crime since they moved the embezzled money on their own accord. Basically what Sima is proposing is that since they can't report to the Black Cat Union due to being accomplices to a crime, Saha does not need to kill them. It is better than dying here. Izaha knows it is only annoying at this point and it won't matter if what Zaha did gets out to the Black Cat Union or whoever later on. Izaha agrees to the proposal, and Sima bows his head in thanks. Izaha puts soldier Sima in charge of this matter. Since early times in Jianghu, groups recruited soldiers with Sima or Zhuge names though Zaha has no idea why. The embezzled money is moved to the Plum Blossom Brothel, where Izaha is staying right now. Zaha guesses the embezzlement is a success. Since they moved all the money that they embezzled to Iliang, Sima and his fellow goons have no reason to return now. Zaha warns Sima to not cause any trouble during his stay in the Iliang prefecture. Zaha will not let anyone who causes trouble live. Sima nods eagerly. He will make sure everyone understands. Izaha tells Sima to also think about the jobs those useless bastards who have never done anything in their life should get. Izaha tells Sima the name of their clan, how clan, the clan for lowlifes. Sima thinks for a while but he has never heard of the clan by that name and apologizes to Zaha for being unknowledgeable about these things. Zaha tells him it's fine, he just made the sect on the fly, and what's more important is that it was made. Sima is worried that Zaha is using the name Matchless, low life so recklessly, he doesn't know what others may say. It's alright with Zaha, it just means that they are matchless in terms of trash. Suddenly, an aggravated voice reaches their ears and Sante comes barging in. Sante asks about all the stuff that they are moving outside. He has no idea where Zaha found it. Maybe he has learned to steal as well. Zaha calmly announces that it is the wealth that he has taken from the Black Cat Union's Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master. It's the funds for the construction of Murim family buildings like they're in. Sante is speechless that Zaha brought the Black Cat Union's money here because he felt like it. It's what the errand boy felt, what the Hao clan leader felt, and what a thief felt. Sante is pissed. He understands what the errand boy, how clan leader and the thief felt like, but the Black Cat Union might invade the Iliang prefecture because of this. Sungtae shouts at Zaha that he already knows all this. The Black Cat Union is the one who takes the money, not the one who gets their money taken. They are the kind of people who beat money out of thieves. Izaha is unmoved. He can also beat up people pretty well so it's fine. Sungtae bangs his forehead, 
he is going crazy from all this. Izaha also tells Sungtae not to worry, Zaha can just beat the shit out of the Black Cat Union Master if they come to attack them. Beating him sounds good to Sungtae. Or they can capture and torture the Union Master or even make him their subordinate if the situation calls for it. Torture and subordination also sound good to Sungtae. Or Zaha can just kill him. Suddenly, a big and bright smile overtakes Sungtae's face, they can just kill him. That is such an excellent idea and Sungtae was worried over nothing. Izaha smiles, there was never any need to worry. Sungtae swears tiredly, he would be more relieved if Saha said something that made sense. Izaha guesses everyone would be anxious from looking at Sungtae. Saha understands how he feels. Izaha commands Sungtae to have all the heads of the Hao clan gather in front of the Zaha Inn. There are three heads for now, Zhang Duxu of the Store clan, Mr. Jiam Chilyong of the Steel clan and Yun Jiaosung of the Architecture clan. The Hao clan heads, Zhang Duxu, Jiam Chilyong, Yun Jiaosung, and Sungtae and Izaha gather in front of the Zaha Inn. Mr. Jiam grins broadly, he heard their clan leader had something to say. Izaha has gathered them to inform them of the code of conduct of the Hao clan, and with that, he begins going over the rules. From now on, everything that happens in the HAO clan will be Izaha's fault. If a problem arises, they are to say that the Hao clan leader is responsible for it. Everyone is shocked. No matter who comes to ask them where the Hao clan leader is, they will not try to be righteous by keeping their mouth shut and just tell where Zaha is. If anyone tries to interrogate them, whatever the question is, they are to tell them that only the HAO clan leader knows the answer. That is the HAO clan's first code of conduct. Mr. Jim speaks first. He asks Zaha how pushing all the responsibility to the clan leader can be called an organization's code of conduct. Izaha gets serious and explains further that he has no talent in making chicken head noodle soup. So he has devoted himself to the Jianghu, the world of martial arts. Everyone is pleasantly shocked that Zaha has finally admitted that he has no talent whatsoever in making the chicken head noodle soup and that it tastes like shit. Jasung asks if it was that bad, and they tell him it was so bad it's no joke. Izaha sighs and tells them to just move on. Mr. Jim, who owns the smithy, and Duxu, who owns the springtime inn, have no business in Jianghu. Neither do Sungtae and Jasung, even though Sungtae says differently. Most people in the HAO clan will be the same, however, Izaha is different. He wants to keep the weak from dying as much as possible through the HAO clan. Everyone listens to Zaha speak raptly. In this world, errand boys at inns, porters and coachmen, and those who make armaments, food and daily necessities have suffered countless deaths by people from the Jianghu. The injustice can't even be questioned, and this will most likely continue to be so. If there are weak individuals who have died unjustly, as the leader of the HAO clan, Zaha will always question the injustice caused by the opponent, whoever they may be. He will fight against the existing established forces by himself. If they are killed by the black faction, Zaha will kill those in the black faction, and if they are killed by the white faction, then he will kill them before they have the chance to go to the Murim Alliance to distinguish between right and wrong. That is because Izaha is the leader of the HAO clan. The following silence is only disturbed by the rustles of wind. During Zaha's time as the crazy demon, the demon cult, the Murim Alliance, the black faction, and the white faction continuously fighting resulted in countless people dying as if a war had occurred. Zaha does not even have a speck of sympathy for those crazy monkeys who learn some martial arts and die in battle. However, he could not stand for an errand boy serving drinks and food to be beaten to death for no particular reason. Therefore, after killing those crazy monkeys without a cause, Zaha easily earned the nickname Crazy Demon. He was criticized and bad-mouthed by others too easily. He was called crazy no matter what he did, and he was even framed for crimes he never committed. To be honest, there were many times when Zaha was just too lazy to prove his innocence, and due to his temper, he became the natural enemy of all Murim in a very short time. No one could understand his circumstances of needing to avoid the Murim alliance while training to kill the demon cult leader. But now, it is different. As the HAO clan leader, Zaha will always have a cause for fighting, whoever they may be since he will be the weak's advocate. Sungtae slowly raises his hand, he doesn't understand something. Zaha needs to be extremely strong for this code of conduct to have any meaning. Leaving the Black Cat Union aside, how will Zaha handle all the sects and martial arts masters that are to come? Zaha tells them that everything will be solved as long as he becomes the matchless one from now on. 
The heads and Sunte are shocked into silence. Sunte thinks Zaha is talking shit again. He will continue to be anxious as long as Zaha is like this. Mr. Jim smiles and agrees to support the clan leader as a man must have large ambitions. Jasung grins widely and agrees to support Zaha as well. He will become the HAO clan leader's sponsor. Duxu asks Zaha if something like this is possible. There are countless sects and martial masters in the Jianghu as well as countless martial arts geniuses. Duxu has heard that they train in martial arts before they even learn to walk becoming the matchless one is hard to even for them, and a matchless one of an era is sent by the heavens. Izaha glares and announces that he is the one sent by the heavens. It's not that important whether Zaha becomes matchless or not. What's important is how much effort he puts into that goal. The errant boy Izaha will become matchless. So all of the men with him should think seriously about what they want to aim for in life. Izaha walks back alone to the brothel in the dark, his brain working overtime. The difference between him and the crazy demon of his previous life is that he had no goal in his past life, but now he does. And only by taking good care of the HAO clan will he be able to fight against the Murim Alliance and the demon cult. As long as he is the advocate of the weak, he will not become the natural enemy of all Murim like before. By having a cause, he can fight the white faction through justice, and fight the monkeys of the demon cult through martial arts. He can either kill or subordinate those in the black faction out of their minds. This is the power of having a cause, when an individual pushes an opinion different from the majority of the world, he becomes a revolutionary if he succeeds, and a crazy person if he fails. Unlike his previous life, Izaha will become a successful crazy person. Black Cat Union Master presides over the union meeting while the executives sit in anticipation. The union master, with a cat mask on his face, confirms from one of the executives that the Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master was involved in embezzlement and beaten to death by an errand boy, an evidence of his embezzlement, and his corpse was discovered in his safe house. After examining him, it was concluded that he died without much resistance, and his subordinates have been captured by a man named Izaha from Iliang Prefecture. The union master narrows his eyes and asks who Yi Zaha is. The man tells him that Zaha is an errand boy from the Iliang prefecture and an executive of the Black Cat Union was indeed beaten by an errand boy. The union master wonders if one of the twelve heavenly generals is playing tricks on them, but that shouldn't be it. So he tells his executives that one of the heavenly generals or a martial master from another region must be posing as an errand boy. But the man corrects the master that Zaha is truly an errand boy from that area and nothing more and he pleads with the union master to send him there, and that he will take care of Zaha without fail. He will kill that errand boy and take back all the money that Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master embezzled. The union master contemplates something and glances at a long-haired man sitting at the far end of one row. The union master addresses this log-haired man, Pavilion Master So, and says that he heard that So has been training diligently. It's to the union master's knowledge that So is more skilled than the Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master, it shouldn't take him many blows to overpower Zaha. The Golden Dragon Pavilion Master, Sogumpion, could have beaten the Phoenix Pavilion Master in the amount of time it takes to drink a cup of tea, as he wasn't great at martial arts, but there is no need to say it straight like that here. So bows his head to the Union Master and tells him that he is not certain since he hadn't fought against him before, but so would have overpowered him somehow. The Union Master then leaves this matter in SO's hands to test his skills. So flinches, Union Master wants So to fight an opponent that easily killed the Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master. There is no need for any subordinates to kill a mere errand boy, so as to take care of it by himself, and if he fails then he should kill himself. So nods again, he will be killed if he loses anyway. So is infuriated, the Union Master is just throwing him away when he is no longer needed. Izaha arrives at the springtime noodle shop, and Duxu is just done serving a customer in black robes. Duxu greets Izaha smilingly and asks for his order. Zaha orders some spicy noodle soup instead of the usual rice soup. The other customer slurps his noodles and he is none other than So Gunpyong himself. Izaha notices him immediately after he seats himself. He has never seen So before in the prefecture, and he seems to be quite skilled as well. And So's weapon is a Japanese sword. Izaha realizes then that So is the man of the 3,000 armors from the Black Faction who was nicknamed that because of his persistent lifespan. So will be a big shot in the Black Faction in the future, but here he is having some noodle soup in the springtime in. So calls out to Duxu and asks him for a place where he can meet a person named Izaha living in this neighborhood. 
Duxa acts oblivious and tells So that he hasn't seen Zaha recently, and that he might have ran to somewhere far away as he is quite the troublemaker. But he can try asking around. Izaha gives a hidden thumbs up to Duxa from behind. This is the wisdom of a store owner. So glares and chuckles, he had heard that Iliang Prefecture is full of crazy people and it seems like that's true. So is pissed off and his brows throw in anger. He knows Duxu is lying right to his face when Zaha's sitting right in front of him. So asks Zaha if he knows who he is. Izaha tells him that So is the So Gumpiang of the Black Cat Union, and he swears at So to watch his tone. So is shocked that Zaha knows his name and asks Zaha who he is, about his nature. Izaha begins mumbling. The question about his nature is quite deep and he is not sure. He needs some time to think about such a deep question. So has decided that Izaha's crazy and slurps more noodles. Izaha asks Duxu when his spicy noodle soup arriving. Duxu is pissed that Zaha is asking for spice when he is about to die and tells him that it seems that they're all out of noodle soup. So gulps down his soup, this neighborhood is quite amusing. So calls for Duxu so he can pay the bill, and Duxu begins sweating and doesn't move from his place. So slams the money in his hand on the table and beckons Izaha outside as it is too cramped inside the springtime in. So tells Duxu that his soup was delicious and he will come again and goes outside. Izaha demands a kitchen knife from Duxu because he didn't bring a weapon with him and heads outside too. As soon as So sees the kitchen knife in Zaha's hands, he's taken by surprise and asks him what he is planning to do with that kitchen knife and Zaha tells him that he just didn't have a weapon on him. So just stares at him. Izaha sniffs the knife and he smells garlic. It'll hurt if garlic gets into So's wounds. Izaha tells the third-rate black faction man, so, to remember that anyone who messes with the errand boy will be done in by a kitchen knife that stinks of garlic, and think about how painful it will be when garlic gets into So's wounds. Izaha is indeed insane, and so can't believe that the Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master was beaten by a guy like him. Zaha wonders why So Gunpyeong is alone, the black faction members move in groups usually. So tells him that they wouldn't make such a commotion for a mere errand boy because that's just embarrassing. Fighting Zaha embarrasses So. Izaha can't even hold a proper conversation, and So can't believe that Zaha killed the Golden Phoenix Pavilion Master. Zaha wonders why So has such a moronic look on his face, he must have been thrown away, and So grits his jaw. Izaha smirks, he is right, So is thrown away by the Union Master. So can't listen to any more of Zaha's bullshit, and unsheathes his sword, he has no idea how an errand boy from the countryside can be so impertinent. And Zaha doesn't know how a third-rate black faction member can be so overconfident. So Gunpyeong's eyes glint, and he charges. Gunpyeong swings at Zaha, and Zaha jumps back to dodge. So Gunpyeong's blade is so sharp and sturdy that the edge of the kitchen knife will be destroyed if Zaha blocks it head-on. Gunpyeong slashes again, but Zaha twists and keeps dodging. It is inefficient to pour internal energy into the kitchen knife. Gunpyeong arcs his sword and Zaha darts and jumps forward. Gunpyeong is pissed and he turns and takes a swipe again, but none of those hit Zaha. Gunpyeong shoots out and Zaha tilts and dodges the blade by a hair's breadth. Zaha judges Gunpyeong's skills to be passable but far from sufficient. Zaha's finger shoots out towards Gunpyeong's sword but he jumps back, sensing the threat. Gunpyeong finally realizes that attacking his own won't be effective against Zaha. Gunpyeong still doesn't believe that Zaha is an errand boy when he came here knowing that's what he is. Gunpyeong tells Zaha to shut up and answer if he is one of the heavenly generals like the Union Master. Ah, uh, Gunpyeong must be crazy, telling Zaha to shut up after asking him who he is. And how can Zaha not see through Gunpyeong's crappy movements? He is using a crappy martial arts technique that the slaves of the Black Faction learn. Gunpyeong is annoyed at Zaha calling his technique a slave's martial arts technique. However, all the forces led by the twelve heavenly generals are the slaughterous slaves. In reality, they don't even deserve to be called slaves, they aren't normal members of the black faction. They are all the slaughterous puppets, his pawns, his gamecocks, his toys, his cleanup crew, an association that provides him with women, and they only exist to lick his ass. Gunpyeong tells Zaha to shut up but he keeps going. Just look at the pathetic state of the slaughterer's disciples, the twelve heavenly generals. At his command, they wear those moronic masks. They're told to kill and train. They are each given unions to run. They display their secret techniques to determine ranks for the slaughterer's entertainment, and they flatter him with money and women. 
They are a group of trash. Gunpyeong wants to deny all these accusations but he can't refute any of this errand boy's words and he trembles in place. Gunpyeong should not be so surprised, the black faction was never cool, so there's no need to feel so depressed. The slaughterer, that old pervert, will die at Izaha's hands in the future. Gunpyeong glares and dares Zaha to just keep talking. Zaha stares and then smiles, impressed by him, and continues talking. The chief level 12 heavenly generals battle for ranks, and first place and learn more martial arts from the slaughterer. But there is no point in learning that, he isn't the strongest in the black faction. There's no way that narrow-minded guy would ever pass on his greatest technique. He is using that as an excuse to exploit those slaves acting all cute as much as he can. Gunpyeong hopes that is all Zaha had to say and if Zaha is so almighty then he won't just keep dodging. Izaha smirks looks like Gunpyeong will need a beating to get himself together. Zaha adopts his stance and touches two fingers to the kitchen knife, forming a fire sword of energy on top of it. Gunpyeong is shocked and gulps. As expected, Zaha is a martial master that he never had a chance against. However, he won't back down even if he dies fighting. Izaha calls this technique fiery taste, but the official name is the way of flame. Gunpyeong readies his sword as well, and both men smile preparing to clash. Gunpyeong attacks first and swings, blue energy shoots out towards Zaha. Zaha counters and swings, and a thick coarse layer of energy slashes the blue energy in half and strikes Gunpyeong with a spin. Gunpyeong rolls and falls to the ground. Duksu, who is watching this from the inn's entrance, is in awe of Zaha's skills. The fight looked very cool to him, and it was a true battle between the people of Nirim. Izaha keeps kicking the knockout Gunpyeong again and again, and only one thought goes through Duksu's mind. What the fuck is this son of a bitch doing? Izaha and Sungtae watch over the Gunpyeong who lies knocked out on the bed. Zaha orders Sungtae to wake Gunpyeong up. Sungtae rolls up his sleeves and slaps Gunpyeong, swearing at him and simultaneously beating him up. Gunpyeong groans and abruptly sits up, shocked to be alive. Izaha asks Gunpyeong to immediately tell him the slaughterer's whereabouts. But Gunpyeong doesn't know, even the Union Master probably doesn't know. Izaha asks Black Cat Union Master's whereabouts, who is in his own union. Zaha asks what that Union Master is doing these days. He is in the middle of training for the battle ranking. Gunpyeong is surprised and it is indeed strange that Izaha knows about the battle ranking because it is something that only the leaders of the Black Cat Union know. But the HAO clan knows everything except the things they don't know. Though Zaha only knows because he returned from the past. Sungtae announces arrogantly that there is nothing that the HAO clan doesn't know. But that's not true, they don't know what they don't know. What's most important is having the ability to find out whatever they don't know quickly. Sungtae turns and repeats himself, there is nothing that the HAO clan doesn't know, and the HAO clan is the greatest intelligence group. As Gunpyeong expected, Zaha isn't an ordinary person, he was a stooge of the HAO clan. Before Zaha can correct him, Sungtae punches Gunpyeong in the face, he must be out of his mind, and how dare he call the clan leader an errand boy, and keeps raining punches on him. It seems strange that Gunpyeong is weak enough to be beaten by Cha Sungtae. Cha Sungtae, the bastard, is acting all strong because Zaha is with him. When Sungtae is finally done with the beating he turns to Zaha and tells him that Gunpyeong is very good at asking for a beating. Yi Zaha orders Sungtae to leave them for a bit, and he obliges. Zaha turns to Gunpyeong and asks him if he has any thoughts of coming under Zaha's wing. Gunpyeong says no. Yi Zaha should just kill Gunpyeong then and he shivers. Zaha smiles and orders Gunpyeong to put away his bravado and answer properly. If Gunpyeong wants to be killed then Zaha will kill him. It feels like he will be killed if he asks for it. Gunpyeong lowers his head and pleads with Zaha to spare his life, and he wants to live without serving Zaha. Gunpyeong will never touch the HAO clan if he is spared, he swears it, not only the HAO clan, but he will never lay a hand on anyone related to Izaha, he swears upon his sword. Izaha is planning to subordinate this bastard, so it's best to let him go for now. No matter how straightforward the person is, they can be subordinated if one catches and beats the shit out of them about seven times. That's what the saint, crouching dragon that Zaha admires said. Zaha orders Gunpyeong to go and get the hell out of there. Zaha will accept his challenge if he comes back stronger. In exchange, if he hears that Gunpyeong killed merchants or any ordinary people from now on, Zaha will kill him by tearing his limbs apart. Gunpyeong will surely keep that in mind, 
and he stands up and bows to Izaha in gratitude for letting him live even when he lost, and he will keep his promise until he dies. Gunpyeong trudges outside and leaves. Sunte asks Zaha why he let Gunpyeong live. But a life clan leader can't kill every single person they see. Gunpyeong realizes that he lost. He remembers the Union Mater telling him to die if he fails. He wonders why he has to end his own life, and why should he? His stomach grumbles and since he can't go back hungry, he goes to Duxu and asks him for noodle soup in exchange for an advanced sum of money. Duxu welcomes his dear customer inside. Duxu asks Gunpyeong if he can get him anything else since he paid too much money and Gunpyeong agrees. Gunpyeong's future looks bleak, the Union Master will kill him if he goes back like this. But he cannot leave without saying goodbye to his subordinates. Living is quite tough but that's the same for everyone, who doesn't have a tough time staying alive. However, it's gotten much easier for Duxu because they don't have any more taxes to pay thanks to the HAO clan. Duxa smiles broadly and tells Gunpyeong that the HAO clan doesn't force them to pay taxes and protect the regular working class citizens. The clan leader said that is the reason why he created the HAO clan. Gunpyeong realizes that Izaha is not completely crazy. Duxa serves some pork rib soup on the table, and it looks delicious. It looks plain but it will be delicious so Gunpyeong should eat it comfortably with his hands. Suddenly, Izaha enters the springtime and how dare those bastards have pork rib soup without him? Izaha joins Duxu and Gunpyeong at the table, and they all have pork rib soup together. Zaha wonders what Gunpyeong is doing here eating pork rib soup when he went out of his way to spare him. He must have nowhere to go since Gunpyeong was abandoned by the Black Cat Union. However, Gunpyeong was staying here for a bit because he had something to think about, about his subordinates left behind in the Black Cat's Union who he thinks of as brothers. Zaha guesses Gunpyeong has at least some sense of honor. Most of the people in the Black Cats Union are those who have surrendered after the slaughterer killed the former Union masters. It is the same for Gunpyeong. The slaughterer killed the existing executives and pushed those remaining into their places. Gunpyeong stayed alive because he wasn't an executive back then. If so Gunpyeong doesn't return then other people, or even the Black Cats Union master himself, will appear. Things will get annoying if it comes to that. Izaha orders So Gunpyeong to take him to the Black Cat Union in a little bit. He is going to attack the Black Cat's Union alone, much to Gunpyeong's shock. After guiding Zaha there, Gunpyeong should take care of his subordinates, so they do not die. Since if Izaha goes alone, he may have to kill not only the Union Master but every single warrior of the Black Cat's Union. And that little bit means right now. Duxu is afraid that Zaha is being too hasty by going without any preparations. But surprise attacks are meant to be done hastily. Iliang Prefecture will be safe only if Saha raids them himself. Also, Gunpyeong will not come under his wing if Saha kills his subordinates. Gunpyeong and Izaha arrive at the Black Cat Union. Saha orders Gunpyeong to stand by until he sees a chance to save his subordinates. Gunpyeong goes around to the back entrance while Izaha kicks the front door. A man peeks out from the door's peephole and asks for Zaha's identity. Zaha introduces himself as Izaha of the Iliang Prefecture but the man does not recognize him. Zaha commands him to stop questioning and open the door before he breaks it open. The man tells Zaha to stop fucking around and that he will spare him, so he should be a drunkard somewhere else and shuts the peephole. Izaha takes a step back and jumps to the top of the doorway, then jumps back down inside the place, and continues walking inside slowly. Two men abruptly turn to him and shout to everyone that there's an intruder inside. Men come running from all sides and surround Zaha, asking for his identity. He tells the bastards again that he is Izaha of Iliang Prefecture. The Union Master stands on top of the staircase, mask in place, and finally regards the errand boy who killed his men. Izaha smirks, it is the duty of those in Jianghu to answer a question with a question in a battle of nerves. So he asks the Union Master if he's the moronic elderly slaughterer's slave rabbit, or maybe he should call him a rabbit slave instead of slave rabbit. All the men gathered in the courtyard start sweating in apprehension. Izaha questions how dare a mere slave playing master in some countryside union show such discourtesy towards Zaha, the Union Master must be out of his mind. Union Master doesn't answer and Zaha commands the rabbit bastard who doesn't know his place to say something. One of the executives standing beside the Union Master speaks up and announces that Saha is not some ordinary crazy bastard. The Union Master realizes that if Saha's here and the Pavilion Master Husomo went to kill him must be dead. 
Izaha grins and tells the rabid bastard to stop spouting shit and fight. The Union Master begins to ask why he should fight Saha but Saha interrupts him and declares that if the Union Master fights Saha alone, then he would be a good master regardless of his skill. However, if he orders his men to fight Saha just to find out how skilled he is, then the Union Master isn't worthy of everyone to serve him. The men are stunned speechless. Not only that, they could call him the trash, the insect are the coward of the black faction. A weak-ass moron who only puts on airs and a rat bastard who hides behind a mask. And a useless bastard who only relies on the prestige of the slaughterer to order him around. So basically, Izaha wants to fight one-on-one. -on -one. No union master falls to the trivial taunts of an errant boy. Suddenly, Gumpyang arrives from the back. The union master is trying to send his subordinates to their death this time as well. The union master told pavilion master, so Gumpyam, to kill himself if he failed but he is still alive, he must have begged for his life or something. But no one gives a damn, Gumpyang's life is now his to do whatever with. He doesn't have any deep sense of loyalty or affection towards the union master to die whenever he tells him to. The union master is shocked and asks Izaha if he spared Gumpyang's life. Zaha indeed did, he is not like the union master moron. Gumpyang orders the golden dragon pavilion to come to his side. He will put his life on the line so that the HAO clan leader of Iliang Prefecture will win. Five men walk and join Gunpyang. The Union Master is infuriated and shakes with wrath. How dare they betray him like that? Gunpyang dares the Union Master to fight Izaha if he is so confident, and one-on-one -on -one without sacrificing his subordinates. All the men in the yard glance at the Union Master, and he swears to make them all pay after he has taken care of this situation. The Union Master accepts the errand boy, Izaha's challenge. Zaha arrogantly tells the Union Master to stop putting on air when he is being forced to do something. Zaha announces to everyone that this battle will be a one-on-one -on -one between Izaha and the rabid bastard and if someone butts in, a voice cuts Zaha and an axe comes swinging at him. Izaha catches the axe and throws it right back where it comes from and it hits a man point blank on his head and he dies immediately. Izaha was going to say he will kill anyone if they butt in, so why are they butting in? The Union Master's nerves twitch in anger. The Union Leader starts to give off furious energy and tells Zaha that he is being too noisy. Izaha smirks and turns to look at Gunpion who approaches him. Gunpion requests Zaha to use his Japanese sword, Nodachi. The Union Master's blade is sharp but the Nodachi is just as good. Gunpion is handing over his weapon to Zaha which is akin to the life of a person of Nirim. Moreover, that Nodachi was known to be So Gunpion's most treasured weapon. Izaha chuckles and silently takes the weapon, and promises to return it to Gunpyeong afterwards. Izaha wields the Nodachi and smiles, ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the bastard rabbit. The Union Master descends the stairs and walks towards Zaha, and unsheathes his sword. Izaha swings his sword back and forth from one hand, and two fingers are pushed out from his other hand, to activate his sword chi. The Union Master startles and slashes his sword forward. Izaha smirks and dodges, running towards the Union Master, fingers out, and the men clash in a burst of energy. Their swords clang and the power reverberates through the air, smashing the ground to pieces. Both men attack and parry and dodge, all the while observing each other diligently. Zaha's eyes glint and he swings again. The Union Master counters with his attack and Zaha darts sideways and forward to dodge. Their swords meet again in a fury and their energies clash. All the executives and the underlings gathered around them are completely shocked that the errand boy is on par with their union master. Gunpyeong is observing from the sidelines, and scoffs because they are nowhere near on par. Izaha is still holding back. Back to the center of the space, Zaha dodges another attack with a grin plastered on his face. He was going along with the fight so that he can get a taste of the slaughterer's martial knowledge through the black cat union master's martial arts. But there is nothing more there for him to see. Done playing around, Zaha Antes up his power and swings. Their swords meet and the Union Master's foot sinks into the concrete underneath. The Union Master's sword hand trembles with the force of Zaha's attack, and he is enraged that Zaha was hiding his true skill all this while. Izaha smiles coldly when the Union Master finally comes to the realization and jumps and attacks with the crushing force. The Union Master retreats, but it is too late already, and Zaha slashes once more. The Union Master breathes heavily and orders his men to kill Zaha. Gunpyeong shouts from the sidelines, enraged at the Union Master's obscenity, 
he told Gunpyong to kill himself if he loses, and yet here the Union Master is commanding his men to kill Zaha when he has been defeated. The Union Master tells Gunpyong to shut up but he does not. The rest of the Union observes the exchange in fear, and Gunpyong tells them to stand down. As long as they ignore the Union Master's order and stay still, Gunpyong will take care of the rest. The men stare in indecisiveness. Before the Union Master can tell them to hurry up and kill Zaha already, Zaha smiles and charges at him again. The Union Master's jelly hands try blocking, and he calls Izaha the clan leader, hoping to stall. Zaha smirks evilly, it's too late for the Union Master to be compliant now, the men and their swords meet again in a series of attacks. The Union Master's hand is bloody where he is gripping his sword too tight, and swears at Zaha. The Union Master jumps and rains a heavy attack from higher ground. If Izaha dodges, so Gunpyong and his companions will be hit by that sword chi. Izaha's sword chi flares up in a flurry of fire, and he swings before the Union Master's attacks can reach him. The Union Master and Zaha's attacks meet in the middle, and the power explodes. For a long while, no one can see anything because of the thick fog of smoke and carnage. But when the smoke finally parts, the Union Master lies burnt on the ground. He sits up suddenly and vomits blood after blood. Chills erupt in the air, and the Union men cower in their places. Gunpyong sweats profusely. He knew Zaha was hiding his true strength, but he didn't know Zaha was strong enough to overpower the Union Master so completely. The wind parts to reveal E. Zaha standing in all his glory, strong and unscathed. So Gunpyong saved many lives today with his words. Gunpyong bows to Izaha in gratitude, he was able to save his comrades because Zaha gave his word beforehand. Zaha turns forward towards where a few men are contemplating an attack. Since Zaha is one to respect a man's desire for revenge, those of them who feel bad for the Union Master's loss should come forward now. Zaha tells them with an evil smile that he will open the path to ascension for them to allow along with their Union Master by his own hands. The men cower in fear and stand down. Zaha is disappointed that no one came forward. There are usually a few people who want to follow their master, saying some weird shit like it's a good day to die. They won't get many chances to challenge an errand boy like this. Chills erupt in the air and the men sweat profusely. What a shame, it was their last chance to fight an errand boy. Izaha walks forward and picks up the fallen Black Rabbit Union Master's mask and puts it on. From now on, he is the Black Rabbit Union Master, whether anyone likes it or not, that's what he has decided. Dadi Zaha she's the Nodachi. He used it well, and returns it to Gunpyong. Zaha picks up the fallen Union Master's sword and asks Gunpyong the sword's name since he cannot quite remember. That sword's name is Black Rabbit Tooth. It is a dumbass name, but since it is Zaha's now, he shouldn't call it a dumbass. The Black Rabbit Union's men watch in apprehension. Zaha orders them to remove the former Union Master's corpse who opposed Zaha without knowing his place. They are to clean up the walls and floors as well. They should bear in mind that to succeed in the black faction, everyone needs to be good at cleaning. The men agree immediately to follow those orders. To start anew, Zaha calls for a meeting of executives. Gunpyong will join Zaha once he cleans the surroundings, so the rest of the executives head to the hall first. Zaha wields his new sword. From today onwards, he is the Black Rabbit Union Master. Until he is found by the slaughterer, the Great Rakshasa. Zaha does a series of complicated steps with the sword in the air. Everyone in the courtyard is surprised because he is using the technique of the former Black Rabbit Union Master meeting in progress. Zaha orders the men to report on the present situation. From what Gunpyong knows, thanks to Zaha's generosity, it seems that many of the Golden Phoenix Pavilion warriors have survived and are living in Iliang Prefecture. Gunpyong asks for Zaha's next order on what to do with the men. Zaha smiles happily, pleased by So Gunpyong and commands the other executives to follow Gunpyong's example. Gunpyong is not only smart, but he has affection for his comrades, and he bravely stood up to save their lives. Gunpyong is surprised that the clan leader is this kind of person, and that Zaha is an unusual man, but he acknowledges his subordinates. All the while Zaha is still speaking, Gunpyong is very durable and can take a beating as well. E Zaha commands Gunpyong to use the Union men however he wishes. Pavilion Master So Gunpyong is the clan's talent, their brains, and the representative executive of the Black Rabbit Union. The other executives should continue to train hard, and Zaha will bestow them a golden letter, an amount of money given to someone without disclosing its amount to the receiver or a third party. It's not even Zaha's money anyway. 
Gunpyeong beams, ecstatic about the money. When they show no reaction, Saha orders everyone in the meeting to clap before he breaks their hands. The men start clapping immediately, and then Zaha orders them to stop. To encourage each other, to be motivated with each other, to train together, and to become stronger by fighting together. That is what the dark faction is all about. If anyone starts to have emotions of hatred, affection, or desire to beat the shit out of someone in that process, a brotherhood that was never there is bound to be formed. That is what makes the dark faction truly powerful, according to Izaha, that is. Zaha addresses a big round man in the front of the right row. If Zaha is boring that fucker, then he should leave, not be an executive. He can go outside and either fix the broken wall with the other subordinates, or remove the corpses. The man bows his head immediately and apologizes. Izaha Tieskeas, how dare the man not pay attention to what his union master is saying. Some other executives start sweating profusely. Izaha continues where he left from. Zaha asks the men who the administrator is and an old man with a headband comes forward. Zaha can just call him Administrator Bayak. Zaha commands Administrator Bayak to give the Dragon Phoenix Pavilion Master, Sogunpion, a golden letter. Zaha would also like to know the present situation of their current funds, so the administrator should report to Zaha once he has organized it. If Zaha uncovers any forms of embezzlement or shams from now on, he will execute the administrator first. Come to think of it, Zaha forgot about the ranking battle and its date. All the executives gape at Zaha in shock as he shouldn't have known about the ranking battles. It looks to them like Zaha was the union master from the start, from how he's talking so naturally. Gunpion supplies that there is no set date, but the lower rank heavenly general expected to challenge the union master soon is the red monkey. Also, for Zaha to increase his rank, he has to fight the heavenly general white rooster. The Union Master of the Black Rabbit Union, Izaha, is the fifth rank of the twelve Heavenly Generals. Zaha is surprised that the former Black Rabbit Master was so high up in the ranks. Zaha inquires about more information on their respective master, the Slaughterer, the Great Rakshasa. The Heavenly General Red Snake seems to have offered the Great Rakshasa a blue-eyed beauty that he obtained somewhere, so he is most likely there. Izaha chuckles, that old bastard has quite a lot of energy to even lay his hands on a blue-eyed beauty. He stops laughing and is filled with rage all of a sudden, veins popping on his body, and dark energy permeates the room. Gunpyeong looks down and sweats, he cannot tell what Zaha is thinking. First Zaha calls Great Rakshasa his master, then an old bastard and starts getting mad. Izaha continues talking angrily, the Great Rakshasa is still using his disciples to get his hands on those pitiful women. What in the world is the Murim Alliance doing? They should just arrest him. When Gumpian just stares at him, Zaha asks if he said anything wrong. Izaha stands up abruptly, infuriated. This won't do. Though the great Rakshasa is his master, since the old bastard has fallen deep into debauchery, he plans on plotting a rebellion. All the executives gape again in disbelief. Zaha wants to rebel just because an old man is enjoying worldly pleasures, isn't he just rebelling because he is in a bad mood? If anyone sides with the great Rakshasa or if they get in Zaha's way, he won't let them live. Zaha inquires about the recent state of the black reconnaissance. From what Gunpyeong knows, they have been busy with their gambling and auction businesses. At this rate, there won't be any other sects that can match them in terms of wealth. They are still auctioning slaves. This enrages Zaha. How dare they still auction slaves in the current generation? As a head of the dark faction, Zaha cannot ignore such acts of evil. Ija announces that the Black Rabbit Union will fulfill its duty as part of the Dark Faction by destroying Black Reconnaissance and becoming the spearhead of the Jianghu Slave Liberation Front. The confused executives wonder how in the world Zaha is deciding these things, and since when did the Dark Faction have that kind of duty, a man asks why they are attacking the Black Reconnaissance all of a sudden. Zaha believes that it isn't right to buy and sell people. Izaha swears at everyone and asks why they learn martial arts up until now. Do not avert their eyes from injustice. That is the duty of those who walk the night drunk on the sword. No one knows what the hell Zaha said even means. Zaha demands a quick response from everyone because he is getting all embarrassed now after that speech. His temper is suddenly starting to surge. The executives bow and agree immediately then. Also, for their cause, Zaha will use the Black Rabbit Union's resources such as elixirs, funds, and so on however he wishes. If there is anyone with a complaint, 
they can have a one-on-one -on -one battle to resolve their differing opinions. No one objects, Zaha is so relieved that his hands aren't stained with the blood of his executives. He beams. The atmosphere at the Black Rabbit Union is very peaceful. The meeting was finished peacefully, and it was time well spent in Zaha's opinion, to think he had talent in things like these. A man arrives to inform me Zaha of his meal, but Ziaha foregoes that in favor of washing himself. He hasn't cleaned himself yet after getting some blood on him earlier. Zaha removes the mask and turns to the man, the wind blowing his hair back. The man is suddenly shocked and scared out of his mind for some unknown reason. Ziaha asks the man if he is so surprised because of his surprising handsomeness. The man immediately apologizes and looks down, sweating profusely. There is no need for the man to shake so much, no harm will come to them. From now on, Zaha is the new Black Rabbit Union Master. The man nods again and tells Zaha it is his pleasure to meet his new Union Master. As the man knows, it's Zaha's first day since his inauguration as the Union Master, so the man will guide him, show him places such as the individual training room and elixir storage room, and will wash himself there. The man obliges. Izaha enters the elixir room which looks quite decently stocked. He wonders what kind of elixirs are here. There are rare elixirs that people can never lay their hands on in the Jianghu and distributed elixirs that are the opposite. There are very few people who have consumed rare elixirs, and most people in Jianghu just take the distributed elixirs. Zaha opens one drawer. As he thought, there are only distributed types here. And they are not even the good ones. He slams open and close all drawers, hoping to find something special, when he comes across the heart blazing pill, a high quality distributed elixir. Zaha takes out three pills and swallows them. It is an elixir befitting Zaha's condition, with heaps of internal energy piled up inside his body. He turns and walks a few steps and settles himself on the ground. His eyes close in concentration and his energy blazes around him. He calmly quells the blaze of the blazing heart pill activating the journey through the steel lands, the invulnerable golden tortoise technique. His energy twirls and twists inside him. Zaha is confused that the Heavenly Pearl is absorbing the blaze of the Blazing Heart Pill before he even started his cultivation technique. Zaha opens his eyes and wonders what is going on. Before he even started cultivating, the elixir's energy instantly combined with the Heavenly Pearl as if it was being absorbed by it. Zaha pushes his palms closer together and summons some energy, which swirls and changes color to lemon green of the Wood Realm. The energy ball's color changes once again to Fire Orange of the Flame Realm. Zaha pushes his hands together more and the furious energy permeates the air. Zaha slowly disintegrates all energy, and it is strange indeed. The heavenly pearl was made by absorbing countless warriors' chi, life force, and something one could call the essence of their being. But it even absorbed the energy of the elixir that Zaha took just now. It could be that the heavenly pearl had some strange power that lets it absorb an opponent's chi or even their internal energy. But that can't be. Zaha just wants to live as a crazy person. He chuckles, he has no plans to become a monster surpassing the demon cult leader. For now, he will hesitate to figure out what's happening inside his body. Zaha closes his eyes in concentration again and decides to give this a name just in case. He breathes out slowly. One never knows what's going to happen, after all, there are so many options for the name, absorption technique, chi absorption technique, heavenly absorption technique. Heavenly Pearl Absorption Technique Heavenly Pearl Absorption God Technique Heavenly Pearl Absorption Demonic Technique and Demon Heavenly Pearl Heavenly Technique Mad Demon Heavenly Pearl Absorption Technique Heavenly Pearl Absorption He decides to forget and fuck it all. Since he has already returned to the past due to some strange fate, what else couldn't he possibly do? Suddenly Zaha shoots his palm out toward the drawers and twists. But nothing happens. He concludes there is no way that he can perform chi telekinesis with his current level of martial arts and internal energy. However, when has he ever followed other people's standards? Inventing a martial art that doesn't exist in the world is what crazy people do. It's only through estranging himself from other people's beliefs that one can create something that has never existed. He will abandon all theories of martial knowledge that he has accumulated. Zaha pushes one hand out straight. He will organize the power of the heavenly pearl and the fundamental principle of absorption in his mind with a clean slate. He closes his eyes and calls forth his energy. His hand erupts in power, and he gives just one command, come. 
A black hand of energy shoots out from his outstretched arm. Saha focuses his eyes, and boom, a box lies there in his formerly empty hand. Izaha grins. He has decided he is going to name it the Great Heavenly Pearl Absorption Technique. Since the Heavenly Pearl is a secret, he will keep those two words to himself and call it the Great Absorption Technique. The morning arrives and the sun shines brightly in the sky. The men in the Black Rabbit Union go about their business, astonished to see a new face arrive at the hideout. Someone came to see Izaha, who is sitting in a throne-like head chair, mask in place. So Gunpyong informs him that a woman has come to inform the Union Master news about the Iliang Prefecture. Gunpyong would have chased her out if it was for anything else, but he thought Zaha should hear it since it has something to do with the Iliang Prefecture. Izaha is surprised to hear this, as there should be no immediate problems in the Iliang Prefecture now that he has completely subdued the Black Rabbit Union. Zaha agrees to invite the woman in. The door to the main room swings open, and a trembling woman arrives inside with hair and an intricate braid. Zaha is shocked to see Miss Sun, whom he hasn't seen in quite a while, here. Gunpyong orders Miss Sun to tell the Union Master exactly what happened. Miss Sun speaks up shakingly and introduces herself as Sun Soso of the Iliang Prefecture. Zaha is surprised to hear that name and tells her out loud that it is a beautiful name. Zaha signals her to continue speaking. Miss Sun tells him that there is a place called Zaha in an Iliang Prefecture and that place is Aaron Boy. Dot before she could continue further, the Union men's heads jerked in shock, as the Aaron Boy of Zaha and is their Union master now. Miss Sun continues speaking about stuff like the Aaron Boy and the drinks that were going to be offered to the Black Rabbit Union, and so on. Gunpyeong's face tightens at the audacity of the woman snitching on the Union master to the Union master, while the other men face down as well, thinking they are going insane and wondering what will happen now. When Miss Sun is finally done speaking, the men all look up to Ziaha. The errand boy, the union master, Iziaha, nods. He has heard Miss Sunwell. What she is saying is that the Zaha and Zaren boy killed the owners of the brothels and completely seized the Iliang prefecture. That is good news indeed. Zaha smiles and asks the brave woman if she has anywhere to go. She does not. That is a shame, to think such a brave woman has nowhere to go. Zaha asks Miss Sun if he shall give her the managerial position for the servant girls. Miss Sun beams with happiness. As per him, brave women should be used with care, and she should try working at the Black Rabbit Union. She is old enough, and since she has worked in the Plum Blossom Brothel, she must have enough experience. Thus, she is perfect for the job. Miss Sun agrees immediately. Union Master can leave everything to her, and she will do her very best. In exchange, Zaha asks her to promise two things, firstly, betrayal will without a doubt result in death, and secondly, she should watch that mouth of hers especially. Miss Sun suddenly feels like she has heard that somewhere before, but that isn't too hard for her, and she lowers her head, she will follow the Union Master's commands. It's settled then, Miss Sun Soso, the brave woman, passes. Miss Sun smiles wide in happiness, and thanks the Union Master, she will serve him with her entire being from now on. Zaha grins and tells her that she should be thankful, as he is giving her another chance like this, they should get along from now on. Miss Sun is confused by the words another chance, and E. Zaha finally removes that rabbit mask. It's really hard to see with the damned mask. Zaha's face finally reveals itself to Sun Soso, and she trembles in fear. His handsome face must be really that surprising. Miss Sun sways and falls. Zaha swears and asks everyone why she collapsed. So Gunpyong checks her breathing. She is alive but just fainted from shock. Iziha huffs and orders Gunpyong to have the servant girls tend to her. To think she fainted as soon as she saw her union master's face is such impertinence. Gunpyong is surprised by the command to tend to her. Zaha scoffs. He won't throw an unconscious girl out onto the streets when she has nowhere to go. All of them are such heartless bastards. Everyone should remember this moment. This is how merciful Izaha, the Union Master, is. Rows of muscled men lie lined up in the training space, and a voice orders everyone except the warriors of the Golden Dragon Pavilion to begin 500 basic push-ups. The men sweat profusely in the sweltering heat and oblige. Izaha's voice presides over everyone and he orders them to keep in mind the ways of the dark faction. First is to train, second is to train, and third is to battle. The sweat drips to the ground in buckets from the men's bodies. From now on, other than the time they spend shitting and sleeping, 
they will focus only on getting stronger. Since they are being made a fool out of just because they are in the dark faction, they should at least be strong. All of the men in Sogumpian's Golden Dragon Pavilion are commanded to make some sandbags in the rear garden and place them on the backs of their comrades who have started their push-ups. Sogumpian is ordered to go watch his men to see whether they are doing their jobs right. Gunpyong bows and obliges. The executives will perform 100 push-ups. The executives who complete their 100 push-ups are to pick up a wooden sword and strike those who slack off. Zaha will allow the executives to strike them to the brink of death, and up to the point their bones break. The men flinch. The men smile like sadists and run to pick up the wooden swords. Izaha observes that the executives are even using chi to get to a wooden sword, the dark faction is full of weird people indeed. It will be good for the underlings to finish their 500 push-ups quickly. The sandbags that the Golden Dragon Pavilion warriors have made will be here soon, which means they will have to complete the rest with sandbags on their backs. The men grit their teeth and push on. Which do they think is faster? The 500 push-ups are much easier now compared to doing them with sandbags on their backs. Zaha commands them to go faster and faster until they scream from exertion. That was good, a good audible expression of their rising pain. Zaha will allow this level of screaming, so they should feel free to scream all they want. The screams rise in the amount. Izaha announces that he will grant golden letters to the five people who complete their 500 push-ups the fastest, so they should try their hardest. Zaha walks out with a smile when the sandbags finally arrive. Back inside, the administrator gives something to Izaha. It is the 12 Heavenly Generals Conquest Collection. Administrator Bayak thought that Zaha would be curious about the figure, appearance of their mask, martial arts, and weapons of the 12 Heavenly Generals, so he organized and wrote everything that he knows into a book along with illustrations. The book is amazing, especially the illustrations. There is a lot of information about the 12 Heavenly Generals that Zaha doesn't know about. Zaha guesses that Admin Bayak knows so much because he was involved with them. Iziaha finds out from the book that the Red Monkey is a woman. Admin Bayak tells Ziaha that the Red Monkey is a bit of a special disciple. She is a woman who stole an item that the Great Rakshasa commissioned her for, and used the money she received to learn martial arts from him. Although she has a lower rank than the Union Master of the Black Rabbit Union, Iziaha, there are no heavenly generals who underestimate her because of her extraordinary Qinggong martial arts technique that allows your body to become very light, skills. Iziaha wonders if her Qinggong is that amazing. Some geniuses are talented in only one aspect, and it seems that Red Monkey has talent in Qinggong. Admin Bayak has organized the information about the Great Rakshasa as well in the end, as information about the leader is always organized last. Iziaha grins mischievously, leaving the final boss for the last is what Administrator Bayak is saying. Iziaha is impressed by Bayak and decides to bestow a golden letter upon him. Admin Bayak bows to Iziaha in gratitude, though he didn't put this together to receive money, he will gratefully accept it. Both men start laughing maniacally and suddenly Miss Sun interrupts them. Iziaha smiles at their chief attendant, Sun Soso, who is pretty with her words and tells her to speak up. Sun Soso tells them that there is a masked individual outside looking for the union master. Zaha asks her about the kind of mask the person is wearing. She reveals that it is a monkey mask. Seems like the red monkey is on their doorstep. Iziaha flips open the book and skips to the red monkey section. The information reveals the red monkey to be crazy about Qinggong, an extremely kleptomaniac person who is assumed to have immense wealth who became the disciple the latest, but has quickly increased her rank by defeating many of the heavenly generals and she shamelessly runs away when she is at a disadvantage and calls it a draw. There are many rumors that her internal arts cultivation speed is fast because she steals elixirs, and she made a deal with the great Rakshasa to learn a martial art that she wants from him in exchange for stealing and replacing an item. It is assumed that her Qinggong does not fall behind the top four heavenly generals. Izaha flips the book close and grins threateningly. He has completely memorized the information. Zaha walks into a separate room and comes face to face with Red Monkey in an obvious monkey moss. Zaha enters the room fully and sets himself on a chaise. The Red Monkey stands up and approaches Zaha. The Red Monkey puts her hands together in greeting and asks if her brother Rabbit has been well. Izaha tells the thieving bitch that it's been a while. The Red Monkey gets pissed, she doesn't appreciate being called that. 
The red monkey observes that the rabbit union master's hair is longer than before and his manner of speaking is strange as well. Iziaha realizes his mistake. She didn't have this kind of relationship with the former union master, and he tells her that he has misspoken due to fatigue from training recently. He provides her that he was learning quite an extreme martial art, but his throat was injured while being unable to fully control the true chi in his body, and his voice became like this because of a fever. It is perfect for the red monkey when he is injured. She tells him that she came because she thought she'd greet him, and that if he gives her some allowance like last time, she won't challenge him and head back for today. Izaha is shocked. Perhaps she is planning on ripping money off him since she thinks he shouldn't push himself before his battle with the white rooster. To think she's trying to rip money off her brother like Zaha thought, the dark faction is a complete mess. The red monkey provokes him by saying that he has to settle things with brother white rooster soon. If he gets hurt while fighting the red monkey, his chance at becoming one of the top four heavenly generals will go up in flames again. Iziaha wonders menacingly if she rips money off all their brothers like that, she must be a beggar. The Black Rabbit Union Master's words are quite harsh today, looks like the Red Monkey will have to settle the score with him today. Zaha interrupts her by asking how much she was thinking of taking. The Red Monkey's attitude changes immediately and she beams. She will take around 30 silvers, and then she won't even come near him for a while, or he can have a battle with this sister. The red monkey believes that since he got injured honing his martial arts, he is sure to turn down her challenge. Maybe she should increase her price a little. Izaha smiles coldly and addresses the monkey sister. He will make her a deal as well. If she hands over all the money she has, he will be considerate as they are both members of the dark clan and let her leave with her limbs intact. The red monkey is outraged. The red monkey can't believe that the black rabbit master is serious, but he is. He will also no longer accept her challenges if she doesn't bring him any money. In exchange, if the red monkey manages to defeat him even once, he will return everything that he has taken from her. It's a martial match gamble. There is a saying that theft and gambling are intertwined, so she wouldn't be able to refuse this proposal. The red monkey can decide the contents of the martial match. The red monkey smirks, wondering what's with the black rabbit's confidence, and that he must have damaged his head as well. Whatever the case, it's good for the red monkey. The red monkey lays down the rules. If he manages to take her mask within half a gack, seven and a half minutes, she loses. That's it. He is free to use any means and any methods he wants, and the location will be within the Black Rabbit Union. This sounds adequate to Izaha, the union master. To think that he tried to catch the red monkey with Qingong, there must be something wrong with his head. The Red Monkey and the Black Rabbit Union Master face off in the open space. The Red Monkey beckons Zaha forward, daring him to try and take her mask. Izaha doesn't react. He is very composed, however, the Red Monkey believes that the time he has is very short. Zaha orders her to shut up, how dare she lectures him. He will be educating her today, so she should prepare herself. Zaha told her that he'd let her go in the same state she came in, but she doesn't seem to know her place. The red monkey sighs, she should be the one to be saying those words. Suddenly, Zaha jumps and grabs the red monkey's mask. However, his hands meet cold air, and the red monkey appears behind him. Zaha's eyes glint and he turns and attacks, but she does a backflip and lands on her feet a few meters away. Gunpyong and Administrator Bayak are observing the fight from afar. Red Moki's Qingong skills are truly remarkable. Even the Union Master Ziaha will have a hard time catching her with his Qinggong. Yi Ziaha taps his feet on the ground and charges at the Red Monkey again while she daydreams about what she would buy with the money she'll get. Zaha lunges at her, and she jumps back to dodge, surprised. She has no idea what happened, he has gotten faster all of a sudden. Zaha appears behind her and pushes his hand out, but she flips back to dodge again, and smoke pours out from her hand, hiding everyone from view. The red monkey lands back on the ground, sure that the smoke will hide her from sight, but suddenly Zaha's hand shoots out. He makes a grab for her, but she barely dodges and jumps, mere centimeters separating them. The red monkey sweats profusely, properly threatened, and E. Zaha activates the great absorption technique. Dark red tendrils of energy shoot out, grab the red monkey's leg, and drags her back to Zaha. The red monkey attempts to attack Zaha from close range but he closes his hand around Red Monkey's in a tight grip and slams her hard to the ground. 
The smoke parts to reveal the red monkey lying upside down on her hands and knees on the ground. Zaha contemplates her, and she twists, and steps away in a series of complicated twists. The red monkey pulls her fist back and charges at Ziaha. At the last moment, Zaha activates the Great Absorption Technique. Suddenly, tendrils of crimson energy push out and grab her face and pull, removing the mask, and on the other hand, Zaha unleashes another attack, hitting her right in her face. The red monkey goes flying to the ground, bloody and bruised, and maskless. The ground she lands on crumbles from the force of the attack. Looks like the Black Rabbit Union Master, Izaha, has easily, comfortably, and instantly won, without even the slightest hint of danger. Gunpyong and Adnan Bayak congratulate him. Zaha asks them to take a look at Sister Monkey. Do they think she is still unconscious? They approach her, and she is indeed still unconscious. Other men arrive outside from inside the house, it isn't strange for her not to be. Zaha tells them no that she will wake back up in the middle of the night after being carried away. Then she will come to empty the elixir storage room or take the funds of the Black Rabbit Union. And she'll just leisurely escape like a burglar. But that won't work on Ziaha. Everyone must be wary of various honey traps, especially in the dark faction. The men nod in understanding. Suddenly, the red monkey awakens and stands back up. She has learned a lot from her brother Black Rabbit today and wipes the blood from her nose. Only one thought echoes through all the men's minds then, she is so pretty. But they all abruptly turn their necks. The men turn their judging glares to Zaha, all coming to the same conclusion that Zaha went too far on such a delicate girl. Iziaha scoffs and grinds his jaw, this is the true power of honey traps. The red monkey is tied to a giant pillar with thick ropes. She can't even move because pressure points were pressed. She glares at no one and knows now that the Black Rabbit Union Amster is not her brother. His skills, the way he talks, and even the air around him. It's all different from her brother Rabbit. She should have realized it sooner. The door swings open, and Administrator Bayak walks to the Red Monkey. Admin Bayak has come on the Union Master's order, and he apologizes for the discourtesy. The Red Monkey rages at the said discourtesy. The group of men in front of her parts in the middle to reveal a chair with some papers and ink on top of it, and the men beam with surprising happiness. Adnan Bayak thanks the men for their hard work and ushers them out. He then turns to the red monkey with a pen in hand. Adnan Bayak observes red monkey in deep concentration, thus making her uncomfortable and furious with the attention. The union master ordered Adnan Bayak to draw heavenly general red monkey's face with much detail. He tells her in complete unseriousness that an old man like him can't do anything. If he is ordered to draw, then draw he shall. The Union Master is much more terrifying than the Red Monkey would expect. Bayak is only following orders, so she shouldn't resent him. The Red Monkey asks why her face is being drawn. Admin Bayak ignores her and continues with his observations. He heard that she became renowned for her stealing. If she runs away all of a sudden or does not comply with the Black Rabbit Union's demands, the Union Master, Iziaha, said that he will give the sketch that Bayak will draw right now to the Miram Alliance. Admin Bayak orders the Red Monkey to stay still, and he will draw her in great detail. The Red Monkey reprimands him for observing her so diligently. But how can Bayak draw without looking at her? One looks at mountains when drawing mountains and at rivers when drawing rivers. The Red Monkey grinds her teeth and orders Admin Bayak to stop right this instant. Though she is a heavenly general like his Union Master, Bayak doesn't feel all that great when he hears someone her daughter's age speaking to him so informally. It is very unpleasant. The red monkey smirks, so what if Bayak feels unpleasant? Admin Bayak innocently asks if he should draw a nude sketch instead, and the red monkey shuts up instantly. Admin Bayak laughs, that was just a joke. He will finish this quickly and requests her to not hate him too much. Since he has absolutely no choice but to do this to stay alive. The red monkey swears at the son of a bitch, Bayak, it doesn't look like he has no choice. Admin Bayak addresses her again. As she might have already noticed, the Union Master that he used to serve is dead. Without being able to resist properly, he got sent flying. All the bones in his limbs shattered and he died. The Red Monkey flinches. To be honest, Bayak expected the Red Monkey's bones to be ripped into pieces as well, and for her to die. He tells her to be good to the Union Master when he is being nice to her. Admin Bayak beams again, admiring the Red Monkey's posture, and continues his sketch. 
Izaha is shown the sketch of the red monkey and he is impressed. It looks like a spitting image of the sister monkey and tells Admin Bayak that he passes. Izaha orders Admin Bayak to make multiple copies of this drawing and send it not only to the Murim Alliance but to all the sects and great families rumored to be looking for thieves if sister monkey ever lashes out. A bounty will naturally be placed on her head. Admin Bayak bows and leaves Zaha alone with the red monkey, still tied to the pillar. The red monkey glaringly asks Zaha who he is. Zaha smirks, surely she has already realized that he is not that rabbit bastard. The red monkey tells him that he cannot hide his identity with a mere mask. Who does he think he is to show such discourtesy towards the great Rakshasa's disciples? He won't be able to handle their master's wrath. Iziaha smiles and tells Sister Monkey that he wouldn't do something like this in the first place if he was afraid of the great Rakshasa. The red monkey warns him to not call her sister. Perhaps she would prefer thieving bitch, but she doesn't if Saha goes by the slump of her shoulders. She tells him to call her just sister instead. The red monkey addresses her fake brother, he probably kept her alive because he wants something from her. She smiles, for her money is more important than anything else in life. As long as Zaha pays her well, she can help out with whatever he has planned without a problem. Zaha is going to kill the great Rakshasa. The red monkey thinks that he has gone insane. Master great Rakshasa is stronger than what people of Jianghu think. She doesn't think that Zaha is strong enough to fulfill his goal yet. Iziaha will keep that trivial piece of information in his head and confirms if the red monkey has it in her to betray the great Rakshasa. As long as Zaha gives her money, she will help him. Zaha doesn't believe her words. The red monkey grits her teeth, wondering what Ziaha wants her to do. He won't believe her even if she tells him that she will betray the great Rakshasa. Zaha ignores her and announces that pavilion master Sogumpion will be arriving with a poison soon. Who does she think will be eating it? Of course, it'll be Sister Monkey. The red monkey starts sweating heavily, disbelieving that the crazy bastard Zaha will feed her poison. Suddenly, the red monkey becomes obedient. Instead of poisoning her, she asks Ziaha to give her an order. She will not betray him and will act on it without fail. He even has her sketches. Ziaha still doesn't believe her. Just then, Sogumpyang joins them with the purple haze curse poison in hand. The red monkey is taken aback by hearing of a curse poison. Saha orders Gumpyang to feed the disgusting ball of curse poison to her. So Gumpyang approaches her and forcefully feeds her the poison. The red monkey is adamant about not eating it and moves her face left and right to no avail. She is still not swallowing so Zaha orders her to keep beating her until she swallows. Hearing that, the red monkey immediately swallows the poison and asks Zaha to talk and tell her what he wants. Zaha will give her 10 days. He will give her the antidote if she manages to return after killing either the white rat, yellow horse, or green dog. Since the 12 heavenly generals can have martial death matches, she is not committing a capital offense to the great Rakshasa. Those three generals are the ones notorious for evil acts, murder, and robbery. The red monkey is very perceptive, as expected of a thief. Zaha approaches the red monkey and snaps the ropes, freeing her. The red monkey demands to know who Zaha is and if he was part of the Murim Alliance. E. Zaha is an errand boy from the neighborhood next door. Gunpyeong is bummed that he is revealing his identity so easily. The red monkey believes that he doesn't plan to tell her, and she understands. He will come back after killing one of them, they can talk more after. Gunpyeong is bummed again, the woman is not believing the truth. When she leaves, Zaha calls out to her. Though she has taken the purple haze curse poison, the choice is hers alone. She can side with the great Rakshasa, get the antidote, and also reveal Zaha's identity to him. She wonders what she will gain from her fake brother winning, which is nothing much. She just won't have to watch any more of the great Rakshasa's pathetic state as he orders his disciples to get him young women, money, kill someone, or steal something. The red monkey turns and then she is off. So Gunpyeong joins his union master. The purple haze curse poison was made half-assly, he wonders if it'll be alright. Gunpyeong just got some laxatives and digestive medication and made it into a ball. She might shit herself while she is running. As expected of pavilion master So Gunpyeong, he is quite meticulous. The red monkey is off on her new mission running. The red monkey is speeding through the streets like a flash when she suddenly feels sick, she wonders if that is because she ate the cursed poison. Her face clenches, 
swearing at the bastard black rabbit union master for making hers eat something like that. Say abruptly remembers Zaha's statement about her not having to watch any more of Great Rakshasa's pathetic state as he orders his disciples to get him, young women, money, kill something or steal someone. The red monkey can't believe that Zaha expects her to risk her life and betray her master just because of something like that. She grins, calling Zaha a crazy bastard when she suddenly freezes. Her stomach is getting worse. She is still in place, hoping it isn't what she thinks it is, but boom. Her stomach explodes. This is diarrhea. Even with an excruciatingly painful stomach ache, her situation is getting worse in the middle of the street. She promises to whatever god exists to be good for the rest of her life. Her vision blurs and she sees two men passing by her, and a filthy smell emits from her. She closes her eyes in humiliation, it just had to happen in a place like this. She grabs her stomach a walk a few steps, just to get to a place where no one is around. She grits her teeth and concentrates all her energy into her sphincters. Finally, away from the people in a secluded forest, she looks around her before deciding to relieve this demon inside of her. But suddenly, she notices movements from somewhere. Someone is approaching her quickly. The person's speed is as good as hers, so that person must be a master. A man appears in white robes appears above her in the air just before he lands on his feet in front of her. Zaha stands in front of her in all his glory, without a mask. Lian asks this young lady red monkey if something is wrong, and that her face is pale. She tells him that it's poison but shuts up, she can't just tell a person of Jianghu that she has been poisoned. Her head drops and she tells the man with long hair and white robes that she is looking for a washroom. This is a predicament. The man crouches and tells her to hop on his back. He was just heading to his regular store. If she is not going to take care of business deep in the woods, then he will take her there quickly. The red monkey leaves herself in the man's care and hops on. Zaha zings up with the speed of light, well on their way. He tells her to stay calm, and that she can overcome any adversity as long as she stays calm. The red monkey notices that the man's speed is that of a master's, he has a nice voice too. She wonders where a young master like him appeared from. They arrive at the store the man mentioned and the red monkey hurries to a washroom at the back. The store they are at is none other than Springtime in Zaha's good friend Duke's store. Inside the washroom, the red monkey takes care of business loudly and bites her fingers to prevent any noise from escaping. Done with relieving herself, the red monkey walk outside, embarrassed. There is no way she can look the man in the eyes, he must have heard the noises from the washroom. She swings open a door and walks inside. The man asks her if she is alright. She is alright indeed and bows to him in gratitude. Zaha sits with a bowl of pork ribs in front of him. He sure has good luck when it comes to food, Duxu would have used it on rice soup if Zaha hadn't come today either. But Zaha should have at least good luck with food when his life is full of bad luck. The red monkey watches while Zaha prepares to dig in. She beams. The food he is having looks so delicious she is drooling. Duxa tells her that they are pork ribs. Zaha digs in with enthusiasm. Duxa tells the red monkey to not just keep standing but have a bite as well. She tells him it is okay. Her stomach isn't feeling too well. He drags a plate towards her and tells her to have just one bite. It does look delicious. The red monkey contemplates taking just one bite. Duxa tells her to hold the bone with her hands and eat it. The red monkey settles down at the table and chews a bite. It is super delicious. Duxa bends to whisper in Zaha's ear asking what his relationship is with up. Zaha bluntly replies that she is his sister and the red monkey suddenly freezes in realization. Sister, now that she hears that this voice, all the humiliating events that took place with Zaha play across her mind. She shrieks in disbelief. Zaha pushes aside a strand of hair and smiles. He must be that shockingly handsome to garner such a reaction. The red monkey recalls again that she was piggybacked by this bastard and took a massive shit in front of him, and she faints from shock and embarrassment. How rude. She passed out from looking at her brother. Or not, perhaps she passed out from how delicious these pork ribs are. Dusksu is unsurprised when he hears that Izaha is now the Black Rabbit Union Master. Zaha tells him that the passed out woman on the ground is one of the twelve heavenly generals, Red Monkey. Duxu now understands why Zaha called her his sister and tells him to take care of his new sister. Duxu finds her quite pretty as well. Zaha's eyes glint, could this be love at first sight? Duxu tells Zaha to shut up and quit spouting bullshit. 
Zaha turns to address the passed out woman on the ground. Guess she is still able to sleep when she has only 10 days left. But she sits up abruptly, she will finish her task within 10 days. The red monkey stands up and thanks Duxa for the pork ribs. Duxa smiles wide and tells her it is no problem. She quickly takes her leave then but sneaks a glance back and spots Zaha signing to her. After 10 days, she dies. She shivers, turns back, and leaves running. That crazy bastard is quite scary. Izaha stands up to leave as well. He will take a look around at the Iliang prefecture after a while. With a final goodbye wave to Duxu, he leaves. Out in the streets, Zaha strolls leisurely. His body feels much lighter after training in Qigong after such a long time. It reminds him of the quick party that he joined in the past. The quick party is the mysterious force that most people of Jianghu do not know of. You can enter when your Qigong reaches its peak, and it was full of lunatics who only trained their Qigong to death. They competed against each other in Qigong regardless of which sect they were in. All to obtain the title given to one person, the quickest one. In actuality, they called it the Quick King, or Quick Party Leader. Though Zaha became one of the Quick Party members in his past life due to his exceptional Qigong skills, he could not rise to the seat of the Quick King. Back in the present, Zaha smirks. He is looking forward to meeting the Quick Party members that he knew again. Zaha soon reaches the Zaha in construction site and Jianpeng greets him, addressing him as his youngnim. The construction had heard that Zaha barged into the Black Rabbit Union from what Sungtae told him. Zaha sent the Black Rabbit Union master to heaven since he said he had something to do there, and the responsibility was passed down to Zaha. Zaha smiles and asks if anyone is causing trouble in the prefecture, and about the Black Reconnaissance's movements. Jianpeng tells Zaha that Sima soldier frequently patrols Iliang prefecture with his subordinates. So no one even has the leeway to cause any trouble. Zaha is smiling throughout the exchange and inquires about Cha Sungtae. Jianpeng tells Zi Zaha that Sungtae sparred against soldier Sima with a wooden sword and was beaten disgracefully, so he's training these days. He already lost 10 out of 10 times. It's become quite a famous attraction, so whenever soldier Sima and Cha Sungtae fight, lots of spectators gather to watch. Zaha sighs mockingly. Sungtae calls himself the clan leader of the Life Clan and gets himself beaten up. Zaha feels embarrassed for him. Zaha gives Jianpeng a small bag and it contains gold plates. Zaha tells him to keep the plates with him and buy people drinks from time to time. They work for a living, but they'll get hurt if they work too hard. Jianpeng is happy but worried that Zaha is still giving him too many gold plates. But there are a lot of members in the construction clan. He can use it however he sees fit. With that, Zaha is off. Jianpeng bows to him in gratitude and Zaha leaves, the group of men celebrating merrily behind him. Zaha makes his way through a path in the forest and passes a group of men. The leader of the group is a man with long cinnamon hair, and he calls out to Yi Zaha. Zaha turns to them. The men are sure that he is Yi Zaha. Zaha asks if they are dregs from Black Reconnaissance. Another short man whispers to their leader asking him what they should do. They don't know Yi Zaha would be in the prefecture. They heard he left for quite a while. They came to cause a mess since they heard Zaha wasn't at Iliang prefecture. The Dark Faction uses this tactic frequently. They torment the people around one to leave him nowhere to run. The leader comes forward, introducing himself as Dok Gozing of the Black Reconnaissance. Gok heard that Zaha killed Nung Jiziek, Wai Sienwu, and Gu Yangsu. The master of the Black Reconnaissance put a bounty of 30 gold plates on Zaha's head. It was commissioned by the Tiger Roar Union and the three sword-selling men. They were on their way to put up a wanted document in the Iliang Prefecture as well but Zaha can read it directly. Another man walks forward to give Zaha the parchment. Zaha knows that it is common courtesy to not receive anything the dark faction gives someone. The man still has his hand stretched out, scroll in hand, but Zaha makes no move to take it. The men get anxious that Zaha isn't taking it, he needs to take it. The leader supplies that they were looking for him since there was a rumor that he disappeared from the Iliang prefecture. If Zaha comes back to the black reconnaissance directly, the reconnaissance aster will withdraw the bounty on him after paying the tiger roar and the three sword selling men adequately. The leader wonders what Saha will do. Izaha observes that there are too many people to just post a wanted document. The leader says that is just because they heard of Zaha's skills and wanted to stick together. Zaha sighs tiredly, that is an acceptable excuse. There are days when Zaha feels strange. 
There are days when he doesn't feel a thing after beating many people to death and days when he tries to avoid killing for no reason. Today is one of those days. He doesn't know the reason either. He wouldn't be called the crazy demon if his actions were consistent. He contemplates what to do. Finally, Zaha turns away. He doesn't feel like going to meet their reconnaissance master right now, though he will visit him soon. The leader glares and warns Zaha. It will be good for Zaha to come with them now. Izaha stills and turns with a threatening glare. The leader said his name was Dok Gozing. Why is he trying to die with his subordinates? But how are they supposed to handle that attitude of Zaha after he killed Nung Jiziak, Wai Xianwu, and Gu Yangsu, and then tell them that he will come and explain himself at a later date? Suddenly, the reconnaissance men pull out their weapons. It is the same, whether Zaha kills them all now and visits the Black Reconnaissance later or whether he comes with them to the Black Reconnaissance Fort now. If Zaha keeps postponing his visit, he will have to face the Tiger Roar Union and the Three Sword Selling Men. Whichever Zaha chooses, it'll still be an annoyance to him. Zaha smiles and the leader suddenly realizes that this bastard is not afraid of death. Izaha turns and heads to the Black Reconnaissance Fort together with the MEN.IT is sad. In this life, when Zaha wears a mask, he is the Black Rabbit Union Master that develops the forces of the Dark Faction. And when he takes off his mask, he becomes the crazy demon once again. A boat sways in the Hornless Dragon River, several men on board. Izaha turns towards the sun and bids farewell to his hometown. He is off to make some money. He will return after he makes it big. The other men on board glare silently at Zaha, while he speaks about welcoming him when he returns. With that, the errand boy left on a boat. Zaha finally settles down, and the sweating men wonder if he is crazy. Izaha first glances at the men on his right side, and then at the men on his left. They are all so ugly. He wonders if they are doing such ugly things because they are ugly. One can never tell what goes on in the world. But there's this handsome guy that Zaha knows who does lots of ugly perverted acts. That man is the sex demon, the left envoy of light. Guess an ugly face has nothing to do with ugly acts. The men flinch. In any case, why are they so fucking ugly? Is it because all they see around them are ugly things that influence their faces? Ugly things as in stuff like slave auctioning. Zaha hears that the black reconnaissance dabbles in slave auctioning. A man tells Zaha to just shut up. But Zaha is not done talking, and swears at the rat-looking son of a bitch, if the fucker wants to make a living then work. What comes to his mind when he sees slaves being auctioned? The son of a bitch man grins and tells Zaha that the only thing that comes to his mind is that he should earn some money to buy a slave too. All the men burst out laughing, and suddenly, Doke rages and scream at them to shut their mouths, before he kills them all. These stupid bastards can read the mood of a master who will fight the reconnaissance master in front of them. Doke asks Zaha if he will let them live. On the other hand, Zaha stares out to the water and wonders why his madness levels are starting to rise. He is not sure if it is because he left Iliang Prefecture. Though he'd rather not live like the crazy demon from the past. Dok asks again if Zaha will let them live. Izaha coldly tells them to fight amongst themselves, and he will let the one who survives live. Dok immediately agrees, and all men stare at their unit leader in shock, but they all immediately take out their weapons. Dok charges at his men, and they all end up in a pile of bodies, blood spraying the river. As promised, Zaha will let him live. The Black Reconnaissance is full of morons nowadays and Zaha smiles. They finally reach the ancient city of Black Sand, which is the military headquarters of the Black Reconnaissance. Two men with spears stop Zaha and Dok at the dock. Dok orders them to step aside, he has brought E Zaha as per the Reconnaissance Master's orders. The two men part, and Dok orders Zaha to follow him. Inside, people watch him as he walks. They are the Black Reconnaissance civilians. It makes sense since some people were dragged here as slaves. They reach a dwelling and a man greets unit leader Dako. Dako tells the man to tell the reconnaissance master that he has brought Izaha. Zaha is the one who killed unit leader Y. The doors swing open and Zaha walks inside a meeting room. There are so many old geezers here. Why are these geezers doing all those ugly acts when they are too old to even enjoy wealth and glory? Dako announces that he has brought Izaha as per his orders. All the men in the room turn to look at the reconnaissance master, a stern old man, at the front of the room. Zaha orders an old man to move from his place because he wants to sit. 
When the old man doesn't listen, Zaha slaps him away. Everyone turns to look at Zaha, and he drags the now empathy chair to the center of the room, in plain view of everyone. A man stands up to kill Zaha for his audacity, but the fort master stops him. The first master grins and addresses Zaha, since he has come a long way, they'll get straight to the point. Zaha has killed three people in the Black Reconnaissance. The fort master heard that it was Zaha's house that was burned down. Because the Black Reconnaissance people were the ones who acted first, Zaha can leave after they cut off three of his fingers. He Zaha denies it immediately with detachedness. They can't carelessly cut the buddy given to Zaha by his parents. The fort master tries to make do with one finger and 100 tails of gold. Zaha will pay for the damages while under the Black Reconnaissance's surveillance. That is all. All the men in the room thank their fort master for his hard work and Zaha grins. The fort master is just going to end things this one-sidedly. There are so many crazy people in the world. He Zaha denies this solution too. He doesn't have that much money and he wouldn't give it to them even if he did. The reconnaissance master glares, black reconnaissance fort gets their money one way or another, and his family will have to bear the cost, which must not be alright with Zaha. Zaha tells him that he doesn't have a family. He longs for one today as well. He also longs for some noodle soup. The men in the room flinch. If he doesn't have a family, then they will demand it from the people of Iliang Prefecture. The fort master is so annoying. Then Zaha also makes a judgment. He gives the old geezer two options. The fort master can either get over to Zaha on his knees and lick his feet, or everyone in the room will die. Everyone jerks in shock. Diako concludes that Zaha is out of his mind. He is not only provoking only the fort master, but even all of the others. The bearded elder who stood up before screams at Zaha and all the other elders stand up and take out their weapons. How dare Zaha insult them? Zaha's mouth forms a thin line and he stands up from the chair. The fort master calls Zaha a fool. He gave Zaha a chance but he insists on spilling blood. But the foolish one is the fort master. Zaha gave him a chance to live but he insists on spilling blood. The fort master tilts his neck and gives the order to kill Zaha. All elders charge at Izaha at the same time, weapons out. Zaha darts sideways to dodge one attack and punches the attacker man hard, who goes down flying. The brown bearded elder attacks next, and Zaha meets him just in time to block and counter with a forceful open handed jab. Another man swings a spear and Zaha dodges and counters. The man goes flying to the far wall. A weapon comes flying at Zaha, and he twists his hands and pushes to send the weapon to the wall. More men charge at him, and Zaha grabs an errant sword and swings. Both men fall dead. Every elder stops in their footsteps, cowering, and Daka clenches his teeth in fear. When no elder makes any move to attack further, Zaha moves to them. He lunges ahead and slashes his sword in an arc, slicing men left and right. He twists and shoots people away with his energy, and swings again in a series of complicated moves until all men end up dead. Blood drips from Zaha's sword and only the fort master and Daka remain alive in the room. The fort master commends his dead companions on work done well. Zaha tells him to stop acting so pompous when all he did was watch his subordinates die while waiting for Zaha to tire himself out. The fort master's eyes throw in fury and he jumps. The men's swords clash in the middle. The fort master attacks first in a cross arc and Zaha counters with his own attack. The energy explodes and the smoke parts to reveal the men still fighting. They parry and dodge and block and counter. The fort master attacks once more and Zaha finally deals his finishing blow. The room explodes and the ground crumbles. Daka covers his eyes to prevent rubble from getting in his eyes. The smoke parts again and the men are still fighting, swords mashed together and hands trembling. Suddenly Zaha's sword breaks. Zaha's broken sword goes flying and the fort master grins. Zaha has no weapon now, and the fort master swings his weapon in a vicious arc Zaha dodges and uses the great absorption technique to grab another errant sword in the room. Daka's eyes widen with shock as the sword is drawn towards Zaha, and Zaha and the fort master collide again. Zaha smirks and his eyes glint coldly. He didn't have a weapon but then he did. Unimpressed, the fort master swings his twin swords again in a wide slash, and Zaha counters with a vicious attack of his own. The men attack and dodge and attack again until they become just a flurry of movements. The fight is inconceivable to any ordinary person. Zaha acknowledges that the fort master fights well, 
and he is as strong as Dako Singh if he trained in the blade for 40 years. Zaha blocks one swipe of an attack and counters again. The men's weapons meet in a blur and Zaha's eyes glint and narrow. The fort master looks to be unwell. Although it's faint, his movements aren't good either. His breathing is also rough. Both men charge again at the same time. The fort master's breaths are heavy, and Zaha makes a grab for his face, but he jumps. Zaha jumps to meet the fort master and attacks viciously. Energies collide and the subsequent explosion blocks everyone's vision. The mist parts to reveal the fort master kneeling on the ground, his weapon barely blocking Zaha's killing blow. Yuzaha pushes out his hand again towards Fort Master's face. Energy accumulates and twists harshly. A furious blot of magenta energy shoots at the Fort Master and he goes flying. Zaha pulls his hand back again to gather force, as well as his sword, and both hands shoot out together. The sword pierces the Fort Master harshly and reappears neatly on the other side. The Fort Master is knocked back to the far wall and he spurts out thick spools of blood. Dako is baffled and intimidated. The few injured but alive elders stare in shock and fear that Zaha was able to take down the Fort Master so easily. Zaha walks to the near-dead Fort Master who pleads for his life. The Fort Master tries to convince Zaha to allow his subordinates to treat him and he will then appoint Zaha as the next Fort Master. Zaha has nothing to lose from this. Rather, if he kills the Fort Master now, he will not be able to completely take over the Black Reconnaissance, Black Pearl Fort. And since all of the elders are nothing but imbeciles, the Fort Master has to lead them. Yuzaha looks down at the Fort Master patronizingly. He is speaking an awful knot. He must not want to die. Zaha asks the Fort Master if he lived a good life from the money he earned from kidnapping people, selling slaves and making his subjects' lives a living hell. He must have killed countless people who begged for their lives just like this. Magenta energy begins to gather in Zaha's claw-like hand. Trash like the Fort Master is better off dead and he crushes the Fort Master's face with his bare hand. Blood splashes the wall behind. Tangible fear radiates from Dako who has been watching this, and the elders. Izaha twists his neck to the remaining audience, and they flinch with cowardice. Dako grits his teeth and tells him that Zaha has to become the next Fort Master now. Zaha pushes out one finger and beckons Dako to him. Dako obliges and walks over to Zaha. As soon as Dako reaches him, Zaha slaps Dako so hard on the face that he crashes to the ground from the force. Zaha pulls Dako up by his hair and threateningly warns him to stop fucking with Zaha if he doesn't want Zaha to send him to the Fort Master's side. Dako suddenly faces Zaha in a moment of foolish bravery and asks him what else he is supposed to do now that Zaha has killed his Fort Master. Zaha remembers the Fort Master's words about someone having to lead all these imbeciles. What a troublesome force indeed. Zaha abruptly lets Dako go and tells him to come to the hall after gathering everyone directly under the executives. Zaha orders him to have the elders who were lucky enough to live treated. Living people should live after all. Zaha turns away, annoyed. If this was a force entirely made up of people of Jianghu like the Black Rabbit Union, he would have easily been able to absorb it. But because the force is too blended in with the public, one can't even tell whether someone's a person of Jianghu or not. Zaha settles himself in the former Fort Master's perch at the head of the room, his face and dress bloody. Guess there's a price for beating someone to death. All the people Zaha called for gather in the hall. Zaha presides over everyone and decides to be brief. For Zaha, the best option is to appoint a Fort Master and have the entire Black Pearl Fort under his command. The men stare at him silently. Yuzaha will appoint Dako Singh as the next Fort Master. Dako's first job as the Fort Master is to mobilize everyone available to destroy the old rampart. Everyone is confused about why the rampart needs to be destroyed. Zaha explains to them that they might believe that the rampart keeps them safe, but it's completely useless against the martial masters of Jianigu. The fact that the Black Pearl Fort Master, the strongest among them, could not hold on to his life is proof of that. Also, because they are so closed off, they don't even converse with anyone outside the rampart. They need to understand what Zaha is saying for things to change. Zaha wonders if the foolish guys sitting in front of him even understand that. Zaha is so tired, but he tells them to begin by taking down that rampart anyway. He orders them to go outside more often too as the world is wider than the Black Pearl Fort. The men agree obediently. Also, when Zaha comes to visit next time and if he sees that they are still running slave auctions or collecting loans from gambling debts, 
or if there is anything that rubs him the wrong way, Dako suddenly flinches, he will first kill Dako Singh, and continue by killing every single one of the captains whose faces he remembers. Everyone jerks at that proclamation, and Zaha smiles and tells them that they can then send Zaha's regards to the former fort master when they go to the afterlife. Everyone is silent, and one man raises his hand to ask for more details on the method. Zaha is immediately annoyed and pissed off, he told them this much already, so what method? What the hell has he been listening to? Also, he should think about the details on his own. If he can't even do that then the son of a bitch should just go clean up the bodies and destroy the rampart with the other henchmen, and not just sit there calling himself a captain while asking Zaha how to do his job. The man sweats and looks down. It is because of men like him ending up as captains that their organization ended up this way. Zaho irritatingly orders all the men to ask the fucker who just asked the question about any details before doing anything. The men hesitantly agree. Zaha orders them to abandon the Black Pearl Fort name and report to him after they decide on a new name for themselves. And they are not to use the word Black in the new name, they couldn't make it any more obvious that they are from the Black faction. Another man with big and round cartoonish eyes raises his hand and asks if they can use the word White instead. Zaha turns towards the cartoon man, expression pissed off, does he think they are from the white faction? He knows they aren't yet he still asks something like that. Even the method of naming one's force has a right and wrong. Zaha finally orders them to not ask any more questions until the meeting is over. This whole ordeal is so tiring and Zaha orders them to reduce their rules to three. He wants them to cut their over hundred rules to three, they are too many. If they really need to add more, they are to discuss the pros and cons amongst themselves before adding any. He orders them to also get rid of the toll and release the people they've captured. They are to burn all the documents related to bounties or whatever, and captains are not to take the money from the Fort Master storage for themselves. They are to use that money for the people who have been having a hard time and build houses here damn properly. They are to employ some people from outside and erect some buildings. Everyone is immediately tense and silent so Zaha asks why the atmosphere has changed. One man tells him that Captain Daku used to say that a lot before, though it is not the same, it's very similar. Every man has heard this before from time to time, and Zaha turns to look at Daku. Zaha and Daku stare at each other, and Zaha tells him to do his best, which Daku will. He also orders Daku to get Zaha a change of clothes as his are too bloody. The night falls and Izaha arrives back at the Black Rabbit Union headquarters. The men welcome their union master back with deep bows, and Zaha passes by them with a nod of acknowledgement. Finally inside, Zaha wonders why it is so quiet. Perhaps his bastard men are slacking off on training after he let them be for a second. Adnan Bayak comes running to Zaha with a notebook in hand, welcoming Zaha back. Zaha asks him why everything is so quiet, and why no one is training. Administrator Bayak tells him that it's not that, but that the gold boar is here. One of the twelve heavenly generals, Gold Pig is at the Black Rabbit Union. Izaha ascends the steps and walks inside the house with steady footsteps. According to the Conquest Collection, Gold Boar is the man no one knows whether became Gold Boar because of his gluttony or if he is gluttonous because he is the Gold Boar. His martial ability is around the 7th to the 8th rank, and he is known to have become the great Rakshasa's disciple due to his physical strength and body condition. It is assumed that he is a young master of a rich merchant group and offers the most money to the great Rakshasa. Zaha swings open the door and enters the room where the gold boar is waiting for him. Zaha walks inside to see a whole ass feast served to a fat man in yellow robes alone, who is enthusiastically chewing on some chicken. The fatty's mask is pushed up and he eats chicken from one hand and something else from the other. This is the gold boar. Izaha and the gold boar's eyes meet and the gold boar orders Zaha to fetch him some water from behind. Zaha glares and his eyes droop. Something drastic is about to happen. Zaha stares as the gold boar asks for water again. Zaha snatches the water jug from the table's end and walks over to the gold boar and pours him a glass of water. If the gold boar barged in unannounced like this and is willing to show this kind of state, it must mean that he was not afraid of the black rabbit, who Zaha is currently pretending to be. The golf boar has never seen him before and asks the unmasked Zaha if he knows where the black rabbit, the union master went. He went to heaven of course but the boar doesn't know that. Abruptly, Zaha turns away and walks out of the room. The gold boar is irritated at his arrogance, 
If this wasn't the Black Rabbit Union, he would have done something to Zaha. But Zaha is no longer in the room to listen to him talk. Outside the room, Edmund Bayak meets Zaha again. Bayak has prepared some clothes since he believed Zaha would need them. The gold boar lets out a loud burp just as the Union Master, Zaha in the rabbit mask, enters the room. The gold boar turns to greet his brother rabbit. It has been a while since they last saw each other. Ignoring him, Zaha asks him what the piggy bitch wants. Gold boar is annoyed and Zaha wonders if this isn't how he is supposed to address the boar. Zaha reverts back and asks the boar's purpose to be here. The gold boar tells him that his merchant group has gained an elixir. Since Zaha's battle with brother white rooster is coming up, the boar thought he'd ask if Zaha has any intention to buy it at a reasonable price. Zaha is curious. The elixir is a 300-400 year white flame herb. Since gold boar knows that Zaha is a trustworthy customer, he will sell it to Zaha for 50 gold ingots. He'll even throw in 10 boxes of regular white flame herb. Zaha tells him to bring them to him. The gold boar believes that Zaha has made a wise decision, but he was going to make the same deal with brother white rooster had the black rabbit refused. In other words, the gold boar will change sides whenever the situation calls for it. Zaha keeps being reminded that the interpersonal relationships here are a complete shitshow. 50 gold ingots. The more useful the elixir, the more expensive it is. Zaha closes his eyes in concentration to think. From this moment on, Zaha will completely erase the assets of the Iliang Prefecture and the Black Rabbit Union from his mind. He has no money. He just doesn't. Even if he does, he doesn't. Zaha gets into the mindset of not giving money even if he has it, and his eyes glint open. He feels such peace of mind. Zaha walks to where the gold boar is exhibiting the elixir. It is hard to acquire elixirs like these, and it's just as hard to store them. Zaha should use them as soon as possible. Zaha picks up one regular white herb and swallows it. Zaha tells the gold boar that the elixir is alright, and from the looks of it, it seems to the boar that Zaha has eaten a white flame herb before. Zaha has had a bunch of white flame herbs in his past life. The problem is the 100-year white flame herb. There's no way that the gold boar would just let Zaha eat it as he did with the regular one. Izaha tells Administrator Bayak to examine it. The boar wonders if Admin Bayak knows how to examine elixirs and Zaha tells him not to look down on Administrator Bayak. Zaha announces that Administrator Bayak is an elder of Jianghu who has dedicated over 30 years of his life to the Jianghu. He is a legendary elixir judge. Bayak bows with feigned humility. Elixir expert the wizard of elixirs, the wise master in the field of elixirs, and an elixir genius. Admin Bayak huffs in his bow, and Zaha continues about how Bayak can find elixirs 100 miles high in the sky, and even smell elixirs from 100 miles away. He became a man of Jianghu solely to appraise elixirs, that is who administrator Bayak is. The gold boar is impressed by the list of Admin Bayak's achievements. Admin Bayak dons on gloves and moves to examine the three roots of the 100-year white flame. He sniffs the elixir and darts left and right to examine it, and then tells the men that all three roots have the same scent. However, if they look at the bottom, a part of the root has been awkwardly torn, it seems that someone has had a taste of this root. The gold boar flinches and then begins raging, he told Bayak to appraise it, but what kind of bullshit is he spouting? Admin Bayak should just tell whether it is genuine or not. The boar is being generous by handing over three roots for 50 gold ingots. Admin Bayak bows an apology and tells Zaha that the white flame herb is genuine, and it wouldn't be easy to obtain something of this quality even if Zaha sends someone to Namlin County to get some. And above all, because it is difficult to transport, if there were around five or six roots, Heavenly General Gold Boar would have asked for at least 100 gold ingots. The Gold Boar smiles. He thought that Administrator Bayak was just some perverted artist, but he sees now that Bayak's knowledge of elixirs is also deep. Zaha orders the boar to confirm the money set aside in a box and take it. The gold ingots seem to be the right amount, and the gold boar orders his men to load the box into the carriage. The boar turns to see Zaha aggressively chewing the white flame herb which is certainly genuine. The gold boar is shocked that Zaha is eating it right now and tells him that no matter how rushed one is, he should go to a quiet room to make cultivation preparations or something. But because of the Heavenly Pearl, Zaha has no need to cultivate right after eating elixirs anymore. The Heavenly Pearl absorbs the elixir's energy, and Zaha can just drag out the energy from the Heavenly Pearl through cultivation whenever he has the time. 
He is probably the only person in Jianghoho accumulates energy like this. The gold boar tells Admin Bayak to tighten their security more than usual as Brother Black Rabbit, Saha, must cultivate for the whole day, and leaves. As soon as the gold boar is gone, Admin Bayak turns to Zaha and asks if it is really alright for Zaha not to begin cultivation right away. It is alright and Zaha removes his mask and asks the other executives whereabouts. The executives are standing by at various points of gold boar's route. That is indeed good, and Zaha smiles crookedly, ready to go reclaim their money. Admin Bayak worries that it'll become an issue to do something so suddenly without a plan. But Zaha is not someone who makes plans anyway. What's more important is having the courage to steal the money, the will to steal it no matter what, the spirit, fearlessness, aggressiveness, and an assertive stance. Admin Bayak is enlightened and he shall bear Zaha's wise words in his mind. Zaha walks out, telling his brother Boar to wait for him. Zaha is coming to meet him. The gold Boar's carriage is on its way back, and the horse's hoofs clack loudly on the concrete. Inside the carriage, a man thanks the gold Boar for his hard work saying everything went according to plan. Since they sold three roots to the black rabbit, if they sell four roots to the white rooster, the boar would be able to raise the stakes and take it all for himself, and the black rabbit won't even know why he lost again. Suddenly, the carriage jostles as the horses panic, creating a frenzy. The wheels screech and the carriage careens to a stop. The gold boar swears from inside the carriage, and the second man asks the coachman what is going on. The driver tells that a carriage that stopped to change wheels is blocking the road. The gold boar rages. They should have parked their carriage on the roadside if they wanted to change their wheels. What the hell are they doing? The second man with the top hat steps out to confirm the situation and the boar tells the man to give their coachman a good slap across their faces. A group of men stand around the second carriage. It is not like they wanted to block the road. As soon as those words leave a man, the top hat man slaps him across the face so hard that he falls, and he kicks another man. The top hat man is pissed off that they dare block his young lord, the gold boar's way. Suddenly, Zaha comes flying from behind and kicks the top hat man so hard on his back that he thumps into the far tree. How dare someone lay a hand on the coachman of the house sect, the ignoble clan. The two men who were beaten down tell their union master Zaha that they were just disguised as coachmen. The gold boar walks outside from the carriage, masked and furious, and wonders if Saha is not just a servant. But a servant does whatever he wants, so the boar shouldn't mind Zaha. The gold boar gets more pissed off, does Zaha think that the boar will let him live just because he is Brother Rabbit's servant? Izaha just stares at him coldly and the gold boar wonders about a mere servant like Zaha's attitude. The gold boar stares at Zaha silently and comes to his own conclusions, he believes Zaha did this on purpose. Zaha must know that the boar is great Rakshasa's disciple, as well as an affiliate of the Golden Mountain Merchant Group. If all of them are subordinates of Brother Rabbit, then the entire Black Rabbit Union will have to bear his master's wrath. If they were paid by someone to do something like this, the boar's merchant group will find out. The gold boar points one single finger at Zaha and tells him that it is clear he is not just a servant, it is easy to find out who he is with money. Abruptly, Zaha walks towards the gold boar, and he stumbles back. Zaha couldn't care less about what the boar does. Threatened, the gold boar pulls his hands back and blasts outward. Zaha counters with his own magenta energy force. The men's hands meet in the middle and the ground crumbles from the force of their energies. Their eyes meet and both of them attempt to overpower each other. The air around them crackles with power. The gold boar calls Zaha an imbecile. To think that Zaha is challenging him who has eaten countless elixirs with the merchant group's wealth, to a duel of inner chi. If it is a battle of inner chi, even if it is any of great Rakshasa's other disciples, he is confident he wouldn't lose. Suddenly, a claw of crimson black energy shoots out from Zaha's hand towards the gold boar, and he flinches. This is the ability of the heavenly pearl. The tendril of crimson energy wraps around the gold boar's hand and his inner chi transfers to Zaha's body. The gold boar is confused and shocked that his inner chi is leaving his body and attempts to blast Zaha away from him. Their chis collide and the ground smashes to crumbles, cracking the boar's mask in half. The gold boar begins sweating profusely, as Zaha and his tendril of power are not coming off him. The heavenly pearl absorbs the opponent's chi more mercilessly than Zaha expected. The gold boar is being forced back, his body crumbling. If Zaha stops this rashly, he might receive an internal injury from Gold Boar's palm art. 
but if he doesn't stop at the right moment, Gold Boar will lose his life. It's not a serious issue if Gold Boar dies since Saha was planning on killing all the 12 heavenly generals anyway, but he doesn't want Boar's vengeful spirit or soul to latch onto the heavenly pearl. If that happens, he will be no different from the demon cult's leader. Zaha sighs and calls back his chi. It bursts and knocks the gold boar back. But Zaha expertly gets the energy and the heavenly pearl under control, bringing his hands together and shrinking the power into a tiny little ball. Blue-faced and nearly dead gold boar lies on the ground. Zaha alone stands victorious. He came to steal some money, but he ended up stealing up some inner chi. The gold boar wonders just what Zaha did to him. Obviously, Zaha saved him out of the kindness of his own heart. The gold boar blanches at Zaha's view of the situation. Meanwhile, Zaha is sure that there are no fighters more chivalrous than him in the world. Zaha orders his men to check the gold boar's carriage. Now that he has started this, he might as well steal everything. The gold boar screams at them to stop as there are items in that carriage that will go to the heavenly general white rooster. Is Zaha sure he can handle the consequences? Hearing the white rooster's name, Zaha just orders his men to make sure they take everything. While the men are carrying the stuff, Zaha spots the box which had the hundred-year herb. He orders his men to bring that small box to him. The gold boar shouts at Zaha that he can't take that, but Zaha does that a man brings the box to Zaha and opens it to reveal four white flame herb roots. Zaha glares at the gold boar, whose way of business sure is unpleasant. He sold black rabbit three roots but he was going to sell four to white rooster. Zaha lists that the gold boar engages in martial death match gambling as well as match fixing, and he is taking this chance to completely ruin the black rabbit, but the boar demands proof of this accusation. Zaha walks forward and punches the fucker right in his face, he has no proof. Zaha tells the boar that if the black rabbit union master finds out about this, then he would gather all his subordinates to attack the golden mountain merchant group. The gold boar grabs his bruised cheek with a trembling hand. His master, the great Rakshasa, wouldn't stand for that. Zaha's eyes glint and he declares that the great Rakshasa would stand for it and there's a reason for that. One of Zaha's men raises his hand to state the reason. The great Rakshasa would stand still if they give him about half of the golden mountain merchant group's wealth to him. Zaha tells the man that he passes and the man celebrates. The gold boar just stares and Zaha asks his men for their opinion on whether he should tattle to the Black Rabbit Union or the Great Rakshasa. Two of the men have no problem either way and a third man suggests that they should tell both, but that would be boring. Zaha is doing this to try and enjoy his life, but telling both would be boring. Zaha turns to the Heavenly General Gold Boar and asks him which option will it be. Zaha tells him to hurry up and choose already, Biarararayanji with his hands impatiently. The gold boar asks Zaha what he wants. If he had a grudge against the boar, then he would be dead already. Perhaps Zaha wants money. Suddenly, a voice comes from behind the men, informing Zaha of her return. The men turn abruptly and come face to face with a haggard-looking red monkey, a distinct green heavenly general's mask in hand. The gold boar is shocked to see the red monkey here, and she is unsurprised to see that the gold pig got caught as well. Reaching Zaha, the red monkey hands Zaha a green and black animal mask. She failed in her ambush, but she fought the heavenly general, who is in heaven now, and rearranged the rankings. Zaha commends her on work done well. The red monkey pleads with Zaha to take pity on her sister and give her the antidote. The gold boar watches in shock, thinking that the red monkey is Zaha's blood sister. The red monkey continues speaking about how she can't fight properly because she has to go to the bathroom all the time due to diarrhea. The gold boar's mouth drops even more, wondering why the red monkey is talking about diarrhea all of a sudden. Izaha tells sister monkey that she did good and that he will keep his promise. From behind, the boar abruptly speaks up and asks Zaha just who is he. Before Zaha could reply, the red monkey lunges and slaps the boar hard on his cheek. How dare he show such disrespect to his martial brother? The gold boar is confused by the word brother and Zaha once again praises his sister and the red monkey bows and thinks. The gold boar is still confused. Zaha turns back to his companions and commands them to load all the boxes back into gold boar's carriage. The rest of them can clean up and go back and they are to take the unconscious top hat man and free him later. The black rabbit union master, Izaha, orders the gold boar to call over his coachman. The three of them have somewhere to go together. When the gold boar doesn't obey, Zaha just glances at the red monkey, 
and she walks over to the gold pig threateningly, warning him to not question their brother, and slaps him again just for the fun of it. Zaha interrupts them and declares that Marshall's siblings shouldn't beat each other up like that so much. The red monkey immediately vows to keep that in mind. Zaha's hand whooshes up and he puts the green and black mask on his face. The gold boar is shocked and confused about what Zaha is planning to do. The red monkey immediately bows and greets her brother dog. Zaha is impressed that she is so fast on the uptake. The red monkey abruptly turns her neck to glare at the gold boar, and he immediately follows suit and greets brother dog too. Zaha, now disguised as brother dog, commands them to be at ease. The gold boar frowns and wonders what in the world is this confusing situation. Zaha, the red monkey, and the gold boar travel together in the carriage while the gold boar wonders again just who really is Zaha and how he has such powerful martial arts. Not only that, the red monkey speaks her mind to even the great Rakshasa, but she's acting so cautious towards Zaha. Abruptly, Zaha calls out to the pig and tells him that he is thinking way too loudly. Just because he is smart doesn't mean that he can figure out everything in the world. The red monkey raises her hand to hit the gold pig again, and he flinches and shouts in understanding, he will empty his mind. The trio reach the Moong clinic, and a few men escort the injured gold boar inside. A doctor immediately rushes to his side and orders his subordinates to carry the young lord, gold pig, inside. The doctor huffs out a gentle smile and Zaha stares at him through the eye holes in the mask. He remembers the doctor as the poison demon, Moong Beck, who saved Zaha from Chi Reflux in his past life. Moong Beck lost his entire family due to a dispute with the great Rakshasa. Someone who used to save lives becomes quite terrifying when he starts to bear resentment, and the man who proved that was the poison demon. The poison demon became stronger through his knowledge of the body and medicine, and started to research poison when that wasn't enough, he even tested poisons on his own body. After a constant cycle of poisoning and treatment, the doctor who'd become a completely different person, killed the great Rakshasa in the end. The poison demon didn't leave the great Rakshasa's disciples behind either. There were even members of the Twelve Heavenly Generals who abandoned their identity, as previous disciples of Heavenly Generals to live their lives in peace. But he found and killed them all. Zaha met him after he killed the great Rakshasa, and not only did he bear hatred towards members of Jianghu, he hated humans in general, to the point that he made an oath to never save a person ever again. He treated countless patients, but none of them helped him while he was going crazy due to their fear of the great Rakshasa. The great Rakshasa and his disciples were also once his patients. Due to this, Moong Beck started to resent humans and sank more and more into the Jianghu. The reason why Zaha is thankful for the poison demon is that he abandoned his oath to never save a person ever again and saved Zaha from Chi Reflux. The man who was slowly going crazy may have sympathized with Zaha, who had already gone crazy a long time ago. Zaha guesses that it is a kind of sympathy that only crazy people share. Guess even the poison demon had a time when he was just a normal person. Izaha snaps back into the present and tells Sister Monkey to go get treated along with Gold Boar as well. She obliges and leaves. Moyong Beck approaches Zaha. Moyong has never seen Zaha the Heavenly General before and asks him where he is hurt. Zaha removes his mask to reveal his face to Moyong though he doesn't recognize him, and Zaha smiles. There is no way Moyong Beck would recognize Zaha when they have never met in this life. He introduces himself as Yi Zaha of the Iliang Prefecture, who is a clan leader of a small group called the Ignoble Clan. Moyong confusedly asks Zaha if he is not one of the Heavenly Generals. Zaha tells him that the Ignoble Clan is currently at war with the Great Rakshasa and the original owner of the dog mask was killed by Red Monkey. Moyong wonders if the clan leader is feeling unwell then. Zaha smiles softly again, he just came to pay. He is not feeling unwell anywhere, though he was curious since he has heard of Moyong's outstanding medical skills. The doctor removes his glasses with glam and, apologizing for the late introduction, he introduces himself as Moyong Beck. Zaha moves a few steps and invites the doctor to come with him for a second. Zaha shows the white flame herb elixir to Moyong and the doctor wonders why they are here. Moyong was the one to appraise them, considering the girth of its roots and the number of sprigs, it's at least a hundred year white flame herb. Assuming them to be 300 to 400 years is a stretch though. These are quite expensive, so whatever they can find gets transported to the central plains. Even a hundred year herb is very rare these days. Zaha frowns, he knew that the gold boar lied to him, 
when he said they were at least three to four hundred years old. Zaha tells Muang that he has already eaten three roots, and the doctor congratulates him. As Zaha already knows, because the white flame herb contains a large amount of energy, he must be careful of the raging disease once he has eaten it. But Zaha is always angry so it's fine, Muang begins to sweat profusely. If Zaha has a tendency for raging, then he must be especially careful. But Zaha is letting out his anger appropriately, so he is fine. Moyong asks Zaha how he lets out his anger and tells him to feel free to speak comfortably because those who have practiced medicine are not allowed to leak patients' secrets. Zaha begins telling Moyong his story. His house caught on fire one time, it served as both a house and an inn and Zaha was boiling with rage. That is definitely something one would rage over, so he killed the arsonist. And once he did, he felt extreme peace. Later he found out that the ones that he killed were trying to raise a sect of the Black Faction with the Black Rabbit Union's permission. So the Black Rabbit Union's goons came for him and kept saying shit about whether he wanted to live or die. So he killed them too. And once he did, he again felt such peace. Moong Beck just stares at him, unsure how he should feel about this. Once Zaha did that, they sent an assassin after him. But he let the assassin live since he had guts. After the assassin and Zaha had some pork ribs together, they barged into the Black Rabbit Union. To be honest, Zaha was pretty excited. Though he had the slightest intention of letting the Black Rabbit Union master live, Zaha made him ascend because he said something that annoyed Zaha. By ascend, he means killed. And once he did that, as he expected, he felt such peace. Moyong Bek beams, Zaha the clan leader has done very well in releasing his anger. Moong can tell that just from Zaha's expression. When Zaha met the poison demon, the expression that he had after he fulfilled his revenge by killing the great Rakshasa was completely void. When the once blazing desire for revenge subsides after killing everyone, what should one live for after that? Neither the people that one loves nor the people one must kill are in this world anymore. Zaha will prevent the misfortune that will befall Moong Beck, who has helped him. Though Zaha will likely become the crazy demon again, there is no need for Moong to become the poison demon again. Zaha alone becoming crazy is enough. Suddenly, Zaha hears Red Monkey's voice repeatedly thanking someone behind the curtains to the other room and smiles. Her utmost gratitude must be coming out, now that she has hoped that only solid shit will come out of her ass instead of diarrhea. Moong comes out from behind that curtain and tells Zaha that neither of the patients suffered any major injuries so he shouldn't worry. Their injuries are on the light side, but their mental states have symptoms of instability. Especially Heavenly General Red Monkey, it seems she hasn't slept for days. She also keeps asking about what Zaha is doing right now, and she's also suffering a lot from diarrhea. Especially the diarrhea, she even begged Moong on her knees to stop the diarrhea. Moong and Zaha stare silently at each other, and Zaha reveals that he fed her sister monkey diarrhea medicine and made her think it was cursed poison. Just so Moong knows, Zaha fed her medicine that causes diarrhea, not one that stops it. Moong is unsurprised after what he heard earlier. Zaha ordered Red Monkey to kill one of the three most tyrannical twelve heavenly generals, Green Dog, Yellow Horse, or White Rat. Zaha clenches his fist and shouts that he would have had no choice but to kill Red Monkey if she continued to resist him like the Black Rabbit Union Master. Therefore, the laxative that Zaha fed her is the only thing keeping her alive. Moyong is worried when he hears the last part. This is what Zaha calls the theory of laxatives. Moyong sweats and suddenly starts mumbling in enlightenment. A laxative that saves people, he didn't know such laxatives existed. However, since she killed the green dog as ordered, Zaha requests Moyong to treat her as promised. Moyong seats himself at the table with Zaha, and Zaha decides to stop talking about shit. The conversation seems to keep getting into the topic of shit. In any case, Moong reveals that the Heavenly General Gold Boar seems to have suffered some sort of psychological shock as well, and his face has been in a ready state too. Zaha tells him that the boar lost a lot of his internal energy and money while battling him. Dr. Moong hesitates to ask Zaha a question, but Zaha tells him to feel free to ask whatever he wants. Moong finally asks if Zaha is the great Rakshasa's enemy, then why has he come to treat his disciples? Moyong Beck has pinpointed the heart of the subject and Zaha taps his fingers on the table in a walking manner and begins answering. There is a person of Jianghu, and he is walking in the same manner as Zaha's fingers. If that person kills everyone that he encounters, if they have diarrhea, 
if they farted, people worth sparing, strangers and pretty much everyone else, then he becomes a part of the demonic faction. Muang flinches in shock and concentrates on Zaha. Though that person kills cruel bastards and people who burn his house down, he spared people who'd be useful if left alive. A woman with a potty mouth, a killer paying for his meal, and a man who could not properly understand the world due to being kidnapped at a young age are people he has spared. This is not the way of the black faction, it is Zaha's attitude toward their ways. Zaha is treating people with the hope that a few of them may one day be reformed. Even if Zaha is to be betrayed later, he is willing to bear that as well. Moyong innocently asks Zaha if he is a part of the white faction then, a chivalrous fighter that people commonly talk about. But Zaha is not part of the white faction. It'd be hard for him to become one of them right now because he has no virtue whatsoever. Dr. Muang believes that not everyone in the white faction has virtue. But among them, the sect founders and first clan leaders have a high amount of virtues. They are very skilled as well. The people who lack virtue are part of the white faction because they are their disciples, and the disciples of their disciples. It's the power of heritage. On the other hand, Zaha is not. His house that burned down was an inn, and Zaha was an errand boy. Because he lacks the heritage, he needs time and effort to become part of the white faction. Moang processes this in silent contemplation, and Zaha smiles thinking about how normal he was in the past. Zaha hopes that Moang understands the difference between the demonic, black and white factions. Something makes Moang Beck jerk, and he looks up at the box which contains more than a dozen gold ingots for the treatment fee. They are too many, and it might not be the case anymore, but giving this much money to Zaha's life savior isn't a waste at all. Moyong tells him it is too much, but Zaha contradicts him by saying it's not and to please prepare a quiet place for Zaha to sleep in while he waits for the two heavenly generals' treatment to finish. Moyong picks up three gold ingots and tells Zaha that even these three are excessive but Zaha orders him to accept them. Moyong refuses again with a wide smile. Zaha observes frustratingly that Moyong Beck was already this stubborn before he became the poison demon. Zaha then requests Muang to at least take the white flame herbs as a doctor like him needs to be healthy to save lives. Now begins round two of negotiations. Dr. Muang politely tells clan leader Zaha that for him to completely absorb this white flame herb, he must cultivate energy for over 10 days. Patients come every day so how could he possibly leave them to eat these? Muang beams while Zaha pouts in dissatisfaction, he lost in a battle of words again. This is the kind of man Zaha is. A crescent moon shines on the slightly cloudy night, and a subordinate approaches Dr. Muang outside. The female informs Muang that Zaha has begun cultivating in his room and Muang tells her to pay special attention to Zaha. He seems to have some sort of rage disorder. Remembering back to Zaha unloading his story at him, Muang laughs. That diarrhea conversation keeps coming to his mind. Izaha sits on a bed, eyes closed, and deep in meditation. A voice speaks from outside asking if the clan leader is awake. Zaha opens his eyes and swings open the door to see Dr. Moong back standing with a tray in hand. Moong smiles wide and requests Zaha to have the decoction he brought. Zaha's brows fro and he contemplates taking a black medicine from the poison demon. Moong just smiles with innocence and tells Zaha to gulp the medicine all in one shot. Zaha just nods and swallows the medicine. Moyong asks Zaha how the medicine is but the only thing he can feel is his chest becoming refreshed. Meaning that he feels at peace. Moyong is glad and requests Zaha to come by to get his pulse checked from time to time, even if he is busy. Zaha states with a straight face that he will come back with a lighter heart once he kills the great Rakshasa. Just by doing that, he can prevent any mishaps from happening to Moyong back out of the blue from then on. The same morning, the two heavenly generals and Zaha take their leave from the clinic. Zaha thanks Dr. Moang for the last two days. Moang wishes the clan leader luck and requests him to feel free to come by whenever he feels unwell. Zaha wishes Moang luck too and tells him to be wary of the people of Jianghu and to contact him if anything happens, Zaha will come personally. Moang smiles and wonders what could possibly happen to a physician, just Zaha's words are enough. Zaha just stares, the bastard doesn't know that Zaha is at war so that possible thing doesn't happen. Inside the carriage, the atmosphere is the same as it was when they were arriving at the clinic. The gold boar speaks up and nervously asks Zaha for permission to return home. Zaha allows him to return home and he thanks Zaha. But the gold boar shouldn't thank Zaha because he is not letting the gold boar go. 
Red Monkey speaks up cheerfully and confirms that Saha is going to give her the antidote. Saha tells her he already did. When the Red Monkey is confused Saha tells her that the Purple Haze curse was not a poison but a laxative, and Dr. Moong should have treated her diarrhea. Red Monkey's eyes widen in shock, no wonder she had so much diarrhea. Besides that, she is mortified to think that she caused such a rampage by thinking the laxative was a cursed poison. She even fought while shitting diarrhea. Zaha warns Sister Monkey to compose herself, and she jumps and smiles placatingly. Zaha calls out Brother Boar and Sister Monkey, and they both snap to attention. Zaha asks them if they find it funny that someone like him, who is barely their acquaintance, is calling them brother and sister. They blanch and deny it, they do not find it funny. If the two of them will take the great Rakshasa's side and go against Zaha, then he will stop the carriage immediately. Since the cursed poison has been treated and their internal injuries have been treated to an extent, they are free to get off the carriage and go their separate ways. They are either Zaha's slaves nor the great Rakshasa's, so they are free to do whatever they want. Both of them contemplate this choice and Red Monkey decides that she won't get off. The gold boar's entire house may be massacred if he betrays the great Rakshasa, so he asks about Zaha's skills and the size of his forces. Zaha grins at this question, guess the gold boar is not a merchant for nothing, he is making detailed calculations by comparing their war power. The gold boar honestly apologizes, it's just that it is not only his life that's on the line. Zaha asks them if they side with the great Rakshasa and Zaha loses, will their lives be satisfactory though? The great Rakshasa will tell them to steal, bring money, and offer him, women, like he's always done. They will have no choice but to be his slaves until he dies. Comparing their war power is not important. Even if Zaha is weak, will they continue to live as slaves or will they not? That's what's important. Gold Boar was born into a rich family, and raised with everything he could possibly want, he must have some pride towards his clan. But looking at the current situation the money isn't his. His entire house is nothing but the great Rakshasa's storage. If the gold boar is truly rich, then rather than tirelessly gathering money, how he uses that money would be more important. Abruptly glancing sideways, the gold boar asks Zaha if he can buy him another meal. Zaha turns to Red Monkey and asks her answer, and she agrees to side with her brother Zaha no matter what. The gold boar flinches from shock and asks Red Monkey why she is agreeing to side with Zaha. The red monkey tells the gold boar that Zaha took her to the washroom and to a doctor, and he even fed her pork ribs. Though she was a bit sad that he fed her poison, it turned out to be a laxative. And what if the great Rakshasa feeds her poison, she would have died since it would be real poison. The great Rakshasa wouldn't take her to the washroom, and she would have shat in the bushes. It's gruesome to even think about that so she will side with Zaha. Meanwhile. Zaha coldly believes that he has once again captured a maiden's heart with a laxative. They all decide to have a meal. When the trio returns to the Black Rabbit Union, the men are training hard in the training space. All the men bow to Zaha in unity with So Gunpyeong and greet their union master. The gold boar once again jerks in shock and asks if his brother rabbit was brother dog. Zaha turns and doesn't answer him, just stares. The gold boar shakingly asks again if the servant was brother rabbit. Was it brother dog? Then finally he asks if the clan leader was the servant. By now the gold boar is sweating buckets with tension and cannot comprehend the incomprehensible situation. Looking at gold boar, it looks like he's getting chi reflux again and Zaha calls sister monkey and she automatically knows what to do. Sister monkey lunges and slaps the gold boar hard on his face and warns him to get his shit together. The gold boar gets a recollection of all the times he has been slapped by red monkey and wonders just how many times was it. Inside the Black Rabbit Union, the Red Monkey and Gold Boar dig in ravenously, working overtime to stuff their mouths with food. Zaha just stare at them for a while then addresses his sister Monkey and brother Boar, they must become stronger. There's nothing more miserable in Jianghu than being weak. The door to the dining room swings open and so Gunpyeong slips inside. So Gunpyeong informs his union master that Heavenly General's Yellow Horse, White Rat, Black Ox, and Red Goat are outside. Zaha asks if he has been found out, but Gunpyeong isn't sure yet. And they do not have forces with them, it's just the heavenly generals. Zaha wonders why they have come all at once. The gold boar supplies that heavenly general White Rooster may be coming. The rest must have come to watch a match between two of the top four heavenly generals. Izaha stands up from his chair, ready to face everyone head on. 
Zaha walks outside with the black rabbit mask on to face the heavenly generals. He arrives at the front of the house where five heavenly generals stand and four of them greet Brother Rabbit in unity. The fifth general is the white rooster and he finally greets Brother Rabbit and asks him if he has been well. He is more or less fine and asks how Brother Rooster is. The white rooster smirks calculatingly. Suddenly, three men jump over the high walls of the Black Rabbit Union and land smack on top of the gates. The rest of the three heavenly generals have arrived now too. Red Monkey and Gold Boar observe that there is something strange in the air and the way they have all swarmed here. The three newcomers are White Tiger, Green Dragon and Red Snake, and Zaha is surprised to see them here but doesn't show it. Zaha's eyes widen and another blur rolls in the air and smack dab in the middle of the yard. The man stands up and Zaha flinches in shock to see the great Rakshasa here. Red Monkey and Gold Boar blanch in fear when they see their master here. All of the heavenly generals bow simultaneously and greet their master, the great Rakshasa. Zaha straightens up from his bow and wonders why the great Rakshasa is here. Surprisingly, the great Rakshasa came because he was bored and he orders White Rooster and Black Rabbit, E. Zaha, to fight. Zaha descends the staircase and reaches the open space where they will fight. The great Rakshasa calls the fourth heavenly general, White Rooster, and instead of ordering him to fight, he tells the White Rooster to step aside because the Black Rabbit isn't someone the fourth general can handle. The White Rooster flinches in shock but obliges. The Great Rakshasa contemplates that the match list is mistaken and orders White Tiger, Green Dragon and Red Snake to face the Black Rabbit all at once. Everyone in the yard trembles with fear but the three heavenly generals oblige their master and land on the ground with a resounding thud. The Great Rakshasa declares the match. Today, three of the four heavenly generals will face the fifth heavenly general, who seems to be making rapid improvements in martial arts skills all at once. The martial battle will be a death match, so it's killing or being killed. He forbids the rest of the disciples from interfering in the martial battle. Zaha smirks under his mask, just look at this cunning elder of Jianghu. He must have noticed something. Zaha raises his hand and calls out to their master. The great Rakshasa asks him if he shamelessly has something to say. Zaha tells him that the match list is a bit wrong. The great Rakshasa wonders if he should take one out or maybe also add White Rooster. Zaha is free to do as he likes. Hearing this, Zaha bursts out laughing and laughs loudly nonstop. When his fits of laughter finally subside, Zaha tells the old geezer that in a death match, the master should participate directly instead of pushing his disciples into it. Silence follows Zaha's words and only one thought goes through everyone's minds he's fucked. The great Rakshasa did think that the black rabbit had gotten stronger beyond belief, but that's not something his disciple would say and he orders the bastard rabbit to show his face. Zaha tells the great Rakshasa that he is not his slave and calls him a perverted geezer. Why is he making someone he just met take something off? Alarms dawn on every face and the great Rakshasa chuckles and orders all top four heavenly generals to come forward. Zaha provokes him by saying that he is just gonna force his disciples to fight while he falls back. Great Rakshasa, why must he fight so dirtily? If the four heavenly generals come at Zaha simultaneously, he will run away. For everyone's information, Zaha's Qinggong is more exceptional than his martial arts. They can all play a game of tag throughout heaven and earth. However, if the great Rakshasa himself challenges Zaha, he will accept a one-on-one -on -one battle with him like a man. And just so he knows, the rumor that the great Rakshasa avoided a one-on-one -on -one battle will be spread throughout Nanhua County because Zaha is quite the blabbermouth. Zaha orders the 12 heavenly generals to listen as well. The reason their master the great Rakshasa is making them fight him first is obviously to ascertain his strength while he is beating the generals to death. Just how much wealth and prosperity is a geezer master like him planning to enjoy after sending his disciples to hell? Izaha points to a man with a black cow mask in the audience who looks young. His perverted master wouldn't be sad if he dies. All he'd do is pass on his mask to someone else. It has been more than one or two generals who have been swapped like this. Are the generals gonna die while listening to their perverted master like this? The great Rakshasa smiles. It seems a crazy son of a bitch has been masquerading as one of his disciples. Zaha agrees, masks worsen one's madness, and his brother generals should keep that in mind. Red Monkey and Gold Boar in the audience turn blue in the face with disbelief, wondering what the hell is Zaha even talking about. The great Rakshasa smiles and agrees to face Zaha, 
but he sends a slight signal to his heavenly generals and Zaha spots it. The master is sending eye signals to his disciples after agreeing to face him. Zaha knew the old perverted geezer would do this. Before he is surrounded Zaha decides to make the first move. Suddenly, Zaha charges at the white rooster, unsheathing his sword, and swings the blade. The white rooster blocks the blade, and taking advantage of the distraction this has created, Zaha jumps and runs out of the black rabbit union. Immediately, all the generals follow him outside, running after him at top speed. When the generals are nearly head to head with Zaha, he tells his brothers to not worry about a thing because he will kill master, so they are to react accordingly and trust Zaha. The generals fall back and halt suddenly, and the great Rakshasa shouts at them to stop staring and get a move on. Izaha swears at the damn geezer, how dare he try to come between brotherly bonds. All the heavenly generals run after Zaha to catch him. Zaha stops and sits at a store and has some liquor. The storekeepers wonder if a huge fight has broken out somewhere. Zaha takes another drink while thinking about the many heavenly generals. The heavenly general yellow horse walks towards the same store. Suddenly he picks up the errand boy by his neck and asks if he has seen anyone run away in a hurry or a suspicious person. The boy has not so yellow horse turns to a maskless Zaha who is peacefully drinking. Suddenly, a tendril of crimson black energy shoots out from Zaha, grabs the horse general by the neck and pulls him towards Zaha. Zaha's eyes glint with fury. How dare the general choke an errand boy in front of him? Zaha grabs his neck by his hand and punches him so hard on the jaw that he goes thumping over the table and onto the ground. The store errand boy flinches in fear. Zaha tells him to not be so surprised, this is usual in Jianghu. The errand boy nods immediately. Zaha washes his bloody fist with the drink, pours some into the cup and gives it to the blue-robed errand boy. The errand boy shakingly takes the drink and thanks Zaha. Meanwhile, Zaha has a one-sided conversation with the errand boy, running errands is a shit job, and everyone thinks that errand boys are pushovers, so they lash at them for the smallest things. The errand boy disagrees with that so Zaha tells him to just shut up and drink. Both Zaha and the errand boy down the drink together, and looking at the errand boy's face, Zaha tells him to go take a rest. Zaha will send his subordinate over to pay for the alcohol later, he will drink the rest by himself here so he orders the errand boy to go home. The errand boy startles but a Bay's point two generals arrive and look over the bloody yellow horse's body on the ground, and conclude that he is dead. The red goat general tell his companion Black Ox to be careful because Zaha must be nearby. Zaha is chewing on a twig in the background at the same table as before, and the Black Ox turns to him suddenly and asks what the hell is Zaha looking at. Zaha is looking at the fucker Black Ox and abruptly he shoots something at the ox which pierces his head straight through and he falls. The red goat turns in panic to call his brothers, but before he can, Zaha shoots another stick which pierces goat's head through as well and all the while Zaha peacefully sips alcohol. Zaha thumps his cup on the table and now three heavenly generals lie dead on the ground. They sure are weak since they are at the bottom ranks. The white rat comes running and seeing his now dead brothers, he lunges at Zaha. The white rat shoots out his palm to attack, but before he can, Zaha's hand shoots out and the white rat halts stills and vomits blood beneath his mask. Zaha's tendril of power is wrapped around the white rat's stretched out arm and Zaha darts under that arm and hits the rat on his face. The white rat falls to the ground, dead. Zaha watches with detachedness. He tells White to hope that he doesn't meet someone like Zaha in his next life, and removes the white rat's mask and puts it on his own face. All that's left now are the top four heavenly generals and the great Rakshasa. The top four heavenly generals along with Zaha disguised as the white rat surround the three dead bodies on the ground. The Red Snake concludes that Saha must be planning on luring them one by one and killing them. At this rate, they will all die and try to come up with a solution. The Green Dragon supplies that the top four heavenly generals should stick together. The fake rabbit can't do anything to them if the four of them stick together. To think their brothers died so futilely. The Red Snake contributes that they should return to their master, the Great Rakshasa, instead. But if they like this, master would be even more irritated. Not only would they return empty-handed, but they also lost their brothers. Zaha, masquerading as the white rat, stays silent throughout the exchange and the four generals turn to their brother White Tiger to make the final decision. White Tiger decides to continue with the pursuit. As Green Dragon suggested, the four of them should stick together. 
White Tiger orders White Rat Zaha to go report their brother's death to Master and tell him that the four top generals went to chase Zaha down, and he nods in obedience. The Green Dragon asks the White Tiger if he is trying to keep his distance from the Master. White Tiger replies that Fake Rabbit's objective is Master, he probably didn't cause this entire mess to kill all of them, he even said so. The White Rooster wonders then if everything he said was true. White Tiger believes he was indeed telling the truth, he thought that the rabbit was spouting nonsense earlier, but nonsense from a person with a screw loose tends to be the truth. The rest of the heavenly generals just stare at White Tiger and wonder why Black Rabbit killed their other brothers then. The answer is that the fake rabbit is crazy, and Zaha commends White Tiger's answer. As expected of the eldest, he is making quite a plausible deduction. White Tiger is certain of his craziness since he said he wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one duel with Master from the start. As long as they don't chase him, the rabbit does not need to fight them, and he will appear where Master is by himself. Zaha smirks, would you look at the tiger, the more he hears, the more he is impressed. White Tiger continues that if Black Rabbit kills the Master, they can just start anew after making White Rat one of the four heavenly generals. Like the fake rabbit said, how long are they going to be Great Rakshas slaves? To be honest, the White Tiger would rather not see the Great Rakshasa mistreat the young any longer. Zaha, still in White Rat's mask, nods solemnly and abruptly asks what if he just kills Master? That'd be the end of it then. The four heavenly generals just stare at Zaha, and suddenly realize that he is not White Rat despite the mask. Zaha swears. This goddamn mouth of his always gets him in trouble. The top four heavenly generals immediately turn to Zaha to attack him, but Zaha unleashes his flame realm, Palm Force, first. The generals block it with their own palms and jump back from the force of the attack. The Red Snake sways with weakness, and Zaha lunges at him. The Red Snake flinches thinking Zaha is going to attack and prepares his fist, but Zaha just shoots out his palm and halts centimeters from Red Snake's face. The four heavenly generals are surprised to witness Zaha's strength. Zaha grabs the Red Snake's mask from his face and puts it on his own. Zaha threateningly warns the generals not to pester him any further. The problem will be solved once either Zaha or the Great Rakshasa dies from their battle, so they shouldn't make things difficult. White Tiger immediately agrees, they will not go near the Black Rabbit Union today and pleads to spare the Red Snake. But Zaha cannot let the Red Snake live. White Tiger asks why not. Zaha said his goal was to fight their master and that he had no intention to fight any of the generals. Zaha did say that. But the Red Snake Bastard is the one who kidnapped pitiful women and offered them to the Great Rakshasa. The three generals flinch with surprise. Zaha also heard that the Red Snake recently offered the Great Rakshasa a blue-eyed beauty. The Red Snake trembles behind Zaha, and the generals jerk in disbelief once again. They cannot understand whether Zaha is killing Red Snake because he kidnapped pitiful women and offered them to their master or because he offered their master a blue-eyed beauty. Abruptly, Zaha pulls back his fist and punches the Red Snake, hard. The Red Snake goes flying to the far wall, and the wall crumbles into pieces. The Red Snake is the most loyal to the Great Rakshasa. He did all kinds of things he shouldn't have done for the Great Rakshasa without hesitation. That's reason enough for him to die. Zaha beams and turns. The four heavenly generals are now three heavenly generals. Zaha emanates a dark aura and with that, he is off to fight the Great Rakshasa. If the three generals don't value their lives, they can fight him four to one in the Black Rabbit Union, so they can do as they like. Saha, with two masks on, lands on his feet in front of the Black Rabbit Union and announces that the Master's Disciple has come. The Red Snake has arrived. The White Rat has arrived. He announces that Saha has sent Black Ox and Red Goat on their merry way and returned alive. He calls his master again. Where is his fucking master? The Great Rakshasa is sitting on top of the Union Stairs with Zaha's subordinates all around. So Gunpyong and the other executives are extremely relieved to see Zaha return and alive. There is no way their Union Master would be killed so easily. Zaha again calls out sweetly to Master, the Great Rakshasa, and his men start sweating wondering if it's really their Union Master and why he is calling the Great Rakshasa so dearly. The Great Rakshasa smiles cunningly and welcomes him back. He asks Zaha what Red Snake's last moments were like. Zaha tells him that Red Snake embraced the wall after he punched him, and he is probably lining up somewhere at Hell's entrance. This is truly unfortunate, he was the great Rakshasa's most treasured disciple. 
Zaha asks Master something he has always wondered. Why are they wearing these masks? The great Rakshasa finds this fascinating and smiles toothily. Not once have any of his countless disciples until now asked him that question in detail. The answer is simple. It's because when one wears a mask, he can naturally do things more naturally. Whether the person or the mask is the one doing those things becomes more blurry. Since the great Rakshasa has answered the question, he demands to see Zaha's face. Since one of them is going to die anyways, that much is fine. But Zaha denies the order because he doesn't want to show his face. He shouldn't, since he is about to do something bad. The great Rakshasa chuckles, which is unfortunate, and stands up, someone like Zaha should have been his disciple. But even if Zaha was his disciple, he still would have killed him. And like today, he would have asked him why he made Zaha wear a mask. The great Rakshasa descends the stairs and commands Zaha, that is how a man should live. Zaha didn't have much popularity with the normal ladies even though he was on the handsome side, yet someone old and wrinkly like the great Rakshasa is mingling throughout east and west. All of a sudden, Zaha is filled with immense rage and his eyes glint. The great Rakshasa addressed Zaha as a disciple and asks him how would he like to compete, palms, fists, or internal arts. Whatever is fine. As someone who has trained in martial arts for a longer time, he will let Zaha choose. Zaha asks the great Rakshasa what he is confident in. The elderly are confident in their internal arts, and since Zaha will be at a disadvantage in this, he orders Zaha to choose something else. But Zaha decides to go with internal arts for now. The great Rakshasa smirks, Zaha is one crazy bastard. From his skin and voice, he looks young, but he wants to fight in internal arts against the great Rakshasa, who has trained in it for several decades. The great Rakshasa turns serious and stretches out one palm. Zaha follows him and stretches out one hand as well. Their eyes glint and they abruptly clash. Suddenly, Chi bursts out from each plan, and yellow and magenta Chi's battle for dominance. The hand contact is discontinued, but then the palms meet again, and the ground they are standing on crumbles to pieces from the power. Cracks spread throughout the ground as the men's internal arts battle for dominance once again. Suddenly, the great Rakshasa's eyes widen in shock. This boy, Zaha, isn't being pushed back by the great Rakshasa's internal arts. He is shocked to discover that Zaha has the same amount of internal energy as the great Rakshasa, who has been accumulating it for decades. Zaha's eyes glint as he stands unmoved. Suddenly, a blade appears out of nowhere, and the great Rakshasa wings the sword at Zaha's neck. However, Zaha grabs the master's sword hand in time, and the blade shakes just an inch away from Zaha's neck. Zaha's eyes glow. The great Rakshasa said that he wanted a fight of internal arts. But as he expected, their master doesn't disappoint. The great Rakshasa flinches. Their master never disappoints. Suddenly, Zaha, still in the masks, jerks forward and headbutts master so hard that he vomits blood. Before master can recover, Zaha headbutts him hard again. Then again. Then twice more. The master's face is bloodied and bruised and his teeth broken. Without a break, before he can get up, Zaha sends out his tendrils of crimson heavenly pearl energy, which wrap themselves around Master's arms and start training. Shocked, the great Rakshasa observes his internal energy being extracted, and his veins pulse and bulge with the extraction. The tendrils forcefully suction the internal energy from the great Rakshasa, and he screams from the pain and force of the extraction. Abruptly, Zaha lets him go, and he slumps on the ground with a thump. One bony and shaking hand raises from the ground, and the bloodied, bruised, and toothless great Rakshasa wonders what happened to him. Zaha officially greets him with a nice to meet you. Master turns to look at Zaha, who has now removed his masks. He finally introduces himself as the leader of the ignoble clan, Izaha. Wind flutters and blows Zaha's hair and petals rustle in the air while a trembling great Rakshasa calls Izaha's name. The great Rakshasa would have saved more of his ignorant disciples' lives if he had fought like this from the start. Zaha tells their masters to say a few words to his disciples as their leader before he goes on to the afterlife. Master spits blood and asks where the hell would his disciples be when Zaha has killed them all. Just then, Red Monkey and Gold Boar step in front of him. Before the great Rakshasa, the master can get any significant words out. Three more disciples appear at the Union, White Tiger, Green Dragon and White Rooster. Master is surprised to see them standing and tells the crazy bastard Zaha that he has left quite a lot of the disciples alive. The great Rakshasa finally acknowledges the ignoble clan leader, 
Izaha, as an amazing person. The great Rakshasa straightens himself and addresses his disciples. He tells them that they have worked hard caring for a lacking master like him. They are to make sure to devote themselves to serving the noble clan leader Zaha from now on. All of them may live without their masks. The disciples all stare at him one last time, and the great Rakshasa takes his last breaths and dies with his back straight and eyes open. The great Rakshasa spoke words of kindness to his disciples at the end of his life. Zaha closes his eyes with his hand and orders the disciples to take off their masks as per their master's dying wish. The generals immediately oblige, and finally, free themselves from their masks. E Zaha turns to the Black Rabbit Union men and orders them to clean up the interior and clear the streets of the corpses that are lying around. Zaha orders the twelve heavenly generals to talk with him and invites Admin Bayak, Red Monkey and Gold Boar in as well. The heavenly generals, Admin Bayak and Zaha all gather in the meeting room. Zaha announces that from now on he is their great brother. Everyone in the room is confused by that, so he clarifies. Zaha would act as their master if he ever taught the disciples anything. But since he is visibly younger than them all, great brother would be perfect. Zaha asks if anyone has an objection. The whole room is confused once again. He is gonna be the great brother because he is the youngest? That doesn't even make sense. Zaha continues talking. He tells his brother generals what they have to do now. He will challenge them to a martial death match if they make him repeat anything, so they should listen as closely and properly as possible. Red Monkey nods immediately and enthusiastically, and Zaha smirks, people who've shared pork ribs together certainly share a deep bond. Zaha smiles and orders them to be comfortable with each other now that Great Rakshasa is dead. The three heavenly generals just stare at him in disbelief. Zaha's eyes droop, threateningly this time, and orders them to be comfortable. They nod in understanding immediately then. Zaha continues. He doesn't know how big each of the general's forces are or how many subordinates they have. They are to make sure that they clean up their own shitty messes by themselves after holding the great Rakshasa's funeral, and then join the ignoble clan that Zaha leads. The green dragon asks about the ignoble clan and Zaha tells them that the ignoble clan is formed from a gathering of workers. It is a secret, lousy, complicated, and chaotic organization. Zaha then asks them what they think is the first thing they must do for the ignoble clan. The generals start sweating. Of course, they don't know, Zaha doesn't know either. But he tells them that they can come to report every now and then. They can also come if an issue arises. Zaha will leave them all be for now, so they are free to go about it in their own way. However, they must clean up the things the black faction did themselves. The white tiger solemnly vows to take care of it. Zaha nods. He guesses that it is pointless to order grown adults around. Since they have taken off their masks, they can change on their own. Zaha tells them that he is not a good person, and he is not very patient either. He is the kind of person who has to endure dozens of times harder than the average person just to spare someone. Just like when he spared White Tiger, Green Dragon and White Rooster. Just then, the White Rooster raises several concerns. Master had enemies and allies, he was especially close friends with Elder Hornless Dragon King who received a lot of money and women from Master. He will be the most enraged when he finds out that Master has passed away. Saha asks them who else might be a problem. The Green Dragon supplies that there is also the Cloud Rain Society. They were enemies who were on the worst terms with the Master, and the Master's right arm was cut off by the Cloud Rain Society leader. Unlike Elder Hornless Dragon King, the Cloud Rain Society's leader will be happy. Aside from them, many people hold grudges against Master. They cannot predict how they will react. In that case, Zaha is relieved. Red Monkey asks what Zaha is so relieved about. Zaha's face turns innocent and peaceful. He is relieved that he has more people to kill. The men sweat anxiously. Zaha wonders if the Cloud Rain is part of the Cloud Rain Society. The same characters as fornication are used. The White Rooster confirms that it is. Zaha finds the name immoral and orders Administrator Bayak to send a letter to the Cloud Rain Society in the Black Rabbit Union Master's name, and tell them not to fuck around and live in modesty. Admin Bayak's eyes twinkle and he confirms that he just needs to send them a declaration of war under the pretext of a letter of goodwill. That is exactly what needs to be done, and Zaha compliments Admin Bayak on his capabilities. Administrator Bayak beams from the praise. The White Rooster tells them that the Cloud Rain's forces are nothing to scoff at, 
there is really no need to provoke them first. Before he can finish that sentence, Zaha orders Brother Rooster to shut up and he obliges. The generals sweat while Zaha declares that there is no problem with declaring war against the Cloud Rain Society, they are not on good terms anyway. Zaha suddenly realizes something and furiously smashes his fist on the chair. The generals cower. Cloud Rain Society, as Zaha thought, there is no way he can leave a clan with such an immoral name B. He orders Administrator Bayak to not disguise it as a letter of goodwill and just send them a blatant declaration of war. The men blanch in shock. Zaha is just declaring war against the clan just because he doesn't like their name. Zaha screams with fury. The Cloud Rain Society are also the enemies that severed their master's arm. As his disciples, it is obvious that they should take revenge against them. Everyone in the room gives Zaha a wide side eye. He wants to take revenge against someone who severed master's arm when Zaha is the one that killed him. He is definitely crazy. Zaha threateningly looks down at the room and demands their answer. Everyone immediately agrees. Zaha then tells the guys to cheer up. The baffled audience eventually obliges. The sun shines on a new day and morning arises. Zaha is extremely busy while he takes rounds of the Black Rabbit Union. The men sneak glances at him in the yard and immediately bow. So Gwimpyong turns to look at Zaha from where he is training the men and greets him. Pink petals float in the air, framing Zaha in elegance. Zaha turns and seats himself with his back to a tree with those pink petals. He closes his eyes and starts his meditation. The petals land on Zaha's shoulders and Gunpyeon peruses him from time to time. Day changes into evening, and the sun is about to set. By now, dozens of petals have overtaken Zaha's body yet he is still deep in meditation. More men have gathered to watch him besides So Gunpyeon. Zaha eventually opens his eyes and stands up. He unsheathes his sword and swings it in the air in smooth arcs. Men watch Zaha with open mouths. Zaha stops swinging and contemplates his sword swings. Petals still fall and one pink petal lands on Zaha's eye and suddenly he is hit with an idea. He pulls his sword hand back, the other hand stretched outwards and swings the blade clockwise parallel to his body. The men in the audience jerk in surprise. Zaha twists and twirls and swings the sword in position with his body. He halts at a point pulls back the sword, the petals following the blade's direction, steps ahead and swings diagonally. The petals shoot outward, and Zaha swings the sword in their direction, catching a single petal. Zaha glances sideways at a petal, pulls back, and swings and cuts the lone petal in a precise half. He twists his sword then points it upwards, and pushes out with the other palm, and the petals burst away. The men shield their eyes from the blast of air, and when it finally clears, the men gawk in awe. They stare in disbelief, they just witnessed the creation of a new sword technique. Zaha turns to the tree and asks the men what kind of tree is it. The men tell him that it's a plum blossom tree. Zaha touches the tree softly and smiles, he will call it the plum blossom sword technique. A female voice repeats the technique's name, and when Zaha suddenly turns to look at Sister Monkey, she startles. To think she'd steal a glance at Zaha's personal martial art, as expected of a thief. Zaha just stares at her as Red Monkey starts chattering. She tells him that the Plum Blossom sword technique sounds way too weak for a sword technique name. Zaha asks her with a straight face if he should call it Rakshasa sword technique instead, and she immediately retracts. She supplies that Plum Blossom would last longer. Zaha turns to go inside to eat, and Red Monkey stays outside to enjoy the view a little longer. Red Monkey turns towards the view and smiles softly. Inside, Gold Boar is chewing aggressively on a chicken leg piece, while a feast lays on the table. Zaha is settled at the table along with him and asks the Gold Boar if he became a heavenly general before Red Monkey. When he tells Zaha yes, Zaha asks him why he let Red Monkey slap him so many times then. The Gold Boar thought about that too, whether it is normal or not, and it is not. It's unacceptable in a renowned orthodox sect. Slapping a senior brother would result in her being excommunicated. The gold boar abruptly turns back to his food, but they are not a renowned orthodox sect. They are in the black faction. A junior slapping a senior in black faction. The gold boar thought deeply about it after getting slapped once, and how dare she. He will give her a proper lesson later. Or so he thought. But Zaha stole his internal energy, and Sister Monkey's internal energy is nothing to scoff at either. It wasn't a very simple issue to deal with. Zaha slumps in his seat when he falls asleep eating. The gold boar calls out to his great brother, 
and Zaha startles awake. He must be exhausted and they keep eating. Zaha takes a bite and concludes that the gold boar likes red monkey. The gold boar makes a face and asks Zaha if he has been dreaming. Zaha asks him then if he doesn't and the gold boar just sighs and continues eating silently. Zaha acknowledges that the gold boar is good at stuffing his face. But since Zaha stole his internal energy, the boar should at least make up for it. A fat ass's logic is invincible. The gold boar tells Zaha to thank God he is a fat ass. He is a member of the Golden Mountain Merchantry, possesses bottomless wealth, and he is the youngest son there. He has money and martial art. Imagine if he was thin on top of that. Zaha is not surprised to find out that gold boar was the youngest child. He seemed like the youngest, perfectly fine with getting slapped around. The gold boar blanches at this and asks why everyone is acting like they are, even Sister Monkey is acting weird. They look outside where every one of Zaha's men is swinging around their swords and practicing their sword technique, and Sister Monkey is swinging around her blade as well landing gracefully. The gold boar observes that they are all swinging their swords at the blossom leaves. They all must have gone crazy. However, looking at them, Zaha commends them, they are doing well. A confused gold boar turns to Zaha and asks if this is really doing well. Black Rabbit Union is more like Crazy Rabbit Union. Zaha's face rests on his fist and he acknowledges that everyone is doing so well. They were inspired by Zaha's training and are struggling to pursue the path of martial arts that they desire. That is indeed very good. They've caught the fragrance of plum blossoms within the falling leaves. Zaha's fingers begin tapping the table and he hums happily under his breath. Seeing Red Monkey, so Gunpaying and his men training to their heart's content makes Zaha absurdly proud. Night falls and lanterns light the Black Rabbit Union. Zaha and the executives meet in the meeting room, where Administrator Bayak informs them of the latest changes. Anman Bayak tells them that they've received reports of the Silver Phantom, Yusachom, near the area. And along with the meteor wanderers that caused trouble with money, several unknown martial artists have also gathered en masse. When Zaha asks why, Anman Bayak supplies that after hearing the news of a portion of the Twelve Heavenly Generals and the Great Rakshasa's death, they must think that Nanwa has become weak. They are trying to take this chance to take over Nanwa. Zaha concludes that they know someone killed the Great Rakshasa, so if they think Nanwa has become weak, then they must be idiots. Admin Bayak is surprised to hear the word facial sketch from Zaha's mouth. But Zaha has someone he needs to find, thus the sketch. Admin Bayak immediately bows and tells Zaha to just say the word, and he will find them for Zaha, no matter what it takes. Zaha states with a straight face that the person he is searching for looks like a sex maniac. Admin Bayak is confused, Zaha is telling him his impression of this person, he is like a sex maniac, with a handsome face, pale skin, makes a great smile with his eyes. Zaha asks Adnan Bayak if he gets what Zaha means, and Adnan Bayak sees the picture already. Administrator Bayak tells Zaha to not worry and continue his explanation, his drawing will catch a sex maniac. Zaha is sitting in a carriage in red and black robes, looking out to the trees, and suddenly orders the coachman to change their direction. Since there's a refreshing breeze, instead of going to Moong Clinic, he decides to go to the Iwa Prefecture where the Cloudy Rain Society is. The coachman startles with confusion and hesitates. But the fact that they always seem to be fornicating without Zaha is unpleasant. The coachman hesitates again but obeys Zaha nonetheless. Izaha smiles. In the spring sunshine, since the breeze also blows away his madness, it feels as if Zaha's gone on vacation. When they have arrived at their destination, Zaha orders the coachman to go back and make sure to let people know that he is at Moang Clinic. The carriage leaves and Zaha steps into the Iwa prefecture. He arrives at two gray-green double doors and knocks loudly. Anaya appears in the door's peephole and asks who's there. Zaha just looks in the eye and ignores him. But when the man asks again, Zaha steps forward and tells him that he has come to collect some debt. The man shuts the peephole, and the double doors swing open. Considering they open the door without even confirming it, they don't seem to be the type to pay their debts. A man with a short brown ponytail and blue robes invites Zaha inside. The ponytail man asks Zaha about whose debt is it. It can't be society leaders, and he wonders if it is the vice society leaders drinking money. Zaha just casually peruses his surrounding and the ponytail man abruptly turns to him and asks why he isn't answering. 
Zaha's non-answer of what infuriates the man, and he pulls his hand back to slap Zaha because he isn't getting his shit together. Before the slap can reach him, Zaha abruptly grabs the man's hand mid-swing and squeezes hard. The man shakingly demands that Zaha let him go, but Zaha sends a harsh glare his way and the man shuts up immediately. Zaha squeezes the man's heart harder, and the man's tone immediately changes when he asks where the good sir, Zaha, is from. Zaha's origins are a long story, but he is probably from his mother's belly, but since Zaha is assuming the man is not asking about his origins, Zaha inquires why the man is asking about Zaha's neighborhood, and he is not asking for a geographical location either. The man is probably asking what force Zaha is in, but that is also quite a long story. The man begins sweating buckets and shakes. Not meeting Zaha's eyes, that man pleads with Zaha to spare him. Zaha stares at him for a while and then throws him back with so much force that he lands on the far pavement. Zaha walks towards the house. Since most of the people who follow the commander-in-chief, Professor Su, seem to be out, it is emptier than Zaha expected. Zaha comes across a small water body with some fishes. He turns away and walks towards a man, who seems to be examining something sitting beside a brick structure. Zaha asks him about what this place is. The old man with a gray man bun looks up at Zaha from chewing something and asks who might Zaha be. Zaha tells the man that he is someone who is here to meet Professor Su. The man tells him that Professor Su is out. Zaha wonders then if the Vice Society leader might be here. But only the guests are present, the Vice Society leader is also out. So Zaha asks the man what this place is again, and the man tells him that it's an incineration facility. Zaha wonders why they need an incinerator, and what they burn here, and the man tells him that they burn corpses. When Zaha asks him why they need to burn corpses, the man answers that they burn them if they don't pay their debts. The man just follows orders, so he is not sure either. Zaha concludes that if they don't pay up, they are killed, and this facility burns their corpses. The man affirms this and continues eating aggressively. Zaha huffs, he is not sure about killing someone who is eating, and the man stops eating in confusion. Zaha turns away and tells the man to finish his meal. The man finally realizes that Zaha is not a guest, and takes out his weapon. The man wonders just how many men Zaha has killed to make his decision so quickly. The man lunges at Zaha and swings his blade. Zaha twists sideways to dodge, and he pulls back his palm and shoots it at the man. Zaha's palm hits the man's abdomen, and he twists his hand and explodes the man back into the incinerator. Zaha picks up the man's battle axe and takes it with him inside the house. The inner doors of the house swing open and Zaha enters inside to see females dancing on a stage and men sitting around the said stage drinking and going about their business. Zaha ascends the staircase to the stage. The females leave it running and order someone to turn on the lights. It is too dark in there. The guests whip out their weapons. Izaha returns to the Black Rabbit Union late at night and the doormen bow to him in greeting. Zaha is feeling much better now after talking with Muang Bek. A conversation with someone who you can open your heart to puts you at peace. Zaha smiles softly and enters the main house, where he is met by the heavenly generals, his subordinates, and Cha Sungtae and Sima Bai. Cha Sungtae smiles as soon as he sees Zaha and stands up to greet him. Cha Sungtae welcomes back the clan leader, and subsequently, everyone rises from their seats and welcomes back their union master and great brother. Izaha settles himself at the head table and orders everyone else to have a seat as well. Cha Sungtae and Sima Bai stand beside Zaha. Zaha asks them if they have all introduced themselves to each other. Sumi tells him that they have. Zaha wonders though why he was sitting on the high seat to which Sungtae replies that he is the general of the ignoble clan, which is indeed true. Sungtae beams, he is the general of the ignoble clan, and Zaha agrees. Red Monkey supplies that Sungtae claimed to be the second in command of the ignoble clan and asks great brother whether that's true. Zaha ponders that and glances at Sungtae who is making a face that practically pleads with Zaha to just say that he is the second in command. It seems that Zaha has raised quite the sly little fox. Zaha abruptly denies that claim. Sungtae's face turns sour. Cha Sungtae is just a general of the ignoble clan. There's no such thing as a second in command. However, the position of general is still quite important, so everyone has to treat Sungtae as such. The heavenly general's beam, as everyone can see, Sungtae will die if someone hits him once or twice, so they are to treat him with care. Cha Sungtae grumbles and walks to the end of the room to take a seat. 
Zaha calls Sante and tells him to get stronger if he has any complaints. Cha Sante would like to. Everyone in the room managed to meet a powerful master and got stronger after getting to eat elixirs and learning powerful martial arts. Sante had neither a master nor even seen an elixir. He swung his blade only to survive. So Sante believes that he may have a chance if they fought only with external arts. So Gunpyeong abruptly speaks up and challenges Sante to a fight of only external arts right now. Cha Sante angrily backpedals, this isn't the time for that, he should read the mood, they will do it next time. Gunpyeong glares at Sante and Red Monkey and Golf Boar laugh evilly and eventually, everyone starts laughing. Izaha huffs and tells Sante that he better do it next time, and Sante immediately bows. Now that everyone is gathered in the room, Zaha starts the discussion. Zaha asks the room about how they should destroy the cloud rain in such a way that rumors spread. Should they charge at them, or go on a siege defense? Everyone is free to speak their minds. Cha Sante asks who they are fighting against. Their opponents are the Elder Hornless Dragon King, Professor Su, and some other black faction small fry Cha Sante supplies that there must be well over four to five hundred soldiers then. Everyone turns surprised looks at Sante, wondering how he knows that. Listening carefully, Zaha orders Cha Sante to speak. Sante believes that a siege defense would be better because they are lacking in numbers and it'd be the more entertaining choice. That is all and Zaha decides to go on a siege defense then, as Zaha also thinks it would be more entertaining this time around. If anyone has a more entertaining opinion, they should speak their mind. Everyone except Cha Sante Blanche in disbelief that Zaha is choosing something like this based on entertainment. E Zaha bangs his hand on the armrest. He takes it that there are no more entertaining opinions so they will go with siege defense. They will evacuate the servants and those who haven't learned martial arts to Iliang Prefecture, since they may get caught up in the battle and die. Zaha asks the room who'd like to escort them to the Iliang Prefecture. The enemy may charge at them soon so they must leave immediately. However, no one comes forward for the task so Zaha asks Weak Sante if he'd like to go. Zaha doesn't think Sante will be of much help even if he stays here. But Sumti's eyes twinkle and he is Cha Sante of the Ignoble Clan, he would stay here as the representative of the Iliang Prefecture. Everyone seems to want to stay back, so Zaha will decide. Zaha orders Administrator Bayak to take full responsibility for the vanguard and leave the rearguard to Sima Bai's group. Zaha commands Sima Bai to dispatch someone who's quick on their feet beforehand to secure the road. Both men nod and after a couple of yesers, they leave the room to do their jobs. After they've left the room, Zaha orders Junior Brother Boar to follow them from the very back, and if something happens, he is to use his own judgment to report back to Zaha. Gold Boar nods in understanding and leave the room as well. Zaha smiles big. Since they have nothing to do now, they are going to have a few drinks. The whole room cheers up. Inside the room, everyone is peacefully having drinks and snacks and smiling at each other. Zaha glances to the doorway when he notices something, and suddenly, the Black Pearl Fort enters the room, Deco in the lead with three other men in tow. Deco Singh gives a sharp toothy smile and announces that Zaha's young is here. Zaha swears at the crazy son of a bitch. As ordered, Daco has brought reinforcements. The whole room turns to look at Daco and sweats, worried about the repercussions of his nonchalant behavior. Daco greets everyone in the room, and it looks to him like a lot of masters are gathered here. Daco seats himself right beside Sante. He picks up a cup and orders Sante to pour him a glass. Sante bursts out, furious, and tells the son of a bitch to pour a glass himself. Also who the hell does Daco think he is to call himself the clan leader's young? He has completely lost his mind. Deco Singh's eyes glint in outrage. The guest hall is painted red with the guest's blood, and none of the men remains alive. Zaha leaves a trail of blood dripping from his battle axe, his face and robes thoroughly bloodied as well. The blood drips harshly from the axe to the ground, and Zaha's face shows no trace of mercy. Footsteps come running into the guest hall to find a bloody Zaha the only man alive in a room that was previously filled with more than a dozen of men. At the head of the group of new men is a man in white robes. The man with long hair and white robes looks around, assessing the situation, and demands Zaha's identity. Zaha turns to him and the new man flinches. He has a very bad feeling about Zaha. Zaha tells him that he came to collect a debt. The new man is shocked, wondering just how much is the debt for Zaha to do something like this. Zaha asks the new man how much he can give. The new man inquires if 300 tails of gold will do. 
Zaha glares at him and turns. Surprisingly, this amount matches the amount the Black Pearl Fort Master asked Zaha to pay. The new man wonders if Zaha has a debt to pay to the Black Pearl Fort Master. If so, he can take 300 from him and pay them to Black Pearl Fort Master then. Zaha tells him he does not need to pay. When the new man asks why not, he is sure the Fort Master is demanding it like crazy since Zaha borrowed money from him. Zaha answers that dead men are bound to forget about debt reminders, and they probably don't even know who they lent money to. The new man should also be thankful to Zaha if he had any debt to pay to the old Fort Master. The new man wonders if Zaha is saying that he killed the Black Pearl Fort Master, but one glance at the dead bodies has him cowering in place. Zaha warns him to not even think about running away. Zaha will ignore his subordinates and chase only the new man. He shouldn't order his men to attack first either. Zaha will ignore them and kill only the new man. The new man sweats and asks what Zaha wants him to do then. Bring the money perhaps? Zaha tells him to forget it and not do that either. His forces will only grow while he goes to get the money. So he is to just stay here and they'll take some time to confess and grieve for the dead. The new man is shocked. They are going to think very deeply about how their lives ended up here. They must not have been weaklings from the moment they were born. So how in the world did they end up this week? A door opens somewhere and Zaha emanates a dark aura. Zaha concludes that they are seriously going to be like this, and they do not want to talk to him. The new man is sure that Zaha is crazy and that he has been caught by a crazy bastard. The new man couldn't see them because he was so confused earlier but all the guests died in one blow with that axe. The new man orders all his men to go outside. The men are surprised and hesitant, but they oblige. Eventually, it's only Zaha and the new man in the room. Since he made all his men leave, the new man asks Zaha to tell him what he wants and to talk it out from beginning to end. The new man is willing to cooperate, betray, or even beg for his life on his knees. Zaha stares at him coldly and commands him to kneel. The new man immediately obeys and kneels on the stairs, with his hands on his knees. The new man tells Zaha that fortunately, the society leader is absent, so Zaha can tell the new man anything. The new man is sure that Zaha is not interested in money or women, but he'd like Zaha to at least tell him what he wants. Zaha asks when is Professor Su coming back. Professor Su will be back later in the evening. Zaha then asks if the new man thinks he will be able to kill Professor Su. The new man is confused but decides to convince Zaha in a particular way. The new man tells Zaha that it'll be hard by himself, but he can kill Professor Su by using all his subordinates at once. Professor Su will come back drunk, so it'll be easier than normal. He can do it, he can kill him. Zaha now knows that the new man is a traitor and picks up his axe. The new man's face twists and he begs for his life, asking Zaha to believe him. Zaha can just kill the new man if he fails. Zaha was planning on killing Professor Su anyway, he could just kill them all at that time. He grabs the new man's forehead with one hand. Zaha has heard that Professor Su is as strong as Great Rakshasa. Does the new man think he can do it? The new man cries pathetically and says that is only the case in an official match. Zaha's eyes glint and he suddenly brings the battle axe down on his head, blood splashing everywhere. The new man falls dead. Come to think of it. No one in the Cloud Rain society would be of any use. Suddenly, the earlier group of men enters the room, and the men's voices reach Zaha, announcing that the vice society leader has been killed. Zaha stares at more than two dozen men. There are so many people to kill, and he descends the stairs. Night has gotten late when Zaha arrives at the Moong Clinic. Dr. Moong Beck greets the clan leader, and is surprised by his current state. Izaha smiles genuinely and asks Doctor if he has visited at a late time. Muang smiles and tells him it's alright. Besides that, he asks if Zaha has fought again. Zaha's smile disappears. He fights pretty often, it's a daily routine. Dr. Muang Beck supplies that they should both have a cup of tea and they subsequently do that. The men settle themselves on a small table and Muang pours them tea. Dr. Muang asks him who he fought this time. Zaha wonders if Muang has heard about the Great Rakshasa's death, and he has. Those of the black faction associated with the Great Rakshasa have been banding together since his death. That's why Zaha visited the Cloud Rain Society first. Muang concludes that Zaha caused a mess in the Cloud Rain Society. And Zaha did, with an axe. Muang is confused about that technique so Zaha tells him that he just split their heads open. 
Murder is all the same, whether it be with a sword, axe, or fists. Moyong inquires if Zaha has killed anyone that he shouldn't have killed by accident. But Zaha hasn't, and that's good. Zaha tells the clan leader that his mind demon is right outside the door though. A bloody crazy demon from the future foreshadows Zaha. Izaha smiles, that is why he came to see Moyong. He is occasionally becoming his patient. If Zaha were to join forces with Professor Su, he felt like he might actually become a berserk crazy demon. So he held himself back and went to see Dr. Moyong. Zaha wants to be a level-headed crazy demon that strives to fix his faults, not a crazy demon that has been driven by massacres. Zaha's goal is to become a slightly better crazy demon. Dako pours himself a glass of liquor and ignores Sante. Sante swears at the son of a bitch again, angry at being ignored. Zaha's voice interrupts their bickering and he asks Dako if they have decided on a new name. Dako tells him they were once the Black Pro Fort, but now they are the ignoble clan. Zaha wonders what the hell he is talking about and Dako supplies that they are a stupid bunch, so they couldn't decide on a name, and Zaha shouldn't expect such a naming sense from people like them. They will just go with the ignoble clan. Also, the number of rules has already increased by 10, and being a leader is extremely difficult. Sungtae jerks when he realizes that the red-headed son of a bitch is actually from the Black Pro Fort, and he is their leader no less. H. Sungtae glances at him and abruptly turns away. Zaha asks Dako how many guys he brought. Zaha said to bring a hundred. Dako gives that sharp toothy smile again. So he only selected the elites and brought thirty who will do the work of a hundred. Zaha commends the son of a bitch on good work. That aside, the alcohol Dako is drinking is really weak, he cannot believe that they get drunk from shit like this, they are some funny guys. Everyone just stares silently at him. Dako abruptly turns to Zaha and asks about the plan. But there is no plan, they just have to kill them all. That is the plan, kill them all. Dako nods in understanding and stands to leave, telling them to wake him up when the enemies come, until then he will be asleep. Dako walks in Zaha's direction and lies down on the ground beside Zaha's high seat, hands under his head. Everyone jerks again. Zaha addresses his men and wonders if the moon is bright tonight. It is, and the conditions are perfect for battle. Zaha asks if there are any who use poison arts on Elder Hornless Dragon King's side. But there are none as far as Gunpyeong knows. The Elder Hornless Dragon King and Professor Su are most likely to be the strongest among them according to White Tiger. When Zaha asks how they are compared to the Great Rakshasa, White Tiger supplies that they each have their pros and cons, but they are masters that don't fall behind Master Great Rakshasa. E. Zaha will face Elder Hornless Dragon King and Professor Su himself, so everyone else should also fight enemies that match their strengths. It'll become a dogfight, so if someone comes face to face with an enemy much stronger than them, their order is to retreat. Everyone nods in agreement. Running footsteps reach the meeting room and a man bursts open the door. The enemies are coming. Nerves strike each person and Zaha's eyes glint. Zaha stands up and orders someone to bring his mask. White tiger hands over Zaha's mask and he once again dons the black rabbit persona. They all leave the room together, following their leader. The men gather in the black rabbit union and Zaha takes the lead and bursts open the main doors, where they are faced with the enemy army. An old man in turquoise robes provokes the four heavenly king juniors. They couldn't do anything against the old man even when the great Rakshasa was with them, so he doesn't understand what makes them think they can face him now. The old man then grins with malicious intent, if they kill the one who killed his vice society leader, he will be generous and take them under his wing. Zaha the black rabbit speaks up, such marvelous mischief. The white tiger greets the old man, Professor Su, it has been a while. White Tiger asks why Professor Su submitted to the Elder Hornless Dragon King. The Great Rakshasa would be embarrassed for him if he finds out about it in the afterlife, as Professor Su was someone the Great Rakshasa acknowledged. Professor Su laughs at the poor provocation and wonders where their little red monkey is. Could she be dead? Just then the red monkey, who is standing at the back, makes a show of looking at Professor Su and spitting on the ground. Professor Su chuckles evilly, he will especially spare red monkey. Suddenly, an even older man, with white hair and a white beard and a walking stick in hand, comes forward. This is Elder Hornless Dragon King. He announces that only the one who killed his old friend needs to face his fury, so all the young ones better stop their foolishness. But those who want to die can come his way. 
If they think about why the Gret Rakshasa periodically gave him offerings, it won't be a very difficult decision. On the opposite side, Saha smiles and rubs his hands with excitement. Truly odd that there are so many people to kill. Saha suddenly addresses his junior brothers and tells them not to betray him today because he is in good condition today. His madness becomes deeper when he fights under a full beautiful moon. He may lose his reason, so they better not be misled by those geezer's words. He won't be able to spare them today. They immediately nod in understanding and fear. Saha orders White Tiger to lock his fingers together and bring them to him. The White Tiger obliges and comes forward with his fingers locked. Zaha steps into the cradle of the fingers and orders White Tiger to use his internal energy to throw him up as hard as he can. Zaha wants to view the full moon. The White Tiger stares and nods, and Zaha reminds him to throw him as hard as he can. Zaha smiles, he will see the junior brother later. The White Tiger smiles in return, he will also see his great brother later. Zaha smirks and then he is thrown hard and far into the air, in clear view of the moon. Seeing the moon, he begins laughing. Big, choking bursts of laughter escape him on his way back to the ground, and he twists to face the ground. Zaha pulls his hand back and calls his chi, shooting out the flame realm's great handprint. Humongous beams of fire shoot from Zaha's hand, like a blazing sun, and hit the enemy territory. The ground explodes in fire, and the generals shield their eyes from the smoke. The smoke finally subsides to reveal Zaha, standing front and center, smiling genuinely. The smoke parts and reveals many crisply burnt bodies of the enemies who were directly under Zaha's humongous fire handprint. Professor Su, the Elder Hornless Dragon King, and their men are in shock. Zaha slowly unsheathes his sword and commands everyone to listen to him closely. He points at the Elder Hornless Dragon King and announces that because of this senile old man who did nothing but eat what the Great Rakshasa gave him, they will all die today. The Elder's eyes glint with anger as his men give him a dirty side eye and he abruptly orders his army to kill them all. Both armies collide with a bang. Deko Singh swings his blade with a manic laugh and madly kills enemies left and right. The Heavenly General's Red Monkey, Green Dragon, White Rooster and White Tiger jump into the fray and unleash themselves onto the enemy. So Gunpyong and his men kill their enemies equally enthusiastically. The enemy army surrounds Zaha from all sides. The moonlight is great, his subordinate spirits are great, and Zaha's mood is also great. The enemies hesitate to charge at Zaha and Professor Su screams at them. He shouts that Zaha is just one man and they are to kill him immediately. The enemy army grips their swords tighter, and Zaha warns the dregs to step aside. The men are still in place. Zaha's sword breaks out in fire, and he announces with an evil smile that he only kills leaders. The men see his smile and run away in fear immediately. But Zaha begins slashing and they all end up bloody and dead. A malicious smile takes over Zaha's face as he zooms by killing everyone left and right. He slashes his fire blade without remorse and whoever is in his path ends up dead. Zaha leaves carnage in his wake. Zaha wonders why the men are running, and runs after them and severs their heads from their bodies. That malicious smile covers Zaha's face again. Did the men think they had a chance just because the great Rakshasa died? He snaps another man's neck with his crimson tendrils of chi while he keeps talking. Why do the crazy sons of bitches think the great Rakshasa died out of the blue? He asks again why they think the great Rakshasa died all the while the crimson tendrils kill a man by extracting his chi. Professor Su and the elder flinch. Zaha is completely insane. Zaha swings his blade once more, and the enemy men drop their weapons to run, but they are stopped by Professor Su. Those who fall back will die at Professor Su's hands. Skills hit the ground and heads crack, and Zaha breathes with satisfaction and his sword erupts in fire once more. Professor Su orders his men to kill Zaha immediately. As soon as the dozens of enemy men charge at him, Zaha's eyes glint red, and strange fire-red tendrils wrap around every person and they halt in their footsteps. Zaha just widens his eyes then and activates the flame realm sword path, and the men explode in blood. A huge pool of crimson blood now surrounds Zaha where men formerly stood, and Dako Singh, Sogumpion, White Tiger, White Rooster, Green Dragon, Red Monkey, Professor Su and the Elder simultaneously flinch. All the while, Zaha snickers raining over a bloodbath. Professor Su wonders just who the hell is Zaha. Abruptly, Zaha stops smiling and asks where the man named Yu Seishun is. Everyone turns silent. 
Zaha tells that Yu Seisheng must have set this stage. There is still no reply from the shocked audience. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a voice shouts at him. The voice belongs to Chao Sante, standing amidst the Black Rabbit Union men. Sante points towards an inconspicuous man in the army. That man is the Silver Phantom, Yu Seisheng. The said man's brows fro in annoyance. Zaha asks why Sante thinks that particular man in Yu Seisheng. Sante tells him that the man is doing absolutely nothing in this utter chaos, just like Cha Sante. Zaha chuckles and praises him and tells him that Sante is a great detective, and even cow shit has its uses. Cha Sante beams in gratitude. He Zaha turns to look at the silver phantom. Yu Seisheng's face breaks out in a cunning grin. Zaha reminisces back to when Administrator Bayak told them about the Silver Phantom. They'd received sighting reports of the Silver Phantom, Yu Seisheng. On the outside, Yu Seisheng is an arbitration expert, but in truth, he is a gambler who searches only for the largest disputes. Zaha could probably call him a problem-spreading expert. He travels alone without any factions backing him, but he butts into disputes among the Black Faction to earn tons of money. He even has the skill to do so. It was Zaha's first time hearing of the name, but Zaha was more bothered by him than Professor Su and Elder Hornless Dragon King. Zaha snaps back from the memory. Back on the battleground, Yu Seisheng observes that Zaha is not the Black Rabbit Union Master. This is correct because there is no way the Black Rabbit Union Master would be this strong. Yu Seisheng addresses Professor Su and the Elder, and provokes them to fight. Are they going to fight like this even after taking Seisheng's money? Professor Su and the Elder just stare at him, and Seisheng continues talking about how he doesn't think it has been that long since they were boasting about generously repaying his money and raising their forces by conquering Nanwa. Zaha looks at the Silver Phantom as he addresses the two older men. Seisheng tells them that if they understand the situation they are in, the insects of the Black Faction should keep fighting until a winner is decided. Zaha contemplates that for a while and rages, how dare he give Zaha an order. Zaha raises a hand and proposes a ceasefire. Professor Su and the Elder on the enemy's side, and the Heavenly Generals and Executives on Zaha's side, are all equally surprised. Deko Singh's eyes glint with shock as well. Their reaction is good, it is now officially confirmed that Yu Seisheng is behind this matter. Yu Seisheng is confused by Zaha's train of thought. Zaha addresses the two enemy leaders again and tells them to go for a ceasefire. Those two will suffer the most losses if they continue fighting Zaha. The Elder asks the reason for proposing a ceasefire, and Professor Su announces that he has never suffered a loss in his life either. Zaha guarantees them that over half of them will die at his hands if they continue fighting. Zaha's subordinates will obviously die too. The two enemy leaders realize that it is as Zaha says, at this rate, they will have to make an enormous sacrifice just to eliminate him. Zaha forces them to think of the one person who will lose nothing from this. That person is Yu Seisheng, the bastard who set this stage. The Silver Phantom grumbles with anger. Zaha figures that Seisheng must have given them a sizable amount of money to attack Nanhua and pay him back, and he either brought his own troops nor fought. The one that Zaha wants right now is either Professor Su nor Elder Hornless Dragon King. If they keep doing absolutely nothing for Zaha like this, Zaha gives an evil smile. He will kill Yu Seisheng first. But Professor S. Yu can't possibly trust the words of someone who hides behind a mask, so Zaha announces that he will reveal his face. Everyone turns silent at this proclamation and the two enemy leaders turn to glance at Seisheng. Yu Seisheng wonders if they will keep listening to Zaha's bullshit. Zaha continues speaking, they just have to let him kill Seisheng, and it won't be too late to keep fighting after that. Zaha is absolutely right. There is no need to suffer losses from facing him. Professor Su and the Elder don't know exactly what Zaha is planning, and even if he wins, he will be tired from his battle against Yu Seisheng. They have absolutely nothing to lose from this. Bloody hands touch his face, and Zaha slowly removes his mask to reveal his face, which is as bloody as the rest of him. The two enemy leaders and Yu Xiong are shocked as they do not recognize Zaha, and he looks young. The Elder Hornless Dragon King makes a counteroffer then, they will not accept a ceasefire. Seisheng grins thinking he has won, but the Elder tells them to carry out a death match between Zaha and Seisheng. If either of them dies, the Elder will pull back his forces. Yu Seisheng flinches. The Elder continues that only after Zaha shoulders the sin of killing Yu Seisheng will a true ceasefire be established. 
Professor Su agrees with this counteroffer as well. Izaha huffs. He understands that the enemy will use their forces to conquer Nehua if Seishong wins, and pull back their forces if Zaha wins. Zaha agrees to the offer nonetheless, he always welcomes one-on-one -on -one battles. White Tiger steps forward to whisper to his great brother Zaha. He tells Zaha that the enemy is planning on analyzing his skill by observing this deathmatch. Zaha smirks, he already knows this. The White Tiger's fist and palm meet in a greeting, and he requests Zaha to be careful. The Elder orders them to make an encircling net so that no one can run away, and a thick coarse encircling net immediately surrounds them. Yu Seisheng smiles mockingly, wondering if they are all crazy. But Yu Seisheng just has to win, if he is truly that powerful, he should prove it to them through not just words. Seisheng glares, this is the problem with black faction trash. Saha steps forward and widens his legs in a stance. Yu Seisheng unsheaths his sword, takes his stance as well, and abruptly charges at Zaha. Asekyong swings his sword in a vicious arc, and Zaha blocks it. Both men's eyes glow at the same time and they clash. Seisheng taps his foot, jumps at Zaha, activates his sword chi and slashes downwards and sideways. Zaha jumps back and blocks it again. Seisheng lunges once again, sword pulled back in a furious arc and unleashes his phantom sword technique. Zaha blocks the attack with a single swipe of his blade, Seisheng swings again and Zaha jumps and stretches his neck to dodge it. Izaha observes that the technique Seishang is using is not just some sword technique that he picked up from the streets. He sees traces of Seishang training that one single sword technique for at least a decade. Seishang slashes viciously again and Zaha comes to a startling realization. Yu Seishang is from the white faction. Yu Seishang grins and slashes forward, but Zaha blocks the swing as well. Seishang keeps jabbing his blade, and Zhao darts his neck left, and right easily to dodge. Seishang wonders why Zaha is only defending, and where all that confidence from before went. Zaha jumps to dodge another low swipe of the blade and lands back on steady feet. Seishang swings the sword again numerous times, and Zaha parries it with one swipe of his own blade. Yu Seishang is shocked that he cannot figure out Zaha's martial art, and he asks Zaha out loud his martial art of use. Zaha's eyes glint. There is no way Seisheng would be able to figure out Zaha's martial art since it has no foundation. The process of surviving from the bottom itself is the foundation of his martial art. There is no way Seisheng could figure it out from just a few sword clashes. They attack and dodge and parry again, and Seisheng grows even more confused because Zaha is blocking all his attacks without moving an inch. Daddy Zaha's face breaks out in a wide manic smile, and he tells Seisheng that he is too slow and to swing faster. Seishang's eyes glint in angry mortification and he attacks and attacks but to no avail. Zaha blocks them all and the only word that escapes his mouth is faster, faster. Seishang shouts in aggravation and slashes his sword downward viciously. The air explodes, blocking everyone's vision of the fight. The smoke eventually subsides to reveal Zaha holding his sword downwards and blocking Seishang's final vicious blow. Zaha notices that Seishang used that same technique three times, all he has done is use his internal energy differently. Yu Seikyong immediately retreats a few steps. But Zaha's hand pushes out, and crimson black tendrils shoot out towards Seishang. The tendrils grab and pull him to Zaha, where he grabs him by the neck and squeezes. Zaha's other hand breaks out in lime-colored chi. It shoots out and strikes Seishang at multiple points on his body. Zaha pulls his hand back and Seishang slumps, paralyzed. The enemy army and Zaha's subordinates watch in surprise. Zaha struck Seishang's pressure points, thus his body isn't moving. Zaha abruptly declares that Seishang is now his prisoner. He is Zaha's pawn, his slave, and his subordinate's prisoner at the same time. Whether Zaha tortures him or kills him, it's all up to Zaha, so no one should dare tell him what to do. Suddenly, Zaha raises his sword up straight, pointed towards the moon, the men watch in surprise wondering if Zaha is going to kill Seishang now. He takes a deep breath, spitting at his sword, and begins twisting and turning around Seishang in a series of complicated moves. Zaha's subordinates are surprised and in disbelief, wondering what he is doing all of a sudden. One man realizes that Zaha is following the steps of an executioner's dance. But they wonder why he is doing the executioner dance all of a sudden, no one knows. Zaha does one more twirl under the moonlight and glances at his sword, which is glowing in the night, and jumps to execute the next step of the dance. 
Red Monkey raises her hand, apologizing for interrupting her great brother's dance, and asks if Zaha is gonna kill Seisheng, but Zaha has no idea what he's gonna do. He is doing the executioner dance because he just wanted to try being an executioner. Zaha twists and twirls while talking. A sword dance under the moonlight, an executioner under the moonlight, an errand boy of the Iliang Prefecture, the freer of the Black Pearl Fort, and the Union Master of the Black Rabbit Union. The men are confused. That is who Izaha is. Everyone's shoulders drop in disbelief. Cha Sungte casually points at the enemy and tells Zaha that the sons of bitches are running. Zaha immediately stumbles to a stop and turns a threatening glare at the enemy force. A dark aura emanates from Jia and the opposing men retreat. The elder observes silently and Zaha points out that the old geezer is acting quite calm. Perhaps he has something to say to Zaha. The elder hornless dragon king promises that he is just maintaining a ceasefire, holding true to his word. The white tiger proposes that they should just kill them, and the elder flinches. But Zaha waves his hand in a vague gesture and tells him to forget it. A ceasefire is a ceasefire. The elder immediately walks away behind Professor Su. Professor Su tells Zaha that they will meet again very soon. Zaha smirks. Professor Su is a sorry excuse for a leader. They should just meet again now. Why soon? Professor Su immediately retreats. Zaha will only treat those who come to him to surrender as such. He makes the enemies think if they'll have another chance to survive once they go back. Eventually, all the men of the enemy forces leave. Zaha orders his subordinates to tend to their wounded. The night is deep, so they should also go to sleep. He orders them to stop the siege. And once Gunpyeong finishes setting up the lookout arrangements, he is to rotate shifts with another executive. Gunpyeong nods in understanding and Zaha glances sideways at Yu Seisheng, sitting slumped on the ground. Seisheng glares at Zaha. Zaha suddenly raises his hand and slaps Seisheng so hard on the face that he goes rolling to the ground. Zaha observes that his prisoner sure has it hard, and since the night air is cold they should head inside. Zaha walks forward to address Sungte and beckons him towards himself. When Sungte reaches him, Zaha swings his arm on Sungte's shoulder, ready to head back inside together. Sungte beams with happiness. Cha Sungte is the ignoble clan's general after all. Back on his high seat in the meeting room, Zaha sips on some liquor. The executives and the heavenly generals roam and eat happily. Everyone is celebrating merrily, except Yu Seisheng who sits slumped on the ground in the middle of the room, bound with ropes. Deko Sing approaches Seisheng and slaps him hard. Seisheng begins trembling with something akin to mortification and restrained anger. Zaha asks his subordinates if any one of them is injured, but they are all alright. Cha Sungte supplies that he is alright as well, and of course he'd be, he only watched. So Gunpyeong asks how they should deal with Elder Hornless Dragon King and Professor Su going forward. Zaha tells him to just wait, the damage is greater on the enemy's side. They will be anxious now that they've witnessed Zaha and his clan's power. Their subordinates would be shaken as well. White Rooster smiles big and tells his great brother that his executioner dance was great. He should have done a fan dance alongside Zaha as well. Zaha smiles, they will dance together next time then. The White Tiger provides that the sword technique Seisheng uses is not something that can be learned in the Black Faction. Zaha tells White Tiger to explain to others why that is since people like Sungte wouldn't know. Cha Sungte's nerves pop in momentary anger at Zaha's words. The White Tiger continues speaking about how he got a feeling that Seisheng intensely trained his stance before training in the sword technique. Recalling the first half of Seisheng's attack against Zaha, the flow of his sword technique was also consistent. Seisheng didn't learn some mediocre sword technique. Zaha reveals that he thinks so as well. Dako Song's forehead veins twitch in anger when he concludes that the son of a bitch Seisheng is from the white faction. He stands up and slaps Seisheng hard once more. Red Monkey asks her great brother Zaha if he pressed Seisheng's mute point, a pressure point that prevents one from talking when pressed. He hasn't said a word since earlier. Zaha probably has. Red Monkey asks if she should release it. But she won't be able to, either can Zaha. Zaha has pressed it many times before, but releasing it is a hassle, so he never practiced. Zaha didn't put much chi into it though, so it'll be released soon. The red monkey supplies that the mute point is pretty dangerous. Esekion might not be able to talk for the rest of his life if it's not released quickly, but none of that is Zaha's problem. 
Red Monkey guesses Zaha's right doubt a man arrives in the meeting room and addresses their union master Zaha. The Wu clan leader has arrived in front of the gate with his weapons on the ground, and the man asks what they should do. Zaha tells the man that if the Wu clan leader is here, then they should let him in. The room begins mumbling about why the Wu clan leader is here. Izaha wonders if the Wu clan leader grasped the situation first. The double doors to the meeting room swing open, and two men carrying a box enter behind an old, healthier man. The men place the box on the table, and the leader of the Wu clan, Yang Jiegyang, greets and introduces himself to the union master. Zaha smiles and welcomes the clan leader Yang. Clan leader Yang trembles and speaks. He has come to tell the union master that the Wu clan will never face him as an enemy from now on. Clan leader Yang supplies that they have made a terrible mistake due to their lack of information. Zaha nods in understanding and affirmation and clan leader Yang is extremely grateful for his great generosity. The Wu clan will never answer the calls of Elder Hornless Dragon King and Professor Su ever again and requests Zaha to rest easy from their side. Clan leader Yang opens the box he brought and asks Zaha to please accept the gold as a form of goodwill. Zaha's subordinates get wide-eyed with animation when they see so much gold. Zaha looks down at clan leader Yang with an upset and tells him that they didn't have to bring something like this, they are friends now. Though their first meeting wasn't all that great, it is fine as long as they do not meet as enemies from now on. That's just how life is and the clan leader is in agreement with that too. In Jiang Hu one's enemies become his allies, and vice versa from time to time. Some die in the process, so clan leader Yang shouldn't let it bother him that much. Clan leader nods in understanding and he shall keep that in mind. It's gotten late, so clan leader Yang excuses himself. Zaha wishes him a safe trip back and tells him that he shouldn't have brought all this in the middle of the night. Zaha thanks him for the trouble. What clan leader nods in greeting and they leave. Before they can get out the door, Zaha calls out to clan leader Yang and he startles. But Zaha just tells him to have a meal together sometime. Clan leader Yang smiles placatingly, agrees, and then immediately leaves. As soon as they've left, Deko Singh scoffs and calls them a joke. They were raring to kill Zaha and his subordinates just a while ago, and now they are licking their feet. The white rooster hides his laugh under his fan. Zaha smirks as well, as Dako said, it is quite funny. Everyone begins laughing then. Suddenly, Seisheng aims a glare at Dako Singh. Dako jumps and slaps him hard once more. Dako mockingly asks Asekyong why he isn't laughing, did a pressure point on his face get pressed as well? The doors swing open and a man announces that Madame Kielsium has come to see the Union Master. Zaha tells the man to not keep asking while leaving them outside in the cold air and let Madame Kielsium in. An older tall woman with raven hair and blue robes enters the room. Zaha asks the woman if she is Madame Kielsium. Zaha saw how skilled her subordinates were as they threw weapons from the rear. Their skills in throwing hidden weapons all the way from the rear were no joke. That is true and Madame Kielsium lowers her head to apologize. Her disciples and she were thinking of leaving Elder Hornless Dragon King's side and returning to Pomegranate Blossom Valley. She will also warm her close friends of the Black Faction from now on. She requests Zaha to forgive their mistakes from today. But these things can happen in battle. He smiles and forgives Madame Kielsium. And now that they've come to know each other, Zaha'd appreciate it if the entire Pomegranate Blossom Valley does not become his enemy. Madame Kyosium nods in understanding and fetches something from her robes. A dagger appears in her hands. As a token of her words from today, Madame Kyosium offers Union Master the Moonlight Dagger that she has treasured since she was young. Zaha tells her that he shouldn't have, but as a form of sincerity, he accepts it and will use it well. He wanted to have a dagger or two on him, so it's suitable for self-defense purposes. Although the Moonlight Dagger is short, it can cut most long swords in half like tofu, and it is also perfect for assassinations. Those in Jiang Hu sure do love their quality goods, and Zaha will use the dagger well. Madame Kyosium lowers her head and excuses herself from the room. Yi Zaha orders So Gunpyeong to go outside and check the faces of anyone outside the gate, and to send them back after threatening them a bit. Zaha is too lazy to deal with them all. So Gunpyeong nods with understanding and stands up to leave. Zaha rises up from his high chair and finally walks towards a bound Seishan on the ground, with a liquor cup in hand. Now in front of his prisoner, Zaha gulps the liquor and glares at him. Yu Seishan stares back at Zaha with tenacity, and Zaha punishes him with a hard punch so hard that he thumps to the ground. 
Cha Sungae harshly straightens Seishung up with the back of his robes. Zaha wonders if he should just kill him, or kill him after torturing him. Seishung's eyes turn hard. Zaha sure has changed a lot. As long as they were his enemies, he used to beat them to death, break their skulls, or kill them with an axe. He wonders what happened to him. The whole room stares at Zaha in disbelief, and Zaha still ponders what in the world happened to him. Is this how people feel when they are astonished by how much has changed? Or is this what people call the vicissitude of life? Are they both wrong? Zaha touches the moonlight dagger to his own neck. To kill or not to kill, that is the question. To kill or not to kill, that is the real question. Zaha glares down and wonders what's with Seishan's eyes. Does Zaha look stupid to him? Does Seishan think Zaha is uneducated? Yu Seishan flinches and sweats profusely, sensing the danger. Zaha realizes that Seishan can't reply to him because he cannot speak. His mute point hasn't been released yet. Suddenly, Zaha grabs Seishan from the front of his robes, throws him harshly on a wooden chair, and aggressively stabs the moonlight dagger on the table. There used to be a pretty interesting Hyung in Zaha's neighborhood when he was young. Everyone knows those kinds of people, the Hyung in every neighborhood who's cheerful, funny, and treats even some like Zaha well. That Hyung was manly as well. Yu Seishang sweats, sensing where the story is going. The death mass in Zaha and the Hyung's neighborhood went like this. They tried to resolve things with words after sticking their daggers on the table like right now, and if it was not resolved, they'd each take their daggers and try to kill the other person. Zaha calls it a death match, but people didn't die every time, at least a finger or two was cut off every single time though. Zaha remembers back to that time. One day, he saw that Hyung was dead on the table, and Zaha wasn't that surprised. Zaha's grandfather disposed of the corpse and Zaha cleaned the table with a rag. The rag kept getting snagged on the table, so it wasn't getting cleaned very well. After taking a good look, Zaha saw dozens of dagger marks on the table. After seeing that Zaha had thought that at least the Hyung that he knew didn't go down without a fight, Yu Seikyong sweated and gulps hard. Zaha cleaned that table at least once every day, and he wondered how to embrace the emotion that he felt every time. Zaha doesn't remember his name all of a sudden. The Hyung was an orphan, so there is no way for Zaha to find out. In any case, although much time has passed, the one who killed the neighborhood Hyung was killed by Zaha's hands. Zaha abruptly pulls the moonlight dagger from the table. In the end, the killer of the Hyung went round and round and then was killed by Zaha. Suddenly, Yu Seishang starts crying heavily. He begs Zaha to spare his life. Zaha realizes that Seishang's mute point was released. Seishang pleads with Zaha to spare him. He will tell everything he knows. He will cooperate with Zaha for sure. Zaha doesn't know what Seishang is gonna tell him, but he doesn't care. Zaha swings the dagger again viciously and grabs Seishang's arm with his other hand. Looks like only his mute point was released. Zaha tells him that if he doesn't get a hold of himself from now on, he will experience qi reflux. Seishang is to stabilize his breathing. Zaha grins creepily. Why would he kill Seishang? Yu Seishang begins trembling in truth, mouth wide and everything. Zaha's arm, which is holding Seishang's wrist, breaks out in tendrils of crimson black qi which wrap themselves around Seishan's arm and creep towards his face. All the qi immediately leaves Seishan and enters Zaha's gut. All the while, Seishan shed tears and snot on the brink of death by strangulation. The crimson black tendrils retreat as fast as they arrived and Yu Seishan slumps with energy depletion. Zaha swings the dagger again, and this time it stabs Seishan's palm to the table. Zaha orders Asekyong to shut up. If that Dako Singh he met earlier wakes up, he will come here and break his neck. Holding in pain is better than dying. Zaha turns away and walks to his high east, leaving Seishang slumped in pain. Now that Zaha has absorbed his chi, he should start cultivating. Zaha tells Seishang that if he is confident, then he can pull out that dagger and attack Zaha. That is how they used to handle death matches in Zaha's neighborhood. Yu Seishang shivers in fear and disbelief and wonders what the hell is wrong with that son of a bitch, Zaha, who is cultivating in front of his enemy. Zaha closes his eyes in concentration and cultivates. There is a lot more chi than he thought. He can break out of his current flame realm if he pushes himself. But since the overall principle of the martial study incorporated in the invulnerable golden tortoise art doesn't want that, Zaha won't rush. Zaha eventually opens his eyes and walks to a trembling Seishang. 
A sweating Esekyong tells Zaha that he stopped the flow of the blood from his still dagger-pierced palm. Zaha commends him on a good job, Seishong thanks him in return, and abruptly pulls out the dagger. Yu Esekyong immediately pushes his hand back, tears his robes from his teeth, and bandages his hand from the torn-up piece of cloth. Zaha pours some liquor and tells him that the reason why clan leader and Madame Kyosium bowed down to him is that they stay in one place. He pushes the liquor glass to Seishong, since they know Zaha could go massacre the entire Wu clan or set fire to the pomegranate blossom valley, they lowered their pride and came to apologize. Yu Seishong downs the drink fast and thanks Zaha. But Zaha doesn't really care about Seishong's circumstances who is the owner of a gambling house. Zaha gulps down a glass as well. If Seishong is of no help to Zaha in killing the elder hornless dragon king and Professor Su, then Zaha has no reason to spare him. Zaha's eyes glint with a threat. Yu Seishong's life solely depends on how he will dispose of those two enemies, so Zaha asks how will he persuade him. Seishong starts breathing heavily suddenly and passes out on the table. Zaha sighs and wonders why people keep passing out and if he needs to bring this concern to Dr. Moyong. Dako Singh approaches them from the opposite side, yawning, and asks Zaha if he killed Seishong. Zaha didn't, he just passed out. Something startles Dako Singh, and he abruptly tells Zaha to sleep as his eyes have turned red with a unique dash of purple. Zaha stares at him with those exact eyes and turns. He will sleep. The dream begins with a cloud of mist and the Zaha Inn, where a young Zaha is wiping the tables with a rag. The table is clean so it is easy to wipe. A man with light brown hair arrives at the Zaha Inn and orders Zaha to get him a bowl of noodle soup. A startled Zaha turns to look at the tall brown-haired man and asks if Young is going somewhere since he is wearing some nice clothes. Young just smiles and slurps the noodle soup while young Zaha watches, he hasn't had a meal this nice in a while. Young finally speaks, he is a bit sad that Zaha doesn't remember his name. Zaha asks him what was his name again. Young tells Zaha his name, but his words are all jumbled and messed up. Zaha wonders what Young just said. Zaha suddenly remembers. Young thanks young Zaha for the meal and Zaha asks him again why he is dressed so nicely and if he is going to see a woman. The brown-haired Hyung smiles genuinely. Of course not, he has to start a new beginning now. Zaha abruptly stands up and asks Hyung if he is not going to have sword fights anymore. He needs to take revenge against Joe Aijio. Hyung smiles again. What use is there in revenge when he is already dead? But he thanks Zaha anyways, and then he is off. Izaha smiles softly and wishes Hyung good luck in his new beginning. Zaha stares after the leaving Hyung and opens his eyes. Zaha's eyes snap open in the real world, back in his bed at the Black Rabbit Union, and he wonders what he just saw. Suddenly, a loud female voice, that belongs to Red Monkey, calls out from outside, waking her great brother up. It is time for breakfast. Izaha smiles humbly. Zaha and his nearest companions, Heavenly Generals, Cha Sante, So Gumpyang, and Dako Singh, sit together having a hearty meal. Gumpyong addresses the table and asks if they should attack the Elder Hornless Dragon King first or Professor Su first. Zaha pauses mid-bite and declares that he doesn't know. When the White Tiger asks where the man named Yu Seishong went, Zaha doesn't know that either. Everyone watches him in disbelief, this is normal by now. Zaha is a man who doesn't know much. Suddenly, the double doors to the room burst open and Dako Seng arrives along with a blindfolded Seishong. The table turns surprised looks at them. Dako drags a chair and commands Seishang to sit and eat. Seishang immediately obliges and bows to him in gratitude. Everyone wonders just how much Dako beat Seishang for him to be so submissive. Zaha tells Dako that he shouldn't be so brutal, and Dako growls that he only punched Seishang in the face a few times. No one believes that, and that their union master was the one who stabbed Seishang's hand. Zaha even took his internal chi. Seishang was so afraid of the Union Master that he couldn't even speak properly. And Seishang confirms that Dako is absolutely right. Dako beams and everyone just stares. Dako taps Seishang aggressively on his back and creepily commands him to keep up, and he obliges. Cha Sungte smiles teasingly and says that it looks like Dako Singh has gone through a lot. Everyone turns shocking stares at Sungte wondering why he is always messing with Dako. Dako gives a smile in return and announces that looks like General Cha is also going through a lot, stuffing his face like that. Laughter escapes Red Monkey and others at this and Cha Sungte flushes angrily. 
Yu Seisheng asked Zaha's permission to gather his forces and go to the vanguard together with Dako Seng. Zaha immediately tells him to shut up and eat, and he listens. Zaha sits back on his high seat in the meeting room. Now that they all have finished eating, Zaha will explain the plan, so everyone should focus. A few men drag a paint board into the room, and Administrator Bayak tells the Union Master that they are ready. Zaha stands up and moves to the board, brush in hand. Zaha draws a dark blot of paint to indicate the Black Rabbit Union. A few centimeters above, he writes to indicate where Professor Su will be. In between the two of them, he draws a triangle, which is where they will ambush Professor Su. The Cloud Rain Society's morale has completely dropped, and both the Wu Clan leader and Madame Kielsium broke away from them. They should obviously trample on the weakened Cloud Rain Society first instead of Elder Hornless Dragon King. As for the members, Zaha will limit it only to people who can keep using Qinggong. From the Black Rabbit Union until they reach Professor Su without rest. Zaha asks if So Gunpyeong understands the sort of plan this is. Quickly traveling to the Cloud Rain Society using Qinggong. Those who fall behind aren't even necessary for an ambush. That is correct, but it's not all. Everyone else has to agree with Zaha on the details as well. It is simply a Qinggong contest where they have to keep up with Zaha. The room is confused by the use of the words Qinggong contest. Zaha clarifies that he will start together with the executives, he will run at the front, but he will not check whether everyone is keeping up with him or not. Red Monkey raises her to ask if a gap won't form based on one's Qinggong skills then. That is probably true, but it doesn't matter. They will go over the Cloud Rain Society's walls in the order of arrival and keep moving. They will go straight to Professor Su's residence. Gunpyeong is surprised that Saha is telling them to run even after they reach the Cloud Rain Society. That is true, all of them must keep running until they find Professor Su. Saha is the lead, the apex, and the drill. They are to forget about the enemies that run away, kill only the ones who face them head on, and keep running and running. Zaha orders them to keep charging while keeping up with him until he finds Professor Su. Everyone shouts in understanding. Zaha then orders everyone except the Slowpokes to get ready to depart. Cha Sunte asks when they will depart. Zaha smiles and tells him that they will leave right this instant. All the heavenly generals and executives stand up to follow Zaha. When Seisheng begins to stand up as well, Zaha declares that the captive is excluded. Zaha orders Sunte to keep watch on the captive and Sungte screams in outrage, wondering why he is the one staying back to keep watch. Zaha ignores him and turns away. Deko pats him on the shoulder and wishes General Cha good luck. Everyone else also turns away to leave the captive to Sungte and wishes him good luck, telling him to watch the captive well, he is finally pulling his weight. So Gunpyeong hurries after Zaha and tells him that they need time to explain to the subordinates. They don't have time for that so Zaha orders him to just tell them to keep up. Those who fall behind can just think of it as Qinggong training. The guys, Heavenly Generals, Deko Seng, Gunpyeong, and Zaha are more than enough to face Professor Su. He Zaha swings open the main doors of the Black Rabbit Union. Come to think of it Zaha is also curious about the order they will arrive in. He smiles and tells them to think of it as a ranking battle and just run. Deko Seng kicks the door abruptly and runs ahead. Gunpyeong calls Dako a crazy bastard and Zaha tells them to quit standing around and start running. Zaha is faster than them all. They immediately oblige and everyone zooms away one after another. Zaha's face breaks out in a proud smile, and he too jumps. The men run to Professor Su's location, with Zaha hot on their tails. Zaha's feet tap the forest ground and he jumps, quickly overtaking his subordinates, and so in Pyong. He orders Gunpyeong to be faster, and leaves him in the dust jumping through a space created by the tree canopies. Zaha soars in the sky quickly overtaking the three heavenly generals as well, and sneaks behind Red Monkey and Dako, who were in the lead. The two didn't do a bad job. The Red Monkey quickly runs forward leaving Zaha, but he catches up immediately. Zaha teases Sister Monkey, wondering if she needs to go to the bathroom, she is quite fast. Red Monkey doesn't answer, she is the fastest one and Zaha tells Junior Sister Monkey to keep up this pace. The others won't be able to keep up with her as long as she runs like this. Zaha leaves Sister Monkey behind as well and lands at Professor Su's headquarters. He jumps over the tall wall to get on the other side of the gates, and over all the guards. The guards are surprised by Zaha's speed and alert everyone to an intruder. Zaha keeps running, 
Kicking down the inner doors, he lands on the stage and then runs past it to the stairs to Professor Sue's room. More goons appear, shouting intruders. But before they can take out their weapons, Zaha kills them all with a single swipe of his blade and runs down the hallway. Running down the upper floor hallway, he is met with another guard, but he doesn't stop and pushes him away. More underlings arrive from everywhere, asking Zaha who he is and Zaha introduces himself as the Moonlight Executioner. Again, before men can fully unsheathe their weapons, Zaha swings and severs the men's heads from their bodies. Blood rains on him and everywhere, and he reaches Professor Sue's doorway. Zaha smirks and asks if Professor Sue slept well. Inside the room a half-naked Professor Sue stands at the foot of the bed, holding up his pants, while two women hide under the blankets. The men have a silent stare on and Professor Sue immediately lunges to grab his weapon, one hand holding his pants. Zaha is just a flurry of movements when he charges at him and swings, and Professor Sue barely blocks it with a shaking hand, the other hand still on his pants. Professor Sue is shocked to see Zaha here, and Zaha smiles creepily. Zaha slashes his sword in a vicious arc and Professor Sue parries. The crimson tendrils of Chi shoot out from Zaha's other hand and grab Professor Sue by his neck and pull him to Zaha's awaiting hand. Grabbing him by the neck with one hand, Zaha aggressively stabs Professor Sue with his sword from the other hand. Professor Sue vomits blood and stumbles back to the wall. Zaha grabs Professor Sue's bloodied face and squeezes. This is how he really looks. Professor Sue loses all energy in his legs and falls and a pencil swipes into his blood. Zaha sheaths his blade and glances at the cowering bare women on the bed. A mumbled word leaves Professor Sue's mouth and Zaha goes closer to hear him, who is mumbling the word bitch. Zaha swears at him angrily, must he leave a curse word as his last word. Professor Sue is a pathetic bastard. Zaha asks him why he didn't surrender, he already told them that they wouldn't have another chance to live. Zaha wonders why he didn't believe in others for once. He shouldn't live his life trusting only himself and Zaha wonders what in the world Professor Su was doing in broad daylight. When no words escape Professor Su, Zaha realizes that he is dead and Zaha was talking to a corpse. The crying voices of the women begging Zaha to spare them reach Zaha's ears, and he turns to them. Zaha immediately spares them. A voice shouting Union Master reaches Zaha, and he turns to look at the people in the doorway that have arrived. The Heavenly Generals and Gunpyong are finally here and they are shocked that it is over already. Dako Singh enters last with his bloody twin swords and asks if it is over. Zaha tells them that it is indeed done and orders them to take care of the rest downstairs. They are to tell Professor Su's men that Professor Su is dead. Zaha gives another order threateningly. They are not to kill anyone who kneels and kill everyone who resists. Zaha's subordinates agree immediately. Zaha descends the stairs of Professor Su's headquarters and bloody and painful screams reach him from everywhere. He exits the inner gates to see the enemy men kneeling and Zaha's subordinates presiding over them. Zaha makes an announcement to the Cloud Rain Society. Even after Zaha had a good night's sleep, had a nice breakfast, and kept waiting while day drinking, Professor Su did not come to surrender, so Zaha came himself to kill him. Those who have still not understood the situation and want to fight can come to Zaha, he will send them to their leader, and those who do not want to do that must follow Zaha's subordinates' orders. That is all. Zaha steps in front of the kneeling men and declares that Zaha and his subordinates are a part of the Cloud Rain Society from now on. Gumpion starts sweating in confusion, not understanding Zaha's words. Zaha orders the heavenly generals and his executives to get changed. They are to change into the clothes of the dead. If that's not enough, then they can take clothes from the injured or get fresh ones from inside. Zaha turns a startled glance at Dako and orders him not to change because he stands out too much. Changing isn't gonna do shit. He commands Dako to stay back at Professor Su's headquarters and clean up the place along with his subordinates. Zaha tells Gumpyong that they will divide and rule, so he should get ready. So Gumpyong nods in understanding. While all the men are changing in the background, Zaha addresses junior sister Monkey. Women know a woman's heart best and Sister Monkey agrees. The crazy Dako Singh might kill whoever he wants, so Zaha orders Junior Sister Monkey to stay back and take care of the captives. Zaha is thinking of sending the women who were suffering here to Iliang Prefecture or releasing them, so Junior Sister Monkey should take care of them. Red Monkey smiles and immediately agrees. Zaha turns to the kneeling enemy men and calls them a goddamn freeloading bunch of Sungtis. 
The men are confused about what a sunte is, but figuring from Zaha's tone, they guess it must be a pretty harsh insult. Zaha should be killing them all for working for the Cloud Rain Society, but since he tends to change his mind all the time, he will become their single ray of light. If they do not want that, then they can either raise their hands or bite their tongues and die. Zaha won't stop them. The men remain silent and unmoved. Zaha threateningly asks them if they want that or not. The fuckers do not know how to answer. Zaha will make an example of the next person who doesn't answer properly by sending them to Professor Su, and the men immediately speak up and shout that they do want what Zaha is offering. That is good and Zaha tells them that they will all now join forces with Zaha and kill Elder Hornless Dragon King. These guys are a bunch of dickheads who have been bringing poor women here, undressing them, watching them perform, and selling them off to other places. That is all the truth as the men affirm it, and Zaha is suddenly pissed off. He begins to unsheathe his sword, he should just kill them all and go to hell. But White Targa immediately grabs Zaha by his arms, telling Great Brother to calm down. Zaha struggles and tells White Tiger not to stop him, he will kill them all and go to Inferno Hell. White Tiger calmly tells him that Zaha can kill them after they fulfill their roles as fodder, there are too many people like them. Since Professor Su is dead, White Tiger requests Zaha to show a new life to them, as he did to the Heavenly Generals. Zaha halts with that realization, turns to look at White Tiger, and she's his sword. Guess Inferno Hell isn't a good place to be in. White Tiger tells Zaha that he is right and takes over responsibility for the Cloud Rain Society men. Zaha leaves them to White Tiger, and the White Tiger bows in gratitude and requests Zaha to continue saying what he was saying. White Tiger reminds him that Zaha was talking about how they were a bunch of dickheads and calling them a bunch of sunktis before that. Picking where he left off, Zaha continues. He will have the men act. They will report the fact that Professor Su has died, and Zaha and his subordinates will disguise themselves as stragglers and aim for a bloodless victory by infiltrating Elder Hornless Dragon King's perverted mountain. Zaha asks them if they understand the plan and they fail again to answer immediately. White Tiger interrupts him by saying that he has fully understood the plan, and he will command the Cloud Rain Society's men on the details. Zaha turns and approaches Gumpion, and tells him to let the marvelous subordinates of the Black Rabbit Union who ran all the way have some rest. They worked hard to run all the way here, so they should have a break. Zaha and the men will only become weaker if they follow them in that state. Zaha swears and wonders just what kind of bullshit is it to become weaker with more forces. Gumpyong just gawks. Running footsteps approach Zaha, and the man gives the Union Master a bloodied outfit to change into. Zaha takes the robes, peruses them, and orders the cartoonish man to bring him something cleaner. In no world does it look like Zaha has a chest injury, he looks fine. Zaha orders the fucker to pull himself together. The cartoonish man asks why Zaha is swearing at him, he was only trying to help. The man turns away to bring something else. If Zaha remembers correctly, he was the same cartoonish guy who couldn't take a hint in the Black Pearl Fort. Zaha sighs, he wonders how the man managed to stay alive. Finally, all the men are changed and ready to go. Zaha nods and they all take their leave. A bruised faced man runs with limping steps in the forest, clutching his broken arm. Zaha and White Tiger watch him from behind a bush. The injured man is breathing heavily and suddenly falls with a harsh thump. Zaha observes that this man is a great actor. White Tigers tells Zaha that he told the man to act that way, and he was actually stabbed. The man grunts in real pain, and Zaha admires the enthusiastic performance. The man eventually reaches the double doors to the elder's location and begins knocking desperately. An older man with a white beard opens the door and catches a falling man. The old man realizes the injured man is someone from the Cloud Rain Society and asks what happened. The injured man reveals that they are currently in an all-out war against the Black Rabbit Union, and the man came to request reinforcements from Elder Hornless Dragon King. The older man invites the injured man in. The injured man stops the older man and requests some water. Zaha smiles in the bushes, satisfied, that was an amazing delivery. Izaha patiently stands outside the door of the Elder Hornless Dragon King's manor. He observes that the manor which should have been in an uproar after hearing news of the Cloud Rain Society being under attack, is much too quiet. He descends the stairs and walks towards the forest. He guesses that the jig is up. White Tiger and So Gumpion hide in the nearest bushes, and White Tiger proposes to head inside and put an end to this. But Zaha rejects that idea, 
It looks like he underestimated the elder too much. Saha orders all of them to stand by here, and turns back. White Tiger and Gunpyeong call after their great brother and union master respectively, but Saha has already turned away and he waves. Zaha reaches the entrance stairs but turns back to retrieve his different clothes from under the bushes and changes into them. Zaha enters the manor and sees no one around. He finds Elder Hornless Dragon King sitting atop one black circle, while other white circles function as the ground. Zaha approaches the Elder, and the Elder greets him. The Elder wonders if the ceasefire is already over. Zaha looks around and asks if the Elder has already finished things up here. As he can see, the Elder has let everyone go. All that was left was the servant who opened the door a moment ago, and he just let him leave through the back. The servant does not know martial arts, so there is no need for Zaha to kill him. The elder sent the subordinates who have a place to return to on their way and gave money to those who don't. He said farewell to them all in the span of yesterday and today. Zaha notices that the elder is pretty quick on the uptake. The elder chuckles, he likes to think he is, and orders Zaha to sit. But Zaha remains standing, he doesn't sit when he is told to sit. The elder asks Zaha if he won't even have the time to share a cup of tea with him. Zaha grins, he is usually a very busy man. The elder observes how distrusting Zaha is, he found out that Zaha killed the great Rakshasa in a one-on-one. -on -one. The elder has seen many men like Zaha in Jianghu, his actions, and his manner of speaking, he has seen through Zaha's depths and figured out his personality. The elder slowly moves his teacup forward, this match is between the Elder and Zaha. The Elder was waiting by himself since there is no need for his subordinate's blood to be spilt. Zaha knows the Elder was good friends with Great Rakshasa. Dot the Elder drags his teacup again, and suddenly, a black hole opens beneath Zaha, and he falls. Several circular black holes surround the Elder now. A thump sounds and Zaha jumps back out of the hole. The Elder's eyes glint and he suddenly imagines a trail of blood, death, and skulls leading to Zaha. Abruptly, Zaha's eyes narrows with cold fury, snapping out of whatever trance Elder was trapping him in. The old man scared him. The Elder flinches in shock, and he harshly rotates the cup clockwise. The ground Zaha was standing on sinks below the ground level. Zaha jumps from one moving cylinder of concrete to another, and suddenly he is standing on a gray concrete that rose above the ground level, while the Elder sits in the center on a level black circle. That trap just now aside, more than half of Zaha's forces would have died here had he entered with them. The Elder Hornless Dragon King finally stands up from his table. The setup looks just right to the Elder, and they will fight now. Izaha smirks, he understands now why the crazy bastard is not as notorious as the Great Rakshasa. Because the Elder has been dropping everyone in these pits for 40 years, no one knows anything about him. The letter has been eating, drinking, and sleeping on top of the people he has killed. Zaha understands why the Elder's face is so pale now, perhaps he is afraid of Jianghu. The Elder tells Zaha to quit being so chatty. Zaha continues jumping backwards. Zaha has seen many people like the Elder, small fry who are too scared to leave the safety of the trap they've made. The Elder doesn't go out to hunt beasts, nor journey through the lands to fight the strong, he spends his whole life rotting here while burying both his friends, and subordinates, and those who have offended him. Zaha can smell the stench of rotting corpses every time the Elder opens and closes the pits. The Elder's face breaks out in a big toothless smile, and he asks why Zaha is running. Zaha tells the moronic geezer that he is running because it is disadvantageous for him here. The Elder suddenly points out that the direction Zaha is going is not the exit. Zaha glances back and notices that the exit has indeed gone. The Elder is quite an interesting old man, he has even learned arrangement techniques. He wonders if the Elder is perhaps mimicking the Wraith Valley Master. The Elder asks how a brat like Zaha knows of Sir Wraith Valley. Zaha might look younger, but he is much older than he looks. He is a baby face from the heavens. That sounds terrible though, so he can't say it out loud. Wraith Valley Master is an eccentric martial master living in seclusion and the progenitor of machine arrays and arrangement techniques. His title originated from his residence, the Raddy Valley Mountain Manor. The Wraith Valley Master is the kind of person the Memory Master, the founder of the invulnerable Golden Tortoise technique, hates the most. Zaha tells the geezer trash of a much further generation from the Raddy Valley Master that unfortunately for him, one of Zaha's spiritual masters absolutely despises people like the Elder who live in seclusion with wicked intentions. And that person is called the Memory Master, 
Saha doesn't know if the ignorant fuck has heard of him. It's the elder's first time hearing that name. Zaha learned the martial art that Memory Master told him to if he ever meets people like the Elder. Deal with any prior preparations made by your opponent by burning it all to a crisp without hesitation. The Elder managed to get caught by Zaha of all people, how fascinating. Zaha remembers Memory Master's words. A clever rabbit digs three holes, Memory Master said to burn all three holes to a crisp. And so, he created the invulnerable Golden Tortoise Technique's flame round. Zaha smirks and a bold and blazing fireball forms in Zaha's hand. The Elder immediately jumps and lunges at Zaha, swinging his weapon downwards. Zaha dodges the swipe and calls out the Elder. Zaha reminds the Elder that it is common Jianghu courtesy to wait, while someone prepares their ultimate technique. Zaha's eyes blaze. The Elder Hornless Dragon Kinga and Zaha's swords meet with a clang. Both men jump back immediately, and the Elder swings down his snake staff. Zaha blocks the swing, and three more sharp weapons come flying at him. Zaha sidesteps and sends all of them back with a swipe of his blade. The Elder brings down his staff again aggressively, and Zaha rolls back to dodge the attack. For a moment Zaha is about to fall into a pit again, but he recovers and jumps outwards. The Elder attacks Zaha back to back and sends dozens of sharp daggers at him. Zaha jumps in the air and removes the robe from his back to block those daggers from hitting him. The robe falls into the pit, and Zaha grows saddened at losing his poor robe. He hopes that his robe meets a better owner in its next life and be reborn as clothing worn when meeting a woman. Zaha lands smoothly on a risen cylinder, and his eyes glint with fury. The elder flinches because he can tell that the air around Zaha just changed. A blazing ball of fire burns in Zaha's abdomen, turning into a dark crimson black mass. Zaha announces that the elder is going to die, and he will avenge his robe. The Elder, holding his thick snake staff, wonders what the hell is Zaha. Both men have a silent stare down, and Zaha, realizing something, corrects his earlier statement. The Elder is going to die a little later. The Elder is confused by what Zaha means by a little later. It looked like he was going to come at the Elder to kill him just a second ago. The Elder taps his staff on the ground, and more daggers fly at Zaha. Zaha twists and darts to dodge all the sharp blades. He has more or less figured out all the traps and he just has to be wary of poison now. The Elder calls Zaha a bastard and charges at him, swinging his staff. Zaha meets him halfway with his sword, and their weapons meet with a clash. The Elder gulps, realizing that Zaha was hiding his strength, and Zaha grins. The Elder calls him an impudent brat, and tightens his grip on his snake's staff, up to something. Suddenly, purple gas permeates the air, surrounding him all over. Zaha jumps back but the purple gas follows him, and he unleashes the Great Absorption Technique which immediately wraps and twists around the purple stuff and absorbs the poison. Getting rid of it all, the air explodes. The Elder stares in shock that Zaha dealt with poison so easily. The smoke dramatically parts to reveal Zaha, standing unscathed. He asks if this is it, or if the Elder has anything else to show him. The Elder raises his staff and beckons Zaha to come closer, but he doesn't want to. From what Zaha has deduced, the spot where Zaha is standing is the safest. The Elder is surprised once more, he thought that Zaha was out of his mind, but perhaps he has figured out the arrangement. Izaha's grip tightens on his fiery sword, and he jumps, slashing the in two vicious arcs. The Elder uses his staff to block being hit with full force, and Zaha swings again from afar. This strike hits the Elder spot on, and he barely blocks it with his staff. The Elder is recovering from this attack with trembling limbs when Zaha unleashes attack after attack of burning slashes. The Elder is sweating profusely now, barely holding himself up. Zaha's eyes glow coldly, and he suddenly jumps and swings, severing the Elder's staff arm from his body. Before the Elder can even inhale, Zaha swings again, severing his other arm as well. The bloody severed arms fall to the ground, the Elder bleeding heavily from the stumps. Zaha stares at the Elder and a blazing ball of fire appears in his hand. He shifts the fireball to his fingertip. This is when the Elder begins begging and throws the little fireball at the Elder. The little fireball goes flying and hits the Elder spot on, and he erupts in fire. The earlier alive Elder is now no more than a rolling burnt crisp on the ground. The flames burn viciously and Zaha stares. He is burning up. The raging fire spreads from the burning body to the surroundings all the while Zaha just watches. Suddenly, Zaha begins laughing viciously. 
He straightens his fiery sword and begins twisting and turning, spreading fire everywhere with his blade. He tells everything and everyone to burn. A flame burns in Zaha's eyes too. This fire is an errand boy's gift to the people of Jianghu. A while ago, back when the Zaha and burned to a crisp, this is simply the fair punishment given to the elder hornless dragon king for the sin of dragging an ordinary errand boy into the Jianghu. He slashes fire in a vicious arc once more, when suddenly a voice calls out great brother. Zaha's eyes are drooped, and he wonders if he had something like a junior brother. Another slash of fire and a different voice calls out Union Master. He again wonders if he was a Union Master. A raging inferno of fire surrounds Yi Zaha, on the brink of Qi Reflux. He is an errand boy of Iliang Prefecture, a great keeper, a master at using a sickle, a loser of martial gambling, a third-rate martial artist, Qi Reflux, a fish of Jujang. Zaha is slowly losing himself when a voice calls out to Union Master again, announcing himself as Gumpyong. Zaha's despaired and glinting eyes immediately turn to Gumpyong, the man of 3,000 armors. Below, Zaha's subordinates await him, so Gumpyong, White Tiger, Green Dragon, White Rooster, and others. Zaha immediately snaps back from wherever he had gone and sighs casually. He told them all to stand by, they shouldn't have come in. So Gumpyong shouts at him, they came inside because there was a fire, and tells Zaha to immediately come across. Zaha glances at them, imagining a black chasm separating them. But there is only fire surrounding them right now, so he jumps down to meet his subordinates. White Tiger asks if Great Brother was the one who set the fire, which is exactly the case. White Tiger suggests that they leave now, and Zaha laughs and runs ahead and commands everyone to leave too. Gumpyong runs after Zaha and asks him why he is laughing after worrying them like that. But Zaha set fire to someone's home, he wouldn't be crying. Gumpyong barks out a laugh too then, so this is how people get Qi Reflux, Gumpyong thinks he gets what the feeling is. Zaha smiles and tells Gumpyong to be careful, there is nothing more terrifying than Qi Reflux. All his subordinates follow Zaha out of the burning manor. Outside, they all watch as the manor is burnt to a crisp. When White Tiger asks what happened to the Elder Hornless Dragon King, Zaha tells that the Elder burned to a crisp before the manor. White Tiger smiles in relief, that is good, very good. It is, and Zaha begins laughing again, and soon the Heavenly Generals and Gunpyong follow suit as well with their own laughter. Zaha wonders what happened to the actor who went in first, he was a great actor. The said actor raises his hand to indicate he is alive and here. Gunpyong tells that the actor left through the back with the servant. The servant escorted him out, saying there was going to be a huge battle inside. That's a relief, the great actor was almost killed. Zaha tells them that there were many mechanical apparatuses inside. His subordinates just stare at him, that was just it. Zaha declares that the elder wasn't all that outstanding compared to the great Rakshasa. The great Rakshasa, Professor Su, and elder hornless dragon king all died at Zaha's hands, but the great Rakshasa was the manliest among them. The white tiger, green dragon and white rooster nod, that's good enough. The cloud rain society is no more. If anyone wants to leave, then they can leave, Zaha won't stop them. Those who stay will be under the ignoble clan. The black rabbit union, black pearl fort, and cloud rain society are all under the ignoble clan. One of the cloud rain men asks what the ignoble clan is. The ignoble clan is a clan filled with moronic dregs like them. It's a lousy clan that will spread throughout the Jianghu as they kill bastards like Professor Su. Another man asks who the leader of the ignoble clan is. The leader is Zaha. The man is confused. He thought Zaha was the Black Rabbit Union Master. That is Zaha too. The Cloud Rain men turn confused and contemplating glances at each other. Zaha announces that their forces suddenly got a lot bigger, but it doesn't really matter. He will let the executives and juniors discuss the details of how to organize them. He is not good at managing an organization in great detail. The executives and juniors agree, and Zaha tells them to do their best. He is going to get even stronger. Getting stronger is ultimately a clan leader's biggest role. The White Tiger tells Zaha that the juniors will stay in Cloud Rain society temporarily. They have a rough idea of the guests that come to visit, and they will kill or spare and send them back using their own discretion. That is good, and Zaha tells them to do their best. He will go back to the Black Rabbit Union first. The men immediately nod in understanding. Izaha lands at the Black Rabbit Union with steady steps. 
He walks inside through the inner double doors and is met with Chao Sante and Seishong. Zaha settles himself in his high seat and asks the two men if they've been well. Sunke smiles and tells him yes. Zaha asks Seishang if Sunke was good to him, and he affirms that. Cha Sunke asks Zaha what happened with his business, he went to kill Professor Su. Zaha tells them with boredom that Professor Su was stabbed to death, and Elder Hornless Dragon King was burned to death. He sent an enemy and a friend to Great Rakshasa, so he won't be lonely in the afterlife. Come to think of it, Zaha guesses that they did because of you Seishang. Zaha smiles and declares to Seishang that he played a big part in this. Yu Seishang sweats with fear. Zaha discovers that Yu Seishang is from the Huyan Sword family, and his real name is Huyan Chong. Zaha is searching for a man, and he shows his sketch to Huyan Chong, who promises to find this man, whatever it takes. Zaha concludes that Huyan Chong doesn't actually know this man. Chong immediately begins begging, he pleads with the Union Master to spare him and he swears that will find that man. Zaha can even poison him if he wants, Chong will come back for the antidote. Zaha has already killed so many people today, his ordinary day shouldn't end with killing someone when he has already started it with killing someone. Huyen Chong sweats and thanks Zaha. These kinds of relationships are good too, it is not like anything can be resolved through force. Zaha orders Sunday to go bring some alcohol from the back with three glasses. Sunday immediately stands up and obliges. Sungtae comes back with the liquor and dumps it down on the table in front of Zaha, and settles down. Zaha tells Huyen Chong to listen carefully. At this moment, Zaha couldn't care less whether he is Yu Seishang or Huyen Chong, he also couldn't care less whether Chong is a martial artist of the Huyen sword family or a martial artist of a different force hatching some sort of plot in the Jianghu. Huyen Chong is simply an unlucky man who happened to be captured by Zaha, from now on he will do as Zaha says. Huyen Chong nods with understanding. Zaha takes out a dagger from his clothes and abruptly, stabs it hard on the table. Sante and Huyen flinch. This is how they handled death matches in Zaha's neighborhood. From this point on, if they happen to disagree, they can pull out this dagger and kill each other with it. Sante and Huyen sweat, wondering what's up with Zaha all of a sudden. Zaha announces that he will give them 108 days. Huyen Chong must pass on every martial art he knows including sword techniques, step techniques, internal arts, and cultivation techniques, to Cha Sante. Both men stare at Zaha with shock and confusion, and Huyan looks down. Sante asks clan leader how he can possibly learn every single one of his martial arts in 108 days. Zaha just stares at Sante and asks him if he wants to die, he believes he said this was a death match. Sante jerks, hesitates, and tells Zaha it's nothing, he can continue. Zaha continues speaking. Since this is the Black Rabbit Union, Essing Ti and Huyen will both wake up when the time of the rabbit, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., begins. They will have breakfast, train, have lunch, train, have dinner, and take a break. Although they are given free time during their break, if they try to go out or escape, Zaha will start the death match and kill them himself. If either of the men has a problem with that, they can pull out the flashing dagger and stab Zaha with it. Huyen and Sante blanch again, it's not like Zaha is just going to let them stab him. Since Huyen's internal energy was stolen by Zaha, he can recover it during his break, or just rest, it's up to Huyen. But to reiterate, they have 108 days. It's a long time, but also very short. Zaha is not telling Sante to master everything. However, he should at least be 108 days stronger in 108 days. Sante asks how Zaha is going to assess if he has become 108 days stronger. Zaha just tells him that if he has a problem, then Sante can pull out the dagger and stab him. Cha Sante sweats, it was just a question. He swears, Zaha just tells him to stab him no matter what Sante says. Huyen tells that 108 days is very short to pass down even a single sword technique. But that is not Zaha's problem. Although Cha Sante is a freeloader, he is not an idiot. A mad Sante can't figure out if that is a compliment, or a fucking insult. It is entirely up to Huyen whether he teaches Sante a sword technique, or something else, he can do as he pleases. Huyen tries to say something about his Huyen sword family, but Zaha interrupts him. Zaha doesn't care about Huyen's family, if he doesn't want to teach, then he should pull out the flying dagger and die, or he can let Zaha stab him himself. Huyen Chong shuts up and lowers his head in understanding. Zaha turns to Sunday then, 
If he doesn't want to learn, then he should just die here instead of just freeloading. If Sungdae doesn't like his options, then he should pull out that dagger and come at Zaha. He will let Sungdae die by his hands. Cha Sungdae contemplates everything for a while and raises his hand to tell that he is fine with it. Huyen Chong sighs and also declares that he will teach Sungtae everything. They are finally getting somewhere, and Zaha pulls out the dagger from the table and makes a small cut on his fingertip. He places the cut finger above the liquor bottle and droplets of Zaha's blood mix with the liquor. Zaha then hands the dagger to a confused Sungtae to repeat the process, and Sungtae cuts his fingertip as lightly as possible then, places his finger above the liquor bottle, so droplets of his blood fall in. Huyen Chong repeats the same steps and his blood mixes with the liquor as well. Zaha pours the liquor into three glasses then. Zaha begins speaking, and this alcohol is the blood of three men who have undergone a death match. Under the pact, the master, Huyen Chong, will teach his disciple, Cha Sante, with sincerity and his absolute best for the next 108 days. And the disciple, Cha Sante, will learn the teachings of his master, Huyen Chong, with fervor and sincerity for the next 108 days. Zaha tightens his grip on the liquor bottle. He, Yi Zaha, swears to the God of heaven and earth that he will end the lives of the two bound by the pact with the flashing dagger if they treat the duty promised to them through this death match lightly or show insincerity, as the overseer of this pact. Sungtae and Huyen begin sweating profusely at that. Zaha picks up his glass and asks if both of them swear to uphold this pact. Huyen picks up his glass and swears to uphold it, and Cha Sungte follows suit. The three down the liquor down their throats, as soon as Zaha tells them to. Zaha thumps his empty glass back on the table. All is good. Since harsh training awaits Sungte and Huyen tomorrow, they are going to enjoy themselves today with a lavish feast. But Sungte suddenly announces that no one can make food right now. This truly shocks Zaha. The servants went to Iliang Prefecture and most of the subordinates are still in the Cloud Rain Society. Zaha killed both Professor Su and Elder Hornless Dragon King, but the biggest problem is how to take care of their dinner tonight. What a dilemma. Suddenly, the doors swing open, and Red Monkey arrives with a sack in hand. Red Monkey tells her great brother to have some dumplings, she bought some on the way. Zaha is pleasantly surprised, unaware of the silence, Red Monkey chatters away. She didn't know what her great brother liked, so she got both meat and vegetable dumplings. They were also selling sweet and sour fillets so she bought them as well to go with their drinks. Suddenly, Cha Sungtae and Yi Zaha begin clapping loudly, and Red Monkey looks up to wonder what's with the two of them. This is outstanding, and Zaha announces that the four heavenly generals will now be White Tiger, Green Dragon, White Rooster, and Red Monkey. Red Monkey wonders about the out of the blue decision. Zaha bobs his head up and down in all seriousness. Zaha, Sante, Red Monkey and Huyen merrily eat dumplings and fillets at the table. Zaha addresses Red Monkey, mid-bite, and asks her if she can make noodles. Red Monkey asks Zaha if he'd like her to, and he says yes. Red Monkey decides to go make some after she finishes her dumpling. Zaha tells her that would be great, and Sante requests her to make some for him too. Red Monkey agrees, and they all turn awaiting looks at Huyen, who pauses eating as soon as he sees the trio looking at him. Huyen wonders why they are all looking at him, he is a captive but they want him to ask for some noodles as well. He begins sweating and tells them he is fine. Zaha calls bullshit and requests Sister Monkey to make three portions. Red Monkey happily agrees and Zaha gives her a double thumbs up. A serious Zaha with crumbs on his face is reminded again that a Jiang who's swarming with men is nothing but hell. He turns to look confusingly at a suddenly crying Huyen, who is tearing up while chewing his dumpling. Zaha wonders out loud what the hell Huyen is doing, and Sante believes that he is bawling his eyes out because the dumplings are too delicious. Zaha corrects Sante and reveals that Huyen is crying over a bowl of noodles after going off so fearlessly during the battle. Cha Sante realizes that Huyen is going to be his swordsmanship teacher, so he should stop grilling him. Huyen wipes his eyes and tells them that's not the reason he is crying and in any case, he will do his best in teaching Sante. Izaha seriously calls out Sante and tells him that his comfy days are over, so what is he going to do now? They both stare at each other and suddenly burst out laughing. Red Monkey arrives with two bowls of noodles in her hands and two on her forearms, and asks the men what's got them laughing like that. Zaha tells her that when he thinks of how this fucker Sante is going to suffer from now on, it just makes Zaha laugh. Sister Monkey agrees that it is funny. 
A delicious bowl of noodles is set in front of every person, and Zaha slurps his noodles enthusiastically. Sunte and Huyen begin slurping their noodles as well while Sister Monkey laughs cheerfully. Zaha and Sunte turn double thumbs up at Red Monkey, satisfied with the delicious noodles. The door to the room swings open, and Zaha glances up. The Master Swordsmith from Iliang enters the room along with one of his men. Master Swordsmith tells the clan leader that he is a hard man to meet. Zaha stands up from his chair and wonders what brought them to the Black Rabbit Union. The tall swordsmith smiles and tells Zaha that it is finished, the weapon he wanted. Zaha is surprised and an elongated wooden box is pushed in his direction. The swordsmith opens the wooden box to reveal what's inside. Everyone surrounds the wooden box, and a sheathed sword is revealed to be inside, cushioned on red velvet. Zaha observes that the sword is shorter than he expected, but guesses that the swordsmith couldn't acquire enough of the metal that he wanted. But Zaha smiles, he hasn't received a gift like this in a while. GM Kyoliams, the master swordsmith, thoughts count more than the degree of the sword's perfection. GM Kyoliang tells Zaha to quit waiting and try unsheathing the blade. Zaha picks up the sword from inside the box and slowly unsheathes it to reveal a short gleaming metal blade. Sir GM asks Zaha if he likes it, and he does. Zaha turns to his subordinates and asks if there is anything he can slash. Huyen Chong, standing right in front of Zaha, immediately kneels on the ground with a thud and bangs his head on the ground, begging Zaha to spare him. Everyone turns confused looks at Huyen. Why would Zaha kill him? Zaha unsheathes the sword he has on himself and decides to test the new sword on the older, longer one. Sir Jim asks if that's alright, Zaha's sword looks quite nice, is Zaha fine with not being able to use that sword anymore? Zaha doesn't answer and covers both swords with blazing yellow chi. Abruptly and aggressively, Zaha clashes the swords against each other. In an unexpected turn of events, it is the shorter newer sword that breaks clangs to the ground. Everyone watches in disbelief, after praising the new sword that much, what just happened? Huyen begins to sweat even more. Zaha stupidly looks at the newer now broken sword. Sir Jim suddenly shouts that Zaha's earlier sword must be legendary, and asks where he acquired something so amazing from. Zaha tells him that it is just something the Black Rabbit Union Master was using. Sir Jim observes that the blade is priceless, and he'd like to know how the Black Rabbit Union Master managed to get something that amazing. Sir Jim Kyoliang turns away to excuse himself, and says that he will go make something else still wondering about how the Black Rabbit Union Master has something so amazing. The man that accompanied GM Kyoliang takes the broken sword from Zaha, puts it back in the box, and leaves. The man is patting Sir GM's shoulder in consolation when they see themselves out. Zaha stares after them and Cha Sante starts laughing good-naturedly. Zaha orders the dipshit to stop laughing and he obliges immediately. He tells Sante that no one is above failure, just like Zaha. Sungtae has never failed at anything before. That's right, Sungtae brags. He knows not the concept of failure. After all, he can only fail if he actually does something. Sungtae has never failed since he has never done jack shit. Sungtae fumes silently and Red Monkey begins laughing. Zaha abruptly runs away and tells them that he is going to sleep. Sungtae asks Zaha why he is going to sleep outside. Zaha answers that he just wants to. Zaha walks outside in the beautiful purple evening looks at the floating petals, and lays down against a plum blossom tree. To sleep. The crazy monk is a grandmaster that practices esoteric Buddhism and in terms of Zaha's past life, he would be the former crazy demon. He was one of the calamity-like people that the people of the Jianghu must never mess with. The crazy monk dragged Zaha all the way from the central plains to Tibet to have Zaha taste some white flame herbs. All those from the black faction and demonic heretic cult that they saw along the way met their ends at the crazy monk's hands. If the crazy monk didn't reach enlightenment and gone to Tibet, half the masters of the central plains would have died at his hands. Although Zaha had never once called crazy monk master while he was being dragged around, he would always call Zaha his disciple. Looking back on it after becoming the crazy demon, Zaha guesses that the crazy monk was dot his master. The crazy monk speaks that he will pass on his weapon to his disciple, Zaha. When Zaha asks why, the crazy monk tells him that he no longer needs it. Zaha grumpily wonders how he can use something like that when he is not a monk, and why the crazy monk removed the top before giving it to Zaha. Zaha's bloodlust is too sharp, so the crazy monk tells him he will confiscate the sharp end. The rod itself is a magnificent weapon. 
Zaha could say it is similar to an unbreakable conviction. Zaha asks him if it will really not break. The crazy monk tells him that Zaha is as good as dead if his conviction breaks, so there is no need to worry. When Zaha asks what that means, the crazy monk tells him that it means exactly as it sounds. Zaha glances at the rod, grabs it with both hands and picks it up. Zaha asks the crazy monk where he is going. The crazy monk is going back. Zaha wonders if he is just going to go. The crazy monk tells him that it's called a journey because there is a place to go back to. He has fulfilled many things, so it's time to empty them again. Zaha wonders what if one has nowhere to go back to, like himself. The crazy monk glares at Zaha and asks why doesn't he have a place to go back to. His eyes gleam and he tells Zaha that he will shave that unsightly hair clean off if he comes to see the crazy monk anytime. Zaha doesn't want that. In any case, Zaha must not get himself killed chattering away somewhere, and come find the crazy monk if he starts feeling stifled. With a final son of a bitch, the crazy monk is off. Zaha watches the crazy monk leave, and travels alone from that point on, with just his master's rod as company. Izaho's eyes open to find petals floating above him, waking up right underneath a plum blossom tree, where he went off to sleep. The day progresses while Huyan trains Sunte in swordsmanship, and Zaha's subordinates train diligently in the training area. Zaha watches them from his perch atop the house's rooftop. Zaha cools down with closed eyes in the bath. Days pass. He is now watching over Dako Seng and his subordinates. Zaha trains with his back against a tree while Gold Boar and Red Monkey chatter around him. Zaha meditates and sits in discussion with White Tiger, Green Dragon and White Rooster. Administrator Bayak goes about with his sketching. Zaha meditates in his bedroom at night and grows stronger. More days pass. Cha Sungte still trains under Huyen's dedicated guidance. The clouds burst, raining down heavily. Zaha's subordinates train in the rain, half naked, led by So Gumpyam. Zaha meditates with his back against a tree, and it keeps pouring. More days pass. A new sun comes up. Zaha meditates, and a magenta ball of chi flares in Zaha's hands, maintaining control wonderfully. The energy eventually subsides, back inside Zaha, and he slowly opens his eyes to his surroundings. Zaha smiles. He has fully mastered the flame chicken stage and entered the battle chicken stage. His subordinates train hard under Gumpyang's trained eye, and Zaha joins the men in their training. The men are surprised that their union master is here and among them. Zaha tells them to not mind him and continue doing what they've always done. Gumpyang nods in understanding, wondering what Zaha is trying to do now. The men train, and so does Zaha, punching and jabbing the air. More days pass. Zaha cultivates more chi and trains punctually with his men, some more days pass. Zaha sits with his back against a tree, deep in meditation. A voice reaches Zaha, telling his clan leader that it has already been 108 days. Zaha opens one eye and is greeted by a ragged-looking but gleaming Cha Sante, with actual facial hairs grown from hard work. Zaha opens both eyes and smiles. He asks Sante if he feels any stronger. Cha Sante grins and tells him that he has become incomparably stronger compared to himself from 108 days ago. Zaha turns to Huyen Chong and asks him if Sunte really grew stronger. Huyen reveals that Sunte has at least become a swordsman. Although it was a short period of time, he has learned the basics, principles, and forms of the spectral swift sword. Huyen also passed down a cultivation technique, and Sunte's been accumulating internal energy with him in the evenings. Although there was insufficient time to accumulate internal energy, Sunte's dantan was formed and he has learned to bring it out and use internal energy from it. Zaha acknowledges that Huyen has worked hard and asks how the teaching was. Huyen's brows throw in seriousness, and he tells Zaha that he'd like to continue teaching Sante if Zaha will allow it. Zaha is surprised. Come to think of it, Huyen Chong has changed too, perhaps he has reached some sort of enlightenment while teaching Cha Sante. Zaha turns to Sante to ask his opinion, and Sante tells that he'd like to continue learning as well. Zaha stares at the two men for a while then tells them that they've all fulfilled the pact, so they are free to do as they like from now on. They both thank Zaha. Zaha asks Sungtae how he feels about finally stepping foot into the Jianghu. Sungtae does not find it bad. Zaha tells him that if Sungtae had continued to eat and drink in brothels as he had been doing, he wouldn't have had any risk of dying because he was too weak. But now, his life will become much harder because of the martial art he has learned. 
This is how Zaha perceived Jiang Hu. Cha Sungtae smiles and reveals that he has only just begun, and he does not regret it. He did not know the feeling of getting stronger with each passing day. The feeling is just great. Izaha chuckles. That is what most martial artists are like. Most of them don't regret the life they've lived other than the moment when they get stabbed in the heart. Becoming stronger has an irresistibly powerful charm to it. Zaha commends Huyen Chion on good work as well. Huyen Chong bows in gratitude. The sun shines bright on a new day as Zaha is leaving the Black Rabbit Union. He comes across Sungate and Huyen, and Cha Sungtae asks Zaha where he is going. Zaha is going to do some dual gambling. On his way to do that, he will take a look at the Ihua area. Sungtae doesn't know what dual gambling is so Huyen tells him it is simply betting money and fighting, it could be nothing else. Sungtae wonders why Zaha would suddenly go do that, but Huyen doesn't know that either, it'd be weirder if anyone knows what Zaha is thinking. Leaves float in the day air as Zaha exits the Black Rabbit Union. Thinking back on it, the reason Zaha's face looks so grim in the past was because of the dual gambling den. One's face would change shape if it gets beat up a lot, and Zaha got beat up a lot, after all. He learned a lot from that place. Even from his very first loss, he realizes that there's a lot that he could learn. As he got beat up, he learned how to counterattack. He also learned how to analyze his opponent's strength by their looks, vibes, and the look in their eyes. The reason that people who have reached the lowest point in their lives frequently visit the dual gambling den is that they can earn money even if they lose in fights. Izaha finally reaches the dual gambling den neighborhood which is bustling with all kinds of people. Zaha walks around observing everything, and the fucked up place is still the same as ever. He chuckles and enters one particular in which has cooking smoke coming out of it. Zaha enters inside and seats himself at an isolated table. An errand boy comes to ask what Zaha would like to have, and he tells him to bring him one bottle of Dukong liquor. Zaha twists his neck and takes a look around at the people. The atmosphere here is as shitty as usual. These guys are probably fighters that are participating in dual gambling. The errand boy brings his liquor bottle, and Zaha pours himself a cup, gulping it down in one go. Suddenly, a bulky man arrives at Zaha's table, picks up his liquor, and drinks the alcohol straight from the bottle. The bulky man gives a hearty smile, and settles himself opposite Zaha. The bulky man observes that Zaha is a new face and asks him to buy his big brother some liquor, and the bulky man will be nice and tells Zaha all about this place. Abruptly, Zaha starts laughing loudly, then grows silent with a stretched hand out, but the bulky man keeps laughing. Zaha demands the bottle from the man, but he has already finished the bottle though. Zaha snatches the bottle straight from the bulky man's hand and smashes it on his head. The man starts bleeding and Zaha grabs him by his hair and smashes his head to the table, hard. It grows silent, and everyone in the end turns to look at Zaha's table. Zaha pulls the man's head up from the table by his hair, while he grunts in pain, bloody and bruised. Zaha orders the errand boy from earlier to bring him some more Dukon liquor. Zaha turns to the injured bulky man and commands him to get lost. The man stands up immediately and runs out the door. The kind errand B wipes Zaha's table and asks him if he is okay. When Zaha asks what he is supposed to be okay about, the errand boy tells him that the man just now was the red light district's brothel owner, who will probably bring his guys back here. Zaha asks how many people the man usually brings back and the errand boy reveals that he will probably bring back ten or more men. Zaha brings his liquor glass towards his mouth and wonders if that will bring him some money. The errand boy looks at him in confusion and asks Zaha if he has been here before. The errand boy has never seen him around before though. Zaha tells him that he came in the past. The young errand boy runs to the front of the inn and rings a bell to gather everyone's attention. He announces and asks if anyone wants to participate in the inn duel. The new customer here, Zaha, will be fighting with the black whale brothel owner that just got beaten to a pulp. The brothel owner will probably have at least 10 subordinates, and there will be no participation fee for this. Those betting on Zaha can put money in the basket on the left side, and those betting on black whale brothel can put money in the basket on the right side. The inn will be providing an additional 500 niang to the winning side. With that, they are free to start betting. The errand boy goes around carrying the baskets and the customers put money in the left or the right basket. After most of the money has been tossed in, the right side has gathered more coins than the left. An older bent man approaches Zaha's table along with a taller lean companion. The old man asks young man Zaha where he is from. 
Zaha orders them to ask him questions after the sons of bitches have paid up, and they look away. Zaha sips his liquor, now that this is happening, it reminds him of the past. Another big man comes barging in and walks to Zaha's table. He orders Zaha to come outside, and Zaha pours himself another glass and tells the man to wait for him to drink this glass first. The man makes a face but tells Zaha to finish that and get up quickly. Zaha downs the drink, thumps the glass back on the table, and stands up, ready. The man turns his back on Zaha and walks ahead, thinking he would follow. Zaha looks at the back of the man's head and suddenly, he smashes the second bottle of liquor on his head. The man immediately crashes to the ground and the hole and bursts out in cheers, excited by the intense start. Zaha smiles and walks outside, greeted by the ugly bruised face of the brothel owner and his men. Zaha asks them if they are barehanded, and after one look from the brothel owner, the group drops their weapons. The brothel owner smiles, yeah, they are barehanded now. Zaha chuckles and steps forward, and suddenly, all the men lunge at him simultaneously. Zaha taps one foot on the ground, twists, and aggressively kicks one of the men's face, who crashes into his subordinates. The brothel men sweat with anxiousness and stop in fear. Zaha smiles and charges at them, punching one man, twisting another's arm, and poking another in his eyes. Zaha twists and kicks others and blocks them. Zaha completes his twist, and a group of men goes flying back. The men cautiously pick their weapons back up, and Zaha's face breaks out in a creepy laugh. A man tightens his grip on his sword and charges at Zaha. Zaha darts sideways to dodge the swipe, pulls the man forward by his hands, and twists his arm viciously. The man kills in pain, grabbing at his broken arm, and another man tries to punch Zaha. Zaha uses his palm to thwart the man's punch and aggressively twists his arm behind his back. More men lunge at Zaha, and he uses his open palm to strike them all down and break their hands. All the men now lie on the ground, holding their broken arms or faces. The audience has come outside from the inn, and they all gawk with open mouths. No brothel man remains standing, and the old man from earlier calls out to Ilbo, the errand boy, to give out the money. Ilbo arrives outside and distributes everyone their money. The customers who bet for Zaho chatter happily, glad to have earned themselves some allowance money, and money they could use for another drink. Ilbo walks to Zaha and gives him his hard-won money. Zaha picks up a Niang from the victory basket and tells Ilbo to give it to the ones on the ground. He takes out two silver Niang and gives them to Ilbo as well, and Ilbo beams with joy. Zaha tells Ilbo to pack up the rest of the money and he obliges, wrapping the money in a sack. Ilbo tells Zaha that with those skills of his, he can probably participate in a battle too. Zaha asks him who is the one with the biggest bounty right now, and Ilbo reveals that person to be the undefeated Gong Fang Yun. However, Zaha will need at least 10,000 Niang before Dong Fang will fight Zaha. Zaha smirks. Dong Fang Yun was an opponent that Zaha couldn't even dream of fighting in his past life, the man known as the king of dual gambling. Zaha doesn't have 10,000 Niang yet. He tightens his grip on the money sack. He will earn 10,000 Niang and go meet with the king of dual gambling and then settle the past debts once and for all. Zaha reaches a spot where all men are wiping and sharpening their weapons. This is Weapon Duel Gambling Denver, a gamble where weapons would clash against and break each other to win. Zaha walks inside the place and challenges an old cunning man, Gu Jangak. Gu gives a sharp smile, surprised that Zaha wants to challenge him. He tells Zaha that it is quite expensive to challenge him, and tells Zaha to put down the money he has and show Gu. Zaha thumps the money sack he just won on the table, and the old man Gu smiles. He asks Zaha if he is sure he can bet this much. Zaha tells Gu to run away if he is scared, perhaps the king of weapon gambling is scared of this much amount. Gu Jongak rubs his forehead, he doesn't know where Zaha came from, but he doesn't seem like he is from the orthodox or one of the great clans. Gu turns to the other men in the room and demands anyone who knows Zaha to speak up now. He will give one gold niang to the one who tells Gu about Zaha. But none of the people in the room knows Zaha or knows of him. Gu sighs, turns to Zaha, and tells him to put his weapon on the table first. Zaha's eyes turn frosty, and he tells Gu that while it is true that he is here for the first time, he already found out all the information he needed in advance. How dare Gu try to cheat him? The old man dare treat Zaha like he is an idiot just because he is talking nicely? While it looks like it is a battle between weapons, it's actually also a fight between internal energy. 
The reason why Gu Zhanggak can stay as the king of weapon gambling is not just because of how sturdy and sharp his sword is. The true reason is because of his robust internal energy. But he wants Zaha to put his weapon on the table so he can put his internal energy into it. Gu Zhanggak smiles snidely and tells Zaha that fighting with a weapon is bound to cause internal injuries and that he is just doing this to protect Zaha. Life is more important than his weapon or money. Zaha slowly unsheathes his sword and stops the old man from more chit-chat. They should get started already. Zaha will let Gu have the first strike and positions his sword horizontally to prepare for it. Gu smiles, and out of his pick from the swords on the wall, he opts for the Black Heaven sword. Once swords start flying, innocent people might get hurt, so Zaha should make sure to hold on to his tightly. Gu asks Zaha if he is ready. Zaha is prepared and tells Gu to stop talking already. Gu Jonggak swears, the fucking brat, Zaha, keeps talking casually to him. Suddenly, Gu pulls back his sword and aggressively brings it down. Zaha realizes that Gu wants to slightly strike at the side of the blade to break it, and tilts his sword a little. Gu's sword strikes Zaha's but it doesn't break. Gu's smile disappears and he tells Zaha it is his turn now. Gu positions his sword horizontally, prepared for Zaha's strike. Zaha raises his sword. He reminds the old man that it is the rule for one to get stabbed once by everyone here if they try to cause harm to their opponent. Gu is surprised that Zaha knows the rules and fiddles with his necklace. Suddenly, Zaha brings his sword down on Gu's with vicious force, and the Black Heaven sword breaks clean in half. Abruptly, Gu lunges and throws something at Zaha. He jumps back to avoid getting hit. His eyes glint with cold fury, and harshly stabs the old man in his gut. How dare the bloody old man ambush Zaha? Blood flows from Gu Jonggak's nose and mouth, and he begs Zaha to spare his life. Zaha grabs Gu's head and throws him aggressively to the ground. The room full of men watches in disbelief and shock. Zaha opens a metal box behind Gu's table and transfers the owed amount of coins to his own sack. Zaha asks the men what they are doing. It is the rule of this place that one would get stabbed once by everyone in the room if they tried to hurt their opponent. The one who tried to launch a surprise attack first was Gu. If the fuckers have eyes, then they must have seen what happened. Why are they not moving at all? Zaha turns to look at the men, and they remain standing still. Zaha huffs. These men are such fucking idiots. Zaha reaches the battle pavilion arena and walks inside. Inside, two men fight in the center while the audience cheers them on loudly from the stands. Battle pavilion is a place where people fight. Since it is where the most primitive type of fight takes place, using poison is forbidden. Zaha thumps his money-filled sack on a table. In the center arena, one man falls, and the other is announced as the victor while other people cheer loudly. Whispers start in the stands. Someone heard something shocking. Apparently, someone challenged Dong Fabian. A woman whispers the newest development in the battle pavilion's host, strategist Pyong's ears. Zaha watches the current ongoings from the stands and strategist Pyong approach him. Pyong confirms that Zaha is the challenger who challenged Dong Fang Yan, and Zaha agrees. Strategist Pyong shrugs. It seems to him that some young kid who doesn't know how the world works is here to throw his money away again. He tells the audience to clap for that foolhardiness, but they remain unmoved. Strategist Pyong swishes his fan and declares that Zaha might be an exceptionally skilled martial master, and break the undefeated record of Dong Fa Yun. A man shouts from the audience and tells strategist Pyung to stop with that boring talk and proceed quickly. Strategist Pyung touches his closed fan to his face and tells Zaha that if he wants to get Dong Fa Yun into the arena, he will have to show what he is capable of. If the bet amount is too high, no one will want to challenge Zaha, so they should start with a 1000 Yang duel for a warm-up. Zaha could have another opponent depending on the results of the match. Zaha tells him to make the arrangements, and strategist Pyong wonders why young people these days always speak so rudely. Strategist Pyong turns to the audience, they all heard it, and he asks who wants to challenge the man who wants to challenge Dong Fan Yun. The bet amount is 1000 yen, and they can fight barehanded or with weapons. Three men jump from the stands into the center arena. No one said anything about three versus one and strategist Pyong tells them to decide amongst themselves who will stay, the other two will get lost. The third shorter man glares at the two others and they both leave immediately. Everyone might know him, but Zaha might not so strategist Pyong introduces the man. This man fights 1000 Yang duels often, and his name is Bang Gaik. 
Zaha just watches silently, it has been a while. There was a time when Zaha got beat up by him so badly and got his money taken. Strategist Pyung hypes the crowd with a smile, asking why one would use a shield in Jianghu. However, everyone would take back those words after they see Bang Gaek fight. As the audience already knows, Bang Gaek is a man who is already training quietly for the sake of avenging his loss against Dong Fan Yun. Two women go around the stands collecting bet money from them. Strategist Pyung chuckles, addresses Zaha using the words country bumpkin, and calls him out to the arena. Pyung observes that Zaha looks very relaxed, and Zaha reaches the center arena where he stands opposite Bang Gaek. Strategist Pyung tells both of them to get ready and tells the women to finish collecting money in the audience seats too, he will count to ten. Bang Gaek holds his shide close in one hand and a sword in the other. Zaha just stares at him and strategist Pyung announces the start of the gamble duel by bringing his fan all the way down between the two men. As soon as the duel starts, Bang Gaek lunges at Zaha with his sword and when Zaha dodges, Bang Jeek brings his shield forward immediately to block any attack. Zaha's leg moves and he kicks Bang's shield so hard that he is pushed back a few feet. Bang Gaek laughs creepily and Zaha chuckles when he notices the fucker laughing. Bang raises his sword and lunges again at Zaha. Lime Yellow Chi bursts around Zaha, and he activates Unwavering Stance. As soon as Bang reaches him, Zaha's leg erupts and Chi shoots out aggressively, and kicks the shield again, hard. Bang Gate goes rolling far from the force of Zaha's kick, teeth chattering, he feels like something like this has happened before. A furious Zaha reaches Bang again, and kicks his shield again, and again with vicious bursts of energy. The shield's metal pierces Bang Gate's forehead from the force of Zaha's kicks, and he rolls away again. Zaha follows him and kicks him over and over and over atop his shield. The crowd watches in anticipating silence. Zaha knows that the whole point of the fights here is to show them that the standards of the whole Jianghu have dropped so much that the hidden martial masters no longer appear. Zaha is still kicking Bang Gaek viciously. The son of a bitch has really become a turtle by now. Zaha's eyes flare with energy, and he gives one more violent chi-filled kick. Bang Gaek vomits blood and he shouts that he lost. Zaha halts mid-kick when he hears the words, turns to Strategist Pyung and demands his money, his 1,000 yang. Strategist Pyung grits his teeth in annoyance and erupts in anger at Zaha. What the hell does Zaha think he is doing? He needs to show what he is capable of so that the fight will become exciting, and he calls Zaha brainless. Zaha calls Strategist Pyung a fucker and tells him to stop saying moronic shit like that and just announce the results before he slaps the shit out of him. When strategist Pyung still doesn't announce the results, Zaha's eyes go dark and he threatens that he truly will slap him. Immediately, strategist Pyung's fan goes up and he announces the newbie as the winner. The crowd erupts in cheers. Zaha glances back at them. Zaha spots a familiar face in the stands, that rascal is the waiter from just now who looks like the kind that'd be addicted to gambling. Being a waiter is such a promising job though, he is a retard. Strategist Pyung flutters open his fans and address Zaha. He knows that Zaha must be dying to fight Dong Fan Yun right away, but today, they need to get more gamblers coming in to build up the hype. Strategist Pyong will make sure to give Zaha a grand treatment, so he should get a good rest. After he settles today, Strategist Pyong will get him his fight tomorrow. Zaha agrees with him without a problem. Strategist Pyong tells Zaha that he is young and new here, he should speak a little more formally. Zaha tells him to pay him 2,000 Niang if strategist Pyung wants him to do that. Zaha gave him a little discount since he looks especially older than him. At that, strategist Pyung spits on the ground and orders one of his men to bring the challenger, Zaha, to the Phoenix Room. Bang Gaek warns Zaha that strategist Pyung is the kind of person he should be careful of, he shouldn't be so edgy. Zaha asks him what's wrong, perhaps he uses things like beauty to trick others or maybe he schemes against others. Bang Geek turns a surprised look at Zaha and asks him if he has been here before. But Bang Geek hasn't seen him here before so that solves that. A man approaches Zaha to return his sack of money, and Zaha takes out one silver nyang and gives it to Bang Geek, who stares at it with shock. Zaha tells him that it is a cut of his winnings, Bang Geek's insides must be churning, so he should use that to get some rice soup. Zaha tells him to not go around wearing that joke of a shield when he is that weak and turns away from a confused Bang Geek. That is what Bang Geek said to Zaha in the past. Zaha thinks he said something like he shouldn't go around wearing that joke of a scythe when he is that weak. A man leads Zaha to a curtained phoenix room. 
Zaha wonders if this is where he will see the beauty deception that he has only heard about, and feigns a racing heartbeat. Zaha moves the curtain aside to enter the room and is greeted by a beautiful silver-haired woman in white robes. The woman bows in greeting and tells Zaha she will be waiting on him. Her name is Bek Soa and she requests Zaha to let her know if he needs anything. Clothes, weapons that he wants, food, and even alcohol. She can get most of those things to fit Zaha's preferences as long as it's not too hard to get. Zaha asks her if there is poison in the food. There's not. Zaha asks her why not. They need Dong Fanyun to win so that they can earn money though. Bek Soa tells him that no hype can be created by an undefeated martial artist if he keeps winning. Zaha disagrees with that. Since there's an undefeated martial artist, more gamblers gather. Gamblers would bring martial artists that they've groomed, invite external martial masters as well, and then also invite known acquaintances to challenge Dong Fan Yun. They'd gather all sorts of martial artists to bring and offer money to them. Bek Soa has nothing to say to that, and sweetly asks if she should bring some liquor instead if Zaha doesn't feel like eating. Zaha tells her that he only drinks Dukong liquor, and she agrees to make preparations. Zaha asks her if it is free. It is. And it isn't poison either. Zaha tells Soa to bring the liquor then, and she tells him she'd be back shortly. Soa asks Zaha what kind of lady he would like. Zaha is confused about that question and Soa tells that there will be someone serving him the drinks. However, they're not ladies that'll definitely sleep with him. Most of them just want to serve drinks. But who knows? There could be a lady that likes Zaha, and Soa wonders if she should just choose someone pretty for him. Zaha tells her that there is no need for that, she should just bring someone good at drinking. The shock from that finally wipes the cheerful smile from Soa's face. But she recovers immediately, and nods in understanding. She will make the preparations. Zaha drags a chair towards a table where a lady is already seated. The table is set with liquor and snacks and a candle. The pretty lady with brown hair, and red lips and nails, introduces herself as Hyuk Soryang. Zaha asks her if she is good at drinking, the lady is confused by that so Zaha asks it again, and she tells him yes, she is good at drinking. She smiles, and pours the Dukang liquor into a glass, moving it towards Zaha. Zaha glances at the ripple in the cup, closes his eyes, and imagines himself being at the center of a giant ripple. He can sense everyone around him to a certain radius, but he sees no one other than Hyuk Soryang, sitting with him, and Bek Soa, standing outside and waiting on him. He opens his eyes and realizes that the others aren't near here. Soryang delicately asks Zaha what he is doing, and Zaha stares silently at her. In her previous life, these two women were rumored to be the most beautiful people in this place. It is Zaha's first time meeting them in person. When he used wandering vision to check, both of them knew martial arts, and they're pretty skilled. But this is a disappointment. Zaha was kinda looking forward to it because he thought the beauty deception would be much more than this. But then he wonders that perhaps it hasn't started yet. Zaha tilts the liquor bottle and pours some for Soryang, telling her to drink one too. Soryang thanks Zaha and moves for her glass, Zaha glares and suddenly he shoots up from his chair and jabs her in the back of the neck using unwavering finger strike. Hyuk Soryang's mouth drops open and she begins trembling profusely, staring at Zaha. Zaha pulls out a hair ornament from Soryang's hair, settles back in his chair, and finds a small hidden ball filled with white powder. Zaha smiles wondering what they have here, it is a drug powder. He wonders what it does and if one would die if they eat this. He thinks about what he should do, he is so curious. He is dying to find out, all the while Soryang trembles in her chair. Zaha says whatever and pours the powder into Soryang's liquor glass in her hand. Zaha grins and tells Leiji Hyuk it is time to drink. Soryang's eyes widen, and Zaha grabs her mouth, squeezes it open, and pours the drink inside. Droplets escape from her mouth as she works to swallow. Zaha praises her for her good job at swallowing it down, finally releases her face, and dumps the empty glass back on the table. Zaha folds his arms and settles down. If it is a poison that kills, Soryang will die. If it's not the kind that kills, well, that'd be fortunate for her. Hyuk Soryang stares silently at Zaha and sweats. Some time passes as the candle nearly melts all the way, and Zaha laughs, odd. She is still alive, guess it wasn't a fatal poison, perhaps Lady Hyuk is a kind person. Lady Hyuk Soryang starts crying heavily, chest heaving. Zaha sighs. He is glad he blocked her mute pressure point. 
it'd get really noisy if she cries. A female voice calls out a sir from behind sheer red curtains. Zaha Spi walks to the curtains. Beck Soa swings the curtain aside and asks Zaha if he needs anything else, and suddenly jabs her in her pressure points as well. Soa turns a horrified look at Zaha, who grabs her tightly by the back of her neck and throws her on a chair beside Soryan. Zaha removes a ball from Soa's hair ornament as well and splits it open to find more drug powder inside. Zaha lets out an unsurprised gasp at finding another drug powder capsule. He pours some liquor, adds in the drug, and forcefully feeds it to Soa by squeezing her cheeks. Beck Soa tears up and Zaha is annoyed that she is crying too, wondering what on earth could the drug be for them to cry like this. Both of the women let out a soft sigh, sweating and face turning pink. Zaha looks at the burning women again and comes to a realization. It is an aphrodisiac drug, that's it, they won't die if they eat it though. Well, even if they do die, it is none of Zaha's business. Zaha stands up from the chair to go get a drink before coming back. He orders the two women to stay wide awake. Zaha walks outside into the night air, acknowledging that beauty deception doesn't work on this body of his. Zaha is back at the Ilba works at, while he serves him. Since Ilba earned money thanks to Zaha, he cheerfully tells him that this bottle will be free. Zaha asks Ilba the errand boy if it is poisoned and he denies it, telling Zaha that the gamblers won't let him live if he dares poison it. He'd get beaten to death. Anyone can poison it though, so Zaha was just checking. Ilbo guesses Zaha's right, and looks around left and right, before leaning in and telling Zaha that he intends to bet everything he has on Zaha's match tomorrow. So what does Zaha think about it? Zaha asks who Ilbo thinks will win. The errand boy confidently says that Zaha will win. When Zaha asks the reason, Ilbo tells him that's the problem. It feels like Zaha will win, but he is not sure why. Guess Zaha could say it is the instinct of an errand boy. Ilbo shouldn't bet everything he has based on instinct though. Zaha asks Ilbo if he will do as Zaha says, and the boy enthusiastically says yes. Zaha smirks and tells Ilbo to quit gambling. But if Ilbo wins this time around, his life would change completely. Zaha asks him how his life would change with that kind of money, and Ilbo tells him he doesn't want to be an errand boy forever. Zaha smiles and sets the record straight. It is more that Ilbo doesn't dare to try other work. Ilbo flushes and looks away. Money is needed if he wants to try other work. Zaha pours himself a glass and tells him that's not true. It's because Ilbo hasn't searched for what he likes, what he wants or what he wants to do. Ilbo doesn't know what he truly wants. That is the truth and Ilbo asks him if Zaha knows what he wants. Zaha tells him to not ask others about their personal lives and ask that question to himself. They look at each other and down their glasses at the same time. A group of men arrives at the inn so Ilba leaves Zaha to greet them running. The man in front with her hair in a man bun abruptly slaps Ilbo, swearing at him, and says that a fucking waiter is drinking instead of doing his job, and the men accompanying him laugh. Ilbo rubs his head placatingly, smiles, and apologizes, he drank a cup since something good happened today. He invites the men to come in, looks at Zaha, and smiles, life sucks. The man-bun man suddenly freezes and turns to Ilbo, asking if he just threw shade at him. Ilbo flinches as the man threateningly walks towards him, and Zaha abruptly stands up from his chair, interrupting them. He tells the bastard that it was him, and the three men suddenly surround Zaha. Zaha just stares at them and moves, as fast as lightning, and grabs the man-bun man by his neck. Zaha squeezes his neck and asks him why he hit a waiter out of nowhere. The man can't answer due to being nearly strangled, and Zaha's middle finger and thumb meet, flicking the man on his forehead so hard that he crashes to the far wall. Zaha walks to the other two men and flicks them each on the forehead as well, aggressively, and they fall. Ilpo asks Zaha if it'd be hard for him to learn that finger flick, and Zaha tells him yes, it'll be very hard. Ilpo sits at a table and sighs, everything in the world is so hard, he can't even learn a single finger flick. Ilpo suddenly asks Zaha if they've met before though, and Zaha tells him they haven't. Ilpo is sure of it too, but Zaha is strangely friendly. He wonders if he leaves this place, where he would need to go to find Zaha. It feels like Zaha might not remain here even if he wins tomorrow. Zaha can't let him know because Ilpo is too weak, and Ilpo tells him that's because he hasn't learned any martial arts. Zaha sips his liquor and reveals that he never considered himself weak even back when he didn't know martial arts. Ilpo is surprised and asks Zaha how he was able to think that way. 
Zaha doesn't reply and thanks Zilpo for the drinks. Zaha returns to the Phoenix room and finds the two women in the same position as he left them in. The women's eyes are closed, cheeks still flush, and Zaha abruptly stabs a dagger into the table, making them open their eyes. Hands still on the dagger's hilt, Zaha tells them that their pressure points will be released soon. If they dare scream or say anything other than the answers to Zaha's questions, he will be using this dagger. If the women think their hands are faster than Zaha's, they should feel free to pull out this dagger after their pressure points are released. Zaha will assume they want to fight to the death and grant them death. Zaha tells them to blend if they still can't speak. Lady Hyuk Soryang speaks up first, telling them her pressure point has been released. Now, time for Zaha's question. He asks Soryang if strategist Pyung put them up to this. Soryang hesitates to answer and Zaha smirks, seems like she still doesn't understand her situation. Zaha guesses that could happen, but she is still not sure of who she should be afraid of. Zaha can see why she is acting like this. Zaha's fingers halt on his dagger, and he asks again, glare in place, did strategist Pyung put them up to this? This time she immediately answers with a yes. Zaha's fingers leave the dagger, that was a close save for her. Soryang should get this in her head, even if Zaha kills her, he still has back Soa. If Soryang dies, Soa will probably get scared, in that case, she will have no choice but to tell Zaha more than Soryang did. Soryang should understand her situation properly, and she nods with understanding. Bek Soa jerks and speaks meekly. Her mute point has been released too. Zaha smiles, that's great, and he wants the two of them to answer his questions together, they need to answer at the same time. The one who hesitates will be stabbed by this dagger and sent to the afterlife. Zaha's face breaks out in a wide toothy smile, isn't that great? The women sweat profusely, no it isn't. Zaha smiles and rubs his hands like a child, he is also curious to see as to who will die first. He asks the first question about who is above strategist Pyum. Zaha counts one, two, three, and both women answer the gambling king on three. Zaha tells them it is the right answer, and they've now extended their lives. He asks the second question, if the gambling king ranks higher than Dong Fan Yun, then they have to say above, otherwise, they should say below. Zaha's eyes grow dark and he counts to three. On three, both women answer above. Zaha feigns a gasp. He knew this much already. The problem is that he doesn't know the answer to the next question. He tells the two women that he will be counting to three slowly for this next question. They should think carefully and then answer. Jia asks who the gambling king is. He counts to three and both women answer Mr. Ouyang Bak at three. Zhao confirms if they are talking about Mr. Ouyang Bak the innkeeper of the Hell Inn, and the women answer in the affirmative. Zhao contemplates that. Based on what Zhao knows, Ouyang Bak is someone who doesn't make enemies. He is generous and gives out free liquor often. He also doesn't chase after debts much. Since he likes to gamble, he's lost a lot of money in a lot of places as well. This is surprising, and in that case, Zaha concludes that this is a fight between Zaha and An Helen. He pulls the dagger back from the table, hides it in his robes, and takes his leave, thanking the women for their answers. The women slump and sigh with relief. Zaha eventually arrives at the Hell Inn and sits at the table closest to the entrance. A waiter arrives and asks Zaha what he'd like to order. Zaha tells him to bring any baijiu. The waiter tells him that they do not sell any baijiu here, trying to make a joke. Zaha tells the asshole that it isn't funny and orders him to get him any baijiu now, and the waiter immediately obliges. An older man with shoulder-length silver hair arrives at Zaha's table and tells him that he hasn't seen him around before. Zaha looks up and comes face to face with the gambling king, Ouyang Bak, smoking a cigar. Zaha just stares at him silently, and Ouyang Bak apologizes for what Soryang and Soa did. It seems that strategist Pyung got caught while playing a prank. Zaha doesn't answer and wonders how Ouyang Bak knows that Zaha knows everything, and surprisingly, he has revealed his identity so quickly. Ouyang Bak seats himself opposite Zaha, gestures vaguely to a man, and suddenly everyone vacates the inn. The two men sit alone in the inn now. Ouyang Bak addresses Zaha and tells the young man that he doubts that Zaha is here to ruin his business. He tells Zaha that the challenge fee which is 10,000 Niang, along with the dividend from the gambler's bets totals up to 50,000 Niang. The amount is something Ouyang Bak would like Zaha to have, so he tells Zaha to accept it and leave immediately. 
While there have been martial artists from the unorthodox faction that took money without fighting, none have left with 50,000 yang before. Iza unenthusiastically mouths the amount, and wonders that didn't most of the people who fought with Dong Fan Yun die. To Za's knowledge, even though there are occasionally people who won, they die or go missing within a few days. Ouyang Bak has no idea why Zaha has come here to act like this. Ouyang Bak asks if he killed any of Zaha's acquaintances, or did Dong Fan kill any of Zaha's siblings or master. Otherwise, he doesn't know why Zaha is saying such things, despite Ouyang showing such hospitality and goodwill. Suddenly, a big shadow looms over them and Zaha notices the dual gambling king, Dong Fan Yun. Dong Fang drags a chair and sits with them. Ouyang Bak's thoughts haven't changed, 50,000 Yang. He asks to hear Zaha's thoughts on this. Dong Fang jerks and asks Ouyang why he would give 50,000 Yang to Zaha. Ouyang Bak tells Dong Fang to be quiet, Zaha is still his guest. Zaha chuckles and says what they are doing is not dual gambling, it is just cheating. Ouyang wonders isn't that how all businesses are? It's just a matter of whether it's a small or big business. Most businesses that gain a lot of profit are cheating. Zaha tells him that compared to their methods, mountain bandits and pirates are considered pretty innocent. Ouyang supplies that if his business has brought harm to Zaha, he will increase the compensation. Zaha's fingers tap aggressively on the table. The biggest problem with gambling is that it's fun. It's hard to quit. Maybe one will only stop when they lose everything they have or have their arm or leg cut off. It seems to Ouyang like Zaha knows it all very well. Zaha smirks, dual gambling can be justified to a certain extent, but cheating when gambling is different. They are routinely giving money to the nearby unorthodox faction martial masters to ask them to not come here. Since they are rich, they probably give them quite a lot too. Even if one day, the head of some family comes here, spends away all their family's money and dies here, that's way too normal of an occurrence in this place. The unorthodox factions near this place are expanding their forces with the money they get from Ouyang. Since he is not doing anything bad openly like robbing people in the mountains, the orthodox faction has a hard time catching them. Zaha gives Ouyang Bak a fury-filled cold glare. They are pretty amazing from various points of view. Ouyang Bak glares back and asks Zaha if he has any intention of negotiating. Zama smiles and slaps and bangs his hand on the table, he does. Since this all started with gambling, it should end with it. They are going to have a round of cheating gambling that Ouyang does. Ouyang Bak jerks in confusion over the use of the words cheating gambling. Zaha wants all of them to fight him in the arena. If they win, Zaha will die. If Zaha wins, everything in this place will be his. Zaha smiles generously. A great idea! The gambling king, Ouyang Bak, glares at Zaha. Zaha asks him if he is confused because the conditions are too advantageous for them, or if he is afraid they might lose everything in one go. Ouyang asks what would happen if he rejected Zaha. Ouyang Bak would probably get a more disadvantageous card if he rejected Zaha because all of Zaha's subordinates will arrive here tomorrow. Ouyang and his side have the advantage until tonight. Ouyang just stares at Zaha, and Dong Fan Yun tells him to let's just do this since Jia seems like a total nutcase. Izaha calls out to Ouyang Bak, suddenly curious about something. Ouyang hides his true identity, gives alcohol to challengers, and uses beauty deception schemes, aphrodisiacs, and anything else to make them as weak as possible before fighting Dong Fan Yun. He ambushes them if he loses, buries those he kills, uses the money he earns to treat gamblers to alcohol, acts like a good person, and gives money to bribe powerful underworld groups routinely. Yet the nickname he has gotten after living such a pathetic life is just the gambling king, Ouyan Bak sends Zaha a harsh stare, there is something he doesn't understand. If Zaha is that confident, why hasn't he killed them both here on the spot? That'd be more advantageous for Zaha. Zaha is pissed off. Who is Ouyang Bak to judge what's advantageous for Zaha? Does he think they are the same because they both run ins? Ouyang Bak is shocked by that latter statement about the ins. Zaha tells him to just forget it. If Ouyang has lived his life leeching off others so far, they should at least have a proper bet this time around. Zaha tells Sir Gambling King to stop thinking of moronic tricks to pull off. This infuriates Dong Fa Yun, but before he can act on that fury, Ouyang Bak interrupts him by confirming that Zaha runs an inn, and asks just who he is. Zaha tells him with a cold stare that he is the innkeeper of the Zaha Inn, and Ouyang Bak flinches. 
Dong Fangyun asks where that inn is but they both ignore him. The gambling king Ouyang Bak agrees to do as Zaha said, he will gather his people around and head to the arena. It seems that's the most advantageous move for Ouyang. As long as Zaha doesn't regret suggesting that. Zan nods, the value of someone who's in the Jianghu is to live without regrets, and he stands up, calling them vermin. Dong Fanyan stands as well. He cannot believe that he is killing a strange man like Zaha. That almost sounds impressive, and Zaha Mok asks if Dong Fang's nickname is Dual Gambling King, and that he looks all serious. That's pretty cool. Dong Fang's eyes gleam with anger, and he calls Zaha a brat. Ouyang Bak tells Dong Fang to release his anger at the arena and Dong Fang smiles creepily. He will make Zaha squirm and beg for mercy. The men leave the hell in and Dong Fang orders a confused underling to gather every one of their men in the arena right now. The increasing group of men make their way towards the arena and Zaha suddenly stops. Dong Fang tells him that it is too late for regrets, but Zaha just slaps three men to get them to go away and walks to the shop behind. He addresses the shopkeeper and requests one tangulu. The old shopkeeper obliges, giving him a tangulu and Zaha tells him to keep the change. The shopkeeper thanks him and Zaha turns around. It has been so long since he had a tangulu. Dong Fang fumes at the fucking idiot, but manages to restrain himself. A heavily breathing strategist Pyung reaches them from the crowd, wondering what's happening here. They were supposed to fight tomorrow. Dong Fang tells him to shut up and Zaha follows suit telling the ordinary strategist to shut up. Strategist Pyung balks. Dong Fang announces that the Hell Association will kill Zaha in this arena. Zaha waves his tangula stick at him and asks if Dong Fang wants to join in last. Is that how the gambling king or whatever should act? It seems like just anyone can have the word king in their nickname. Dong Fang Yun is shaking now with restrained anger. They are finally inside the arena and the stands are bustling with an eager crowd. Back at the center of the arena, Zaha is rotating his hand back and forth, warming up. An old man asks strategist Pyung what is happening and to explain it to him. But strategist Pyung tells him to just watch for today, and that money isn't the issue for this fight after all. The man continues by asking what fight is it, and why are they supposed to just watch it. Abruptly, Zaha claps his hands to gather everyone's attention and tells them all to listen up closely. Those who know, know, and those who don't, don't. However, the most powerful person in this place is the gambling king. Ouyang just stares at Zaha while Dong Fang shouts at him to shut up, but Zaha continues speaking. He calls Dong Fang an asshole, he will not shut up just because the son of a bitch said to. Dong Fang shuts up and Zaha addresses the crowd again. He tells the audience that the gambling king is the innkeeper of Helen. Everyone knows who that is, Ouyang Bak, and hushed whispers start among the crowd. Zaha will be fighting the whole Hell Association along with the Gambling King right now. If he dies, they all will just keep playing in the palms of the Gambling King. And if he wins, everything that belongs to the Gambling King will be Zaha's. Ouyang Bak and Dong Fan Yun turn silent furious stares at Zaha. Yu Zaha's finger goes up and he points it at Dong Fan, revealing to the crowd that the bastard is also a subordinate of the Gambling King. If he fought with just his skills, he's someone who would have died much earlier. The arena is silent. Zaha tells his opponent that he will give them just one chance to live. Those who are scared are free to go to the audience seats. None of the opponent men moves. Zaha's face breaks out in a cunning smile. Alrighty then. Zaha unsheathes his blade, which reflects a man's terrified face, steps forward and his opponents gulp with fear. But he realizes something and sheathes it back. There is no need to use a noble technique like the Plum Blossom Sword technique to kill mere gamblers. Dong Fang's face twitch with anger, and he commands his men to kill Zaha. Zaha slides his hand together, a yellow chi surrounds his body, and take his fighter's stance. He twists and dodges the men's attack, pushing forward with one palm out. Zaha's family has always been poor since he was young. He punches a man viciously in his gut, and dodges at swats at another. A man that succeeded with nothing. A man attacks Zaha and he darts sideways, twists around another older man and punches him in the abdomen. That's Zaha. Zaha jabs one in the shoulder and another in his foot. The men fall left and right, and Zaha circles his hands in the air and pushes out with both palms. The air explodes and everyone in Zaha's immediate vicinity is blown away. Dong Fan Yun tells the men to stand down, the small fries are of no help at all and vicious skilled men appear behind him. These are all the people who fought in the duel gambling so far. 
Zaha knows most of them, he knows how they fight, and what kind of personalities they have. And, the important thing is that among them, there are those that he needs to beat to death. Zaha unsheaths his sword once more, and everyone fidgets in fear of why he has taken his sword out again. Zaha lunges, and his eyes narrow as he charges at evil-faced demon, who committed all sorts of assault and rape in Zaha's past life. He will be the first to die, and he runs around, wondering why Zaha is charging at him all of a sudden. Zaha reaches the evil-faced demon, aggressively grabs him by the front of his robes, and slashes him, severing his head from his body. Blood splashes on Zaha's face as he lets go of the man. Everyone watches in shock, and Zaha turns around. There is one more to kill, and a bloody face Zaha tells a man to step aside and tells the son of a bitch to get lost. The man finally moves and the man Zaha is searching for jerks. He orders small eyes to come to him, but he begins shaking in fear. This is Slit's smile, he killed his fellow gamblers from time to time for no good reason. Slit smile stares at Zaha and runs away, but Zaha crouches to pick up a fallen dagger, covers it in fire, and throws it at the running man. The fire dagger pierces through Slit's smile and hits the far wall, burning. Men's mouths drop open, and Dongfang swears, positioning his twin swords. Zaha jumps and lunges at Dongfang, and their swords clash with a sharp clang. Zaha jumps back and swings again, but two twin men appear behind him, striking at Zaha simultaneously. Zaha jumps up high up into the arena, Dong Fang and strategist Pyong Gok from below. His sword erupts in fire and Zaha twists like a raging inferno, fire surrounding him, and pushes outwards. Suddenly, it starts raining fire and molten stripes of fire strike the ground. Dong Fang's face changes to alarming as opponents go up in flames, and Zaha lands smoothly on the ground. He twists and slashes and strategist Pyong's head is severed from his body. His head rolls to the ground with a thud, and Zaha stands. Cold fury gleams in Zaha's eyes. We have covered every chapter in this video of this manhwa. There are no more chapters available at the moment. We will have to wait for at least two months to continue because we are waiting for new chapters. Thank you all for watching it until the end. Everyone is looking shocked. The man's arm is injured. His hand is covered with blood. Zaha is looking at him. He says pathetic bastards, then he says right. He was pathetic as well. Everyone is looking at him, confused and scared. Zaha closes his hand fan, and he begins to sing after spending 30 years in a gambling den. The people there look scared, and they start to wonder why he is suddenly sending Zaha to continue his singing, saying that his hair, which was black when he started, became white when he stopped. The audience starts singing with him, saying they spend all their hard-earned money. Zaha says he spent all of it. Is it just his money? The audience replies, no, of course not. He says he used everything, including the money of his friends and even his relatives. Without any hesitation, he finally went back to his house after a long while, but there was no one to greet him happily. The man becomes surprised and asks himself, what are they all doing? Why are they all sending it together? The audience says they took out the money hidden in the closure and headed towards the gambling den. Everyone in the neighborhood looked at him with contempt, and everyone they met locked at them with contempt. Zaha says to tell people that if he does not appear again, he must have died while gambling. Even though he is not yet at the casino, he can already see cards in front of him. The goddess of fortune is probably on his side today. Today is the day when luck is probably good, the audience says today is the day when luck is probably good. Today is the day when luck will be good. Zaha strikes on his hand with his fan. He looks determined. He becomes speechless. And looking at all the people, he says, but today's luck is not good. The audience becomes scared when he tells them this place will be shut down from today onward. The idiots better leave now. He says they are closed. He shouts, gets lost, and calls them fucking idiots. Everyone starts running, and then Zaha asks about gambling. King, did he think he would win if all of his subordinates came at him? The king is speechless. Zaha asks what he thinks of the current situation, which is not a reflection of fighting someone like him after fighting guys who were weak after drinking aphrodisiac. King tells him to look here. He says that before he came here, 
He already sent a letter to the Namnum Association. Zaha becomes confused after listening to the name of this association. King replied yes, he told them that it would be hard for them to offer taxes to them because someone is getting in their way here. It is a simple letter, but they will definitely look into what happened here. Zaha asks him why the king told him because they have been giving them quite a large sum of money for the past few years. Zaha replies that he understands. The man asks him, did he think that if he destroyed this place, the money from here would all go to him? He says the world is not such a simple place, even if he goes on a reckless rampage. The underworld will still be in his way, which is why he chose to be satisfied with operating this gambling den. King calls Zaha an ignorant brat. Zaha becomes furious, and he begins to attack. The man becomes alert. He takes out his sword, and there is a clash going on between them, making the king confused and shocked. Zaha and the king are looking at each other. The king asks him, and he says he is from Zaha Inn. After this, the king begins to run, and he attacks Zaha, but Zaha is ready to fight with the king. The smoke covers the surrounding area, and the ground tears as they are fighting with each other. Zaha says to the king that he now knows whether he is generous or not. Normally, when a gambling den wants to do well, its owner needs to be generous. The king becomes shocked and asks him who he is. He asks him if he knows him. Zaha replies that he is a waiter at an inn. The king becomes shocked after listening to that. Zaha starts using his great energy absorption technique, and the king becomes confused. Zaha is fighting with his full strength, making kings sit on the ground. Zaha is looking at the king, and the king tells him the Namnim Association will not let him off. Zaha tells him to screw up, saying he will deal with that association or whatever. He tells him to stop talking about them already. The king is speechless. Zaha asks the king if he has any last words. The king asks him if he is giving any tips for his winnings. Zaha replies that there is none for him. He calls him an old bastard and strikes him on the neck. He says tip his ass. The king is there now, and the floor is covered with the dead bodies and the blood. He says to the audience to listen up. This is a win, but the audience is not present there. Zaha becomes surprised as he sees that the den is empty. He started working and singing, saying that after spending 30 years in a gambling den, his hair, which was black when he started, became white. When he stopped, he spent all his hard work and money. Is it just his money? He used everything, the money of his friends and even his relatives, without any hesitation. Meanwhile, he is setting up the fire on every dead body. He looks around, then he says he spent all of it. Is it just his money? He used everything, the money of his friends and even relatives, without any hesitation. He finally went back to his house after a long time, but there was no one to greet him. He took out the money hidden in the closet and headed towards the gambling den. Everyone he met looked at him with contempt. He says to tell people that if he does not appear again, he must have died gambling, even though he is not yet at the gambling den. The Kai Na already see cards in front of him. Today's the day when his luck is probably good. Today is the day when his luck will be good. The den is all covered with fire. Zaha is standing in the middle, speechless. He says the power of fire is so beautiful, powerful, and merciless. How good would it be if it were his? He advances his hand and says he wants to hold the stars of the night sky in his head and crush the heads of the cult followers that chased after him. The sums of horses stop everywhere he goes to have those whose swords cut the mountains at his feet. The man who is known to be a great disaster that slaps even the faces of martial masters, that is him. He is looking at the sky, fire is near him, he says that is hot, the den is all covered up with the fire. He asks anyone here, then he asks no, he says guess they are gone. When the sun sets and moonlight shines, he hears someone saying over here. He becomes confused. He goes to check and see the two girls on the bed. The two girls are crying. A man starts running, telling everyone about the fire. The girls are speechless and crying. Zaha asks them, why are they looking at him like that? Is he that handsome? 
The girls start feeling weird. Zaha is looking at them. The people are trying to set off the fire outside the den. The girls are sniffling. Zaha tells them to stop crying already. He says they better shut their mouths before he throws them into the fire. The girls are still crying. Zaha tells them the Hell Association has ceased to exist. Yun, Pyung, and Bak are all dead. This makes the girls shocked. He says to them that a lot of others died. Besides, if the guys don't want to ascend to heaven and create a rainbow over this place with those who died, first answer his questions properly. He asks them, they get it, and they reply yes. Zaha tells them he made a promise with the king, like a real man, that if he went against the whole association, he would get everything it has. They can see he won the gambling. King died after he asked him for tips out of his winnings. He is worried that he will not be able to quit gambling, and the heavens would like them to take a moment of silence to bless his soul. The girls are speechless. Zaha asks them if they will only do silent prayers if he takes out his sword. The girls become scared and reply that they will do it. The girls are sitting silently with their eyes closed. Zaha tells them to open their eyes now. The girls open their eyes. He asked them if he probably went to a good place, and the girl replied yes. They are sure that is the case. Zaha replies like help. That will be the case when the girl becomes speechless. Zaha says he will only go to a good place if we only let off one or two people. He should not go to a good place. The girls reply that he is right. Zaha says his subordinates will be arriving tomorrow. He wants them too to work with him and tell them where the gambling king hid his treasures so that a subordinate can take everything from the Hell Association. He asks them, and they get it. Zaha says, great, have a good rest. If they try to run away because their pressure points have been unblocked, they know what will happen. He asks them if he was right. Soa says that aside from that, the fire outside is not spreading right now. He asks for fire, and then he says yes, he will stop the fire for them. Soa asks him, can he just let them go? He replies, shut up. Stopping the fire is the top priority. The girl becomes scared. Soa says to herself that he is out of his mind. They all stand up, and Zaha comes out of the room. The fire is studying, and everyone is trying their best to set off the fire. Zaha is walking past them with a smile on his face. He enters the house and says to himself, let's see what the gambling king's house is like. His heart is checking around. He comes in front of a door, a thick steel door that does not fit well in the inn. He kicks the door and opens it, and he starts entering the room. He looks around and says it looks like the gambling king lived a vain life. He imprisoned himself here in order to protect it. He finds a paper on a table. He takes up the paper and starts reading the letter saying that the association has been attacked by some crazy bastards. His martial powers are unthinkably high, and he has used various methods to still find out everything about them. He has never asked the Nanming Association for any disparate favors, having signed money to them and supporting them in whatever he can. Zaha starts walking towards a gate. He turns back to look at the letter. He opens a drawer on the table, and then he notices a slab on the table. He tries to pick it up, but he can't. He starts using his powers. After that, he looks at the door. He goes near the door and suddenly the door opens and two swords come out of the door, and he manages to save himself. The swords are stuck in the wall. Zaha says you are down earth. Did he hide the fact that he had set up something like this? He starts checking inside the door. He finds a knife. He picks the knife, and he finds a broken sword. He strikes the sword with a knife. He says this is black iron. He gathers all the pieces of the broken sword. He says to himself that a black iron sword was broken into pieces like this. Who did this even when he was a crazy demon? Martial masters, who were even stronger than him, could not break black iron into pieces like this. He remembers his master telling him that if his beliefs are crushed, then he will die as well, so there is no need to worry. He asks his master what he means, and his master replies that it means exactly what it is. Saha says yes to himself. He did not understand it back then, 
but he thinks he understands it a little now. The owner of this long sword must be an incredible martial master, but when this sturdy sword is broken, you must have died along with it. The belief in his heart must have been broken too. The words of the crazy monk need to be interpreted differently based on his experience and skills. Zaha then picks up the book and starts reading it. It is about the strongest sword family, the Ouyang Muguk. Supreme heavy sword he begins to smile as he start reading that Ouyang was a nameless martial artist bag then had fought with him and lost seven rounds all that he was very proud of his own skills fight in the Jiang who want by the strong he was not surprised by the outcome sensely already knew he would win before they even fought however Ouyang could not accept his defeat he did not even ask him for the reason he lost to him. While he understand how martial artists feel how could he explain to him that? He cannot improve to the next level when he pointed out his weakness to him what he told him was that it is too late for him to start learning again Zaha says, but he disagrees. How can he ever be too late to learn? But he knows that not everything goes according to what one wants. And when he told him that he has only fought a few people within the Jianghu Hefl and to greater shock, although he was not the one who caused him to experience energy deviation, all he had done was train and use his own techniques. For a long time, the training of his heart was nowhere as good as the training of the sword, which is the same for numerous martial artists. Ouyang, who was inevitably dying because they could not overcome the shock they received, had asked him for a favor. He wrote down details about the supreme sword technique with which he fought in concise words. The next generation that obtains this sword must use it for the right purpose. He said that if someone uses it for the wrong purposes, they will be miserable. Zaha says to himself that it has the same kind of tone as what was written in the vulnerable golden tortoise art. The memory master must have written this. To think he fought seven rounds against the memory master who created the vulnerable golden tortoise art, oh yang, just how strong were you? He says to himself that there are a total of eight moves in oh yang's sword technique, which the memory had written down, and he is able to somehow imitate the first four moves which is as good as having already learned this technique. The first move is long sword style, which is sending energy towards. The second move is short sword style, which is compressing energy. The third move is 1000 sword style, which is using the sword like a falling rain and the fourth is the unsheathing style, where you unsheath the sword and use the first three moves. Saha says to himself, but the remaining words move our hearts even for him. The fifth move is lightning sword style. It is supposed to change sword energy into lightning. How is he supposed to do that? The sixth move is in wooden sword style. If one uses a wooden sword to display five advanced sword techniques, should it not be normal for the wooden sword to break? The seventh move is energy sword style. Use all of them without the wooden sword. He does not know what the point of learning a sword technique is when he is not going to use a sword. The eighth move is supreme style. It says that you are supposed to cause your sword mind and internal energy to worsen at the same time he says he is simply speechless. At this because it is so ridiculous. Then he says to himself, I will just give up on the last four moves. A man who gives up if something does not work is who he is. After this, he says, let's not force things if they don't work. Zaha pours water into a pot. He asks himself, did Ouyang's sword technique look amazing? He says he is someone that he has completely defeated seven times. Does this man say he is the strongest in the world? Are similar to his. Humans eventually grow old and die. So how could one possibly boast of being the strongest in their generation? If he does not fight those people and continues to take good care of his health for the rest of his life, he becomes the strongest. APS survive for a long time, some like the strongest, and the world is meaningless. Just being able to roam the world and discuss martial arts would be his fortune and happiness. Things like victory and defeat cannot bring more happiness than improving one's martial arts knowledge. He says to let their descendant learn in a short time games from power and walk on the path of a demon, or twilight them get stronger slowly and become a warrior who is complete in his training. He tells himself to think carefully about this. No matter how strong an artist they become, 
they will not be able to defeat an unwavering and steadfast warrior. He says this to himself, suddenly talking about being a warrior. No one is even talking about the fact that nowadays it is a world where chivalrous warriors are no longer around. But why exactly is a chivalrous warrior stronger? He begins to think the girls are looking at him. Suddenly, they become surprised as Zaha asks them if they are trying to run away. Hyuk replied that they came out to check if the fire had been put out. Soha tells him they came out to find him. Zaha is looking at them. He tells them to set, and they reply yes, and that's it. In front of him, he tells them to tell him what the two of them think about chivalrous warriors. They say pardon. Zaha says nothing. Soa replies that she has learned from a young age that chivalrous warriors are very cool. Hyuk replied she too, but lately they know where to be seen. Zaha tells them to drink. He says drinking wine while looking at the morning sun is truly fantastic. One can only truly enjoy the wine when one sees how pathetic the world is. The girls start drinking the wine. Zaha says he will call them to black and white smiles, just like the name suggests they have right and wide smiles. He wants them to always carry bright and wide smiles from now on. The girls start looking at each other, and their replies are understood. Zaha tells them he will go into meditation until he has the coordinates to arrive at his parents, give them a knife, and tell them to stab him if they see an opening. The girls become confused. Zaha is sitting in front of them and they fall asleep, making the girls surprised. Zaha opens his eyes, Hyuk tells him to have a good rest, and Soha tells him he does not see any openings. Zaha says that is who he is. Then he falls asleep, and a girl is looking at him. After some time, one of them told him she thought he needed to wake up. Zaha wakes up and asks them if he meditated for too long. The girls reply yes. He asks what the girls replied. It was just nice. Zaha stretched his body. His subordinate had arrived. One of his subordinates shouted that he was the leader. A man asked the man. Zaha says yes to the girls. He wants them two to go to the left. They are his subordinates. The girls stand up. They look scared. Zaha is still drinking the wine. The man comes near him and asks him if he is the leader. Zaha replies that that is what they call him. The man sits in front of him and says he is Nam Yanpung from the Nanam Association. Zaha tells him he is the Black Rabbit Union leader. Nam asks him if he is the disciple of the great Rakshasa. He replied that he was the one who killed him. Nam asks him what happened to the gambling king, and Zaha replies that he has gone to the afterlife. Nam asked him if he knew that he was someone who paid protection fees to the Nanam Association. Zaha replied that he told him before he died. Nam tells him he needs him to come with him to the Nanming Association and apologizes to the leader, who is the only one there to do the things. If he does not want to blow this matter up, if he does not do that, he will be starting an all-out war with the Nanming Association. Zaha asked him if he wanted him to apologize. He replied that this is not just about protection fees over the Hell Association. He needs to explain in person why he killed the gambling king. He says the Nanming Association doesn't care who they cut down, whether they are from the demonic faction, the orthodox faction, or the unorthodox faction. Zaha tells him to tell his leader that he killed the gambling gang because he was cheating on his bets, and that he will be added to the Black Rabbit Union. He also tells him that if he does that, he will go find him and explain the details of what happened this time. To say such a fucking retarded thing as asking him to apologize, does he wish to die here in this spot? Nam becomes speechless. Zaha asks, is the Nam Nam association he is strong? He says that is none of his business. He wants him to go back and pass on what he said to his leader. If he wants to spout nonsense, then tell that to his underlings. Nam is listening to him. He stands up and goes back. Zaha calls him by his name. Nam stops, and Zaha tells him he spared his life once. They are both staring at each other. At Mom Physician's family house, Zaha Seth is sorry for disturbing him so often, even though he does not need any treatment. Mom tells him to feel free to come as often as he likes. 
Then he says he seems to become stronger every time they make Saha reply that he is trying very hard to make that happen. Moyong tells him there is nothing wrong with him. He says he has actually always been more curious about what he thinks than his body condition. He replied as he stared at the flame that was surrounding him while he fought. He was little. He could have been burned to that if he slipped up even a little. Moyong asked him why he thought that. He replies that there is an inn named after him that got burned down in a fire at the time. He did not realize it. But the moment his home was burned down, he started to think that his life would not be a smooth sailing one. Moyong asks him why, and he replies that it is because he already knows what kind of person he is, even before his fire burns him. Moyong asks him who he is and how he would feel if he met someone way stronger than him. Zaha replied that if he does, he feels like he might go crazy. Moyong asked him why, and he replied that he needs to be crazy in order to win. If he is more than his foe, then he can only win when he goes crazy. Anyone who fights will eventually feel pain. In order to win, one must endure that pain, and from a certain point in time onwards, one will feel like they have exceeded their limit. They are still conscious, even though they should have painted. They are still standing, even though they should be on the ground, and somewhere around there, they will suddenly appear as if they have been waiting for their chance. Moyong asks him if he is scared of defeat or death. Hei reply, he is not afraid of defeat because he has lost countless times. When he was young, he was able to continually become stronger because of that. In regards to death, he does not think about that when he fights. Moyong tells him that the reason he freezes up while looking at the fire is because of his awareness and concern about insanity, not fear. Saha asks about awareness. Moyong replied based on how he thinks he needs to be crazy in order to win against every single strong person out there. Saha replied yes. Moyong asks him to be so strong that every time he looks at the fire, he will remember the question of his life. Is it the right choice to live like a crazy person who is always prepared to die? Or should he think in a different way about how strong he wishes to become? Saha replied the strongest. Moyong becomes surprised and asks when he thinks the dream will come true. Zaha replied that he does not know that either. Moyong asks him if he is well aware that if that is something that will happen 10 years later, it might be better to just accumulate internal energy through meditation for 9 years starting now and not to do anything else is not that right. Zaha replies that he does not intend to do that. Is it not too much of a waste of life to live like that? He says he is drinking, singing, dancing, and fighting. There is so much to do. Moyong replies this is just what he thinks, but he does not think his dream is to become the strongest in the world. Zaha asks if it is not, and Moyong replies yes, saying that becoming the strongest while drinking, singing, and dancing is more accurate for his dream. Zaha begins to laugh. He says now that he has said that he agrees. Moyong says all this is just his personal opinion. What does he think about letting that insanity take the lead whenever he makes someone stronger? Zaha becomes confused, and Moyong says it would be actually good to practice calming his heart down during normal times. It is to separate his mindset when fighting and when he is not. Zaha becomes speechless as he looks at the old Moyong. Moyong is looking at him. Zaha asks him if he has a serious question to ask him. Moyong tells him to ask away. Zaha asks him what he thinks about chivalrous warriors. Moyong asks him about chivalrous warriors. Zaha replies yes. He says someone he knows said that chivalrous warriors are stronger than any martial master. He does not understand what he meant. Moyong begins to think, and then he says he thinks chivalrous warriors are fools. If they presume that those who are not able to take care of themselves are fools, then walrus warriors can be seen as such. Zaha asks fools, Moyong replied, yes, usually they would call one of the chivalrous warriors if they sacrificed their lives for a good cause. But once life is the most important thing in the world, since they are people who would throw away the most important thing in the world, he could say that they are the biggest fools among the force. Zaha asks, does that make them stronger? Moyong replies that if they are not talking about martial arts and just talking about being humans, 
Could there be anyone stronger than that? He says true chivalry is not about having powerful martial arts. He thinks it is about being stronger as a human. Zaha asks about being strong as a human, and Wong tells him to give it a try himself. Zaha asks, give it a try, and Wong replies, being a chivalrous warrior. Zaha asks someone like him, and Wong replies yes. He says the past chivalrous warriors do not care about the situation in their ranks, their birth origins, or how rich they are. They only became one because they did not care about those things. Come to think of it, the famed founder and sister of the sex Jianghu, a lot of them worked as chivalrous warriors when they were young. If he looked at their early years and lives, they would be called chivalrous warriors when they were young and retire in the mountains. When they grow old, they will raise the next generation and eventually become a founding ancestor. That is something they have been thinking about a lot now that he is saying this. He is starting to get different thoughts about a virus warrior being strong. Zaha replied that he had decided. Moyong asks if he intends to become a chivalrous warrior, and he says no. He says it does not fit with who he is, but he will provide support if there is someone who has the right heart and is an upright person. He will teach that person martial arts and provide for all their material needs. If he supports the person both physically and mentally so that they can become chivalrous warriors, that would not answer his question eventually. Moyong asks him if it would not yet be better for him to do it personally. He is wrong, and he also has powers now. Zaha replies that he is a way more versed person than Heating, and so he is more suited to being a villain. More importantly, he still has a lot of people he needs to kill. He will kill monsters like great villains in advance so that his future disciples, who will have the qualities of chivalrous warriors, will not get beaten to death by them. He says if he does that, his disciple, who is like a fool, will be able to live a more smooth sailing, chivalrous warrior life. Zaha and Moang start chuckling, and then Moang begins to laugh hard. Moang tells Zaha that he too will support his disciples in the future in his own way as well. In that case, he will also be able to provide some help in raising foolish, chivalrous warriors in this dangerous world. Zaha replies, let's give it a try. He will always be on lockout as an applied person, and he will need to become strong first so that he can raise chivalrous warriors to be strong. He will improve on his martial arts, and Moang will improve on his medical techniques. Let's prepare for that day starting now. They will create the strongest fool in this world. Moang tells him they will not be fools, but chivalrous warriors. Zaha says he thought about it and it will be very hard for a smart person who weighs out options too well. Moyong says he guesses that is another common point between a fool and a chivalrous warrior. He asks what happened to the fire that he mentioned. Is it still barely burning in his heart? Zaha replies that it is burning, but it is not barely burning anymore because that is what will drive his enemies crazy. Moyong smiles. Zaha leaves from there, saying to himself that his memories fade. New memories are being made while thinking about Moang. Saha says to himself that he will solve the questions he has about the chivalrous warrior theory written in the Memory Master's book in his own way. He just needs to help the chivalrous warrior become wrong. At the Nan Ming Association meeting, Zaha asks if he is not here yet. A man replies, please wait for a moment. They have already informed the association leaders, so he will be here soon. Zaha yawns. He says to himself that he just came to the Nanmim Association alone, although he is not very interested in getting rid of an underworld force. This will affect more than 10 of his own subordinate students. He is thinking, and everyone else is looking at him. A man asks, is he sleeping? Another man replies, come on, that cannot be it. They are looking at him. The man says he thinks he is sleeping, though the other man becomes speechless. Someone asks the black rabbit if the union leader is here, and Zaha wakes up. A man is coming there. He looks at Zaha. Zaha says to himself, that's him. The man sits on the sofa and asks where the black rabbit union leader is. His subordinate tells him where he is. The man asked what, while looking at Zaha? The man asks as the black rabbit union leader, and Zaha replies that it is him. The man becomes speechless. 
he asks where his subordinates are. Did he come alone? Zaha replied that he came alone. Zaha tells a man to give him some water. He asks him if this is how he treats his guests. Nam ordered his subordinate to bring him water. The man then takes a deep breath and says he is Nam Garrick of the Nam Ming Association. Zaha Android uses himself as the Black Rabbit Union leader. He is offered water, and he asks the girl if she did not poison it, right? The girl replies, no, there is no poison. Zaha drinks the water and takes a deep breath. Garrick asks him what he did just now. Zaha replied, yes, it just happened. Garrick asked him why he came here alone. He heard he had quite a lot of subordinates. Zaha replied that it is normal to come when invited, but he came alone since it is true trouble for some of his subordinates. Garrick questions why he killed the gambling king. Zaha replied that he went there to do a gamble, but he found out he was cheating. He sent ladies with aphrodisiacs stored in their hair accessories and got caught by him. Garrick asks him if he went to the duel. Is he saying that as the leader of his union, he has to do that? He replied that he went there because he heard that Dong Fan Yun was pretty good at fighting. He was called the king of dual gambling, but his actual abilities were nowhere deserving of that nickname. Garrick says before the gambling king died, he heard he told his dad he paid protection fees to the Nanming Association. Zaha replied that he did say that. Garrick asks if he killed him despite that. Zaha asks what he would have spared his life if he were him. Garrick becomes speechless when he asks his subordinate, did he really come here alone? He replies, yes, everyone else becomes worried by looking at their leader. Garrick asks Zaha, who heard he took all of the gambling king's assets, what he intends to do about the protection fees that the Hell Association used to give them. Zaha asks him if he is a beggar. Garrick becomes surprised. He asks him what he is expecting him to do. He wants him to pay him, as well as whether he is asking to go to war with him, or what. Garrick becomes furious, and he is speechless. One of his subordinates asks Zaha how dare he speak like this to the association leader. Garrick tells him to don't interfere. Zaha says to Garrick, did he not hear about how he asked for the whole Hell Association to come together and fight him? He says it was a dual gamble that Bach agreed on. The bet was winner takes all. He took all of his assets because he won, and his tremendous assets were all earned from gambling. Is there a problem here? Then he says, just so he knows, he killed the former Black Rabbit Union leader himself, and he also killed his master Rakshasa himself, and he is asking him to pay him protection fees. Garrick becomes furious, and everyone else is speechless. Garrick asks Zaha why he is here. He replies, what the fuck is he talking about? He came because he invited him here. Garrick's subordinates cough. Zaha looks at them and says to himself, those guys, he heard that after Garrick died to the strongest blades man, they did not surrender and fought with their lives, which means they are loyal as subordinates. That is why he is intending to overlook things if they act arrogant because people who are willing to put their lives on the line are people of respect. Then he says to Zaha that based on what his subordinates tell him, the Naming Association rejected the offer to join a huge organization known as the Supreme Sword Association, ignored the invitation of the Southern Heavenly Troop, and also did a great job maintaining their own forces independently. Garrick asks, yet he responds to their invitation. Zaha replied that he came here to take a look at me because he was curious. But if he keeps rejecting the Supreme Sword Association and the Southern Heavenly Troop, there will definitely be bloodshed someday. Does he have a plan for that? Garrick replies that there is no such thing. He has no intentions of bowing to either group, and if bloodshed occurs, it does. Zaha replies how straightforward he says to himself that a man who acts manly also deserves respect, then he says to Garrick. Just like how not everyone in the orthodox faction is upright and honest, and not everyone in the underworld is trash like the gambling king. Garrick asks him what he is getting from her reply. He is saying he should not read everyone the same. If he wants to harass the Supreme Sword Association or the Southern Heaven Troop, he will help him out. Garrick begins to laugh. Hardly everyone starts laughing. Garrick says he wants them to pay him protection fees in return for helping them. 
Zaha replies that there is no need for him to take protection fees from the Black Rabbit Union, Black Pearl Fort, Professor Liu, the Four Divine Palms, or Iliang Prefecture's subordinates. He says he has actually split up box money with his subordinate. Garrick asks him what her reply is. He has given money to those who want to farm so that they can farm, and he asks those who want to set up their own business to leave. He also gave money to those who wanted to learn martial arts or do blacksmithing, but those who did not know what they wanted to do were still with him. The truth is that even for Box subordinates, he only killed five or six of them. They think he only killed around five or six of them. The rest will probably find their own way to make a living since the gambling den is not around anymore. Garrick says nothing. Zaha tells him that, while he is not someone who would give a hoot to idiots, he will support anyone who wants to do something like a real man. All he wants is one thing from them. When the day he needs help comes, he wants them together again under the name of the Hal clan. Garrick becomes confused and asks him if he is the leader of the Hal clan. He replied yes if he wants to wage war against him, do it. If he doesn't want to come under his clan, that is fine. Whether he is an enemy or an ally, he will respect his decision. But don't think of asking him for protection fees. Don't think of messing with his subordinate, and don't let him hear any rumors of the Nanming Association bullying business owners or those who do not know martial arts. If he does that, he will automatically be at war with him. That is the kind of organization that has clans, and since there is no such organization so far, he has come to explain it to him personally. Zaha tells Garrick to think about it before giving him an answer, and he leaves from there. Garrick calls him and asks him if he should not be sure of his skills so that he can make his decision. Zaha smiles and tells him to don't act up just because he has his subordinates here. Garrick becomes more speechless than he says. He thought he was some lunatic who dared to come here, and even though he has changed his mind after talking to him, let's do it that way. Let's fight before they continue with any other talks one-on-one. -on -one. If he loses, then all of the Hao clan will go under the Nanming Association. Zaha asks him what would happen if he lost his hair. Apply what that even happens. That is so fucking ridiculous everyone starts laughing. Zaha begins to laugh. He says that is so fucking ridiculous. He is so speechless. It is so ridiculous. He says it is so outrageous. It is so ridiculous and bewildering that he has goosebumps. Garrick becomes furious, and I tell him that is enough. Zaha replies, this is so fucking ridiculous. Everyone becomes speechless and shocked. After that, everyone comes outside, and Garrick and Zaha are standing in front of each other. Garrick asks Zaha what he will fight with, and Zaha replies that he is the kind that uses whatever he gets his hands on. He can use what he is confident with. Garrick begins to think. Zaha says, look at that face of his. He is starting to want to bash it in. Garrick asks what, and he replies that he thinks using hands would be better than weapons. He is sure that, as the leader of the Namming Association, he has never been beaten up. He says he thinks that face of his needs to get bashed in a little so his subordinates can enjoy the show. Garrick becomes furious. He calls Hema a crazy bastard and tells him he is really out of his mind. Zaha is smiling. Garrick comes near him and attacks him, but Zaha manages to dodge his attack. He jumps into the air, and Garrick is looking at him. He comes back to the ground and starts using his skills, holding the hands of Garrick. The surroundings get covered with smoke, and after some time we see both of them standing away from each other. They are looking at each other. Zaha is all covered up by the fire. Garrick is looking at him, and Zaha tells him to be careful. Then he starts running towards Garrick. Garrick is in his position. Zaha holds his hands and starts using his powers. The ground breaks. Garrick loses his control. Zaha comes near him. He tries to protect himself. The smoke covers up everything, and after some time we see them. Zaha is standing quietly looking at Garrick with anger on his face. Zaha says yes to himself. He has a good expression on his face despite being overwhelmed one-sidedly. Zaha then runs again to attack Garrick. They are both fighting with their full strength. 
Garrick's subordinates say they think the association leader would be pushed back this much while looking at Garrick. Garrick and Zaha continue to attack each other, and then Zaha starts using his great energy absorption technique, and Garrick becomes scared. He is trying his best to fight against him. Once again, the smoke covers everything, and after that, we see Garrick going flying into the air. He hits the ground and spits out blood. His subordinates become scared while looking at him. Garrick still stands up, holds his sword, and tells Zaha to pull out his sword. He becomes furious and tells him to draw his sword. Zaha is standing there quietly. He says okay, and then, after this, he takes his sword. Garrick's subordinates become shocked. Zaha takes his sword out of its cover, and he and his friends are all covered up with the fire. Garrick's subordinates say yes to himself. He looks even more powerful after he draws his sword. Zaha and Garrick are holding their swords. Zaha asks Garrick if he is prepared to die. Garrick's subordinates are worried about their leader. One of them told him to stop here. Garrick is quiet. There is a terror on his face. He says to Zaha that there is no need to test his sword skills, which he has lost. Zaha replies that being cool-headed is also a great ability. It looks like things were good before they went too far. They are both looking at each other. Zaha says he will be leaving if they are done here. Garrick's subordinates ask if he is just leaving like this and is not going to make any demands after winning. Garrick asks Zaha, how about having a cup of tea first? He replies, let's do that next time. Garrick asks him what will happen to them from now on and she replies that he will be fine. The Hao clan will be the Hao clan, and the Nanming Association will be the Nanming Association. All the people present are looking at Zaha. Zaha says, let's fight again if the opportunity arises. If any of their executives want to fight him, tell him any time. He says he welcomes any fights if he is as confident as his association leader. Garrick becomes surprised. Zaha is leaving. From there, he stops and says if the Supreme Sword Association or the Southern Heaven Troop harasses them again, contact the Hal clan. Garrick asks him, if they contact him, what will happen? He replies that he will go to war with them. Garrick becomes shocked, and he asks himself if he is really going to help them. Zaha says to himself, the choice is Nam Garrick's. Will he stay as part of the Naming Association and pay like he did in his previous life? Or will he change his mind by journeying with the Hal clan? He says all the while that he does not want to forcefully change the fate of people and groups. If Garrick changes his mind, then his faith will probably be different as well. He remembers Moong asking him what he thinks about letting that insanity take the lead whenever he meets someone strong. Zaha says that peace is like a river, and insanity is like a sea. The insanity that surges within him overflows. Zaha says he is an expert on screw-ups and is interested in the Black Iron, which he was looking for in the Hell Association with the Dragonhead Smithy, but he is curious whether it will really become a proper sword or if the Black Iron will be screwed up as well. He sends black and white smiles to the Moong physician family, and if they become decent stepdaughters, they will probably remain there. If they mess it up again this time, then they will come back to the Black Rabbit Union. Sungte and the Silver Phantom have lived a screwed up life for more than 20 years. The subordinates, who were always crude, are undergoing even harder training than Sungte. Since he has taken in so many screwed up people, it's no wonder that he has become an expert at screw ups. Zaha is cultivating when someone comes to him and tells him he has an urgent report. He opens his eyes and looks at the administrator. He says to himself that the administrator has been living in the screwed up black faction for the last 50 years. Then he asks him what a great military advisor they have for him. The administrator begins to cry after listening to the word great military advisor. Zaha says to himself that he was going to call him a screwed up administrator. But sad, something is way too flattering to correct that too quickly. Administrators tell him they have someone with a similar description to the man that he is looking for. Zaha asks him where the administrator is and tells him the location is quite a dangerous place. He is in the World Eagle Town, where the sons of the divided Murum families are gathering to socialize. 
Zaha A.J. cab out of the White Eagle Town administrator replied yes, he was seen on Garosa Street, which is in the middle of the White Eagle Town. Zaha says it is fascinating how the guys found him. Administrator replied as he took his description and two considerations, his pride, some rumors, and famous drinking places. We are good looking, but obnoxious white faction martial artists appear, and he goes to result from that. Zaha replied, amazing, what a perfect move. Administrator thank him, then he says, but they have only confirmed that he looks like the painting, so they still made to confirm his identity and person. However, the guy who was fine with following him got caught by him and was beaten up a little. His face is totally swollen, and he has a broken nose right now. Zaha asks how dare he beta face a subordinate, and he asks the administrator what the name of that subordinate is. Administrators reply that they all call him Gong Chiu. Zaha replies they will seek revenge for him, he says to himself since the left hand of the illuminating light was from a white faction family. He has been known to be pretty deadly. He is a rare genius in regards to the martial arts that helped him climb to being the left hand of the illuminating light of the demonic cult. Zaha tells the administrator to send people to the physician family and request poisons and antidotes from the physician. When the administrator asks about the poison, he replies that if they ask for poison that causes constant pain, he will understand what that means. Administrator replies that he understands and will see to it immediately, then he leaves from there. Zaha says to himself, either kill him or make him subordinate, those are the two choices. He will not let him go to the demonic curve if he fails at killing him or making him a subordinate. He will just trample on him and make him and yunch, at least so that the women of the white faction will not suffer humiliation. The women of the white faction probably don't even know what has changed their lives for them. He says to himself that he will make him into an eunuch. Sante is looking at him from behind, and he asks what Zaha is in fighting position. He says balls uppercut balls lower kick. Sante asks Goon why is he doing that? Goon replies, who knows? Zaha is full of rage. He is practicing eunuchification divine art while fighting against a tree. Sante and Goon are looking at him. They are speechless and confused. Zaha stops, looks at the sky, and says to his left hand that an illuminating light is coming for him. White Eagle Town is a place where the next generation of the white faction gathers, drinks, eats, meets their future partners, and fights in a place where they do all that and make their end. While there are a lot of pathetic people within the black faction, the white faction is not very different. Those who have great ambitions would either be reading books or practicing martial arts. There are those who simply play hard drinks like whales and are super popular with women, yet they are also very skilled in martial arts. Such guys are just born with those genes. The world is never an affair. Zaha is drinking. He asks himself, the child of the Hmong family's concubine, have under how strong, he is now he managed to become stronger very quickly thanks to the heavenly pearl and regression. But these sons of the white fraction family have started to learn martial arts from the time they started to walk, and they are definitely talented, so they cannot be underestimated. He finishes his drink and leaves. From there, he comes outside and starts looking around. He is looking at the dance and the girls, and he wonders if it is a good performance. He leaves from there and finds a couple. He looks at them, and he becomes surprised as he finds the left hand of the illuminating light. He is looking at him, and he says to himself, knowing that he makes a lot of women, that the sea of madness within him still stirs up whenever he sees him doing it in person. He says to himself that from today onwards, he, the temporal chivalrous warrior, will execute the Murim Alliance leader and the innocent Murim Alliance members for the sake of innocent women, and lights you for the sake of OIS, our foolish men for the sake of the white faction, will execute. You know what? He says the man who returned to the past just to execute the left hand of illuminating lights, you know what that is, is him. After some time, a man comes to him and tells him the gentleman over there is asking if he would like to drink together while pointing towards the left hand of the illuminating light. He says he will not regret it, and if he does, he has one more ladies with him, 
It would be two men and two women drinking. Zaha asked Tu on Tu why he would choose him. The man replied, saying he looked the most handsome out of everyone here. Zaha replies, but with nonsense. He says to himself, yes, right, a two-on-two gathering, that guy must have real confidence and have abilities to prevent speech or a smart brain to try and sponge off him. Zaha goes to them, and the left hand of the illuminating light asks him if he has had a drink with them. A girl tells him to join them. She asks Seo what she thinks. Seo looks at Zaha and replies that she would like that too. Zaha says yes to himself, crazy bastards, he will play along, then he says to them, let's go. He says to himself, he will find out exactly how he fools around. They go into the restaurant, and Seo tells Zaha to have one more drink. Is he here for the first time? Left hand of illuminating light reply he has never met any man who stared at him for such a long time in this place tons of women have done so though. He says, hey, I think they are probably around the same time, so let's talk casually. A girl tells Zaha his name is Mong Rang, she is So Wool, and the other girl's name is Seo. Wool asks Zaha what about him. Zaha says to himself that they are all using fake names. Zaha introduces himself as Gwang Chiyoli's older brother. Seo asks him who Gong is. He replies, his younger brother. The girls become confused. Mong tells him to now drink up. He says, who cares about names and statuses? It is only when one drinks and gets drunk that the true appearances of a man and a woman are revealed. They all take a sip of the drink. Zaha says to himself, look at these people. He is not the only one who knows martial arts. Even the girls have both learned martial arts. Mong asks Seol about Saha. What does she think he likes about him? She replies yes, and he asks her how far she thinks and goes today. She asks him why he is so impatient. Mong begins to laugh hard. Saha asks himself why it feels like they just exchanged a hidden message. Mong stands up and says he will be back after going to the loo. They will drink until they are dead drunk today. Wool tells him to come back quickly. Mong waves from there. Wool tells Seol, let's go to the loo too. Cher reply okay. But Zaha holds her hand and tells him to have one more drink with him before she goes. She replies, pardon? Zaha tells Wool to go on ahead. She replies, okay. Seol is sitting beside Zaha. She asks him why he is suddenly glaring at her so scarily. She says he is acting all scary. Zaha moves his hand, making her scared. He takes out something from his shirt and puts it in the drink. He says to himself that this was made personally by Muang, a scentless and colorless diarrhea drug. Although he is considered pretty experienced in the Jianghu, this is his first time using one of these. Even though he is the one using the horrifying drug on others, he feels nervous as well. He made Seol drink it. He told her to tell the rest of this if she did not want the anti-dot. If she did, she would die. He asked her if she got it. She looked confused. Zaha puts the drug and all the drinks away, and Mong and her girl come back. Mong asks what is happening and why the atmosphere is somber. Zaha says fucking pimp. Mong becomes furious and asks him what he said. He asks Mong if he is trying to make a country bumpkin pay for all his drinks. While he runs away, he asks if he or a fucking kid is paying for the drinks. Mong asked him what nonsense he never thought he would hear from a country bumpkin like him. Zaha drinks the wine. Mong is looking at her, so he also drinks the wine. Then he says to Seol, it is enough of that. Why is she acting like that? Zaha replied that he misunderstood and thought she was running away, so he suppressed her pressure points. Mong tells him he has gone and done something unnecessary. He tells Zaha to release her now. Zaha replies that he is a country bumpkin, so he never learned how to release pressure points. He tells Mong to do it. Mong hits Seol on the back, and she shouts. Mong asks Zaha if she really has that wish. He tells Wool to take Seol with her, and she replies okay. Then he tells Zaha to follow him. He says there is no use trying to escape. Then they leave the bar. Mong asks him, 
It looks like he intended to fight him from the side that he starts to get sick of people like him. He asks who sent him. Zaha replied, Gong did. Mon asks him, who the hell is he? Zaha replied that he was someone with a broken arm. Mon asks for a broken arm, and then he asks if he is talking to him. Suddenly, he makes a strange face, and he starts experiencing diarrhea as his stomach is making unusual sounds. Mong's stomach hurts. He asks Zaha what he wants. Zaha replies, who knows? Mong runs to attack him. Zaha activates his skills, smoke covers the surroundings, and then we see Mong and Zaha facing each other. They are both looking at each other. Mong asks Zaha, who is he exactly? Zaha replies, what is the matter? And tells him to speak clearly. Mong's stomach is hurting, and he begins to run. Zaha starts chasing him and asks him, does he think he will let him back down quietly? Mong turns back, smoke covers the surroundings again, and then we see Zaha and Mong at a distance. Mong tells Zaha to leave him and give him the antidote, and he will spare his life. Zaha asks him if the person who was about to run away to poop is now threatening. Mong asks him if he wants to die. Zaha tells him he is an idiot. Does he think if he threatens him, he can make him give it to him? Mong becomes furious and serious. This is his last chance. If he gives him the antidote now, he will spare his life. Zaha tells him that he has to poop here. Mong takes a cloth and ties it around his belly. He says to Zaha that today is the day he dies. Zaha asks him what he is doing, and he replies that maybe he will be covered in poop, but he will die today. He says the antidote, saying he does not need it. Zaha becomes confused. Mong looks furious. Zaha becomes shocked and confused after seeing him. Mong tells him there is no point in begging now that they are both looking at each other. Zaha tells him not to come near him. Mong replied, he does not know himself, but he made him this way. He says, come on, he is going to go to him so hard that he cannot tell the difference between his own bullshit and his. Zaha tells him he really is a bastard. He smells Mong's poop smell, and Mong is coming towards him. Zaha becomes alert and tries to fight him. They are fighting against each other with their full strength. They stop. Zaha asks himself, was that the sound of the explosion all the sound of the wind? He comes over to Mom and comes behind him. They continue to fight against each other. Zaha faces himself. This person is really strong. Even with such a scent, he could maintain his attack and defense. His competitor is really cool. He was worthy of being the target of the Hua sect. He was a fighting genius full of nonsense and he could also completely resist the heavenly castration blow skill. Then he says to himself that it made him completely unable to use it. He cannot take those shitty pants with his clean shoes, and it is even more difficult because he also wears white clothes. Left-handers are more dangerous than any secret personnel. He stands in a certain position in front of Mong. The two start attacking each other. Smoke covers the surroundings and they both start training towards each other. Zaha says to Mong that he is too strong for someone to poop their pants. Mong tells him he is really annoying. Zaha replies that his skills exceed his expectations a lot. It has been a long time since he has had someone who can fight so well. He is not an ordinary man. He takes out the antidote from his shirt and tells him you will give him the antidote as a gift. Mong replies, no, it's all out so he does not need it. Zaha looks at his leg cover with poop and becomes speechless. Mong starts coming near Zaha, he asked him, is he afraid? Zaha asks what Mong replied, yes, he looks afraid. Zaha tells him he is avoiding his dirt. He says to himself that because of what he did, he cannot now brag about his newfound skill. He could no longer attack his lower body for fear of getting dirty. His lower body had become invincible. Then he thinks of something, looks back, and begins to run. Mong begins to chase him, and he tells him to don't run. Zaha asks himself, is he trying to complete with him? No matter how crazy he is, he was not there to walk down the main street like that. After some time, 
He stops and starts checking around. He tells Zaha to come up. Mong tells him to come. Zaha calls him a bastard and tells him to come. Mong becomes furious and says to himself, that bastard then he says to Zaha, let's come down. They are grown men, and they can settle a fight between each other. Why do they disturb and harm others? Zaha calls him an idiot and tells him to shut up. He says just seeing him reminds him of the saying that even dirt can get angry. And there is also another saying that a dog with dung is a prickly dog. Mong becomes furious. Zaha faces himself after all. He could not just pass through the crowded street like that. Even in times like these, the white faction's willingness to save face is frightening. Suddenly, they hear someone asking Mong what he is doing here. It is a girl. They both are looking at her. Zaha asks her, does she know him? She replies, yes, what's wrong? He looks pale. Zaha asked her, did she see what happened? She asked to see what had happened. He did have hope in his pants. She replied in no way. He asked her, did she see the wet white robe wrapped around his trousers? Apparently, he did this because he drank too much. The girl begins to shout at him, telling him there is no way he can do such a thing. She tells him to don't lie and to be furious. Zaha says to himself that this bitch got mad and added him even though she told her the truth. She came this way while he was still being nice to her. Zaha turns around and says to Mong that what happened to him was the harvest of his actions, but he did it because he broke his brother's arm. Now go and change his clothes. Zaha calls him the Lord of the Cloud Plan, then asks him, or should he call him the Bastard of the Mong Clan Guardian of the Mong Clan, the young gentleman who cannot poop properly? Mong tells him to shut up. Zaha calls him a bastard from the family of generals. He tells him to change his dirty clothes first, and then can challenge Hai. There is a silence for a moment. Zaha makes his point. He tells Mong to come back after he takes a shower. He says a man like him does not result in being in the good faction. Zaha is serious about himself. He has to wait until the advantage of being invincible and his lower body expires, then he will show his skills. This time it ended in a draw. While walking down the street, he asks someone to tell the other man that the restaurant there has become contaminated after young women's defecation in it. The other man asks his friend how stupid young people of this generation are. A woman says, oh my god, what shall they do? Saha says to himself that the two girls must not have had hands before going to the bathroom. The laxative that the doctor made this time was really evil. In the future, he will use it to make laxatives and poisons. He goes to a restaurant and orders pasta. His food arrives and he starts eating it. There is a crowd at the restaurant where the nearest river is. From here, the waiter tells him that if he goes in this direction, he will see the Dragon River. Zaha faces himself. Most likely, Bastard felt ashamed of entering his house like this, so he will take a bath here. After he is full, he is going to start moving again. The waiter asks him, why is he looking for a river this late at night? He replies that he is on a heroic mission. He is chasing an evil demon, but he says to himself that he is actually chasing a dirty guy. The waits call him a hero and thank him for his hard work. Zaha looks at him, and then he leaves from there. He says to himself that when he thinks about what happened and everything he has done since he came to life, it is for the safety of Tsungu, for the happiness of women and children, and for the protection of the rights of the working class. He is focused on pushing the evil bastards. He does not even care if the world does not know him. His work is no less heroic than that of the so-called heroes, and even if not, he is not here. He reaches the river. He is looking at the Mong Takin bath in the river. He says to himself, he is a disgusted bastard. He turned the clean river into a dirty river. Mong looks at him. They are both looking at each other, and the moon's reflection on the river water can be seen. Mong is naked. Zaha tells him to don't wash up while he looks at him. He says he is showering to kill him. Mong takes his cloth and says to Zaha, Hey, I just finished showering, so come here. He calls him a bastard. Zaha takes a breath. 
he says to himself that the sky is a pervert at an extreme level. If he throws a kick like that, terrible things will show before his eyes. When Mom approaches, Zaha asks himself, The tattoo on his body, what is it? He thinks, look at that dog trying to act tough. He says, just go home, he pervert. Let's take it as his loss today. Mom says country bumpkins. He won't forget his face. No matter where he runs, be it the Murim Alliance or the demonic cult, he will catch him for sure. Zaha says to Mom, he must know that he did not fight at his full strength because of the shit that was on him, yet he dares to speak such nonsense. Mom says he will specially talk to his master to request that he take him in as his junior brother. That would probably be better than death for him. Zaha asks about the master and thinks he ought to know this information though, with that tattoo in his martial art. Mom leaves by saying they will meet again soon. Zaha is watching him leave, and he thinks Danko is the sword demon, the man who tried to kill the cult leader earlier than he did. A person of the demonic path was given permission to join the Murim Alliance by the Murim Alliance leader, and although he was born within the demonic faction, he never committed murder or evil deeds. It is hard to call him the leader of a demonic faction since he does not have a whole group that he is leading, but at the same time, he is way too strong to be looked down upon just because he is not leading a group. When someone asked him why he fought with the cult leader, he said he just fought because he wanted to see who was a more genuine demonic practitioner. To think that the sword leader is the pervert's master, whether it's the left hand of the illuminating light of the sword demon, he will kill anyone who he cannot bring into the Hal clan, that's all. Inside a house, someone is making a sword. He hears someone telling him he is here, it is Mom. His master asks him why he looks like that, and he replies that he cannot go back to this state. Please lend him a set of clothes. His master says okay and starts to make his sword. After some time, Mong asked his master, saying there would not be anyone around his age that would be capable of being his rival. His master replied, that's not what he thinks, that's what he thinks. Mong replied, that's true. His master says so, but he guesses he met his rival. Since Jianghu is a vast place, that's nothing surprising. His master asks him which group he belongs to. Mong replies that he thinks he is just a country bumpkin. His master remains silent. Mong says he was not able to figure out what he was fully capable of. He will be fighting him again soon. He thinks he has to fight him with full strength when that time comes. His master says if he uses the ice card in the White Eagle Town, he will get very troublesome. Mong says that's why he is telling him about this now. He is not someone who can fight without using his ice arts. His master says a country bumpkin that is not that strong might be a disciple of the three disasters. His master says alright, fight him using ice arts, but do it in an island place not one with many people around. If that's really hard to do, then lure him to his place, and he will take a look at him. Mong says yes, master. His master asks, is he someone who needs to be dead or can he be useful? Mong replies he is not sure, and his master says all right. By the way, he asks what that unpleasant smell is. Mong told him that he was poisoned with diarrhea. This unpleasant smell is because of that. His master stares at him, and then he avoids eye contact with him. His master asks him to take his leave, and he says yes, master. Now the master is sitting outside, and he thinks it was a diarrhea poison instead of a fatal poison he met with an interesting fellow. The next morning, Zaha is eating noodles, and Mong comes and sits in front of him. They are both looking at each other. Zaha tells him that he is spoiling his appetite, shit dog. Mong laughs and says eat all he wants. This could become his last meal. Zaha continues to eat, and Mong says that aside, he has a question for him. Zaha asks what this is, and Mong says he would have died had he used fetal poison instead of diarrhea poison. What he is after Zaha says he can't tell him that. Mong asks, did he steal his woman or something? If that's the case, then he understands why he did what he did. Zaha says to stop spouting bullshit. Mong says he guesses he hit the bullseye, 
otherwise, there is no way he would have a grudge against him. Zaha is getting annoyed, and he says, shit dog, okay, let's say that's true, then sends him to an isolated place. Mong asks what, and Zaha says he heard he learned ice art, but he wasn't able to use it, so he needs an isolated place to use it, doesn't he? Mong remains silent, and then he gets up and asks him to let's go. This is a house, and Zaha and Mong are standing together. Mong tells Zaha that's where his master lives. He doesn't know if he will understand this, but he is not the kind to interfere in the fight between younger martial artists. If he is scared, then they will go elsewhere. Zaha thinks that's where the sword demon is. He says to Mong, no, let's go in. Mong gets quiet and inquisitive. Master is sitting in his house, Mong. Ask him, can they fight here? Master, let him do whatever he wants. Zaha says to himself as expected over the sword master. Sword masters, while practicing martial arts, know that even if they accidentally kill a disciple, he will not be blamed, so fight until their hearts come down. Zaha says to him that this person cannot be his opponent, so he wants to fight him. Sword master is working on his sword, he asks him. Mong becomes furious and asks, is he crazy? Zaha and short master are looking at each other. Master asked him what faction he is from. There are only two of you that he does not know. He responds that he cannot tell him. Master says if he works hard, he will be able to complete with him. But that is impossible now that he is also recovering from his injury. It is not right to compete recklessly if he does not want to complete with Mong Rang right away. Come and sit now. Master says to Mong that this man has a fearless appearance, since he will be completing a lot for him in the future. There is no need to rush. He tells him to go and pour some tea for them. Then he says to Zaha that during that time he will test the scale of his young and uninvited guest. Mong becomes surprised, then says sure. Zaha sits in front of the master. The master starts thinking about something, and then he says, that is amazing. Zaha says to himself, of course he will be surprised. There are not many masters who know the techniques he underwent and what his youth was like. Master says that boy is up to something, and most likely he will add a laxative to that. Zaha asks him why he thinks he would do that. Master replied that it took him a long time to make the tea. Zaha replies that it makes sense, but that he will be the pure one when he brings it up. Master asked him why he replied. Most likely, he heard they were having a conversation and changed the cup when the tea was ready. Master replied that was right. Mong offers them tea and tells them they can drink it with peace of mind since they do not have a laxative. He tells Zaha to drink too. Zaha replied, sure, he went through a lot today and yesterday, and that's what drinking the tea was. There was silence for a moment. Master tells Zaha he does not have to force himself to say something he does not want to reveal. But what does he think about asking each other questions and answering them? If he has something he wants to know, don't hesitate to ask. Zaha replies, let's do it, Master. Tell him to ask whatever he wants. He asks, Master, why does he teach such a fool? The Master replies that he is thinking of making him the next heavenly demon. Does this answer his question? Zaha Main came surprised, and he asked himself if he wanted to make him the next heavenly demon. The master says it is his turn. He says he does not think he belongs to the traditional or non-traditional faction if he were from the demon sect, as it would be impossible for him to not recognize him. This leaves them with the three masters of the three disasters, or perhaps the most difficult prediction to accept, which is teaching himself. Zaha is looking at the master. He says to himself, how could he narrow down the range without seeing his martial arts? Master asks him, is his prediction correct? Her reply is yes. He asks Master what exactly he taught him. This idiot had learned the eyes that make things, while the Master had learned the sword. Master, tell him Halan before meeting him. Just because he is superior at the sword, this does not guarantee that he will be skilled in the same way. Even if not, this guy is experienced and has a lot to learn. He is learning from him first. He knows how much he has to teach him. 
It is better for each person to deepen their expertise in what they are already good at. The master asks Zaha what martial arts he is most confident in. His hands are not stiff. Zaha says he has learned many martial arts, so he does not fight in one style. He trusts them all, but their use depends on the situation. Master says he does not stand out in any particular one, which makes Zaha speechless. He says to himself, it fights like his arm has been cut off. Master, tell him he can ask now. Zaha is looking at him, so he asks what a member of the demonic sect is doing here. The master says nothing after some time. He says he is waiting for the right timing to fight the sect leader. He is not a guy who can fight any time he wants, so he will have to wait a while longer. He also needs to recover from his injury. Then he asks Zaha, this is their first encounter, but he sees him as having known his student before. What does he want from him? You did not use a deadly poison, so he probably wants something from you. Zaha and Master are looking at each other. Zaha says to himself that he cannot lie to him. Mong is sitting there quietly. Zaha says he wants the ice technique, and Master is surprised. There is a moment of silence, then Zaha asks Master why he took him as his disciple. He says he is a lover of women. Master replied that, though this is his major, he is also talented in martial arts. Zaha looks at Mong and says to himself, Surprisingly, this man has nothing wrong with his story, even though the demons admit that he was only born to be a perverted demon. Master asks it's his turn to ask questions about why he wants the ice arts. Zaha replies to himself, kill the Lord. Master is looking at him. He asks Master why he wants to challenge the great Lord. Master replies that someone who straps into the force and fights more than 10 big battles is not a great person. Zaha becomes speechless. Master asks him, Does this mean that there are ten men left to beat? Master says there was a master among them, and that master caught his attention. He is a demon, as far as he knows. Zaha is listening to him. He says to himself, Sword demon, this person is like a demon walking in the path of obtaining the sword master title. Master safe to him. He does not think he can kill him just by obtaining ice arts. Does he have a plan? Zaha replies that he does not care about the outcome as long as he has the murderous intent to kill him. Master takes a pawn, then he thanks him for his patience. Master tells him now it is his turn to ask. Zaha looks at the sword and says to himself, A wooden sword reminds him of what Kuyamuji said. Then he asks the master, Does this wooden sword represent his state of refinement? Master replied, This is a strange question. Wooden swords have recently become resistant to fire. He says this may be true. He has not used this wooden sword yet. He asks Zaha if this answers his question. Master says there is no reason for his discipline to teach him how to use ice arts. How will he get it? Zaha, if he does not get it, then he has to teach him himself. Master says the questions are over now because he found out about him first. Zaha asks him, who does he think he is? He replies that he may have been influenced by a few people, but he is a person without a clear teacher. Zaha becomes surprised when the master says to him that this is usually the case with adults and gentlemen who stand alone. He does not want or need to have the ice arts. Rather, he needs the enlightenment to advance to the next level of martial arts. Extreme martial arts is also an amazing branch of martial arts. Zaha is setting quietly, main while the masters, as this is a common trait among people who excel in martial arts if he did not have a teacher, so it is clear to say that he is self-taught. Maybe he is using the world he learned from his childhood, but if he works hard enough, he will be able to use his real martial arts. Zaha is looking at the master. He says to himself that he is speechless for the first time since he returned to a talkative man like him and that being able to speak is a serious matter. Master asks him, is he wrong? He replays, and now he is right. The master says uncommon flair is a valuable thing in itself. He tells Zaha to forgive his student. If he has wronged him in any way, he does not deserve to be killed. There are not enough teachers, so if he is willing to forgive him, come to him. 
If he is having trouble practicing martial arts and has any questions, the master says he does not know if this can be called coincidence or luck. But both of them want to kill the Heavenly Lord. He thinks they can go ahead and confirm that day. Zaha looks at Mong and asks himself, This forward wants to kill the Heavenly Lord too. This bastard he has been chasing him for so long not to be his master but to kill him. Mong is confused. Zaha says to himself, There is no doubt that he was a pervert from birth. It was never meant to change the Lord by the traitor to retrieve the heavenly jade and give it to his teacher. The fact that he killed hundred elite members of the heavenly demon sector was because the left hand remained a side observer only. Master tells Mong to don't think about what happened with the diarrhea pills. Just consider himself lucky that he did not ingest the poison. He would have died yesterday if the master was not like now. He wonders how long he will continue drinking and having fun with his wives. Mong tells his master he will work harder on his training. His master asks him what about women, and he replies that he will also work hard with women. His master takes his sword and attacks. Mong, Zaha looks at him and says to himself that Nasty is really great as a private has identity. Is it certain that the sword demon was killed with a vase because of a fool in his previous life? Then he says to the master that there is too much to do. He says to himself, thinking about it, that the sword demon walks the path of the sword master, the pervert is a pervert, and he is crazy. All three of them have surnames that are in association with their nature. After that, he says to the master that he told him to ask about martial arts, so he will. Master, ask him now. He replies in an extraordinary martial arts notebook that there was a technique called the Thunder Sword Technique. What does he think of it? Master replies that there must be an explanation. Zaha tells the master that the sword's energy turns into a thunderstorm. Master asks him, is that just that? He replies yes. Zaha is looking at the master, and he says to himself that he is not the only one who thinks it is weird. Master asked him if the Thunder Sword style was his name, then what about the matter before or after he replied? This was divided into several stages, which he will mention in order, Long Sword Style, Short Sword Style, Ten Thousand Sword Style, Sword Drawing Style, then Thunder Sword Style. Master asked him what the next high reply is, Wooden Sword Style, Chi Sword Style, and Wuji Style. Master reply, It is usual to give a name to the level that can be reached while learning passwords. At the same time, he did not think of a complicated or primitive way. He says he guesses he could say that this is the strongest art of the sword method, but he had never heard of a sector that divided the essentials so simply. He looks like an ancient era master that dates back at least 100 years. Zaha replies that the master is right and says he will give him his opinion. Zaha is looking at the master. He says it is just a guess, just for reference. There is a silence for a moment, and after some time, the master says there is no need to be obsessed with the term sword thunder. This person may have accumulated skills. Zaha and master become speechless for a moment. Master tells Zaha his real name and tells him his real name lost its meaning a long time ago, so he does not use it. Zaha also introduces himself as Zaha from the humble faction. Master asks him, is he the founder of the lowly sect? He replies, yes, he is. Master tells Mong, from now on, do not touch those who belong to the humble fraction or insult them with his foolish words and actions. Otherwise, it is a war with their leader. Also, be careful if he encounters them. He replies as he wishes. Master says he will not sleep tonight because of what he said today. He hopes he gave him some time to think alone, both the leader of the humble faction and his disciple. Saha is sitting silently. He stands up and is about to leave at that moment. Master asks him if they can meet again sometime. Saha replies that they have a lot to discuss together in the future. The master begins to smile, then he says to Mong that he is sure that he has learned something today, so stay home quietly tonight. Enlightenment knocks on the doors of the house daily, but it feels like a smell of alcohol. Mong replied yes to his master. Zaha and Mong come outside together. They are both looking at each other angrily. 
Then Mong tells Zaha to consider himself lucky. Today he has received education from the master. He also calls him a village fool. Zaha calls him a little bastard, and he says it seems he wants you to know who among them was truly lucky today. Mong becomes furious. He is standing outside with Zaha when suddenly he hears his master telling him he has something to tell him, so come here. Mong goes running towards his master. Zaha is looking at him, then he leave from there he says to himself he could not immediately that the eyes technique, but he feel like he has gained a sword he did not use swords much in his previous life according to the sword devil standards it is true that he does not possess exceptional techniques, but if he carefully choose the fighting techniques he believe in along with the unknown staff technique bestowed him by the mad monk in addition to the fighting techniques his faith remains unbroken it will become overwhelmingly advantages because that stick was insanely sturdy but honestly he is not pleased so see the sword demon's level slightly surfaces his but considering the short time since he returned to life and looking at his growth rate he has become incredibly strong very quickly so he does not need to rush compare in himself to others around him also because the sword demon is on the different path than his the next day Mong says no wonder the man whose arm he broke was chasing him. He had not used the ice technique openly before, and he did not need to use it on him. Zaha tells him he is so funny. Mong asks what his reply is to all the places he broke his follower's arm in Baikyunji. And since his follower was injured, he had to crush the wretch who harmed him. A place full of boys he discovered had excellent combat skills, so he had to intervene and so he learned that he used the ice technique after the fight broke out. Mong asked him how he was following him in the first place. Zaha tells his men just that an illegitimate son of one of the clans would be adept at it. Mong becomes furious and tells him to stop mentioning that foolish world. He says, does he know that anyone who said that to his face in Baikenji got beaten up? Zaha replies that he does not care. He is a bastard either way so he does not understand why he gets angry at others. Mong becomes enraged, and he asks Zaha as he insults him. Zaha asks him, did he think these words were an insult? It is not as if he can choose this thing. Mong becomes surprised and asks him what he is saying. He replies that he is really a fool. Mong replies that his tongue cannot keep up with him, so he tells the waiter to bring over another drink. Then he calls Zaha a commoner, and asks him why he took the leader of the demonic faction as his enemy. He says he does not think a newcomer like him has any connection to the leader of the demonic faction. Zaha replies, You cannot tell him, Mong is speechless. After some time, he sees a woman passing by and is looking at her. Zaha asks him how it is that he turns into a raging dog whenever he sees women. Is there a reason for asking? Mong tells him yes, there is a reason. He asks what it is. Mong replies that he cannot tell him, then they both begin to laugh. Suddenly Zaha attacks him, and Mong becomes alert and is ready to fight. They are both looking at each other with anger in their eyes. Both of them start using their powers and are looking at each other. Zaha says the sword demon has already prevented them from fighting, but he thinks they can determine who is the strongest now, which is not that right. If Mong says he is right, then we need to determine who is the strongest. Everyone is looking at them. The girls become excited and ask, Are you this Lord Mong? Zaha asks Mong if he is not very famous. He replies that soon he will be famous but less famous than him. Zaha starts using his phoenix strike, and Mong fights against him with his power. He asks, Can this be considered a draw? Zaha asks him how he can say that. Zaha pushes Mong and the Mong goes flying into the air. He falls to the ground. Zaha is looking at him. Mong stands up and looks at the girls behind him. Zaha sees this person as really strong, and even in a situation like this, he still pays attention to the girl's looks. Mong begins to laugh. He comes back to his seat. He says he lost today. Does that mean he won once and lost once? Zaha asks him, is he crazy or what? Mom replies that whether they won or lost, from now on they will continue to complete, so don't be mad like that. Let's just say he lost in terms of internal energy. 
Then he looks at the girls and says to himself, that is good. The ladies seem happy. Zaha is looking at him. Mom drink has more wine than he says. He used to have a servant named Byungjo. He was five years older than him. He used to call him young master. He prepared his meals, cleaned and changed his shoes, and when he took a bath, he would bring him at all and change his clothes. He was a loyal servant. He was the only person close to him when he was young. One day they found loyal Byung dead, and his room throat slashed. He was curious about the reason for his death. When he met that woman, does he know what she said to him? When she refused, Byungjo said to him, he is ugly. How dare he propose to him? He says at that time he never expected his servant to be such a foolish person. He committed suicide after hearing that. So he is curious about women. He tries to understand why they are like this, and why he was willing to die for her. He says it is amazing that almost all of them think like that woman. They all want handsome and rich men. For people like Byung, they don't see them as humans. Even some women don't like him just because he is the second child, and for some women, he is not much different from Byung. Zaha asks him, so did he make them one by one and get rid of them? He replies, no, that is his revenge for Byung. Zaha says he is not just an ordinary fool, he is a mass of foolishness and garbage. He is not much different from his father. Mong becomes furious. Zaha says to him, maybe he got close to his mother and married her just for the sake of her family is martial arts skills even though he did not love her. But because martial arts skills have high production, his mother only thought him ice arts because in the world of he is already considered the second son and he is doing all this because of a servant. That is what he meant when he said he is not much different from his father. He is a fool. Mong becomes furious, and he is about to attack Saha, but Saha slaps him and holds him through his neck. Saha says to him that it seems that his teacher, the sword demon, has become his master because he pitted a naive idiot like him. He tells him to stay away, and he says he will make sure to cut his hand if he tries to attack him again. He says he has never loved the moments, so stop this bullshit. Mong becomes surprised, he asks, really? Zaha replies that the way they live life is different. Mong is laughing hard, while Zaha is drinking. He asks, does true love really exist? Both of them start laughing. Then Zaha faces himself. He may be crazy, but the slice will definitely be different. He looks at Mong and tells him to stop laughing. Mong is still laughing. Zaha stands up and says he will take his leave. Mong asks him where he is going. Is he going to search for true love? Zaha makes some weird faces. He says to himself that he does not want to kill him. Mong tells him to just sit down. There are beautiful women here more than anyone else. He says they have more beautiful women's hair than those famous places where the Namjong men hang out. The waiter tells Zaha he hopes he finds true love. Mong begins to laugh hard. Zaha leaves them, saying if his teacher needs anything during training, just come to him. Mong asks him where he should go if his teacher is looking for him. Her reply is that he is in the Black Rabbit Union, so come and look for him there. Mong tells him to wait for a moment, and he says he is his master. Zaha tells him he has beaten and killed and collected all the people who got in his way. He is the master of the Black Rabbit Union. Mong asks him really, then tells him to leave now and go look for his true love, then come back. Zaha says to himself, the path of the lonely man whose life surfaces, the understanding of the perverted person reminds him of the beautiful girl of the central plains and the orthodox beauty, and all the names of women and different places he has met in his past life. Now, dad, he has thought about it. He thinks half of them have been scolded or cursed by him. Well, this time he has not done anything like that yet. Next morning, Zaha is cultivating. The administrator comes to him and tells him there is someone here who introduced himself as the leader of the Nam Ming Association. He is waiting for him in the hall. There were quite a few of his followers outside, but he entered alone. Zaha stands up and starts walking. He enters the hall. Garrick asks him if he is here, 
and he replies yes. He sits on his chair. Garrick tells him his followers have been trained so well. He replies that they are a rowdy bunch, so he will have to work hard to keep them in line. Then he asks Garrick what brings him here. Garrick replied that there was a big battle between Nam Chan Ryan and the Supreme Sword Association, not only them but also the Southern Sky Brigade. There was a big confrontation, and both sides suffered heavy damage, but no one won. Zaha asks him really, and Garrick says yes. After that, the leader of the Southern Sky Brigade almost went crazy, and he suddenly called all the unorthodox factions that were not under his influence, and told them to come and join him. Zaha replies that he knows they are unorthodox factions, so which one is worst among them? Garrick replies, the Gamnam Association is an organization that grew by force every merging the upper levels. They have a lot of money and since they are extremely despotic. There was no choice but to join the South Sky Lotus, which is literally unorthodox, and it is the force that united all the unorthodox factions in the Nam Chuan area under the leadership of the Southern Sky Brigade in his youth. Goon enters the hall and says the Supreme Sword Association has arrived. Zaha becomes confused. Garrick asks are they here? Zaha tells Goon to total them to enter. Garrick smiles and says he cannot believe they have gone this far. A man enters the hall, looks at Zaha, and then looks at Garrick. After that, he shouted and asked who was the master of the Black Rabbit Union. Zaha replied that that would be him. The man tells Zaha, his servant, to leave. Zaha asks really, and then he says he forgot. Then he asks the man to tell him what he wants. The man says everyone in the Black Rabbit Union will get three pieces of silver if the Union's master comes personally. Ten pieces of gold will be paid daily. Zaha takes a deep breath and says perhaps it is because he does not know that Dai Na Shell died. The man becomes shocked he asks Dai Na Shell died, Nam says it seems he had also does not know about this. Zaha asks Nam what he thinks he replies honestly both of them are foolish and he does not want to fight with either of them he wants both the master of sword faction and the master of southern horizon clan to face each other to settle their problems. He cannot find a logical reason for them to risk their men's lives and he cannot understand why they threaten and involve the other factions in this. Zaha tell him he is being honest that is what men should do. The man makes a weird face and says did not expect that from him then he says all right they will meet later when this chaos is over and then he starts leaving from there. Zaha calls master so and comes there asking yes master. Zaha tells so this man is the messenger of the sword faction whom they will soon be fighting against compete in the inner courtyard gather subordinate so they can watch. He says he want to check the skills of the sword faction scum. The man becomes angry and ask him has he lost his mind. Zaha tells Nam to tell her somebody needs to come as well he wants the members of the Nam Young faction to watch this he does not like the Southern Horizon clan or even the sword faction so there is no harm in checking the opponent's skill through combat. Nam replies okay. Zaha stands up and says arrogant messenger prepare for the fight. The man asks him if can he handle the consequences. Zaha starts running and then he slaps the man making him fall to the ground he asks him is he deaf he says his mood has been extremely bad lately and what angers him even more than this is. The rest respect of the faction he has never heard of. Then he leaves from there saying hurry up and prepare for battle or he will slap him to death. Master So is looking at the man, then he says to Zaha, there's guy is not worthy to face him. Zaha asks as he is much weaker than him, he replies yes. Zaha says well then bring Che Sung Tae. After a moment we see everyone has gathered, and Sung Tae is also there. The man asks Zaha, is this is how he treat the messengers Zaha, asks does he consider this disrespectful. The man replies he came here just to deliver the message please keep that in mind. Zaha says let's do that then they will consider this as a welcome message to the sword faction. The man says alright then he start running towards Sung Tae who is also ready to fight. The man says to him let's compete without hurting each other. Sung Tae shouts as he says shut up, he dumb there are no such things in the combats. Zaha says this guy as he looks hopeless. Sung Tae is all ready, Nam asks Zaha what is his rank in the faction. Zaha reply he is the worst. Nam says oh really? Sung Tae is angry he says to himself bastard that he start running toward the messenger holding his sword and then he attacks him. Their swords are striking, Sung Tae is sweating heavily, and Nam asks Zaha is he is a good fighter. Zaha is silent. 
Sung Tae is fighting with the messenger with all his power. The messenger is also using his all the techniques, they are facing each other in the intense fight, and after a strike of swords, Sung Tae gets back. The messenger looks as he look at his sword, and suddenly he gets slapped by Sung Tae. Sung Tae runs, and gets behind the messenger holding the sword at his neck asking should he kill him? Zaha replies leave him. Sung Tae says the sword faction is not that strong after all. Zaha says no this man is just worthless don't misunderstand he did not make him compete with him to think like that. Sung Tae has a big smile on his face, and everyone else is speechless. Zaha asks did they all see that this is the skill of the man who came to them as their messenger. The sword faction wanted to treat them the Black Rabbit Union as mercenaries but as they can see they refused. Then he says to the messenger he may leave but it will not end with just a slap the next time he acts arrogantly like this. Zaha gets near him. The messenger is scared heat, and same for sharing his life, then he start leaving from there quickly. Sung Tae is scared as he realizes the man's ear is bleeding, he asks that the attack from the palm of his hand have this much power. Everyone is looking at him saying nothing. Now inside the room Sung Tae asks Zaha, his ear was bleeding is he that strong? Zaha says nothing, Nam tells Sung Tae the master slapped him before the fight starts so his eardrum must have burst because of that. Sung Tae becomes sad and says so he understand now. Zaha says the Supreme Sword Association is trying to get into a war with the Southern Heaven Troop, and they're offering to pay each of their men three silver tails per day, if they join them. Three silver tails. Then he says that is the value of their lives in the eyes of the Supreme Sword Association. Everyone is silent making strange faces. Master So says just because they have earned some money from intermediate this is how they work now he says this is trash. Zaha says since they are also trash take back those last words of him. Master So replies understood. Zaha says but they are not the same kind of trash they are kind of crash is more like plum blossom leaves that fell from the plum blossom tree and their kind of trash is like smelly diarrhea that came from eating diarrhea poison. The other man are confused one of them says how is it different? Zaha asks was he too extreme in his analogy? Sung Tae replies he thought that was a perfect analogy. Zaha tell him to shut up he says it was overboard he replies yes sir. Zaha says this is the leader of the Naming Association Nam Garak. The Supreme Sword Association and Southern Heaven Troop also made an offer to him but he rejected them. He is someone he respects as a man regardless of his level of skills this is who is to him. Hey garlics of whether they get into a fight with the Supreme Sword Association or the Southern Heaven Troop, the Naming Association will join hands with the Black Rabbit Union. Bear that in mind. Everyone reply yes sir. Nam says even if they combine our forces, it wouldn't be as strong as the Supreme Sword Association or the Southern Heaven Troop, but the Naming Association promises not to embarrass ourselves in the upcoming fight. Everyone says they look forward to working with him. Zaha tells Nam he has more subordinates. If they combine their forces and they fight in the front, then regardless of who they fight, they'll be able to render one of them into ashes in an instant. Nam gets shocked. Zaha says but, such reckless fighting will cause a bigger loss of lives on their side. Nam is speechless. Huyin stands up and says sect leader, he'd like to provide some reinforcements too. Zaha replies to Master Huyin, he has already helped a lot by teaching Sung Tae. Thanks to him he was able to avoid being humiliated. Huyin gets shocked he says to himself he's addressing him in a different manner now. Zaha then says and so, he doesn't need his help in sending reinforcements. Since they are exceptional in teaching people, please feel free to visit the Black Rabbit Union anytime to give pointers to the people here. Huyin thanks Zaha. Zaha smiles. Char after listening to all this looks sad and he says he did his best too. Zaha then says our main enemy is the Supreme Sword Association. They'll forget about the Southern Heaven Troop for now. Master So asks is there a reason for doing that? Zaha replies from what he heard the Southern Heaven Troop is more similar to their group. There's a high chance that they'll accept to resolve this matter with a one-on-one -on -one fight between the leaders. On the other hand, it wouldn't be surprising if the Supreme Sword Association hired assassins to assassinate the leaders. Then he says to himself Nam Garak was killed by assassins in his previous life. From how the messenger spoke, the Supreme Sword Association must be the ones who hired those assassins. Zaha then says to them they'll ignore the Southern Heaven Troop for now and send a letter to the Supreme Sword Association. The man says he understands and tells Zaha to tell him what he wants to be written in the letter and he'll take care of it. Zaha says Black Rabbit Union, Professor Su's group, 
12 Heavenly Generals, Golden Mountain Merchant Group, Ilyang Prefecture, and Black Pearl Fort all belong under Halo Sect. And any merchants, food vendors, or farmers that aren't protected by anyone also all belong to the Haho Sect. If you discover any intimidation, kidnapping, murder, or violence committed by the Supreme Sword Association against the mentioned groups of people, that mean war with the Hao Sect. He says include all this in the letter. Nam tells HM Sect leader, he didn't mention the Naming Association. He replies, oh add the Naming Association in. The man replies understood he'll make sure the letter is written and sent out. Zaha says the letter will also be sent to the nearby black factions, orthodox factions, martial academies, bandit strongholds, pirate strongholds, merchantries, finance manors, assassination groups, brothels, inns, restaurants, places under the bridge, and even the temple. So make hundreds of those letters and place them in every room and every street. Send them to every sect, family, and the widowed family. Family anyone who dares to mess with the working class will need to take a slap from me, be beaten up by him or be killed by him. Everyone says yes Union Master. Zaha says if anyone with any complaints wants to have a fight with him, or thinks that he is a joke, ask them to look for the Hao Sect Yi Zaha. The man asks him saying Union Master wouldn't he get too busy then? Let him narrow down some of those for him. Zaha asks is that so? Then says in that case, add on the fact that he killed the great Rakshasa. It seems the people around them still don't know that the great Rakshasa is dead. Then he says oh, and also add on that Professor Su, Elder Hornless Dragon King, and the Black Pearl Fort Master have all been killed by him because they got on his nerves. Pay extra attention to put in the fact that Dong Fang Yian, who committed fraud gambling, was specially set on fire and killed by him. Man replies understood. Then Zaha says oh and Sung Tae, Sung Tae stands up and says yes sec master. Meanwhile he says to himself finally is his turn. Zaha tells him he wants him to head to Eliang Prefecture now and bring Duke Su here on a horse carriage. On his way back he wants him to go with him to the market and buy tons of pork bones, all kinds of meat, ingredients and gallons of alcohol. Sung Tae says pardon? Zaha says bring 10 more people from the Black Rabbit Union with him. They'll ask the cook of the Hao sect to prepare a delicious feast for their brothers from the Naming Association. Then, he says to Administrator Bayok, please give Sung Tae the necessary money for all of that. He replies understood. Zaha says to Nam he went to all the trouble of coming here to visit them, so they ought to have a good meal together. Nam replies alright then. Zaha asks is there anything else that he left out? Anything else that needs to be discussed? Anyone that he killed but didn't mention? None right? A man replies he doesn't think so. Suddenly they hear someone saying get out of his way, they all look at the door, the door opens and several man enters one of them says he is from the Southern Heaven Troop. Who's the Black Rabbit Union Master? Everyone gets scared and they are speechless. Zaha is also silent. There is silence in the hall, and the man are coming towards Zaha. Sung Tae stands up and slap one of them saying get on their knees bastard. He starts taking them saying how dare he act arrogant here, everyone start beating him saying trample him fucking manner less bastards. Nam is speechless. After some time, we see the tables have been set, everyone has gathered, the food is getting ready, and Zaha is enjoying alcohol with others, then he looks at the three men in a badly beaten state. He goes near them, and asks who are they guys who beat them up. One of them says Union Master they are from the Southern Heaven Troop. Zaha, ask is that so and the men are speechless, then Zaha turns his head saying Gun Pyong let him power him a drink as he is looking at leaving from there. He has a smile on his face, then he comes out and says about today the letter, and those annoying southern heaven troop bastards arrogant pieces of shit, as he hears someone saying yes everything that their great military advisor says is correct. Tiger says to Zaha senior brother he is drinking quite a lot today. Zaha tell him to drink up as well. He replies yes. Zaha games him the alcohol and says let him borrow his sword for a while. He replies alright. Then Zaha start walking and he stands up beneath a tree and says brothers and sister of the Hao sect, he is Yi Zaha. From the moment he was born in Iliang prefecture and starts to walk, he has been cleaning the tables at a certain inn. But that inn now ceases to exist as it has been burned out of existence. Hao sect actually starts while it was getting burned down. That fire had spread into his heart. Those flames are burning somewhere within his heart. He used to be someone who amounted to nothing, had a bad temper, and was a good-for-nothing in many ways, but because he was one of the weak in the society, 
the Hao sect will continue to stand by the side of the weak. Anyone who doesn't harass the weak for no reason are all family members to him. He could be someone of the Orthodox faction, a martial artist family member, the Black faction, the Demonic faction, the Temple, a widow, a Taoist, a beggar, a merchant, or a lumberjack. That doesn't matter at all. He'd still be his family. Ordinary people who don't know martial arts, the weak, frail women, pretty women, kind women, young children, monks, Taoists, drunks, waiters, jazangs, shamans, nuns, fathers, mothers, uncles, sisters and brothers who do various things to make a living while worrying about putting food on the table. If anyone dares to harass them, he'll deal with them no matter what their background is. Everyone starts looking at Zaha. Zaha then says while he is not skilled enough to fight on par with the strongest people in the world, he spent time circulating his energy yesterday and the day before. He has trained his stamina with his brothers in the Black Rabbit Union, and he also received advice about sword techniques from a senior in the Jianghu, whom he met by coincidence. He is a man who improves himself a little day by day. The leader of the Hao sect Yiza. He'd like to show all of them the sword technique that he has been working on recently. After that, he jumps and hit the tree using his sword. The leaves starts falling, and he is looking at them. Then he strikes at them, he continues to strike the leaves as he continues to walk. His sword catches fire, it's burning, he activates lightning sword form, plum blossom fragrance. He activates the skill using his fingers setting the leaves on fire. He smiles, and everyone starts clapping and hooting. Zaha says the Hao sect looks forward to working with all of them. He is the Hao sect leader. Everyone says greetings, sect leader. After that Zaha returns the sword to his owner. Sungtae comes to Zaha saying sect leader. That was amazing. Zaha hugs him saying their dear administrator Cha. He replies yes, as he pours him the drink. Zaha tells him he must not die he must train hard if he wants to survive, he replies he understood. The administrator comes near Zaha and asks him if he alright. He says is he alright? He has had too much drink. Zaha reply he is good he is good. After that he sits on the ground under the cherry blossoms tree and starts activating his powers. Blood starts dripping out from his finger he opens his eyes, and then he leaves from there saying he has sobered up the guys continue drinking at their own time he will stand watch tonight. Black Monkey says okay senior brother. Zaha gets inside the building, he is standing in front of those men asking them what they come here for did they tell him that already? One of them replies they are under the orders of the Southern Heaven troop leader to request for the Black Rabbit Union to join them in the upcoming war. Zaha asks do they have any reason as to why he ought to do that or not. The man says they were not able to ask their troop leader for the reason. Zaha replies he understand he wants them to pass this message to the arrogant leader of their if he dares act rudely again, he will be the one looking for him they reply yes he tells them to get up they all stand up Zaha starts giving them the support saying they get them out of the black rabbit. Union he will bring them out. The man replies it is fine. Zaha tell him to shut that mouth of his everyone becomes silent, and then they start leaving from that building. We see Zaha going out. Sungtae asks him where he is going he replies for a walk. He asks him if he wants him to join him he replies no. This makes Sungtae angry, and he says he does not want to either. He is extremely angry, and someone is looking at him from behind the wall. He takes out a book and starts writing something, then he smiles. He is writing about Zaha, he says he is good at rejecting others he has a sword by his waist. He is young, he has a sleep deprived looking face bloodshot eyes he is assumed to have a nasty personality. He is good looking. In a flashback we see the man sitting in front of another man, saying swift whirlwinds. He is serious. It is quite a fancy name for an assassin organization. The man is silent, then the other man gives him gold coins, saying he wants him to bring Zaha's head. Then he says well, it would also be fine as long as he confirms that he is dead. He says this bastard is the one who greatly infuriated their assassination leader, who is a busy man. Doesn't he look like he would be rude to anyone? The man says he will remember his appearance please take back the composite drawing. The other man tells him to be careful, as he tells him Zaha has said to have killed both the great Rakshasa and Professor Su. The man is speechless. The man with a mask on his face tells him he has never met him in person before, but he knows a little physiognomy. This guy is a lunatic. Then he says, wait, on a second look at his composite drawing, he has the eyes of a lunatic. He asks, did the person who drew this exaggerate his eyes? To the present, we see the man closing his diary. 
After that we see Zaha eating something and saying God this is so good. A man comes near him, asking him, shall he pack some for him to take away? He asks the man why he would do that he is going to eat it alone though. The man becomes embarrassed, but he says all right. Zaha then leaves from there, saying see him. He starts singing. He is eating dumplings alone and singing by himself. The man is following him, and he wonders if he is really crazy. After that, we hear someone saying welcome. As the man enters a restaurant, the waiter comes near him, asking him what he would like. The man replies that he would like some beef jerky and a bottle of wine. The waiter replies please wait here for a moment. Suddenly he gets excited as he says Union Master. He comes out of the restaurant, asking Zaha where he is going. He replies, just taking a walk. The waiter asks him to take a walk, and he replied inspection, scouting, wandering patrol, sightseeing, and exploring. The waiter panics and says, wow, he is doing it so many times at once. He is an incredible Union Master. Zaha replies, that is the kind of person he is. The man is listening to their conversation. The waiter asks, Zaha, why he is not drinking alcohol these days. He told him to come have a cup of Dukong liquor. He replies, he quit drinking. The waiter says, come on, don't lie to him. The man is shocked after listening to their conversation. He asks himself, is that waiter out of his mind? He dares to talk to his union master in that manner. Zaha says to the waiter that he thinks it was a few days ago that he drank so much with everyone that they almost died. Everyone was so drunk they were either lying flat on the ground or throwing up everywhere. The waiter asks him, even he as well. Zaha replies, including him he stood guard throughout the night. He says to himself what is he saying his subordinates was all he says to himself what is he saying his subordinates was all drunk, but he stood guard throughout the night. The waiter says to Zaha, is that not against the principle of the Jianghu? How could the union master stand guard? Zaha replies that he knows right, in any case thanks. Let him know if he sees any suspicious people. The waiter replies, yes sir, the man is still listening to their conversation. After a moment, Zaha leaves from there, and the man is still thinking, is he crazy? The waiter asks the man, is it his first time seeing the union master? The man looks at him and says, he is the black rabbit union master. Then he says he heard that he wears a mask everywhere he goes. The waiter replies, no, that is the old union master, he is dead. The man replies that he understands the waiter asks him what he thought the man asks him, what does he mean the waiter asks him, what does he think will win if the Supreme Sword Association and the Southern Heavens troop fight. The man replies that he is showing a lot of interest in someone else fighting. The waiter says it is a normal topic that people talk about, even drinking alcohol. Could he please pour him a cup too? The man replies that the waiter thanked him. The man asks him what his thoughts were. Who does he think will win? The waiter starts drinking the alcohol and replies, Firstly, whether the Supreme Sword Association wins or loses, he thinks they are done for. The man asks him why he said that. The waiter replied that there were rumors that the Union Master that he just saw said he wouldn't let the Supreme Sword Association off. The man asks, but why did the waiter reply? Because they are the worst lot they have tons of money, so they hire assassins. Those pieces of trash are speechless. The waiter continues to say that assassinations take place everywhere. Or because of them. On the other hand, Sado Hang, the Southern Heaven troop leader, is more like an older martial artist. He has an intimidating aura and one-on-one -on -one duels. So the Union Master said they would utterly destroy the Supreme Sword Association first. Zaha enters the restaurant, saying give him some Dukang liquor, he has some dumplings stuck in his throat. He says to the waiter, he underestimated those dumplings too much. One must not underestimate them the waiter replies that he understood, then he leaves. There to bring alcohol Zaha sits in front of the man, making him silent. Zaha asks him where he is from, and he replies that he is from shipping, and that he is here to meet with an acquaintance. Zaha says no, 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 then he hits the table. With a screwdriver and asking the man who sent him here, the man is scared. The man is scared to death. He says to himself seriously, why is he not reacting? He says to him that when a young guy rudely talks back to the owner of a fancy place, it is normal to take a second look. If an adult appears to be biting on a dumpling, it is standard to regard them with contempt. Then he says that when someone starts singing a strange song, it is human nature to at least glance back in confusion. After that, he says it is proof that they have been trained. The man is silent. The host turns up and says to him that killing him would not bother him, but what follows is tedious killing, then killing more and more, 
and the big boss does not easily show up, but he must endure it. Enduring being hit by a man is also a burden the boss must bear. The man is silently looking at him, the horses to him. In that sense, how about the kill the boss, Yiwi River? The man asks him what he replied, it would be perfect to prevent the appearance of miserable guys like him? The man is still silent. Zaha says to him that ordinary hitmen are just as pitiful as him, if they were not already pitiful, they would have already killed those around them, making them pitiful. That is why fellows like him lack the emotions to understand his words. He feels a bit sorry for his body it is right for him to end it, but he is not dying because of him he is dying, because of the one who created the Yui River. He tells him to understand that as he dies, that is the life of a hitman, following orders until death. That is a hitman's life no one has to live like that. The man takes a deep breath, and then he says, already drenched in so much blood, who could he blame? Zaha says what a pathetic life what he wants is the main base of the Yui River. Then he says if he cannot speak, draw his sword because he is making this stroll longer. The man is scared he is speechless, then he looks at Zaha. Zaha has taken out his sword. He strikes the man, activating his burning sword. Zaha is in full power the man's body has split into two, and he is dead. Zahadan takes the sword from the table and puts it back into the shield. The waiter comes near him, asking him if he was a hitman. He replies yes, and he tells the waiter to don't touch him. There could be poison on his clothes or in his mouth. He should not even touch a guy like this, not even his corpse. The waiter replies yes. Zaha gives him the money, saying he will send his men to clean this up immediately. Leave it as it is for now and take this. The waiter asks him why he was giving him money all of a sudden, he replied for the ring and the table fee. The waiter asks but why is he giving so much? He replied that it was an advance. The waiter is confused. He tells him a similar incident will likely happen quite often for a while. He will deliberately go out for walks more frequently. The waiter says yes, thanks, then he asks Zaha, but how did he know? He says he just thought he was a bit strange because he is a stranger. Zaha replies that he is hit man written all over his face. The waiter starts checking and asks where he does not see it written, and then he says he is even a narrow foreheaded guy. Zaha smiles, then says he is leaving. The waiter takes his dagger out of the table and tells him he should take his dagger. After firmly sticking the dagger in the table he finishes off surprisingly with a knife slash. Starting with the dagger stuck in the table, isn't there some high-class psychological warfare? Zaha replied. No, it is just a habit. The waiter says yes, then Zaha says he is going. Now the waiter says yes, please come again. Zaha's men have come to pick up the dead body of the man. The waiter says to Sung to excuse him. Sung asks what? The waiter asks him if this person really looked like a hitman to him, and he said he looked perfectly ordinary to him. Sung asks him cannot he tell just by looking? The waiter asks pardon. Sung Tae replies he said, can he tell just by looking at this pathetic guy? The waiter replies no then, then he asks when has he seen him before he might be pathetic. Sung Tae asks, isn't he from Halmun? The waiter says Halmun? Him? Sung Tae replies, yes, he stopped playing tributes like before, did not he? The waiter replies yes, Sung Tae tells him then he is from Halmun. The waiter replies that he understands. Sung Tae shows him his thumb, saying it's him. The waiter asks him, what is that? He replies he is the chief officer of Halmun he is the second in command in Halmun, he is the man who laid the foundation of Halmun with their leader from their very beginning. He is Sung Tae Cha, the premier swordsman of Iliang. The waiter asks himself, what the hell is this shit? After that he says, oh it is his first time meeting him, so chief, he means to say he can tell that someone is a hitman just by looking at their face. After that he says oh it is his first time meeting him, so chief, does he mean to say he can tell that someone is a hitman, just by looking at their face? Sung Tae replies yes. The waiter says to himself that this scamming bastard is ruining the boss's mood. He just looks like some local bully, how did he become the second in command? Sung Tae asks him why is he staring at him like that? Then he says he is quite audacious, the waiter replies oh no not at all, that is him. After that he says he cannot even smack him since he is just a kid. After that he says to everyone, there could be poison in the corpse, so let's take it to a secluded place and burn it. They replied, yes chief. 
Sung Tae asks the weather what his name is, he replies that it is Jang Sam. Sung Tae told him there is a high chance that the fellow hitman will come here to investigate how they died. He tried to see when that happened. The waiter asks him to find out whether he should report it. He replied, no, just find out. Don't do anything dangerous. He will be able to recognize them because he has a similar vibe to the dead guy. The waiter asks how he knows if someone is a hitman. Sung Tae tells him hitman lacks emotion, so their eyes gave off a cold, settled feeling. The waiter says that seems right. Sung Tae then says that guy is a hitman, and the waiter is silently looking at him. Sung Tae then leaves from there saying let's go. The waiter is looking at everyone's face, saying to himself that he is not an assassin either. This guy only has a dead fish's eye, so he is not one either. That guy is obviously not one. He starts prospering as he looks at someone. He gets shocked. Then he enters his restaurant and says to himself that he is a real assassin. Meanwhile, he is cleaning the table. The man enters the restaurant, scaring the waiter. The man asks the waiter if a person who died yesterday was killed in one strike. The waiter says yes. The man asks where he was sitting. The waiter tells him over there. He sat over there. The man sits on the same table and calls the waiter. The waiter says yes. The man tells him to sit down unless he wants to die. After that the man starts leaving the restaurant. The waiter was looking at him, and he said to himself, come to think of it, there were quite a lot of unfamiliar faces today. The man calls him, and he quickly looks at him, saying yes. The man tells him to act normally unless he wants to die right away. He tells him to not shorten his own life by doing anything unnecessary. The waiter is scared to death. He replies that he understands. After that, he sits quietly. Suddenly he heard someone saying welcome, sacked master, and then he looked at Zaha entering the restaurant. Zaha asks did he wait a long time? The man replies that he just arrived. Zaha orders Jang Sam to bring Dukang liquor for him the waiter replies that he understands. Zaha says to the man that it looks like he brought along some gophers today. The man replies that he apologizes for that there was just too little information about him. They should have been more careful from the start. After that he says that if he dies here, things will get pretty complicated for him as Zaha sits in front of him and the waiter is serving them food. Zaha tells the waiter to go back in. The waiter replies yes, sec master. Then he leaves from there and the man is looking at him. He picks up one of his chopsticks and throws it at the waiter, making him confused and scared. Zaha comes to his rescue. He decreases the speed of the chopstick and the chopstick hits the ground near the waiter, making him fall. Zaha and the men are now having eye-to-eye -eye contact, so they start moving. Zaha activates his powers, then he makes the man go flying into the air. The man starts bleeding from his nose and mouth, and he takes out his sword. Zaha starts pouring his liquor into his cup. The waiter is looking at him, and he says to himself, this is what the Jianghu likes. The man comes near Zaha to strike him, but to our surprise, Zaha has stopped his sword with only one hand, while holding liquor in the other hand, making the waiter surprised. The man gets scared, Zaha takes a sip, and after that, he activates his powers and starts burning the sword of the man. The man's hand is burning. Zaha says to himself that if their level of skills had been similar, he could have left after exchanging blows. But since the difference between their skill levels is quite huge, he cannot just retreat now. The man's hand has turned red, he is suffering. Several men start entering their restaurant, and one of them throws his weapon into the air, causing a knife to rain. The knives are about to hit Zaha, but should he start using his powers and turn the knife in the direction of the man? The attacker gets shocked as he looks at his master getting hit by his knives. The enemy is screaming, and his sword slips from his hand, causing his own death. Zaha asks another man why he killed his own comrade. The other man is scared to death and speechless. The man looks scared to death. Another man gets killed. The man looks back and finds Nam standing there, Another man gets killed and this time it has been done by Master So. More men get killed the dragon, tiger and rooster are also there. They have arrived there to kill the assassins. The man starts drenching. Zaha says to him assassin seem to think he is a joke he thought he was clear when he said he has more subordinates. The man he starts looking around, and Zaha orders his subordinate to kill him too. The monkey comes there to attack him. The man gets scared, and he starts jumping from one table to another. The weapons are following him he gets hit by them, and lastly Master So takes his life. The man is dead, lying on the ground. 
Zaha says to the waiter that he did a great job spotting them. The waiter replies yes sir. After that, we hear someone saying he is not the one. He doesn't know martial arts. He meanwhile we see a man getting dragged by Master So. He says to Nam this guy is a little confusing because he does not have internal energy. Nam asks is that so? Then he grabs his hand and starts checking something. Then he says to the sector leader that he really does not have any internal energy. Zaha is silent the man starts saying it loudly. Like he said, he is really not an assassin. Zaha comes near him and tells him everyone is dead except him. He will die if he has nothing to say. The man shouts and says he does not know any martial arts. How can he kill someone like him? Zaha asks him, why is he so angry? Then he says to him, if he decides to stick by the swift whirlwinds, then it is only natural for him to die. Did he think he would let him live? The man starts thinking about his past. Meanwhile Zaha calls Jang he says yes sir. Zaha tells him to look away for a moment. This makes him confused, and he turns around. After that, Zaha takes out his sword and kills the man. The man is lying on the ground dead. Jang is scared. Zaha says, based on, what happened? Yesterday and today he seemed to be their only target. It is not a bad thing. That is the case though. After that he calls it a white tiger. White tiger says yes, senior brother. The heart asks him. The Supreme Sword Association has ties to a merchant group, right? White Tiger replies that they probably have ties to multiple merchant groups. Zaha tells him to get Gold Boar with him, and look into all merchant groups that are related to the Supreme Sword Association. They need to shake them down, so that they can find the base of these swift whirlwinds easily. Those merchant groups might also know how to find them. After that, he says, even if it does not work out, if the Supreme Court Association is disbanded, then those merchant groups that stayed by them need to be dealt with as well. They cannot kill all of them, so tell Gold Boar that the Golden Mountain Merchant Group will take charge of them. Then he says to White Tiger that he wants him to come up with an appropriate solution to deal with the situation. Gold Boar will probably benefit the most in terms of finances from the profits. He wants the victims who have been affected to be compensated accordingly. Tell him to make sure all the calculations are in order. The White Tiger replies, yes sir. Zaha says he will leave the search for the swift whirlwinds fully to all of them. Everyone replies, yes sir. After that, Zaha says to Nam that they will be attacking the Supreme Sword Association. Nam says there is the Southern Heaven group as well. Does he have any ideas on how to deal with them? Zaha replies that he will gather a small group of elites to launch a supreme attack. Their aim is not to kill people they will retreat after they burn down the Supreme Sword Association's main camp. Nam asks if he is only going to burn down the main camp. That is all. Zaha replies no, they need to provoke the Southern Heaven troop too. He is thinking of making the two of them fight to their deaths. Am says oh? Zaha tells him a small group of elites will burn their main camp down, kill a few of their people, and run away. That way the Supreme Sword Association will think that the Southern Heaven troop are the ones who did it, and the Southern Heaven troop will think the Supreme Sword Association is provoking them. Nam replies, he likes that idea. There will not be any losses on their end either. Zaha says to Nam, let's have a fun life. There is no need to get serious when they are only dealing with idiots. This makes Nam confused. After that, he starts laughing hard. Zaha is looking at him. And he says to himself, they just need to harass their enemies. Harass them to the point that they pass out. Ride them so crazy that they pass out. And the fun of driving a deeper wedge into a strained relationship. He knows just how fun that is without realizing it. Somewhere deep in his heart, the Supreme Sword Association has already ceased to exist in the Jianghu. And all he is thinking of right now is how he can drive deeper wedges. He says his heart is at such peace now. Then they will know who is the eviler bastard after all of this is over. Zaha says he is an expert in regards to people being black-clad martial artists. Black-clothed martial artists, this group of people is pretty mysterious in the Jianghu. They are not total idiots but it is more like their martial arts are on the stronger side. Based on his experience of having fought some of the strongest martial masters within the Jianghu most of the black cloth martial artists are idiots. It is because martial masters who are truly strong would reveal themselves. The black cloth martial artist would only be at the level of first-rate martial masters, which is why he acted like them despite being way more skilled. Then it is because of the following reasons because he wanted attention. They are attention seekers. After a moment of silence he says to himself, an attention seeker. That is who he is. The sight of the black cloth, 
that his dear subordinates with the Black Rabbit Union had prepared with their hearts. That gallant spirit within their hearts is magnificent. And as he looked at his black clothes, he was filled with more confidence that he could perform the usual things that he does in an ever manner. After that, he starts meditating, saying to himself that he was unable to figure it out. As he meditates, he thinks about what the way of life means, but it seems vague and hard to understand. He asks himself what life is like. And why would a beautiful woman hate him? Why would his mind be full of thoughts about pork ribs, Duquesne liquor, bastards, disgraceful assholes, and thus swift whirlwinds? He says it is so confusing. He is still meditating alone in his room. The door opens, and Nam enters. He finds Zaha sleeping. He asks him, was he sleeping? Zaha replies, no then Zaha says to Nam. He is pretty good, and the Naming Association is pretty thorough at preparation. Nam laughs and says the Black Rabbit Union is pretty good too. After that they both wear clothes on their faces. Zaha looks at Nam and says, he cannot believe he is using a bandana that is used by the lower-ranked assassins. This makes Nam shocked, and Zaha says how lame. Nam no, remove the bandana from his face asking Zaha, does he have another face cloth? Lend him one. Zaha picks up off his clothes, saying to himself that the administrator shared his meticulous preparation. After that he gives the clothes to Nam and says, let's get going now. Nam asks him, why are they going out from there or are they going to leave via the window? Zaha replies, they are taking the stairs. Nam asks the stairs. He says people will notice them though. Zaha replies, enjoy endure with stand. That is the life of an attention seeker. Nam is confused. After that we see people getting confused as he hears Zaha telling the owner to throw away the clothes that are in the room. The owner replies. Yes, Zaha says great they will not be leaving any traces then. Nam is staring at him. Then they both leave from there. The owner is scared and speechless. The full moon can be seen in the sky, and people are talking to each other about it as they are passing through the street. Zaha says to Nam, did he see that this is the charm, power, and peak of people wearing black clothes? Most people in the Jiangu would tremble at the sight of people wearing black clothes. Nam replies that he does not tell jokes with such a serious tone that he cannot tell if he is joking or not. Zaha says to him while it would be nice if he set fire to the place, it is okay if he does not do so. Nam is confused. Then Zaha says he is saying that whenever they do, they must get them agitated. Nam replies alright. They have reached their destination, and they are standing in front of a giant gate. The guards are wondering who the hell are they? Are they lunatics? Zaha says let's do whatever they want. Nam says it has been a while since his blood has felt like it was boiling. Zaha then starts running, saying he was going first. Nam asks him, why is my brother wearing the black clothes if that is what he is going to do? As he looks at Zaha, he reaches the gate. Zaha starts using his powers, and he breaks the gate, making everyone shocked. Zaha then enters the area, saying the black clothes are used to try and tame his madness. He is still him. Everyone is standing there in a confused state. Zaha starts walking, saying a true man goes in from the front. Everyone starts shouting, saying an intruder. Nam kills the guards and comes in front of Zaha, saying he is going to go first. Zaha has a smile on his face. A dog comes near him, barking at him. Zaha says, make sure their dogs don't bark in the middle of the night. Then he says, fucking dogs. He becomes irritated. Then he jumps on the roof of a house. He is moving himself from one roof to another. Then he makes a huge jump and lands on the roof of the highest building. He starts laughing. Everyone is looking at him from the ground. Everyone starts running towards him. Zaha chuckles. He says to himself, The Supreme Sword Association lives a good life just eating and shitting in this place. The thought of that makes him seethe. After that, he jumps out of there and starts moving around. After some time, he enters the balcony and faces several men there. He says to himself that he's the head of the guards. The man in the red robe asks him who sent him. Zaha remains silent, as he says to himself that a black-clothed martial artist would find it meaningless to answer such questions. A huge blast is seen covering a wide area with fire. Zaha says to himself that it looks like Nam Garak has starts. The man orders others to capture him alive. He says they will be torturing him to find out who sent him. Their reply. Yes sir. After that they start running towards Zaha. Zaha takes out his sword and strikes one of the men, making everyone scared. Zaha asks, capture him alive? With those skills of theirs? Someone attacks him using many knives he dodges all the attacks more knives are coming to him he starts running. Then he turns back and comes near the attacker, he grabs his neck and kills him. Zaha is dragging him with himself. Then he hits the man to the wall. 
After that, Zaha starts making swift movements his sword is burning, and he starts attacking the nearby areas, igniting the fire. He comes near other enemies and looks at them. Then he jumps from the top floor to land on the ground. The whole building has caught fire. A huge blast is seen. Zaha is leaving, and from there he encounters some more men. The man in the red robe asks him, Did Se Dohang send him here? Zaha remains silent. Meanwhile, he says to himself that he might not believe it if he says that Se Dohang sent it to him, so he will just keep quiet. Someone comes there saying to step aside, then he asks hall leader Chion, should he kill him? Chion replies, capture him alive. It is fine if he cuts off his limbs though. The man replies, yes sir. He takes out his sword and starts moving it around. Then he starts running to Zaha. Zaha hands up, saying he surrenders and cannot win against the spear. The man tells him to put down his weapon then. Zaha drops his sword but before the sword can hit the ground Zaha makes it hit the man. The man gets shocked as he looks at the sword in his body. Everyone gets scared including Qian. Zaha is looking at them. Everyone is looking at the stabbed body of a man. Zaha starts moving, then he takes out his sword from the dead body, and then he stabs someone. After he starts moving again and killing other men one by one, all the men around him are dead the ones who are alive are threatened. Zaha is standing there with his sword covered with blood. Qian looks at him. Someone comes there asking Qian is Se Dohang here? Qian replies no. There were just a few rats that came in. Zaha throws his sword at the man, and the man stops the sword with his finger. Zaha says to himself he is pretty good. He got a spare that was thrown in an unwavering stance with his bare hand. Then he starts leaving from there saying damn it their mission has failed. Someone says he is running away, get him and the other men. Start following him. Zaha is running fast. Nam joins him, and they leave from there. They both look at each other as they are leaving the burning castle. After reaching deep inside a forest, Zaha asks, were a lot of buildings on fire? Nam replies, he set fire to more than 20 of them. They will probably have to work through the night to put the fire out. Zaha tells him to go back to the Southern Heaven troop first. Nam asks, what? Zaha tells him to keep quiet. And he says, gotcha. Zaha starts looking around, and after some time he hears someone asking him, does he think he could get away? He is a man in a red robe. He jumps off the tree and starts coming near Zaha. Zaha says to himself, directing. He put all his efforts into it and has worked since the Supremes were association masters and the martial master his subordinates probably have not caught up yet. Good luck to thank a large cat who just unexpectedly appeared in front of him. Then he says to the man, welcome Baldi, who looks pretty strong. The man is silent. Zaha asks him why he is here alone, where he betrayed. Or did he suddenly have a life-changing encounter? The man asks him, What nonsense is he on about? Zaha says, Baldi, that when in the black faction he must always be wary of his second in command. The man says to himself he is just saying whatever he wants to say. Then he says betrayal is meaningless in the Jianghu since the strong are the ones who will own everything. Zaha says he understands that is precious advice, and the man asks him how much was he paid to do this. The ask why does he ask? The man replies tell him. Zaha replies that it's 39,800 Nyang fucking Baldi. The man stares at him and asks, what? The man says to him he lot, is I'm just doing this for money anyway. He will double whatever he is paid. Just kill the person who paid him to kill him. Zaha says to himself this guy must be trying to drag out this conversation to buy more time for his subordinates to arrive. He has a lot to say. But he needs to act like a tight-lipped black-clothed martial artist and just swing his sword first. After that he runs towards the man, and Nam follows him. The man stops him using his powers, Zaha activates his powers and they start fighting each other. The man gets back, Zaha is standing there. He asks, did that surprise him? Suddenly he gets shocked as he says to himself, holy fuck, what is that? He thought that was a red sword with two legs. He cannot believe he looks so darn ugly. He is indeed a villain. The man is staring at him. He looks extremely angry. Zaha comes. Do attack him, saying, doesn't he think of running away? The man gets scared. He also starts running towards Zaha. Zaha calls him Red Squid, Red Octopus, Baldi, Red Egg, Red Baldi, Baldi with red cheeks. Now, after listening to all of this, the man's anger is exaggerated. Zaha continues to fight. He says to himself that his own nonsense has died, even his own attacks. He continues to attack the man and says to his squid that he is doing pretty well defending. The man's face is turning red, 
Zaha says to the man the assets of the Supreme Sword Association will be scattered all over. The man is about to strike him. Zaha gets back and says all his subordinates will become corpses. And the Southern Heaven Troop will also probably be in tatters after fighting the Supreme's Word Association. Then he says all of them are fish, and he is the fisherman. After that, he strikes the man, using his sword, injuring his arm. Zaha's eyes turn red and his pupil constricts. He pulls out his hand, and a giant hand starts coming out. The man's wound is overreacting a lot of blood starts coming out of it. The man is scared, and Zaha is staring at him. The blood splashes of Zaha's power surround the area, and Zaha is controlling the man. He pulls up the man and then makes him hit the ground. The man starts spitting blood, and Zaha continues to hit the ground. After a few hits he leaves him, the man is lying on the ground, and Zaha touches his head saying he doesn't have hair. Then Zaha comes to his throat, he says to himself he is feeling so sleepy due to insufficient sleep. Then he says to the man bastard, why did he do things like sending assassins after him? It was so tiring that he almost died. Let him have some sleep in peace, okay? The man is confused. He asks he sent assassins after him, who is he? Zaha replies to the leader of the house sect, that is him. The man gets shocked after listening to it. Zaha gets angry, he strikes at the man's neck, and then leaves him. The man is lying dead on the ground. Zaha is staring at his dead body silently. And then he turns around and says, wow, look at all of them. He was thinking that even if the association leader had great mobility arts, someone else should have appeared by now. The guys were waiting for him to kill him. Then he picks up the man's sword and asks the man, did he die after knowing he was betrayed by his second in command? The man says nothing, Zaha asks if he doesn't know. Zaha starts thinking about Qian then he leaves from there. At the Blue Eye Escort establishment, Zaha gives the sword to a man saying he wants him to deliver this item. The man is about to touch the sword, and ask him where does he wants this delivered. Zaha replies it is a gift that needs to be delivered urgently to the Southern Heaven troop leader. Make it as fast as possible. Please let him know the cost. The man says he is sorry, but can he know whose sword is this? Zaha replies it's the sword of Baldi. The man says he is hoping to know who Baldi is. Zaha yawns, everyone is looking at him silently. Zaha replies he already told him it is a sword that a Baldi used. The man says please just tell him if this sword is a stolen good. He is asking because this is not a common type of sword. Zaha says it is not a stolen sword. It belongs to the Supreme Sword Association leader. This makes everyone scared. Zaha says to himself there must be one of the escort establishments under the Supreme Sword Association. Then he says to everyone, they guys look like they just saw a ghost. The man asks. Is the Supreme Sword Association leader dead? Zaha replies yes. The man starts panicking then, he said. It seems he knows that they're under the Supreme Sword Association. What does he want? Zaha replies he already said it. He wants him to deliver his sword to the Southern Heaven Troop leader. He was too lazy to do it, so he came to the nearest escort establishment to get it delivered. He asks if is he in the wrong place. The man remains silent. Zaha tells him to do what he is supposed to do as an escort establishment. Also, provide a guest room for him. He needs to get some sleep. Because of the assassins that the Supreme Sword Association leader sent after him, his sleep was consistently disturbed. Then, he says, if Hall leader Qian of the Supreme Sword Association comes looking for him, tell him he did not see anyone like him. It looks like he betrayed the association leader, but if he wants to pin all the blame on him, he will probably track him down. Every man standing there looks scared and shocked. Zaha says don't ambush him while he is getting his fill of sleep. He is the person who killed the Supreme Sword Association leader because he woke him up from his sleep. They got that head escort. Everyone gets more scared. Zaha is sleeping, he smells something and opens his eyes. The hall is filled with people having food. Zaha comes there everyone starts looking at him. Zaha says to the man he wants food, the man is speechless, and someone gives Zaha chopsticks. The man tells him his items have been sent out yesterday night. Zaha starts eating the food. The man asks him the Supremes were dissociation and would probably start fighting with the Southern Heaven troops soon, right? Zaha replies probably. The man says it is worrying for them even if the Southern Haven troops win. Zaha asks why. The man replies Sado Heng is famous for killing anyone that he does not like. If he asks them for protection fees, they would not have the power to go against that decision. Zaha laughs and says hey commander escort. The commander replies yes. Zaha asks him, does he think the Supreme Sword Association leader is any different? 
Then, he says he was probably the same. The commander is speechless and he looks scared. Zaha says, and must they be talking about money matters when he is eating breakfast? The food on the table all looks pretty good. He says to the commander he must have collected a lot of protection fees from all over. His group grew from that money. He did not know the Supreme Sword Association and the Blue Eye Escort establishment were so poor. He says stop giving him that bullshit he has earned so much and enjoyed his life while working in the Black Faction, so shut his mouth. After that, he sees his subordinates will be tracking down all the places that worked under the Supreme Sword Association. If he heard that, some misappropriated funds under the pretense of doing business and made people work like slaves, it would not end with just him eating a meal and beating up their faces like he did today. He sees these guys are not in the position to be worrying Saido Han. They ought to be worried about him coming back here to look for them. The man is speechless. Zaha says if the Supreme Sword Association wins, it will be dealing with all the remnants. If the Southern Heaven Troop wins, then he will either kill Sado Hong Org and beat the shit out of him. There will not be any situation where he will be collecting protection fees. But he is not the same as Sado Hong Org and the Supreme Sword Association leader. He does not need money. But if they dare cross any lines, they will need to go to the afterworld to offer their protection fees to the Supreme Sword Association leader. After that he says anyway. Who is the cook here? He has got really good cooking skills. The commander is speechless and a man asks Zaha. By the way, where is he from? He does not seem to be from the Miram Alliance. Zaha asks why not? Does he look like he is not worthy to be one? The man says he is from the Muslim Alliance. Zaha replies no, he is not from such an obnoxious place. The man makes a weird face and Zaha tells him he came from a place near Nahua. The man replies he sees, Nahua is famous for great Rakshasa. Zaha replies yes, it is his disciples. The twelve heavenly generals are famous as well. The man asks if he is with them. He replies no, he is the one who killed the great Rakshasa. He also killed half of the twelve heavenly generals. Then Zaha says what an unpleasant topic to talk about while he is eating. He is curious as to how he killed them. The man replies he isn't. Zaha says what a pity. After this Zaha finishes his food. Then he says thanks for the food and asks how much for the sword's delivery. The commander asks how could he possibly accept money for that. Then he says thanks to him coming and telling them about the situation. They manage to keep their lives. Zaha says lives aside, since he put in a job request, he needs to pay for it. How much is it? Commander replies. In that case, it would be two silver Nyang. Zaha asks why is it so expensive? Does he look like an idiot to him? Commander replies he will take just one then. Zaha then takes out the money and gives the man, saying this is for the guest room and the unpoisoned food he put in more than needed. Commander thanks him. Zaha told all the merchants who worked under the Supreme Sword Association that the Supreme Sword Association is about to cease to exist, so they should go back to how they used to live. Commander replies understood. Zaha then says if anyone dares to pull any tricks like coordinating and hoarding, he will track them down and kill them. Commander replies, yes sir. Zaha says if anyone dares to do business in a weird manner that causes others to lose their job, he will spend his subordinates to assassinate them. The manager replied yes, that he would pass on that message. Then he asks, but who should he say these messages are from? Zaha replies to the person who killed the Supreme Word Association leader, a martial master who stayed here for a night and left after eating breakfast, black-clothed martial artist. Then he says and commander escort, listen up as well passed on the message and told them he would track down anyone who used to be in contact with the swift whirlwind and kill them all. He will forgive anyone who tells him information about the swift whirlwinds to his subordinates before he does that. He says they do not have any other choice. Commander says he will be sure to pass that message down clearly. Zaha says before that, he wants all of them to pick one side, those who are in contact with the swift whirlwinds. A man says we are not with them. Zaha says he is asking them to just choose based on their gut which side is it. He says if they don't choose one, he will be here. Until they do, he will take the opportunity to learn about how to do escort work. The commander is speechless, Zaha says he guess he does not know. The commander says this is not about the merchants. From what he heard a black faction group known as Lunar Cloud Brothers had hired assassins to kill all of their competitors. That place is one, which escorts would pass by frequently. Zaha asks where are they? The commander replies with the rule over the trading area of Zenping Lake. Zaha replies all right. Gave him a set of clothes that the escort would wear. 
his clothes are way too black. Then we see Zaha in blue clothes passing through an area saying to himself he changed his job from being a black clothed martial artist to a young escort. He has got the black rabbit sword wrapped in leather and placed over his shoulder. His clothes are also perfect and everyone can tell that he is a handsome escort. A black clothed martial artist yesterday. A young and handsome escort today. He says today he starts his solo mission that only he knows of at his place as a young escort who is fooling around. The person who helped him is the Hao sect leader, and the person who got hired is Yi Zaha. The item to be delivered would be the black rabbit sword on his shoulder. The destination would be Zenping Lake, where the Lunar Cloud Brothers are. Everyone is looking at him, passing through the streets. Zaha is going down the streets, and someone grabs his shoulder, Zaha holds his hand and hits him the man falls to the ground. He starts looking at Zaha. Zaha asks him how dare he look down on an escort of the Blue Eye Escort establishment. He starts beating the man again the man is speechless. He slaps him. And he again slaps him, he is about to hit him one more time, but someone comes to him saying young sir. He thinks that is enough. Zaha turns around and finds some more men standing behind him. The first man says to Zaha he is dead mate now. Zaha starts beating him again. Then he says to the men standing behind him, if they are from the Lunar Cloud Brothers Society, lead him to a society leader right now. One of them smirks and says look at him acting all tough. Then they all start running towards Zaha. One of them tries to hit him, but Zaha activates his power and dodges his attack. This makes the remaining two shocked, and they say what? Zaha starts attacking the enemy. He inserts the sword into the man's throat. The other man gets scared. They say they are not from the Lunar Cloud Brothers Society. Zaha asks them. Is that so? They reply yes, they are one of the groups under them. They give them protection fees like the others. Zaha asks really, what does that change though? The men became silent. They look scared. Zaha asks what? He says if they dare to point a sword at an escort, then they ought to die. Did they think he would let them live? The men are speechless. They are wondering why an escort is this strong. Zaha says whoever dares to run away will kill him first. He wants all of them to bring him to the Lunar Cloud Brothers Society. One of them says they will lead the way. Then he says this way. Zaha starts following them, saying to himself he is someone who dislikes a lot of things. What he dislikes the most are black factions collecting protection fees. That is probably because he has worked as a waiter. He cleaned tables, ate leftovers that were dropped on the ground, mopped the floors, washed the dishes, prepared ingredients and cooked food to sell to earn money and slowly save up. He needed to repeat all those actions for 10 whole days to be able to pay the protection fees. If one gets used to it, it is doable, but what upsets him is when random people try to collect protection fees from someone when that happens, he needs to repeat everything he did for about 15 days to be able to pay it. At some point, as he realized how meaningless his life was, he began to feel angry. The source of his anger was the protection fees. Zaha is following them. One of the men tells him the leader's resilience is the one in the middle. Zaha replies all right. The people over there are looking at Zaha. One of them says an escort. Zaha tells the men they guys go and clear away. The corpses stay here if they want to die. Then he says to society's men he wants to meet with the society leader. Bring him to him. The men start laughing one of them tells Zaha to get lost. Zaha asks who is the man who told him to get lost. A man spits out and says this guy must be out of his mind. Zaha starts walking and he gets surrounded by everyone holding the sword. Zaha comes near the man and asks him what did he eat. Was it good? The man asks what the hell he seemed to be from the Blue Eye Escort establishment. Is he crazy? Is he a lunatic? Zaha grabs his throat, a door opens and a man enters there asking what is happening here. Someone tells him an escort from the Blue Eye Escort establishment wants to meet their leader. The man asks an escort? Not the escort establishment owner or chief escort, but a mere escort? Zaha starts beating the man and makes him fall to the ground. Then he says he is from the swift whirlwinds that bring him to his leader. The man says to him they don't have any more business with the swift whirlwinds though. What brings him here? Zaha replies he has business with him, bring him to him. The man replies, please wait he will inform him about this. Zaha turns around to look at the man standing behind him. After a moment the man comes and tells him to come in. Zaha starts following the man after entering the building they reach a lake. And everyone is looking at Zaha, a man tells him he is Bayok Sawoon, and then he says take a seat. Zaha starts staring at him, saying to himself because he asks him to sit down. 
he will not. Bayok is looking at him, and Zaha asks him is he the leader. He says he looks like a catfish, this makes Bayok angry. He asks Zaha he is not from the swift whirlwind is he? He says the sword on his waist is not like one that an assassin would use, and he does not look like one of those from the Blue Eye Escort establishment. Where is he from? Zaha replies he is the leader of the Haho sect as he heard of them. Bayok replies how sect? No. Zaha tells him he is looking for the swift whirlwinds. Bayok replies they want to be an assassin group if they can be found just because he wants to find them. Zaha asks him any way to contact them. He replies yes, there is a simple way. But they are all lower rank subordinates so they won't know where the headquarters are. The reason it is hard to find out that information, even though he tortured them, is that the low rank members don't have that information either. In their organization, they are only able to talk to the person directly above them. If he wants to find the highest ranked person, he will have to draw them out tier by tier and kill all of them. Can he do that? Zaha remains silent. Meanwhile, he says to himself, why is he telling him so much? Does he consider the Hao sect as one of the black factions? Then he says, the market here seems to be doing well. Does he collect offerings? Bayok replies they call them protection fees. Zaha asks him who are they being protected from. He replies it is more like they are being protected from someone. He says it will happen, even if he is not the one collecting it. He was born and raised in this place. It is better that he is the one taking it. While there are people who work and live a normal life, there are also plenty of others who live the opposite life. As he takes charge of them and puts in people to protect the market, he would also naturally have to invest money. He does not think that it is a strange thing to collect offerings. What does he think? Zaha starts clapping and he says wow, it has been a while since he has heard a long speech. Then he says to himself, although it would be easy to take care of him with martial arts, he is not one to lose in such talks. Then he says to Bayok that he is doing a great task, but he guesses those who were killed by him also thought the same way. The way they did it was only slightly different. He says he almost got pickpocketed the moment he arrived in this place. When he called them, he found out they needed to pay offerings to him. Bayok asks is that so? Zaha says they robbed escorts, outsiders and travelers in order to pay the offerings. They probably ate food that tastes like shit so they could save enough money to pay the offering. Their tea looked like they boiled it with filthy water. What he just described may sound natural to him, but that is not the case at all. Bayok tells him he does not know who he has killed so far for him to be so confident. There is a moment of silence, and then Zaha says he is not here to make a request. Catfish get his shit together, and disband the brother society. Bayok stands up, he angrily says fucker, Zaha keeps silent. Bayok asks him who the fuck he is. What the hell is wrong with him? After that he takes out his weapon to attack Zaha, but Zaha manages to dodge his attack. Zaha grabs his hand saying to himself, what is this clumsy asshole he is not even at Sung Tae's level. He starts tightly holding his hand making him scream loudly. After that, Zaha kicks him and takes out his sword. He starts striking him cutting his body in half. Then he takes back his sword. The dead body falls into the water. Zaha turns around to see the people standing behind him all shocked and scared. He asks them, are they guys really crazy? They want a piece of him. He says to bring it on if they do. A man takes out his sword. Zaha sits on Bayok's chair and says guys run and save themselves while he gives them the chance to do so. The men start thinking. Then Zaha says let's do this instead, while Bayok becomes fish food. They will treat him as if he is still alive. Tell the swift whirlwinds that they want to hire them and bring them here. How is that? The men are silent. Zaha asks why is he not getting any replies. Is he talking to the air? He stands up and says guys if they feel sad for his death, come take their revenge anytime. Those who don't feel that way, he will give them two tasks. First, contact the swift whirlwinds and bring them to him. Second is if they discover any of the Southern Heaven troop members inform him. A man asks him who he is though? He replies the one who killed his society leader. The man gets scared. Zaha says just as they know he killed the Supreme Court Association leader too. So the act of trying to take revenge would be a crazy one. All of them are silent, and he asks them, is he talking to the air again? One of them says they will update him after looking around. Zaha asks him what is his name, Water Strider. The man starts looking around and then he points to himself. Zaha replies yes him. The man replies he is Wu Chuljin, Zaha asks if is he second in command. 
He replies yes. Saha says once he leaves he will be the top dog, so cooperate with him unless he wants to die. He replies. Yes sir. After some time, Zaha is staring at the water he says to himself he is suddenly feeling lonely tonight. After that he takes out a rod and starts fishing. He catches a fish, and he is about to hold it, but the fish falls back into the water he says fuck dad scared him. He thought the dead bio came back alive to attack him. He starts thinking about a man emerging from the water, with his one hand up he says Namu Amitabha. Zaha copies him saying Ashura Amitabha, he is the envoy of the Buddha devil, the descendant of Akala. Die. Die. The men are looking at him. They are wondering, is he a lunatic? The next morning we see Zaha fishing. He says to himself he often pondered why men like Zhang Taelong and Old Tails would cast their fishing rods and not bother to catch fish. Perhaps like him they disliked cooking fish. Or maybe it was the shape of the scales that ruined their appetite, or they just hated creatures like catfish his interest in Jiang Taelong as a man was because of a phrase he once uttered. Split water cannot be returned to the bowl. It means that what is done cannot be undone. He said this when his wife, who left him during his poor days, came back upon hearing he had become a lord. That temperament of his, he thought to himself that Jiang must have been a man like him. Wu comes near him telling him it is reported that the forces of the Southern Heaven Troop are waiting in Bokiang. They will meet other black faction who have responded to Southern Heaven Troop's call to join the fight and move together from Bokiang. Zaha remains silent, then he says to himself Bokiang, a place he can quickly reach if he use his light body technique. Then he stays calls Wu and he asks yes, Zaha says if he leave now, he will need to take charge. Then he asks how long will he remain a small fry. Wu becomes confused. Zaha tells him he will make a few arrangements and then depart. From now on, stop taking tributes. Tell the underlings of the Brotherhood to find their own way to earn their livings. Taking tributes has made even the food at various restaurants taste bland and they end up getting slapped by him for petty theft. Wu replies understood. Zaha says if there are any underlings who truly have nothing to do or are worried about their next meal, send them to the Black Rabbit Union faction. He will take them in there. They won't have to worry about food or shelter. But there is a risk of dying in fights with other martial artists or during the harsh training under his subordinates. Keep that in mind when he send them. Wu asks is he a leader of a black faction? He says he did not realize. Zaha replies even the former leader of Black Rabbit Union died by his hand. Most of his followers were spared. He has many like them under him. They all would have become fish food if they had challenged him a few days ago. Then, he asks, does he understand now? Wu replies yes, he completely understands. Then he asks, but why is he joining the Southern Heaven Troop alone? Zaha replies watching the shit show is way more fun than just sticking nose in other people's business. Wu takes a deep breath. Zaha says the battle between the Supreme Sword Association and Southern Heaven Troop will be fierce since they are quite villainous. Which side does he think will win? Wu replies he does not know. Zaha says even though the Supreme Sword Association leader died by his hand, he still does not know. Wu replies yes. Then, Zaha says of course the Southern Heaven Troop will win. Remember that, and later send someone to check how people are living around Jung Myong Lake. Wu says yes. Zaha says by then, he hoped, the food and tea hair, have improved and the faces of the owners and people in the shops have brightened up. Then he and the others will be taken in by his house sect. Then he started looking at his face in the lake, saying but if nothing changes, the underlings of house sect will come here for a sword fight. Some will end up as fish food, even fish food to eat human flesh occasionally. It must be frustrating when they are always being eaten. Then he says Namu Amitabha, Asura Balbalta. The he says yes. Wu says he will remember the name of Hao sect, and ask him so he is the leader of that place. Zaha replies yes, he is even in conflict with the Ilwido gang. He says he has enemies all over the martial world. A man who keeps fighting, creating even known existing enemies that is the leader of the Hao sect. Wu says he will continue to search. Zaha tells him to look at the lake. Not a single human touch yet such a beautiful lake, just looking at it seems to cure his madness. Thanks to the lake he had a few good days of rest. Wu says it is a beautiful lake indeed. Zaha looks at him and says to himself, a man who can appreciate the beauty of this lake can be trusted to lead. Then Zaha tells him to look at that. No matter how many times he sees it, the scenery always changes in fascinating ways.
reflecting sunlight during the day and moonlight at night. A wonderful place. The people living near this lake must be the same. Even without the same villains they would live well. Leave the working people be, they are busy surviving. Wu says since he spared them, he will do his best to disappear from this place along with his brotherhood. Zaha remains silent. He smiles and says he chose well in picking him as a leader. Now he finally looked more than just a small fry. After that they both are smiling while they are looking at the lake. Then Zaha start leaving from there, saying if they are both alive, let's meet again, he is off. Wu tells him to take care. He says the events in the martial word are mostly a cycle of killing and fighting or likely today a cycle of meeting and parting, and so he left Jungmyeong Lake. Wu is speechless. At Bokyang we see people standing in queue, Zaha is also there. He looks around and says good. Then he says to himself, since he is dressed as a member of the Lunar Cloud Brothers, he does not stand out among these rebels. After that he enters into a tent, and someone asks him who and where is he from, young brother. Zaha starts writing something saying for now a wanderer from Lunar Cloud Brothers of Jungmyeong Lake he is Wu Chuljin. The man says Leonard Cloud Brothers, he think he has heard of it. Then he asks he came along, is he here to make money? Zaha replies he has a personal grudge against the Supreme Sword Association. The man says he sees the Supreme Sword Association has many enemies, then he asks Zaha about his skills. He replies by the lakeside, he has never been defeated. Whether it is the best of Champyong, the best of Lionel Cloud, the best of the lake, in their town, he is the undefeated robber that is him. The man is speechless, then he starts writing. The man says it seems that the people by Jungmyeong Lake are quite talkative. He is looking forward to it. Then he gives Zaha coins and says he will give him three silver coins. Zaha asks three. How many do they usually receive? The man replies even one is considered generous, the undefeated robber. Zaha is indeed the judge's disagreement is extraordinary. The man begins to laugh and says he is busy. So please leave. Then, he says next. Zaha leaves from there. Everyone is looking at him. A man standing there starts saying he will relay the words of their leader. They will depart in half an hour. Their target is the Supreme Sword Association's headquarter, since their leader will join the battle personally avoid any unusual behavior. Desertion, betrayal, infighting among allies. While it is appreciated that they are supporting the Southern Heaven troop they are powerless if their leader gets angry. He hoped none of them do anything foolish to have their heads taken by their leader. Zaha is wandering around then he asks himself where might the leader Sato Hang be? The man then says let's slowly make their way and everyone replies yes. Zaha looks at side and find a giant man and says to himself looking here and there, no matter how he sees it, that guy must be Sato Hang. The man passes by him and says brother, he has a fine face. Zaha replies he has one too. The people around the leader get scared and one of them asks how dare. The leader begins to laugh hard and then he says enough. Enough. He is an ally, how could he know who is he? The man says even so, the leader replies let's go. Zaha replies, let's go, is looking at all of them leaving. From there a man looks at his face and asks what? Zaha tells him to keep quiet and the man gets scared and shocked. The leader starts addressing the crowd saying brothers, this is the sword of the Supreme Sword Association's leader. Whether this is a trick or not they cannot know right away. But a man who offers his own weapon as a trick is intolerable. It is a waste to have fought such a fool. Trick or not, the Supreme Sword Association will be dismantled by tonight. After the battle when Southern Heaven troops subdues Supreme Sword Association, those who join from outside will become his brothers. Zaha says to himself, brothers, his foot well. It is somewhat as expected, his plan inspired by fishing at the lake in Jiang Taelong, is to first grab hold of the Supreme Sword Association with Sado Heng. After beating the Supreme Sword Association beat him next, he sees perfect, absolutely perfect, as he smiles. Then he says to himself, if Sado Heng accept his defeat like a man he will incorporate Southern Heaven Troop into Hao Ho sect, and if he causes trouble, then the Southern Heaven Troop must be dismantled too. After a moment we see all of them passing through a forest. Zaha is also with them. He starts looking around and says to himself their movement is incredibly slow. Plus, they stopped once in Bokiang to regroup. So, the Supreme Sword Association must have noticed by now. They continue to advance. Zaha says to himself as he under the illusion that he is already one. After reaching at a place Zaha looks up and says this place is the Musan Gorge. He wonders is he insane? 
He says to himself the Musan Gorge is known for its thick fog at dawn and night. Fortunately today is fogless, but the terrain is such that the stone mountains on both sides rise high, making it the perfect place for an ambush. He says to a man, Look, if they continue on this road they will reach the Musan Gorge. Half of them will die if ambushed, the weak one will surely die. A man asks him is that so? Then he says he will go report this. He starts running and Zaha is looking at him. Zaha starts following him, and after some time the man meets him again Zaha asks him what? The man replies he said to shut up and break through quietly. Zaha makes a weird face then? He asks the man. Did he send his scouts? The man makes a weird face and replies scouts. After that, he starts running away. Zaha it's hopeless, he says to himself. They did not send them, did not send them. They have to be just the right amount of stupid. Those people are nonsense. Other men start talking to each other. Zaha is standing there after that he starts running at a very high speed. We see the leader asking the man has he lost his mind? Why are they talking about scouts? He says they have already received reports that there is nothing unusual at properly. He calls him Moss Head. Zaha reaches near them and hear the man apologizing to the leader. He says to himself, are they idiots? Then he goes near the leader and asks him did he prepare for the gorge? The leader asks him he mean an ambush. Then he says with the Supreme Sword Association's leader dead, what ambush could there be? They will be busy deciding on their next leader. Zaha says even now if they turn back. The leader become angry and shouts shut up. What does a young fool like him know? Zaha stands there quietly. Then he smiles and says if there is an ambush and about 100 die, it is on the leader. The leader says such madness. Then he turns around to look at Zaha and says a young one dares to cross the line. Zaha is standing there quietly. He has a smile on his face and then he says to the leader, if hundreds of people die because there is an ambush that will be on him. The leader turns around, looks at him and says he is really out of his mind. He has just crossed the line. He calls him a brat. Then he says look, he is thankful for his help, but has he ever thought that he might die by his hands first because of how he acts? Zaha replies if he is a leader, he ought to be sure of what is ahead. Is he an idiot? This is not the same for him to care about what he says or does. He tells him to look at this terrain. If an ambush is waiting ahead and people charge at them from the back, they will lose for sure. He tells the leader to make his choice. Will he push past this area or go for a roundabout? The leader turns back and we looks at a stone falling from heights of mountain hitting one cliff after another and then reaching the ground. The we hears someone angrily saying illegitimate child of Nanchuan what is he doing here? Someone is coming near them, they are facing him, Zaha looks at him, he is Qian, he says to himself that person is. Qian loudly says a legitimate child who does not know who his father is he. Is he scared of the association leader? When he was around he kept his distance but now he's trying to act like a man. He says to the leader he is just a rat that sends assassins. This makes the leader angry. He says to himself that idiot that was not the doing of Do Hong that was his brilliant strategy. Then he angrily says to himself, how dare he insult his parents. He is the first on the chopping board. The leader start running toward Qian meanwhile Zaha is looking at him and he says to himself, so he is another idiot. He fell for such a simple provocation. Do Hong says Qian he rat, he is a pussy if he ran away today. Then he starts moving his sword, Qian is also ready to fight. Their sword strikes, they are having an intense battle with one another. Zaha says to the man when all leader change on retreats there will be hidden weapons, arrows and rocks that will fly towards them. What will they guys do? Do they want to go rescue the troop leader? Or do they want to enjoy the show that idiotic troop leader will be putting up? One of them says to other men, look at them fight. How will all leader Qian even run away? Qian and Dohang continue to fight, the man says Qian is weaker than the troop leader, it is obvious how this will end. Zaha class the idiot, and says he is not weaker than Dohang he is just acting like he is weaker. This makes everyone silent, and Zaha says to himself he cannot tell if he is just being a busybody, an observer or a nagi mother-in-law. Dohang gets back, and then he is about to attack Qian again. Qian is also ready, Dohang attack him, he jumps back and lands to dodge the attack. He starts running away from Do Heng. Do Heng is shouting his name. Qian is leaving through the terrain shouting as his subordinates are present there with arrows in their hands. They are ready to attack. All of them aim at Do Heng. Do Hang gets shocked as he looks at them. The arrow starts coming like the rain. Do Hang gets hit by them. Qian is looking at him. 
Zaha say his to himself. The original plan was for that ambush to be launched upon the Southern Heaven Troops forces, but since everyone stopped at the entrance of the Valley Hall leader Qian appeared to lure Dohang and due to that unexpected variable. While it is despicable, it is kind of praiseworthy. Then he says to the man standing behind him they, who only believe what they see, they are utterly pathetic. Then Zaha says to himself now Dohang fate will depend on his executives. Will they go save him, or will they see if there are more traitors like Hall leader Qian? The arrows continue to hit the leader and he is suffering from pain. He starts running, trying to dodge the arrows. Zaha asks the men are the guys from the black faction? Meanwhile one of them takes out his sword and starts running. The other does the same, they are now going to protect their leader, and Zaha is looking at them. They are saying let's go save the troop leader. Kill the Supreme Sword Association. Zaha says to himself he guesses Dohang has some trusted subordinates. Then he asks what about those he hired for help with money. He turns around to look at them running away from there, he says. What a joke. Then he looks around and says to himself the Supreme Sword Association left their own leader alone when he was driven into a life or death situation. And the entire Southern Heaven troop put their lives on the line to save their leader. He continues to observe them. And then he has a smile on his face as he says welcome to the value of the Swift Corps. Everyone starts running towards the Supreme Sword Association's men they start attacking them one by one, and he successfully defeats them. Suddenly Zaha joins in, making them shocked they look scared. Zaha attacks one of them and kills him. Then he starts moving his sword against others as well, and splashes of blood can be seen on the ground. Zaha starts walking, and in the background we can see a fountain of blood emerging from dead bodies. This makes the troops people scared and shocked. Zaha is looking at two forces fighting against one another. Dohang is also there and Qian is leading his men too. Zaha jumps off the cliff, lands near Dohang and says, Say Dohang, he's a damn dog. Dohang gets confused. Zaha asks him, what will he do with this futile death? Did he not say they should turn back? Dohang is suffering from his injuries. Then he looks back and finds a lot of dead bodies. He gets scared. Zaha tells him if he is foolish and dumb, don't be a leader he is a fucker. Dohang says to Zaha, yes, it is his fault. It is his foolish essay Dohang's fault. His men get confused. He looks at them and says, brother, it is all his fault. But even if he dies with them all today he won't regret it. So let's tear the Supreme Court Association apart. Everyone gets hold of their weapon and starts running behind their leader to attack. Zaha sighs and he says to himself that he is thinking of breaking through with force until the end. Well in this situation, breaking through is the only answer after all. After that, Dohang starts attacking the Supreme Sword Association's men he is striking them one after another, tossing off their heads. He looks furious. Zaha says pathetic. Yes, if he is dumb, he at least has to be good at fighting. Zaha holds his hand in the air. And then he starts clapping, saying, good job, good job, good job, good job. Everyone has worked hard. Yes, if they are foolish, their body has to suffer. After that, he says, hang in there, guys. Dohang tells him to shut up as he continues to strike the enemies. He asks Zaha, will he shut the fuck up? He continues to fight. A man comes near Zaha and asks, is he an ally or an enemy? Zaha replies, if he were the enemy, would he still be alive like this? This makes the man confused. Then Zaha jumps and Dohang is looking at him. He is in the sky. While coming to the ground he activates his powers, making Qian shocked. The Supreme Sword Association S men get sacred. Zaha he has a smile on his face as he says to himself, fuckish, then he uses the flame realm. Great handprint, Qian and his men they are trying to dodge his attack, but the fire covers the entire area and burns them to death. Dohang is shocked, as are his men. Qian is alive. He looks frustrated. He looks at someone coming to him. He gets shocked as he looks at Zaha saying Hall leader Qian's him. Qian looks shocked and confused. Qian asks him who is he. He says he has not heard that there was an expert like him in the Southern Heaven troop. Zaha replies the man who mercilessly beats up to death those who curse their parents. That is him. Qian asks him what is he talking about. After he realizes who Zaha is he gets shocked and says he is a bastard. Zaha he looks at him with a smile on his face. Then he takes out his burning sword making Qian and everyone else confused. Zaha starts walking with his burning sword around. After some time he starts running, using the Plum Blossom Ceremony skill to attack Qian. 
A huge blast is seen, and Do Hang and his men get affected too. Do Han looks shocked. After the smoke disappears, they witness a huge destruction with several dead bodies on the ground. Qian is still alive. Zaha is standing in front of him. Qian looks at him, and Zaha says to him, Speak up, fucker. Qian starts running, making Zaha confused. He starts following him, telling him he is not supposed to be that kind of leader. He cannot run away. Come here. Qian is doing his best to flee from there. Zaha has come near him, saying all leader Qian, faster faster faster. Qian takes out his sword and turns back to attack Zaha. Zaha dodges his attack and comes up with attacking in Qian. Their swords strike, and they continue to fight against each other. Qian gets frustrated Zaha is looking at him, then he activates his powers in the palm of his hand Qian, does the same they both attack each other, causing a huge commotion. Qian comes out of the smoke, and then he hits a rock at a far distance. Zaha is safe. Among all the dead bodies, Do Hang and his men are trying to hold themselves. Zaha comes near him they are looking at him. Zaha comes to Do Hang and says, What? The idiot says something. Do Hang is silent. Zaha says the Supreme Sword Association suffered a defeat, and the Southern Heaven Troop fought a stupid fight that was no different from a defeat, but he will not be defeated. This is his victory. Everyone present there is speechless. Zaha looks at two men and tells them to stop fooling around and get up. Look at the people who are still breathing. The living must live. Everyone starts helping out each other. Zaha sits with Do Hang. So he said to him that he would not kill him. However, let's decide the top and bottom clearly in part ways. Do Hang replies that his skills are lacking. So what can he achieve while challenging him? Zaha says is, is it over? If his skills are lacking, what has he done to the weak ones all this time? From what he heard, those pathetic members of the faction knelt in front of him unconditionally, right? Do Hong says that never happened. It is a made-up story, however. He certainly does not recall ever being polite to those who are weaker than him, nor did he ever feel the need to. Zaha says nothing. Do Hong is staring at Zaha. Zaha asks him, who is he? Do Hong replies he does not know. Zaha says when his subordinates went around and asked various forces to participate in the war, they also came to him. They came to him very arrogantly. Do Hong asks, is that so? Zaha replies yes. Then he says look at the results today. When he charged into the canyon just now, there were no forces that followed. They all retreated. While he understood, what kind of idiot could want to come to a canyon like this to die? Do Hong is speechless. Then Zaha says, even ignoring his suggestion to go back because of him, the corpses of his head subordinate are spread out in the valley. Do Hang looks hopeless. Zaha slaps him, swelling his cheek. He tells him to look around him and calls him a bastard. Look at the man who died because of him and honored them. Zaha hits him again, saying to apologize Do Hang says yes, it is his fault. He cannot bear to look around him so just leave him be. Zaha is silent. A man comes to him and says, secret leader, they should have stopped him with everything they had. They will apologize first. Please forgive them. Do Hong gets shocked as he hears the word sect leader. The man says the messenger under him recognized this man as the Hao sect leader and reported it to him. He is here as their ally. He heard that his personality is a little strange, so they must watch out for how they behave around him. However, he was not able to report this to him in time. Do Hong is speechless. Zaha says to himself, it looks like his subordinates usually cannot talk to him directly. Do Hang says to Zaha Hao, the sect leader, that he, say Do Hang, apologizes. Thanks to his help today, he was able to survive and avoid a complete massacre of his members. From today onwards, he and the Southern Haven troop will come running as long as he calls for them, no matter where they are, to repay this kindness of his. While he is a fool, he has lived his life keeping the promises he has made. His men also thank Zaha, saying they will go to him whenever he calls for them. Zaha looks at them and says to himself, darn bastards, this is not the atmosphere he wants. He says he cannot beat the shit out of the guy who is apologizing respectfully. After that he asks, is the messenger alive? A man raises his hand, saying, secret leader he is alive. Zaha looks at him and says, so he is the one. It is good to know he is alive. The man replies, yes, Sir Dohang says to Zaha, may he pay a visit to the Hao sect after they wrap things up. Zaha replies, don't come here, she does not want to see him. Just clean up the Southern Heaven troop while he gets his subordinates to clean up the Supreme Sword Association. Then he says, listen well based on his usual temper, even Usai Dohang would have been. 
Suddenly he looks at the faces of his men and says, never mind. Then he says the reason he is holding himself back is because the martial artist of the southern heavens is true power and brave. There are no other reasons. Then he says to Dohan he needs to know that he is still alive, thanks to the executive who first rushed into the valley to save him and all his subordinates who risked their lives to save him. He asks him. He got it, he replies. He will bear that in mind. Zaha is staring at him. Then he turns around and finds two men standing there. Meanwhile, we see a big hand engraved in the ground. Looking at them, he says to himself, the martial masters of the Swift Corps, slow beggar, and demonic gentleman. This is not good since there are tons of corpses in the place that the martial art masters of the Swift Corps like. Then he says to Dohang clean up this place as quickly as he can, and leave. Don't look at those people. After looking at the face of Zaha Dohang, she looks scared. Then he started doing what he was told to do. Zaha she turns around to look at the same corner, but now no one is there. Zaha sits on the ground and starts meditating. He says to himself, if he brings the Swift Corps, who are known to be observers but are skilled, over to his side, fights that would result in at least a few hundred deaths on his side could have just three or four deaths. He is still meditating. Meanwhile we hear someone saying he is still here. The other one says that puts them in a bind. Should they drive him away? The first one says let's wait a little more and observe. After listening to their conversation, Zara says to himself that the slow-minded and demonic gentleman probably thinks that he is way less skilled than them in martial arts. They probably think he is around the level of one of the black faction members they fought in the valley. After that he opens up his eyes and stands up. Then he jumps from one cliff to another. He continues to do so. After that he makes a huge jump, and now he can be seen suspended in the air. He asks himself what he is doing here instead of eating his meal. After a moment, he lands on a piece of rock. And we hear someone saying that young brat is not bad at running. After that, Zaha takes a turn and finds the two men standing behind him. He says, what, our bagger? The man gets speechless. Then he asks his friend, wait, who calls a beggar? A beggar to his face. What does he think? His friend replied, he does not know the fucking beggar. The man starts looking around. And his friend tells Zah his posture is not good, it is sloppy. If he runs like that, his knees will give out soon. Zaha he looks at him, and says to himself that he knows that too, as it holds. He did that on purpose. Zaha then asks him who he is to criticize him. He looks like a tortoise. This makes the man angry, and his friend starts laughing hard. He continues to laugh as he falls to the ground. Zaha says to himself, he is putting the fate of the house sect on the line now and speaking brazenly as a part of his strategy. A man who speaks brazenly as a part of his strategy. That's him. The demonic gentleman says what an interesting fellow he is. He never learned how to speak to others respectfully. Zaha replies no, he never learned anything like that. The beggar is still laughing. He looked like he had climbed a lot of cliffs. How about a match to see who is faster at climbing cliffs? The loser will have to speak respectfully to the winner. The beggar says that is a good idea. Go on and compete. Zaha say yes to himself because they are serious about mobility arts. He knew they would be interested in him after seeing his mobility arts. After that he starts thinking and asking them. He wants to see whose mobility art is better. Then he says to himself that they are both older than him and have trained for longer than him. They have also made special efforts to train in the mobility arts. There is a good chance he will lose if they compete in mobility arts. More importantly, his goal is not to compete but rather to recruit the martial masters to the Swift Corps. So pitting their mobility arts against each other is not what is important to him. The demonic gentleman asks him, what is wrong? Is he scared? Zaha replies. Let's see. The two of them must have trained a lot in their mobility art. They must be pretty fast. The beggar laughs, and Zaha says the beggar here has a carefree personality and does not care about formalities. He must have trained in both external and internal martial arts while improving his skills. It is probably very hard to find someone who can rival him. On the other hand, the scholar is over here. He is not the kind to have an inelegant style of running. He probably has an elegant posture like that of a gentleman's trolling and is very skilled in internal martial arts. Again, he is probably so fast that not many can rival him. This makes them shocked. Zaha says to himself that it is normal that they are surprised because he just said things that he could only possibly know from his previous life. Beggar says to think he could tell all that just by looking at them. Zaha replies, while he actually wanted to pit himself against them too. 
Beggar says do it then there is no need to complicate things. So simple. Zaha replies that he cannot do that. Beggar asks he cannot do it. Why? He replies that the reason he learned martial arts was to fight against them, not just have a race with them. And to be honest, because he has only trained for three years, it would be close to impossible for him to win against them too. Beggar gets shocked and, he asks what? The elegant gentleman says three years. Zaha says to himself. Actually he was scared they would not believe him if he had said a shorter period of time, so he just told them it was three years. Beggar says impossible, and then asks who is his master. Zaha replies, no one beggar asks no one. An elegant gentleman asks him he trained to that level without a master in three years. Zaha replies, in any case that is not what is important. He can tell that both of them are way more skilled in mobility arts than he is. Why would he raise them when he already knows that? But so. Moyong is looking worried as he is staring at the book. In a flashback we see him saying he has no idea why he is helping the Ha sect leader. The man sitting in front of him asks him how should he describe how he is feeling. He says he has become curious about who the beggar genius is in between him and the Hao sect leader. Someone asks Moyang if is he in there. Someone replies yes he is here. Moyang is listening to all this, Zaha enters, and Moyang says long time no see. He heard he has been pretty busy recently. Zaha searches in front of him and says yes because he had to deal with the Supreme Sword Association. He heard he had been to the Black Rabbit Union a few times to look for him. Moyang replies that is right. Zaha asks him why does he look so tired. He replies it seems he has been practicing martial arts too hard recently, with a fake smile on his face. Zaha says he has trained in martial arts his whole life. He know he does not look like that because of training too much. It seems he is tired mentally. He guess something happened. Moyang replies he is just a little tired. Zaha calls his name he asks yes, Zaha says tell him what is going on. Moyang replies he has obtained the eyes arts. Zaha says he sees so. Moyang becomes surprised and asks him isn't he surprised? Zaha says ice arts are just ice arts, how should he be surprised? Keep talking. He has obtained the ice arts so? Moyang says naturally hitting it. It would be a good idea to give this to him who has the ultimate yin yang body. He has already taken a good look at it. While the martial arts manual was fascinating, the contents of it was similar to a medical book. Zaha says that is possible. Moyang says he was trying to find out if there were any parts of the manual that could be harmful for him. Zaha asks so. Moyang replies this book is not a secret manual. It is just a type of journal. In here it says that if someone want to bring his ice arts to the next level, it recommends using a type of yin absorption method. They already know about it is the yin pilfer technique, an unorthodox martial art. He looks depressed. He says pilfer means he will be taking energy from his target, and that would inevitably lead to the death of his target. It means it is a technique that kills others to become stronger. The person who created this martial art actually completed the ice arts using that yin absorption method. Zaha replies he sees then he asks so he think this method is too cruel for him? Moyang replies it's not just cruel. This book tells him just how the creator is someone who is incapable of feeling compassion or having any sense of guilty conscience. Although it is not written in the book it is impossible to estimate how many he has killed. Although it is not written in the book. It is impossible to estimate how many he has killed while he read this book. He became really depressed. Zaha tells him it is a demonic art. Then he asks did the fan-wielding guy from before give him this book? Moyong becomes shocked, he asks how did he know? He asks him to keep it a secret for the time being. Zaha replies if he really thinks he would not realize it, then he is underestimating him too much. Zaha says to himself the demonic general is also known as the archivist of the demonic path so it would not be hard for him to get a hold of knowledge of ancient ice arts. Then he says to Moyang he is so hard to understand. He is a grown-up man, but he is depressed after reading such a book. Moyang replies he is a physician who works to save lives, but the more he read about a journal that kills people without any hesitation, he just. Zaha asks just what? He replies became more angry and sleepless. He even wondered what use there is for the medical techniques that he is doing his best to practice. Then he says actually this whole time he has been thinking that if the creator of this is alive somewhere, he will track him down and kill him. Zaha says to himself that creator is probably the venom demon. Then he says let him take a look. He takes the book, and he started reading the book asking why are there so many words in here. 
He says it really is a journal that is long-winded. The ice parts are a part of yin arts the yin arts are split into cold arts and ice arts. He says it is so long-winded, heartless lunar shadow. Moyang is looking at him, Zaha closed the book, and says the ice arts was created by a woman. This makes Moyang shocked he asks what. He says there was no mention of anything like that though. Zaha replies no, it was created by a woman heartless lunar shadow. It means a shadow of the moon that is heartless. He think that is an empty woman who has fallen out of love. Idiot men like them would also drink alcohol when they fall out of love. He can understand if a man created this martial art while drinking under the moon, but a shadow of the moon that is heartless. This is not how idiot men would feel. It is obviously the feelings of a woman. Moyang is shocked. Zaha says he thinks these ice, arts were created to take revenge on the trash like man of the orthodox faction. Moyang asks what? Zaha tells him to listen to this. Who would be so determined to learn ice arts? To take revenge on someone by becoming the strongest in the world? Then he says no, he thinks the target of the revenge is a hypocrite, one who possesses great power, and also powerful martial arts. Someone who is like the strongest of the world. Someone who cannot be defeated with martial arts that are obtained using normal methods. He would have a great reputation and would be hard to get close to either a hero or maybe the alliance leader. And he guessed this woman was really beautiful. Moyang says that came out of nowhere. Zaha says yes, she must have been super beautiful and had strong martial arts. She got close to the hypocrite and fell in love with him. She must have been really happy at the thought of being together with him for life. Moyang is looking short, he asks. What? Zaha replies, and when the hypocrite left for another woman. She would have thought about what she needed to do to forget those memories. On how to erase all the happy moments from her memories. Looks like the hypocrite underestimated this woman too much. Her writings are so calm and precise she probably wrote them under a heartless moon. Moyang starts thinking about it and says now that he think about it, the handwriting is quite neat. Zaha says in any case he does not need to know how to absorb yin from others there is more than one way to become stronger if he is going to be as affected as he is today, it would be better to burn this book. Moyang says there is no need to do that. He does not intend to read it anymore. Zaha start living from there saying there are tons of evil deeds in the world that they will not be able to understand. That is why he is going around to kill different villains now, sharpening all the hooks he has to drag them to hell. Those who absorb others' vision and view people as some form of elixir. Those who don't see people as human, he will drag all of them into hell himself. Moyang is speechless. Zaha say yes to him. He need to pull himself together now. He is in no state to look at patience. Now leave the killing to him, got it? He replies all right, sector leader. With a big smile on his face. We see petals falling down and Zaha is sitting beneath a tree meditating. His powers are emitting out of his body. A fireball can be seen between his hands. After a while he opens his eyes and looks at his hands. He says to himself he can now use fire energy in one hand and ice energy in the other. Because the invulnerable golden tortoise art uses extreme yang energy it has seen as the sun. He says the heartless lunar shadow art uses extreme yin energy and it has seen as the moon. To use both arts in each hand, its name could be sun moon art, and if he gave training and complete this art, he could probably call it the sun moon sacred heart and use it at the same time, but rather use them at the same time as if the sun and moon intersect. When the purple light that appears when the sun and moon coexist covers the skies, another martial art will appear that is different from the sun moon sacred art. Naturally, it will be called a different name, the Violent Dawn Sacred Art. Since the heavens have given him another chance to live, he must have big aspirations. He says he will devote himself to training, live a long life trained disciples and two chivalrous warriors, expand the Haho sect and create a sect that will train more chivalrous warriors. He will stay on the ground of the Jianghu to cut down evil people and bring them to the depths of hell. He will stay on the ground of the Jiangsu to cut down evil people and bring them to the depths of hell, while his disciples will climb to the highest place where it has the brightest and inspired numerous others to be chivalrous. What he is doing now would be equivalent to harmonizing light and darkness. After a moment, he says to himself, his name is Zaha. He ruled the world. Weeks later we see him sitting reading a book and a man comes to him saying he has a letter. Zaha looks at him and asks him who is it from. Sung Tae replies he has no idea the person who delivered this letter just said to pass it to him. Zaha opens up the letter and start reading it. The letter says, Myoge Mountain Brilliant Jade Manor. 
On the upcoming first day of the month, there will be an unofficial duel happening. There were supposed to be observers from both sides, but one observer is missing. Please come and fill the empty position. The right says he was going to allow his useless disciples to be an observer, but he kept remembering his name. This would be a meaningful day and his life of boredom please come. He looked forward to meeting him at the brilliant Jade Manor. The letter is from the White Eagle Town Sword Man of the Ha sect leader. Zaha says to himself, it is the sword demon. Then Sung Tae asks him what was the letter about he replies an invitation he is going to Myogi Mountain. Sung Tae asks will this be a long trip? Should he tag along? He replies he think he need to get going today in order to reach there on time. Sung Tae says alright then he asks will he be leaving right away? Zaha replies now he will need to take a bath first. This makes Sung Tae shocked. Zaha asks him what? Sung Tae asks him are there women on Myogi Mountain? Zaha is speechless. Sung Tae apologizes him. Zaha says the peace in his heart. Sung Tae replies yes. Zaha says that peace is like a river to him. Sung Tae replies great. That is good. He just need to keep it calm like river waters. Then he says he is slowly changing as well sect leader. As the days go by, his stature, class and character is becoming more like that of a sect leader. He is incredible. He is doing really good. Zaha slaps him, he tells him to don't cross the line, he replies yes sir. At Myogi Mountain we see Zaha running, moving swiftly from one point to another, he jumps high, and then lands in front of a palace. He looks around and says to himself unbelievable. The man are staring at him, one of them asks him was he invited. Zaha replies he is the Hao sect leader the men welcome him and opens the door. Zaha enters saying to himself, the number one public enemy of Miriam is entering. A man comes in front of him welcoming him saying sir, he will be guiding him inside. Zaha says to himself. Thanks to him going to the White Eagle town and seeing Mong Rank shit his pants, he met the sword demon to think he would be able to see him fight with the Miriam alliance leader so soon. This is all thanks to Mong Rang shitting his pants. This is the profoundness of shit. After that we see him entering into the main hall. Sword demon and left hand are there. Sword demon hey. Zaha replies hey. The man tells him to take a seat. The other man says hey. Zaha asks who is the opponent. Sword demon replies the alliance leader. Left hand becomes angry. Zaha says he sees. Then he says. But why does not he see the alliance leader even though his invited guests are here? Where are his manners? The men become shocked. Sword Demon is laughing and the left hand becomes angry and asks him he is mad. Does he think the alliance leader is his friend? Does he think he is some neighborhood old man? Watch his words. Zaha looks at him and says to himself this little bastard. He thinks he is a part of the orthodox faction just because he is the young master of the Mong family. He was also a public enemy of the Miriam. He perverted, lustful, shitty demon. Sword Demon asks Zaha has he been well? He replies same as usual. Sword Demon asks him he did not inconvenience him by inviting him here did he? Zaha replies for a duel like this, even if he was in the midst of isolation training, he would break the doors and run there to see it. After that he asks the Sword Demon by the way he heard he has some injuries. It that all right for him to fight the alliance leader already? The Sword Demon replies the busiest person in the Jiang who the alliance leader is giving his time to him. Since he had got time on his hand, he will definitely take up his offer. Do not get injured in their daily lives is also a skill, so he will try just have to accept his injury as a part of his skill. More importantly if he gain inspiration after watching for fight, then the fight would be meaningful to him regardless of his win or loss. Zaha remains silent and the other man is also quiet. Zaha says to himself strangely he feel like he is indebted to him. Some men enters the hall. There are three of them. Zaha looks at one of them and says to himself Miriam Alliance leader, Lim Sobek. Whether he is young or old, he has got the same stuff look. The leader sat on his chair and he asks are the two of them the observers? The sword demon replies yes. The leader asks he is the second son of the Mong family. Left hand stands up and says he is Mong Yan of the Mong family. He pays respect to him Alliance leader. Zaha says to himself that shitty Brad's name is Mong Yan. The alliance leader says there were rumors that said he is the strongest among the youngsters in the wild eagle town. Yan replies yes, that is the case, but only in the white eagle town. The leader says to Zaha he must be the Hao sect leader Yi Zaha, nice to meet him. Zaha replies yes yeah, same here. There is a moment of silence. 
Jan looks shocked and other men are also looking shocked. The leader asks one of his subordinate what kind of a sector is the Hao sect. He replies something like a martial academy in the neighborhood. The leader asks. Is he sure? He replies, he will check it out again. The leader asks what will they be fighting with? Real swords? He says he heard they got beat up badly by their cult leader so don't push himself too much. This word man tells him to let's do it with wooden swords. The leader replies that is good. He tells his subordinates to go bring them some. Then he says to the sword demon if he lose, he want him to join the Miriam Alliance and teach the kids as an instructor. The sword demon replies he refused. The leader says if he reject his offer, then he cannot guarantee him that there will be a next duel between them. Think over it again. Then he says if he does win is there something he want from him? Does word man replies give him an elixir? The leader says all right. Then he tells his subordinate if he loses, give the sword demon the best elixir among the elixirs he has. The subordinate replies yes sir. The leader says this place is pretty small. Let's go outside. All of them stands up and comes out of the hole. Zaha says to himself he does not think he is someone the sword demon can defeat. Lim Sobek's energy is definitely not lower than that of this word demon. He is not the only one who knows this. Seems like both the sword demon and Mong Yan knows this too. Leader asks Zaha why did he sigh? Zaha tells him because it feels like the sword demon will lose to him. The leader says he guess if the person he is cheering for looks like they would lose, then it is natural for him to sigh. At the ground the man gives the wooden sword to his leader and then to sword demon. The leader tells the sword demon to take his time to prepare, he will wait. The sword demon is walking and then he comes in front of the leader. Yan and Zaha are looking at them. Both of them are staring at each other. The leader says the atmosphere has become too serious if he has any questions for him, ask away. Guess word even asks when did he surpass the level of the wooden sword. The leader replies it has not been long. He think he reached the level of the wooden sword about five years ago. He will soon be where he is as well there is no need to be impatient. It's not always a good thing to master something. Learn it slowly. Does word demon ask what is the reason for learning things slowly? The leader replies because the next level is a long and extensive journey. It is not a bad idea to take his time when going to such a place because he could run into a wall known as boredom. The sword demon smiles and then he says he is prepared. The leader says let's start then. The leader looks confidant and the sword demon takes his position. After a moment we see them fighting with each other. The sword demon is about to hit leader but the leader dodges the attack and breaks the sword demon's sword. Sword demon and the leader start using their energies, smoke covers the area and after it gets cleared, we see sword demon sad as he says he has lost. The leader gives back the sword. Meanwhile he says great match. Then he says to sword demon there was no need for him to push himself, but he did. Circulate his energy soon since his existing wound code version. Then he says, let's go back. And everyone replies, yes, alliance leader. The leader says to sword demon he will see him around. That's word, demand replies. Goodbye. And after that the leader leaves from there. Zaha says to himself that darn bastard, he is really strong. The demon swords start meditating by sitting on the ground. Zaha looks at him and says to himself he will ask him why the fight was so uneventful after he had circulated his energy. Things would have been different if the sword demon had decided to fight with real swords. The alliance leader did not use his ultimate technique, and the sword demon only used the demonic arts which everyone knew he learned. With their skills, the fight would have been much more longer and turned this whole place upside down. After that, he also sits on the ground in front of the sword demon. The sword demon slowly opens up his eyes. He looks at Jian, saying his apologies, master. He looks at the Yan, saying his apologies, master. He says to him, Mong Yan, he lost the duel. Yan replies, yes. Sword Demand asks him how does he feel. He replies the alliance leader's skill were impressive but he does not know why he chose to announce his defeat so quickly even though he know his opponent is the alliance leader. The sword demon has a smile on his face. Then he turns to Zaha and asks was the match of any issues to him? He replies he has a question. The sword demon tells him to go ahead and ask him. He asks when the alliance leader swung his sword. His movement was a very simple one. But it felt like there were multiple strikes following the same movement in sequence. He says he only swung one sword, but at the point of impact it felt like there was a second, third, fourth and fifth strike. He asks how does he know what technique that is? Sword Demon asks him how many after images did that look like to him. 
Zaha replies 6. Demon Sword asks Yan what about him. He replies he saw about 4 to 5 after images, but he is not sure though. Demon Sword says they guys did a great job observing it. Then he tells them that was the 6 squad sword technique. Yan asks 6 squad technique? He replies yes, the alliance leader was the captain of the 6 battle squad. That means he has been using that sword technique he made since this time as the captain of that squad, which is why the name sounds simple. It just means it was a sword technique used by the 6 combat squad. Yan gets shocked and asks he was not from a reputable family or a martial master of another sect. Sword Demon replies no. He says Lim Sobak climbed his way up, starting from a normal alliance member all the way to being a captain, the bodyguard captain, and then the alliance leader. When he was a normal member, he had frequent duels with other members and experienced win and defeats repeatedly. But ever since he became a captain, he has not lost a single match. He has got a unique personality, and so he would look for his past opponents, which he defeated and asks for a rematch, and they would all lose to him. Then he says the sixth combat squad which he led in his younger days, were all massacred by that current demonic cult. But he was the sole survivor. The reason why he named the sword technique the Six Squad Sword Technique was because he will never ever forget how they died. Despite all that, he still fights him, who left the demonic cult and even invited him to join the alliance. To such a man, at his only right for him, fight him with respect and quietly accept his defeat like he did today. Zaha says to himself the alliance leader has a tragic past as well. Then he asks Demon Sword why did he choose to fight him now? He replies in the Jiang who right now he is the only person who has fought both that cult leader and the alliance leader. Although he wanted them to observe this duel, this is still something that will become a stepping stone for him. He says he is looking at the big picture here it is impossible to get stronger just through training alone, and the alliance leader knows the meaning of this wooden sword well to begin with. He has way more ways of fighting with his life on the line. He knows that too, but he simply wanted to have a sword duel with him, and he lost. He says that is the whole story of this duel. Yan looks despair, Sword Demon looks at him and says, if he want to only become strong slowly and lose like him just keep harassing woman and live the whole life he is living right now. Yan is silent. Sword Demon says however, he has no idea how to counter the six squad sword technique. He cannot ask him to tell him now. He then asks Zaha what does he think. Zaha says to himself, what an amazing man. The sword demon really came to learn about the ways of this world from the alliance leader. Then he says to them, if he was to imitate the principles of the six squad sword techniques. Meanwhile he takes out his sword and the sword is on fire. After some time he uses his powers and the sword turns yellow. And after a moment he again uses his power and turns the sword to silver color. Then he says while he does not know the full details, it looks like it is repeating simple actions like this six time in that short period of time. He think he came up with this technique to increase the destructive power unleashed by the sword while containing the same movement. If they guys had been using real swords, his sword would have been broken into pieces. Jan is shocked, he says to himself. Just from that quick observation he was able to uncover how it works. No way. Sword Demon is also shocked. Zaha says he think he know how the six squad sword technique came about. Sword Demon ask him he does? Zaha says if he started as a normal alliance member, that means he did not have a powerful or rich family. The cheap iron sword he used as a normal member might have broken several times due to his frequent duels. Not only was he poor, he had a lousy sword. He think he came up with this technique so his sword would not break. Maybe it does not matter whether he uses a rusted iron sword or wooden sword or a sharp artisan sword. He think it would not have made a difference to his situation. The attacks would all have been powerful. His sword technique is a strange phenomena created due to a need for survival, a need to last in real fights and the lack of money. Then he takes a pause and asks Sword Demon what does he think. The Sword Demon is looking shocked. Three of them are sitting silently. And after a moment the Demon Sword says he think what he said is correct. It is a strange situation where his martial arts grew stronger because he had undergone hardships. Zaha says to himself looks like Mang Yan and the sword demon came from wealthy households, these filthy rich assholes. Since they have never been poor they could possibly have the same kind of imagination as him when he see the alliance leader's sword technique. The poverty of a Miriam alliance leader and the poverty of Avatar. It is his victory. This means he was way poorer than he was. 
After that he grinds his teeth and says being reminded of it makes him feel really upset. The sword demon is looking at his face. He says to him, Let's have a drink today. Tasting the bitterness of wine due to defeat is a must. Sword demon smiles. Yan says to Zaha why the hell does he talk so rudely to master every single time? Banner less bastard. Zaha asks him how old is he? Yan is silent. Zaha looks at him and says to himself he cannot believe he has made him say something that sounds so pretty. From what he know he is younger than him by one or two years. Yan he's looking afraid as he looks at his master and asks him shall they have a drink today then? His master says to him he heard he does not drink with men to think he would give such a huge honor to him. What a meaningful day this is. Yan is embarrassed as his face turns red. There is awkward moment of silence. In the evening at a restaurant we see the half-pouring drink saying to himself it has been more than 50 days since he last had a drink. Then he says to Sword Demon is he staying in the Wild Eagle Town because the girl has been sending people to him. Sword Demon takes the drink and says not exactly. No matter where he is, the cult will keep sending people to kill him, but they would need to be prepared to suffer great losses. The ones they have sent so far are not good enough. Yan say yes to him master. He has fought both the alliance leader and the cult leader, who is stronger. His master replies between the both of them as he is thinking. Yan and Zaha are looking at him. Zaha says to himself honestly he is curious about that too. Because even back when he was the crazy demon, he had not fought the cult leader or alliance leader one on one before. Sword demon says from his point of view, he think the current leader's internal energy is greater. If they had a spar, then the current leader would probably win. Yan asks what if it was not won. Here's master replies. The alliance leader would probably choose to sacrifice his life to take down the current leader and die together. A suicide attack used by someone of the same caliber as the alliance leader would be hard to dodge, even for the cult leader. It will be hard for the two of them to live normal lives after that. But they both have a lot of subordinates under them, so he does wonder if there will be a chance they would fight each other. Zaha asks him, did he learn demonic arts as well? He replies all those who learned martial arts in the cult from when they were young would start from demonic arts. The basic principle of circulating energy is different from the orthodox. Zaha asks how is it different? Sword Demon replied there are a lot of shortcuts taken when accumulating energy. If one trained for about 23 years, then he will need to face the state of falling into energy deviation. That is the aftermath of using the shortcuts. It cannot be avoided. Yan asks it's not 23 years pretty short. Sword Demon says that is why the cult would routinely cause internal conflicts. That normal cult members would usually either die during a mission or due to one of the internal conflicts before their bodies start to have problems. Their average lifespan is short. The thoughts of those in powers are brutally heartless. In the first place, the lives of low-ranking cult member mean nothing to them. They are considered expendable. Lives that can be replaced when they die. Zaha pours more drink in his cup and start drinking it, saying to himself, it is fascinating that he has the same thought of the cult leader as he does. The cult leader does not see humans as humans. Sword Demon asks Zaha, why is he smiling? He replies he just smiled because his thoughts were similar to his. Then he asks the alliance is different then? Sword Demon says all organizations are bound to follow the thoughts of their leaders. The alliance could easily become like the cult too, and the cult could also become what the current alliance is alike. Zaha asks did he has a hard time when he fought the cult leader? Sword Demon replies the only time he is truly defeated is when he is dead. Not even the cult leader can kill him easily. Then he asks Zaha. By the way the air around him feels a little different. Did he learn the new martial arts? Zaha says asks him how did he know? He replies. He think the difference is very subtle, but he can feel it. From what he feel it seems he is advancing on the right track. Yan is silent as he is looking at his master. His master says even if the cult leader dies, the cult would not disappear just like that. It is because there are a lot of long-standing families in it. Which is why it must raise an upright cult leader, even if that means he has to kill all the current executives. Then he says whether Mong Yan or someone else become the cult leader in the future, this is the only way in any case the current cult leader must die. Yan tells his master he does not want to become the cult leader. His master asks him why? He replies it sounds like the cult leader must be crazy, the fact that the teachings of the cult mean the world to them. Even though he is a crazy asshole who is lustful, he does not think he can embrace such teachings. His master begins to laugh and says that is what the demonic cult is about. They cannot be persuaded. They need to be pressed into submission and ruled with brutal strength. 
As for fanatics, he cannot debate over teachings with them, he has to kill them and get rid of them. Then he looks at Zaha and says sect leader he ought to bear this in mind too. A part of the world has already gone crazy since long ago. Zaha says to Sword Demon he has a favor to ask of him. Sword Demon asks what is it? Zaha says while he does not know who his next sparring opponent will be, please invite him to watch it again. Sword Demon tells him he think he will be in training for a while, but he will invite him again. Zaha smiles so does the Sword Demon. Then Zaha leaves them and start walking. He turns to look at the lake. He is standing by the side of the lake and he notices something and asks who there's get in his way of enjoying the view of the lake. Meanwhile we see a lot of men standing behind him. 